We are continuing with modifying the work as a result of the COVID-19 emergency. Today, board members will assemble in the boardroom with the exception of Ms. McDougall, who will be joining us telephonically. The public may join us via our usual streaming channels. Before we get started with uh, roll call this morning and our Pledge of Allegiance, I wanted to just give our public a little bit of information about what today really is about. Um, typically, when we are under normal functioning circumstances, um, the board would have an opportunity to have a work session around issues before they come to us at a board meeting. Uh, and so today is our opportunity, the board's first opportunity, to see our reopening plan, uh, ask questions, and request additional information. We're not making any decisions today on the reopening plans. Um, but we are going to, to dig in and make sure that we understand and, and get any additional information that we need to get prior to the reopening plan coming to the board um, to the board meeting next Tuesday. Uh, and I think it's important to note too, this has been an incredibly emotional topic. Um, there is no lack of understanding for the seriousness of our role and the responsibility that we have to ensure the health and safety of our students and our faculty and staff. Um, and while it is emotional, I, I want to encourage our public that we are aware that we have this huge responsibility. We have a fabulous team who's been working to ensure that. And at the end of the day, we may have some disagreement on how we uh, achieve those health and safety measures. But I think it's important to note that uh, we're all here to ensure that we can bring everyone back safely uh, and continue strong quality education in the fall. So those are our goals today. Uh, this time, Ms. Escobar, would you please call roll? Mrs. Belford? Present. Ms. McDougall? Present. Mr. Susan? Present. Mrs. Deskovich? Present. And Mrs. Campbell? Present. All right, if you would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Dr. Mullins, I believe at this point I'm turning it over to you to begin our discussion. Thank you, Ms. Belford. Uh, board members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you and, and bring forward for discussion uh, and further consideration of the 2020-21 reopening of schools. I'd like to start by just acknowledging and recognizing the team that came together now uh, a few weeks ago and really has been meeting tirelessly and, and in, in, in some instances endlessly to carefully consider uh, all of the impacts, uh, implications um, to reopening, reopening our schools. Uh, in the midst of, of what we're facing as a, as a community, a country, and as a nation. Um, and I would like to just acknowledge that every individual was completely and fully invested in the process. The team consisted of 14 members uh, across the district, a very cross-functional representation of every function, aspect, and element of the district. Uh, in addition, 
uh, the, the task force, the team, sought aggressively uh, the input and feedback from every possible constituent stakeholder across our community. Uh, they stood up a uh, web-based portal for input. Uh, my last uh, awareness was there was over 13,000 comments and inputs provided. I want to assure our community and stakeholders that every input was reviewed and considered, collated and brought to the task force as they continued to work through some of the different challenges and uh, situations. Um, our school advisory councils at uh, all of our schools met, which uh, as the board knows consists of uh, stakeholders across the local school community from parents, uh, students and so on. And they provided input along the way, which was brought to the task force as well. Um, and we, we met with our union leaders, and we met with, uh, with teachers and considered uh, the full array of teacher type circumstances in our schools. When we think of a teacher, we, we may think narrowly a, a classroom teacher is a classroom teacher but there is a broad array of the different environments that our teachers work in, and all of those uh, were, were taken into consideration. So uh, I'd like to just give my very public and uh, sincere appreciation to the entire team and all of the, the, the work that has gone in, and clearly the, the work doesn't, it has not ended. There will be a follow-up after our conversation today for sure, uh, but th I wanna thank them, but this, this was, on top of all of the other duties and responsibilities that they have had along the way. Leading the task force, I, I wanna give special recognition and my appreciation to three cabinet members who have uh, really carried a tremendous amount of the responsibility as well as the work to prepare for the information that we're bringing, with, uh, bringing to you today. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Stephanie Sullivan, Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Leading and Learning. Uh, to her right is Ms. Jane Klein, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Leading and Learning. And then again to her right, uh, Ms. Chris Moore, Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. Um, and uh, they've, they've been working even into the night yesterday uh, to prepare for today and the information. So I appreciate the opportunity to acknowledge these folks. If you look at the end of the presentation, all of the individuals, um, that have contributed to, to the task force are listed and represented there. I do wanna give special uh, acknowledgement to our Department of Health representative, Patty, I'd never get your last name right, Seibert uh, is with us today and uh, the health department was uh, represented on the task force as well. So Patty, thank you for being here today. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sullivan to get us started in the presentation. The board uh, provided a handout that uh, delineates, we've, we've built in pauses throughout the presentation for the board to, to uh, ask questions. We thought that would be a better organizational means than slide by slide, uh, or certainly wait until the end because there's a lot of information. So you'll see that we'll, we'll pause there if you'd collect your questions on the slides that are presented then uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to you to, to uh, take questions from the board members. Perfect. So with that, Dr. Sullivan, get us started, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Balford, thank you for your preface. Um, that was an important uh, part of what we're doing here today. And thank you so much for our board members being here today and helping us flesh out this plan before we finalize some decisions um, prior to Tuesday. And Finalized decision is a very weak term um, because the climate changes daily. Um, the past three days, we've had different Florida Department of Education conferences, webinars, and information. And so as we move forward, um, we'll be sharing with you today our recommendations. We have pens in hand ready to cross off, erase, and mark up. Take your uh, feedback and then make those amendments prior to Tuesday as we put it out to our community. So really appreciate that you're gonna take the time to go through it with us. It's a real testament to your commitment and we really appreciate it. Um, it is very text heavy, as you can imagine. We're handling a lot of complex issues and uh, appreciate your willingness to flesh out even the tiniest of detail without the team to make sure it truly represents the best work that we can do in this current situation. 
Something that was really important to us as we began this process was to reground ourselves in what we believed in in Brevard Public Schools. Um, we did not want to take on the task of reviewing the best way to open up the district without really reflecting on what were already pre-identified priorities of this board, the superintendent, and our school community. And so as we take a look at our strategic plan goals and initiatives, I think we can see very easily that they don't change in this circumstance. They, they don't differ from what we want and hope and expect to provide for our students. When we look at objectives like ensure every student has daily engagement with complex grade appropriate curriculum, that all of our students are, are, have certified skilled teachers who hold high expectations for learning, our emphasis on equitable supports, our students who have diverse learning needs, and of course, early literacy. Early literacy is paramount to success for all of our students, regardless of their post-secondary goals. When we go and look at our objectives regarding to exceptional workforce, again, every decision that we make and a plan that we propose is grounded in these ideas. We want strong, developed, diverse, and skilled workforces. We want people to have the appropriate professional development. And you know what? Our priorities this year are different than they were a year ago. And so um, we are ready to adjust and customize professional development based on the needs of our teachers. We took a step back and pulled out of our district mandated professional development during pre-planning because we know what our original perspectives were don't necessarily represent um, the needs and desires of our local school communities. And then of course, community connectivity. Um, none of this is possible without a really clear um, collective partnership with our school communities, including our parents and our students, government agencies, local leaders. Um, they've all been really invaluable to the process. And then, boy, uh, you would have thought we knew this was coming when this first objective was written. Provide safe, healthy, and fully equipped working and learning environments. And so again, by revisiting what were already our organizational objectives, what were already our goals, it really helped focus the team on continuing the work that the board has done in focusing our efforts to improve student achievement and overall culture of our schools. But of course, all of this is anchored in an equity framework. Um, I think that we have been extraordinarily overt in our passion and our commitment to equity and revisiting our academic programs, our supports that don't necessarily help us meet that vision. And so all of that work didn't stop because of COVID. And in fact, that work was amplified because of COVID. And you can see that we, uh, we take a lot of pride in this statement that we put forward on the equity framework because we know that COVID-19 further complicated and exacerbated social and emotional inequities because of the additional impact on our workforce, our social systems, housing, employment, all of those factors that we know contribute to the well-being of our children. We know that that safety groundwork um, takes us all back to Maslow, so we've all read Maslow. Boy, it, it's never been bolded more than it is right now and um, we are not minimizing the impact that that has had on our students and community. So our emphasis on equity was simply amplified. It was not derailed because we were struck with a crisis. And so we really wanted to emphasize that for our families. Um, content, resources, and references. Well, um, one Google search will tell you that there are no limits to the amount of expertise out there on an unknown um, situation. We read it all, we relied on it all. Um, we, we were um, agnostic when it comes to research. If, if there was information out there, we wanted to read it. Um, that being said, what you see in front of you are the priority resources that for obviously uh, many reasons, we really anchored our work in. Um, Centers for Disease Control, I, I think that goes without saying. Um, very recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics just put out a comprehensive guideline we're really pleased to get a document like that from an organization of medical professionals that specialize in children. And we felt like that was really important. Of course, the Florida Department of Health, 
um, we've all become BFFs with Patty and uh, her team at the health department, and we are so thankful um, for their gracious time. I can't imagine a public organization busier than the Florida Department of Health. Every single time we called, which was a lot and continues to be a lot, um, they found a way to continue to support us, and that generosity is um, so appreci appreciated as we tackle these challenging issues. And then, of course, from an educational perspective, the U.S. Department of Ed and the Florida Department of Ed, and of course, because of the dynamic nature of this crisis, their guidelines change. And do we get frustrated by that? Well, yeah. <laughs> However, of course it should change. Um, none of us should be in a position where we think that the decisions we make today and right now are gonna withstand the dynamic nature of this crisis, the needs of our families and our communities, and what is the right decision at the right time. So flexibility is key. And so we might grit our teeth a little at another daily update, but at the same time, we are so thankful that the state, that the federal government, that our local officials have the courage to change their minds, have the courage to say, okay, we thought this was a good idea yesterday, not so much today. And um, we think that's important to this process. So a little frustrating, sure, essential, absolutely. And of course, OSHA, um, we, we rely on OSHA guidelines to keep our employees safe as they are um, managing um, activities that could be potentially hazardous. Dr. Mullins mentioned um, briefly our community feedback. Um, I've spoken about our grounding in our organizational objectives and goals. I've spoken to the robust research and information presented to the community, but our community feedback has been the cornerstone of our work. Um, when I say thousands of <laughs> thousands upon thousands of feedback, I'm not exaggerating, I have to give a quick pause and credit to Kathy Whittle, my administrative assistant, who uh, personally collated, managed, read, organized everyone so then I could read them all and so that we could take that feedback in. I wanna talk about our parents and our, our legal guardians and the feedback that they provided. Um, it was genuine, it was passionate, it was representative of their hopes and dreams for their children and their fears for their children. It, it represented the entire range of emotions that everybody is feeling in this climate right now and we were so thankful for it. Um, for every one or two that we read that felt passionately in one direction, there was equal that felt passionately in the other direction. And having that information is really powerful and, and we really honor that. And Ms. Belford made reference to the fact that, boy, we, we're not gonna agree on a lot. It's impossible to because this crisis is so personal and we have personal beliefs we have uh, personal interpretations of things, and that's okay. And when it comes to one's children's, the rules in the book go out the door. All logic goes out the door when it's your baby. And so we allow for that, we honor that. And so I, I ask for all of our community members, for our board members, everybody in our, in our organization to not be frustrated by the discord, to not be frustrated by um, the differences, but to really respect and honor that because um, that is a, that's a robust society. And so did it cause us challenges in trying to find the right answer? Of course it did. Um, but we landed on the fact that um, the, the feedback was valuable and we tried to put together some options that would meet the best needs of our communities. Are they perfect options? Of course not. Um, we don't have unlimited resources, we don't have unlimited personnel, we don't have unlimited buses, buildings, things like that. But we think we found something um, for everyone. Um, and I'm, I'm just thankful for that feedback. Uh, they were long, they were passionate. <laughs> sometimes they were brief and they were curt, sometimes they were kind, sometimes not so much. But that's okay. Um, everybody's allowed to have those feelings. Um, our teachers and staff, boy, we got a tremendous amount of feedback from them. Um, through various means. Many of our teachers and staff took the opportunity of using our generic portal, and we were able to pull those out and realize their feelings and passions. And of course, through School Advisory Council, several of our schools, when they reported their participation in School Advisory Council, they had upwards of 50, 60, 70 teachers participate in School Advisory Council. I'm gonna encourage them to keep participating in it as the uh, years go on. Um, 
but we got a lot of great ideas from there. And of course, we have a wonderful partnership with our union leaders. Um, I can speak for me, Jane, and Chris. Uh, we, we did not hesitate to pick up the phone and call them. They absolutely didn't hesitate to pick up the phone and call us, and we love that. We want to know the pulse. We want to know what concerns are weighing on people's heads and, and which concerns we can help mitigate. And our community leaders, this was a, a big surprise for me. And, and I shouldn't be surprised because of how Brevard is, but I was surprised at how many representatives who did not have children in the system, who were not teachers in our school community, who were not students themselves, took the time to give us great feedback. We got feedback from numerous physicians in our county um, and different perspectives, even within the medical community. And seeing that was important. Seeing that um, this doctor provided this feedback, this doctor provided differing feedback, was important to see as well. And to get the different perspectives of their profession. We got a lot of professional feedback. We got some great feedback from our partners at Patrick Air Force Base. In fact, one of the, the, the feedback's anonymous, but they attached their, their entire reopening plan, which was fantastic information for us. Um, our philanthropy groups, um, there was a great insertion at about like 9,000 and something um, from E Angels, is, which is one of our great partners that said, I, we're just here to help, tell us what you need. I partnered them with Coco High and Palm Bay High to support their graduation efforts and it was simply because they took the time to give us community feedback. And so um, that was really wonderful. And then finally, our students. We had a lot of student feedback, a lot of student comments. Um, we, we especially cherish those. I love students that advocate for themselves. I love students that are willing to take part in the democratic process, provide feedback, engage, and that was invaluable. There are lots of elements in this plan solely based on that feedback. There was kernels and snippets that, you know, you read a thousand that sound about the same, and then suddenly you're like, oh, we didn't think of that. So I, I'm incredibly appreciative of all that feedback. And even for those that think their feedback wasn't necessarily considered, it was, and, and we took those little things. Sometimes it was one little last line while a community member was commenting that made its way into the plan. And so I know that was a long explanation. I just thought it was really important um, for everybody to know that none of that time was wasted and we could not have landed on a lot of decision points without all of that. Um, finally, I'd like to, not finally, to hardly finally. Um, <laughs> Max, I'd like you to take to um, see the opening guidelines that we landed on. We had multiple drafts of our own perspectives. Um, we potentially hijacked language from multiple other plans. Um, we looked at all kinds of different language on like, what are the things that are gonna drive our decisions? And the American Academy of Pediatrics provided some language that we just couldn't help but use in full and of course, cite appropriately. Um, and you'll see some of the language from the American Academy of Pediatrics throughout the plan. And whenever we did that, we uh, quoted in full. We didn't think it was appropriate for us to interpret somebody else's language and recommendations. We felt it was important that our plan had that, had that language in full. So I'm just, I'll pause for a moment and highlight a couple of things. Of course, flexibility um, is gonna be key. We're all gonna be tired of that word. We're gonna ban it next year with t-shirts with lines through it. Um, but for right now, um, we're still wearing the flexibility t-shirts and um, continue to live in that framework. Um, obviously, developmental appropriateness is very important to us. Many of the things that amplify safety and health considerations are in direct contrast to what we know children need depend on for a developmental appropriateness. So we're gonna have to really think through some strategies to attack that affective domain and their social emotional considerations just for their natural development. You know, when we think about um, the power of play in our youngest children's and tactile experiences and the limitations on tactile experiences in this current environment, um, we have to be creative. And, and I, I believe in the skill set of our teachers and their knowledge of developmental milestones. And of course, um, all of the diverse needs of our communities and their situation. 
And so those, those were the guidelines that kind of we tucked away in the back of our head when we were at an impasse. We went back and looked at them. We looked at our guidelines. We looked at our equity framework. We looked at our goals and objectives and everything we said we believe in. And was this decision consistent with that? Um, in the following page, you'll see the summary statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics on their belief in schools. Again, these statements are taken in full as direct quotes, um, but we thought it was really important to share their perspectives on the power of the educational experience for the child. I'm gonna take a break with the mic and turn it over to uh, Chris Moore, who's gonna take you through while we were planning, while we were researching, while we were considering every bit of data, we couldn't wait to act. We had to simultaneously take some important steps. And so, Ms. Moore? Yeah, I think, is there, before I jump in, do we take a pause for some questions? Oh, sorry. Is that there anything that is could. building out there? Yeah. I apologize. Thank you, thank you. no mm -hmm. problem. Um, Ms. McDougall, did you have any questions, comments, concerns for the first section? Uh, not at the first section, no. Okay, very good. Mr. Later Susan? on, yes. Yeah, due to the, I had one question and I just had one uh, request due to the fact that I think this is going to take longer than two hours, uh, was make sure that all our other board members are okay with just extending it until it's finished. Are we good with that? Okay, good, Dr. Mullins. And just the one question I have in the beginning is not towards this, but I was wondering if there was a way that I could get um, the percentage of free and reduced lunch students who signed on with their computers mm -hmm. during the COVID piece from March till the end of school. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, those attendance rates, stuff like that. And that can come in an email later. I don't need that today. Absolutely. That's, that's data we can provide and follow up with. No problem. Thank you. Any other board members have questions or comments for the first section? Uh, I have just one um, kind of keeping in line with Dr. Sullivan, your focus on, I think, the important message that our priorities have not changed. Um, that we just have, have had to maybe adjust the way that we approach those priorities in some ways. But I just want to point out, um, along with all of our wonderful community partners, we have been very focused on safety in, in Brevard Public Schools for some time. Um, and I know there have been a lot of concerns with some of the recommendations about how we maintain our commitment to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas safety elements, um, even though we may be looking at safety slightly differently right now. Um, but we are blessed that uh, Lieutenant Brian Neal has also been on the task force to ensure that we have that <clears throat> that lens of, of safety from that perspective as well. And so, Lieutenant, I know we appreciate your, your contribution and making sure that you guys have your eyes on all of the changes that we're making as well as we move forward. All right, Ms. Moore. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so as, as Stephanie said, you know, we've, we've been through some rapid shifts. We had to scale up a, a whole different way of educating kids um, basically in a week. And as we took this project on and started pulling the research on, and, and now what comes next, um, it became really evident to us really quickly that we couldn't wait uh, to start uh, implementing some of the things that we were reading in the research. And Jane and Stephanie worked with their principals. Every time we came up with a question like, well, what do clinics look like in schools? Uh, they started a Google Doc, sent it out to their schools and said, Principals, we need to know right now, what, what do your clinics look like? And the principals were responsive on a dime. And so as we go through this, know that it was, uh, all of this rolled out as research rolled out and as we worked with the schools. And so this is all, all prior to us even going operational, uh, going to the, to the opening. So under the operational heading, uh, as we looked at the research and we, we looked at ways to maximize space and mitigate contact, we knew immediately our classroom situations needed to change. Uh, we asked all schools to start getting rid of anything extra in their classrooms. You know, all of us have uh, bits and pieces that we brought in to make our rooms homey, uh, but the fact of the matter is we need to spread the desks out as far and as wide as we possibly can, and so that uh, was all taken, uh, taken out of the rooms in cooperation with, uh, with the teachers. Um, we knew that uh, because this is an airborne illness and it spreads through droplets, 
that although we know educationally it's better for students to be collaborative, it's better for them to work in groups, um, it is safer now for them to all be facing in one direction. Um, and so we asked for all of the tables to be seated in that way. We asked schools to start looking at their plan for traffic patterns. The footprint of our schools are so different that, you know, if, if all of them were built the same way, we could have very easily from up here said, and this is the way it shall run. But that's not the case. Um, some schools have very tight corridors. Uh, some schools have very few corridors. So we asked them to all start working on their plan of what their traffic pattern is going to be, uh, what their entrance and exit plan is going to be, um, and so uh, to mitigate contacts. Um, one of the questions we quickly asked was, what does your front office look like? What kind of barriers do you need? And from, from that point on, we realized all of the other areas in which a barrier, a plexiglass barrier, might need to be needed. Um, what you're going to see, and that's a great example, is a little asterisk at the end of that. Whenever we realized that something was going to need COVID fund, CARES Act funds, um, we, uh, we've shown that with an asterisk, that that has been funded through the CARES Act. Um, we may have missed some, I'll be honest, as we go through it, we look and we go, oh yeah, 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 that was funded by the CARES Act. So if I see any of those, or if you guys see any of those, step up. One of the things that helped us tremendously is as part of our uh, budgeting efforts, we were, we were pulling any, anything, um, uh, anything back that we possibly could, that we recouped due to, um, due to not being in school. Uh, before we knew what the CARES Act funding was going to be, and we were fortunate enough that we were able to set that money aside to start purchasing some of those things. So uh, uh, our procurement department has been amazing. They have, it, Johnny on the spot, ordered thousands and thousands of, of, um, of supplies for us, gallons of hand sanitizer and plexiglass and face masks and face shields. And, um, and it was only because we had already started that work to call aside some money that we were able to put that order in while we waited for the CARES Act funding to come in. So you'll see that denoted by that asterisk in, in all those areas. Uh, we asked schools to look at any area in which uh, students congregated. We asked them to look at their schedules that provided time for them to congregate and asked them to mitigate or limit those, uh, those things. Um, you know, as things, I'll tell you, two days ago, somebody said, what about water fountains? Um, so that's, that's kind of how, how we have operated, because as we get into the weeds, more things that are of equal importance to everything else come up. And so as you can see, we're going to limit water fountain use to just refilling bottles. Um, God love them, I don't think they were really meant to be used in a sanitary and clean way. <laughs> so, so we're going to have signage up to limit that. Uh, again, I said PPE and hand sanitizer, cleaning products we have ordered, uh, and, and they have some of them have come in. We are waiting for others to come in. Um, but procurement, Christy Rodriguez and her team have done a tremendous job. Um, and, and we have started the work with bus drivers, our cleaning staff, our cafeteria staff on what, what the cleaning procedures are and protocols will be. Continuing with um, operational, I, I wish I could speak uh, intelligently about HVAC, but I won't. I will tell you that Sue Han can and she has and we thank her for it. Um, Dr. Miller has been working tirelessly. Um, as some of you guys know, our bus runs uh, on, our, on our best day. We had subs on our buses, sub drivers on our buses, three to a seat. Uh, we said to him, we can't have that. Um, so we have asked them to design routes with only two to a seat and, and added additional safety measures in there. Um, we have looked at everything, all of our policies and procedures as it relates to Mitigating student contact. If you're sick, stay home. Visitors, thank you. We appreciate your being there. But anytime we could tell somebody that we do not want an additional contact in our schools, we have taken off the we have taken the opportunity to do so. Um, that fourth bullet down, adjusting clinic space. 
Uh, I will tell you, we knew very early on that our clinic was going to be essential to the functioning and the well-being of our schools. Um, when Stephanie mentioned the time, I will tell you um, just as, as, as praise to our local health department, I talked to Patty probably no less than three to five times a day. Um, she helps me problem solve through all the issues. If she is not there, I can go to somebody else. I have, I have a backup to the backup to the backup. And uh, yesterday when I was asked, hey, do you think a Department of Health member could be here in case there are questions, uh, in the afternoon, Patty said, um, yeah, I'll absolutely be there. And I can assure you all, it wasn't because Patty had five or six hours free today. Mm -hmm. So to talk to, uh, to the community about the partnership that the <coughs> school system has with the Department of Health, I think that's just exemplified in the fact that Patty is here today. Um, so we took a look at our clinics and said, how do our clinics have to function? And I know Patty and her health department have been working with the school nurses on what that's going to look like, but our principals had to look at what space they had. Um, if we have a student that we believe, you know, may have an infectious illness, we can't have him sitting in the clinic or her in the clinic as other students come in to pick up, um, to pick up their medication for the day. So we took a look at all of that. Um, we, uh, we, are, we are working on developing videos to help teach our kids um, appropriate hand washing, uh, when, to wear face, uh, when and how to wear face masks, um, how to avoid uh, and mitigate uh, coming into contact with one another, um, why we use hand sanitizer, how to m minimize uh, the likelihood of infection getting on and off buses and into, into classroom spaces. So we're working on all of those things as well as companion training for our, um, for our teachers. And we're trying to make sure it's developmentally appropriate so um, our students who uh, have intellectual disabilities understand why we're not hugging each other. Um, our five-year-olds understand why we're not hugging each other. Our, you know, it, it, is, it is a total 180 from the relationship building um, that our kids might be used to. So, um, so we're going to do some direct instruction on that. We're doing some training videos um, as it relates to that. Um, the last two bullets I think are really important, and that is the continued work and discussion around when we are going to exclude students and employees from the work site, when we are going to close classrooms and schools, and how we are going to handle active cases, presumptive cases, and contacts to cases. That has been ongoing. Um, we, we call the Department of Health on every, in fact, I call the Department of Health and I say, I know the answer. I talked to you about this an hour ago, but because it's a different school, I'm calling you again because I just don't want to take the chance um, that I am not relating the exact appropriate information to our schools. Um, and then the other part of it is that just yesterday, just yesterday at around 3 o'clock, um, we got new guidance from, was it the CDC or the Department of Health? The CDC. The CDC um, about cases and contact to cases and, and bringing people, excluding people from areas and bringing them back. So I don't ever want to take the chance that something has come to the Department of Health that hasn't made its way to the school board yet. So we, we stay in constant communication and will continue to do so. Yeah. I, I really to Oh, thank you. So, um, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will tell you that when we talk about people standing up a whole system of retraining uh, how we do education, and then you stand it up again. Um, there are people doing two, two and three jobs. One of the things that I know can't continue as we go into school is uh, for my office to be the central line of communication on all cases, presumptive cases, and contact cases. And so um, after many people said to me, Chris, you can't keep doing this, it finally dawned on me, I can't keep doing this. Um, 
And so it was, it was Dr. Sullivan's idea, because she's a genius, um, that we write into the CARES Act a liaison to work in our building um, that is a member of the Department of Health. And so I called up Patty and I said, Patty, um, if we do this, can it be done? And she said, not only can we do this, Chris, but we were thinking the same thing. So we are working to get a, um, a Department of Health nurse. She'll be sitting, or two, um, she or they, he, he or she or they, will be sitting uh, right outside my office and will um, be the first stop of information for our principals. Um, and we'll sit on our uh, response team as we have to make decisions about excluding kids, closing classes, and closing schools. So that is going to be uh, a tremendous support for the district. Um, in addition to the creation of that position, um, which will be paid out of CARES Act and connected to our um, current Department of Health uh, contract, um, we, we stood up two different teams. One is a response team. I alluded to it just a second ago. I'll talk more about it later. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't come together yet. Our first meeting is next week. And that's a response team that will look at each case uh, in terms of when schools will close or when students are going to be excluded in large numbers. Um, so that it's not just one person looking at all the data, but a team. Uh, and it'll be a rapid response team. The other, the other team that has been stood up and they have actually already been implemented is the custodial strike team. Um, they are still waiting to hire uh, five custodians, um, but the team is led by Jim Powers and Pete Trimnicka, and they have already uh, been implemented, uh, been used out at our schools. As cases come up, um, they, are the, they rapidly respond to the head custodian and provide support in isolating areas for 24 to 48 hours and uh, cleaning them in the manner that is uh, uh, in line with the current protocols. Is anything on there? We're good? All right. So uh, I, again, this is all prior to opening. Um, we were looking, we took a look at the early warning system. We took a look at the data that was available at the time to um, bring some students in for summer instruction. Uh, it was both virtual and in person. Um, and I know that Jane could probably speak more about that if you guys had any questions, because a lot of it was elementary, some of it with student with disabilities, and I can speak to that if you're interested uh, in that. The Department of Health has been working all summer long. They have pulled all of our um, documentation of medically fragile students. Uh, they have been creating health plans to mitigate any, uh, as much as we can, the um, likelihood of infection. Um, we are now treating those new health plans like we do a 504 plan. Every teacher has to read them, sign off on them. Um, they'll be meeting uh, with, as a team to discuss you know, what, what needs to happen for those medical uh, health plans to be implemented for our medically fragile students. We're also uh, assessing our students with IEPs, their progress toward their goals. Um, if there is regression there, we, are, um, we have written into the CARES Act uh, a uh, ESY. And typically you hear of ESY, extended school year, as it, as it refers to summer school. Actually, ESY can happen before school, after school, uh, weekends, and summer school. So we're ready to stand up an ESY plan based on um, students' progress toward their IEP goals. Uh, e that, is, that is different than uh, compensatory time. Compensatory time applies if a student was not offered services. So you may hear them used interchangeably, and they're not. Um, so if you have any, any questions about that, please stop me and, uh, when we get to the end, and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Russ and his team have um, been looking at assessing uh, tech needs and gaps in schools, both hard, hardware and software. I'll tell you, um, in terms of, of the team, that's always one of our biggest concerns, is if we have to shut a building down uh, for three days or two weeks or three months, um, are we going to be able to provide equitable supports for all students, especially uh, when it is technologically uh, heavy? So um, he has been working on assessing that with the schools. Um, our teams, both Russ's team and our leading and learning teams, have been working on creating professional development to support that blended learning experience. Uh, you know, we threw a lot at our schools, and although 
a lot of our digital tools have been available a really long time. Teachers teach. They like to teach. Uh, and so a lot of them don't access those digital tools uh, because they were uncomfortable and unfamiliar with them. Uh, when we went remote, they had to learn real quick. And so there's a lot, a lot of experimenting going on. There was a lot of, you know, is Teams better? Is Skype better? Is what's, what's better? How are we going to do this? Um, so I know that uh, Russ's team led by uh, Don um, Bronstein, sorry, sorry Don, uh, by Don Bronstein have been working on training on all of the tech, um, uh, tech supports as well as the uh, platforms that we're ready to roll out. And finally, um, our students in transition, uh, we have been supporting uh, them all summer long. Um, our transportation department had uh, uh, drivers who provided, um, drove meals out to different areas of the county, supplies, um, social work support, uh, provision. I, I can't even tell you um, the efforts that went into trying to meet the needs of our students in transition. Um, so I, uh, my resource teacher for that area became a, a bit of a router, a bit of a, she became a bit of a everything. Um, but she continues to work with the Brevard County uh, Homeless Coalition um, and will continue to do so as we go through this year. We also took a review of our social emotional curriculum. I uh, alluded to this at our meeting uh, last week. We have developed a plan um, to best support our students or at least to hopefully support our students as they come in. Um, just to base, based off of the challenges that were exacerbated by them being out for three months and now coming back in this really uncertain time. Uh, we created, as I told you last week, um, the trauma-informed compassion fatigue. Um, it, it is, I, I was on the phone with somebody crying today um, and, it's, and it's, not a, it's not somebody who cries. Um, but it is really hard. It is really hard as we deal with how are we protecting our families, how are we protecting our staffs, how are we protecting kids, um, and never more so than now. And so as we talk more about compassion fatigue, we hope to layer in more there. Um, we have looked at the scheduling process uh, the, that is used that allows technology to be used from day one. And by that, I don't mean our scheduler. I mean, um, we want to make sure our teachers are using tech day one, um, because we don't want to worry about the integration of that um, to start when kids have to leave. Uh, and when we close a school, we want to make sure it's integrated and they're used to using it every single day. Um, we already did some small group assessments this summer in a ACT and EOC. Um, and we really looked at identifying ways to accelerate students. Um, our whole goal is to try to mitigate contacts, as we told you from the beginning. So there are going to be some students that may be able to graduate in December. We want to afford them that opportunity. Um, and again, just mitigate the number of kids that we have coming in and onto class, uh, onto campus. That doesn't mean they have to. It just means that they can and we can afford them that opportunity. I, are we breaking for questions now? Okay, so I want to be just quiet and give you a chance to read some of that because I went through it fairly rapidly and then ask any questions that you might have. Ms. Dustovich? I have a couple questions, Ms. Moore. Thank you so much for all of your work on this. Uh, and Patty, did I get that name right? Thank you so much for the partnership with the Department of Health. I think it's essential at this time. I'm curious about the nurse. Uh, is she, it, will that, she, or he, uh, will the nurse be an RN, or what's the qualifications of the nurse that will be here if we've identified that? And is it a, a contract, and what's the contract length for? And you said the CARES Act will cover. Is it covering the entire cost, or will we have to pick something up uh, ultimately in the end? I'll start with the last question first. Yes, it, it is covering the entire cost. Um, we didn't put a timeline on that contract right now. Our DOH partnership is three years. Um, when we no longer need a CARES Act liaison, we will no longer have a CARES Act liaison. Um, so it, 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 for my purposes, we're going to keep, uh, keep that position in as long as we are handling care, uh, COVID cases in our schools, uh, cases, presumptive cases, or um, contacts to cases. Um, in terms of the qualifications, that I'll have to ask Patty.
Okay. Can and we get Patty a microphone? Because the yeah, I was just going to repeat what she said yeah. for those that didn't. They, um, she responded that the position will be a registered nurse with a background in epi epidem epidemiology. 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 I've gotten really good at that word, epidemiology. <laughs> you would think right now that I'd be really good at that word too. I, Thank I can you, add Mr. To the Cheatham. CARES Act questions. Um, we wrote it in for two years. Um, okay. The CARES Act allows for funding for this next school year, the following year, and then a close out in the fall of the subsequent year, fall uh, September of 2020. 22. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. And then my next question is about the GEAR program, which I think started yet yesterday. I, I think it might be for you, Ms. Moore. I'm oh. just curious. We've had two days of oh. students so far. Have we had any, you, you said the concerns are coming to you if there's a student with symptoms mm -hmm. or something of that nature. In the first two days, mm -hmm. are we good to go? Or you've, you've gotten 28 million calls already that kids are sneezing and coughing, what's our status there? So we started return to activity before we started gear. We have had cases and we've had, had presumptive cases and we have had contacted cases. And we have handled all of them in collaboration and cooperation with the Department of Health. Um, with, our, uh, with our start with gear, um, we have not had a case, we have not had a presumptive case, and we have not had a contact to a case as of 9 o'clock this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I, th I think that's it, Ms. Walford, so yeah. far. Thank you. Campbell, I can't see you down yeah, there, so you're going to have um, to I, 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 Ms. Deskovich, I, I do want to add one thing. Um, it makes me very uncomfortable to speak in a public forum on our employees, our students, or, and or their families' health. So um, I want to make sure that as we ask questions and you hear me hesitating, I'm being very clear that that is not what I'm doing, and I will not do that. Um, that is a violation of their HIPAA. It could be a violation of their FERPA. Um, and so I will answer really general questions in a public forum, and I will answer as specifically as I can if you call me uh, and, and if I have information that I'm allowed to share. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So just like everybody, I don't want to start asking questions without taking the time to thank all of you and the ones who aren't here for the time that you've put together. And I, I just have to say, you know, as I'm listening to some of these things and you talk about, I mean, I've already, already had these three words um, written down before you talked about hugs. But I just, you know, part of this process is I wrote down grieve the loss because I think we have to grieve the loss. We're going to talk about some things later as I've skimmed through the things of changes that really, they're going to be losses. I mean, we're grieving the loss of people in our community, in our nation, but we're also, for our students, grieving the loss of, of some really good things that we're going to be missing. And oh, it kills me to say we're grieving the loss of kindergartens wrapping their arms around your legs. And there's kindergartner teachers right now who are probably crying. Um, I'm about to cry. But I just thank you for taking the time to acknowledge that this is going to be a loss, and hopefully not for very long. Um, now back to specifics. Um, because I've had s people from the community ask some specifics about certain things, and Ms. Han, if you wouldn't mind, um, when she talked about the HVAC filters, are these, like, are we getting new kinds of filters or doing things differently, or are we just going to change them more frequently? How is, what is that detail? For example, some uh, more robust filters, but they don't actually fit. So we have to use the filters that are assigned to those systems. So okay. we're, we've ordered um, something along the lines of 13,000 filters. Okay. And as we can then we're deploying them in the schools. Okay, and those are new? These are new filters. Okay. And then, I know we're going to get to transportation later, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm not, I know that some of these were just broad topics, and we're going to get to specific details later. Um, 
I think that was it, because you either answered all of my questions or we're coming to them later. So I'm good, Mrs. Alford. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Susan, did you have Ms. McDougall, did you have questions you'd like to ask? I do. I do. Um, and maybe this will come down later, or maybe I'm asking two specific questions. But first, uh, thank you very much for all the work that everybody's put in. I know this has been, um, in many ways, a labor of love and concern, and I appreciate that. But I, I have also, as Ms. Campbell alluded to, that many people have reached out to us. And um, there's so much that we don't know yet. So how will, you know, when you have computer labs, are we still gonna have computer labs? Do we clean the computers after everybody goes? Um, are we sharing art supplies? Are we, what happens with PE? I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm getting questions about that I don't know if we can answer yet, but I know we need to be thinking about this. And more importantly, um, on page 11 and 12, and a lot of the, great operational things you have in place, but how do we know that they're going to be done with fidelity? How do we know that it's really going to happen? Um, and I'm not saying, I'm not pointing fingers to anybody, but we're a big organization and we're all very busy. So how do we make sure this really happens with fidelity? So I, those are some of my concerns at this point. Uh, Mrs. McDougall, I'm going to take the mic first because several of those programs you mentioned operate out of secondary leading and learning, even in the elementary art and music programs. Um, in the presentation, you will see some explicit guidance in some really narrow areas, and you will see the absence of explicit guidance because our teachers will be working together on some protocols with their principals and with resource teachers and content specialists. Um, our resource teachers and content specialists have been working all summer through the guidelines of their national organizations. And so, for example, uh, Ms. Cindy Johnson sends me with great regularity. The national organization just recommended this, just recommended that. And so some of those things that are global are in this plan. Some of those things that are more narrow um, will be fleshed out um, in additional information to this grant plan. Um, for example, music is, is a good example. Ms. Johnson is working through the national recommendations, has a team of um, band instructor, instructors that she's working with. They're creating a video and creating some guidelines. Um, you mentioned computers, the same thing. Those, those things are being looked at by our career and tech ed program in uh, collaboration with our educational technology. So yes, the, the, there will be an expectation that any shared materials are cleaned before they are shared. <laughs> what we can't put in a plan that wouldn't be a thousand pages is how each item will be cleaned prior to it is shared. So we've also asked schools, when you get to um, one of the second last pages, talks about principal guidelines, we have some clear expectations on where we expect um, schools to work those things out in terms of whether it is a custodial team, whether it is um, a teacher who says, I want to clean it myself, give me the spray bottle, or the older kids that might assist in that. Every special situation, whether it is a culinary lab, an auto body lab where they share a wrench, um, we have a plan during the week of pre-planning for those content specialists and resource teachers to collaborate with the teachers across the district in that shared occupation. Um, they've already provided us a lot of feedback on one of those teacher feedback ones. Um, but again, uh, in some cases, it's securing additional resources. For example, schools might buy more calculators. Um, there may be a different way of managing things but in every school site, in every type of class, it is a little different. So we are certainly empowering them to create policies and guidelines as supported by the school and of course supported by the district. So some of those really granular topics uh, will be fleshed out more prior to the arrival of the students, but with complete collaboration with every teacher in that area. Um, so before any final decisions are made, Ms. Johnson will collaborate with all the band teachers. We'll collaborate, Ms. La Traverse will collaborate with all of the art teachers, uh, Ms. Ely with all of the, the media specialists. So yeah, so, they may not be so explicit I, here, but the, the plan is in place. Right, so, so about understanding then, 
folks in the district will, uh, um, will be able to review some of those narrow plans. Is that correct? Oh, and sure. All, all of those teams are under um, one of the cabinet members' uh, stream of flow. So um, all of our tech specialists work under Mr. Cheatham. Um, our resource teachers, whether they are the assistive technology resource teacher and how we work with students who need assistive technology or art supplies. So we, are, we have dispatched them to that task. And for okay. example, this week we made the decision on dressing out for PE because uh, we already had clear guidance from national and state organizations. We could not collectively determine a good way to do that in a locker room. So we were able to already clearly identify that. Ms. Winston with her teachers will identify healthy practices for physical education, fresh air, and those activities within those guidelines. Okay, thank you. No problem, good, good questions, thank you. I, I do wanna address the other half of that and, and it was the question of how do we know? How do we know this is, this is happening? Um, and I'm, I'm gonna address that in two ways. The, the first is, um, first we assume the the professionalism of our staff. We, we have to go in with the assumption that our teachers, our bus drivers, uh, our clerical staff, our custodians, all the support personnel are operating under the same level of professionalism as, as we expect of ourselves. Um, and that when we put out guidance that they're going to follow it. Um, the second thing I can address toward that uh, is that we have to um, focus on past practice. And like I said, we stood up our return to activity plan. Um, you know, one of the scariest uh, one of the scariest things is to have your first plan roll out be one that's activity oriented, uh, which just by the very nature of what it is is uh, an area in which kids interact with one another, with equipment, with coaches in large groups. Uh, and when we put out our guidelines for the return to activity and said, thou shalt not, um, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if we would be able to hold the thou shalt not. Uh, and in fact, the instances that we have worked through with schools, we have been able to work through with schools because they were following the plan to the letter. They were evaluating kids as they came in they were keeping kids in small groups. They were keeping kids uh, as separate as they could, uh, six feet apart. Um, we were able to mitigate illness because our coaches, our, our athletic directors, and our administrators were following the plan. So I would say that I can't guarantee uh, anything uh, any more than I can uh, guarantee that nobody is ever going to catch COVID again, because I would love to make that guarantee. But I can say that with the assumption of professionalism and our past experiences with our, our, our people following the plans that we put out, I, uh, I have high expectations and high hopes. Thank you. And, and I did not uh, mean this as a disparage against our staff at all. Um, I know we have great professionals. Um, I just get concerned. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions and I was just going to go page by page. Um, the first one is, is when are the cleaning supplies going to get to the schools? Um, I can answer that in part. So uh, the schools should have cleaning supplies. Um, we had schools uh, order um, heavily in the spring. Um, we had our kind of quiet period to close books and that period has opened now for them to do additional orders. Through the CARES Act, we allocated additional resources to every school beyond what we also ordered for them. So in CARES Act, we, we focused on personal items. Um, we ordered uh, a huge supply of masks, a huge supply of hand sanitizer. For example, every teacher will start the year with a gallon jug with a pump. So picture a gallon of hand sanitizer. <laughs> Um, we've ordered face shields for teachers who would prefer a face shield. Um, we ordered the Plexi and something else that I just can't remember at this point. So we ordered large batch things that we wanted to make sure were there day, oh, the thermometers that, we were, that were there day one. Separate from that, schools have varying levels of custodial supplies towards the end of the year. Jim Powers from Sue's office communicated extensively 
with the custodial, uh, the head custodians and the teams at the school on what additional supplies to order, what would be appropriate for that in-process cleaning. Um, so as of, I think today, if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Lazinski, the, the accounting system's open again. The new money allocated via our CARES Act is in their accounts um, for them to order additional supplies that make sense for their campus. And so what makes sense for an outdoor campus might be different than an indoor campus. And so those allocations are loaded and um, they have the information for anything else that they may want to purchase. So some was the school's bot, some of our bot. Um, separately, Ms. Um, Han is gonna talk later about this fantastical misting product <laughs> um, that we ordered for every school. Those will be delivered as soon as upon arrival. But at this point, through pr procurement, everything that we've purchased for start of school will be here prior to the start of school. Beautiful, thank you, and that yeah. was one of the things. Um, did we clean out all of the teacher's furniture and everything else? Have they done that, or is that something they're gonna be doing when they get back? It's in progress. So the schools have been reaching teachers and uh, handling it with the custodial staff. Um, I, I can't give you a percentage, but they've been working on it since the spring. Okay. Um, the desk's in the same direction. When I was looking at that, being a teacher, I taught Socratic circles, I taught group work, I did all that stuff, right? Um, are we saying that that is not going to be part of the curriculum, even if they're socially distanced? Or are we saying that, that they're allowed to do that as long as they're socially distanced? Does that make any sense? The CDC guideline is that desks should all be faced in the same direction. Okay. I, I would, uh, Mr. Susan, <clears throat> I would um, suggest that it's a hard decision to make in general. In some of our schools, it's really easy and common for a teacher to go outdoors and um, utilize outdoor spaces for things that aren't best able in a classroom. Um, I think by and large, most of our classroom spaces could not handle in a safe manner students in a circle in the classroom, but perhaps that day they utilized the cafeteria or, or, or made an arrangement with their principal based on cleaning protocols. So what we wouldn't want is taking a new space without working with the principal because we want to make sure those cleaning protocols happen. And so um, I would suggest that that is a hard question off the top, but... It might all change next week too when the CDC comes out change. with new guidelines, right? Um, it, could. it could be changing as we speak. <laughs> and so um, okay. I, I, I just think that the goal of the Seeds Forward is just we all know the spits, you know, the droplets, what's the right word? I shouldn't say droplets spit. Is droplets. Right droplets is um, the right word. Uh, you know, if we can avoid it, but if there is a safe alternative, it depends on the school. In, in some of our schools, the classrooms, it, it, the safest thing is to keep them the way they are. Um, we've got some unusually large classrooms somewhere with maybe smaller kids. It just, we would really trust our teachers to collaborate with their principals. Plus the viral load is different in age groups too, so I agree with you. Yeah. Um, hallway patterns for the face-to-face -face interaction, um, are we allowing them to print out at their schools? Is that up to the school-based location on how that's gonna work? Or is that gonna be something that the print services and the print services cover for the schools? Who's printing those signs? Who's doing all that stuff? Got it, I lost the question there. Um, little bit of both. So some of our schools have already ordered before we even, it was a glimmer in our eye, the principals had already begun. Some of our schools already had one-way hallways. Some of our schools had minor changes and because of other reasons wanted one-way hallways. Some of them ordered them before we even talked about it. So Molly Vega is our point of contact on print materials. We built a budget into the CARES Act for print materials. So she's working directly with um, print shops so that there's not a million different people doing it and working with our schools and ordering signage for the schools and then providing them information on ordering a different additional signs. And you'll see throughout my questioning, my, my concerns was that a lot of it would fall on the cost of the school's budgets and stuff like that. And oh, I yeah. applaud you for everything that you've been saying. Thank you so much. The ordering, phenomenal. The money that we've packed for CARES Act, phenomenal. I just want to make sure as we're going through that those yeah. are checked off. Good question. Um, plexiglass barriers, we're saying in offices and reception areas. <laughs> Did we look at that in the areas of classrooms that may be smaller. I know some of my schools are smaller. Yeah. So I have some classrooms that are smaller because of the way they're designed than other schools. Have we looked at possibly using those plexiglass barriers in those classrooms that are smaller and have closer, um, kids closer basically? 
Yes, yeah, so yeah. to start the ordering, um, I, I might butcher this a little bit, but I'm gonna be pretty close. Um, for every school, we made sure every school's front counter had a pretty large plexiglass thingy. So however large this thingy is um, for their front office. Um, we also, uh, our high schools that also have a attendance office that's separate that parents come in, we got another large thingy. And then we also got large thingies for the media center circulation desk. Um, because that's also another point of contact. Separate from that, we ordered an additional 10 to 15, depending on the size of the schools, smaller thingies that could be moved. And for the schools to figure out, just to have them to start, to figure out where it made sense. So if a teacher wanted to have one of those in their classroom, it made sense, the school could, of course, order it, which is why we put additional funds in their account. So we spent some upfront and some additional. Um, our procurement folks are putting together kind of a one pager for schools on if you want more of these things, how to do it. Um, I, I wanna back up a little on funding. Uh, a, a significant portion of these supplies and materials, the cost can be co-split with FEMA and CARES Act. And so, um, I've become FEMA friends with our friends in risk management. And so the way the budget works, if we took $100 and spent them on this type of equipment, we are budgeting $12.50 of that out of CARES Act, and the 87.5 will come through FEMA. And so all of those budgets are running through my office right now because we don't have a grant coordinator. Um, and the other duties as assigned. Um, and so every single purchase that the school makes will come through my office so that I can track to make sure every one of those dollars are reimbursed either through FEMA or through CARES Act. And so the FEMA portion of it is allowing us to amplify our CARES Act dollars on all those supplies. So everything that we've discussed and purchased is not general fund purchases, they are, they are they are purchases that will be either reimbursed through FEMA and or CARES Act or a combination thereof. And we set up a pretty tight protocol to make sure all those expenditures are being tracked properly and eligible. And that protocol right now is me, um, but we hope to expand that protocol soon. Oh, that's amazing. Dr. Mullins, do you know what the time lapse on those FEMA reimbursement? Because I know we were two years behind on they, that. They are, this is a rapid uh, version. Um, I assume I asked all those questions. Um, this is a process that's slightly different than with a typical hurricane reimbursement process. Uh, oh, I worked good. with the folks that do it and uh, the state has set those guidelines that also we're expect expecting a rapid uh, replacement. Perfect, because yeah. we don't want to get into a situation like we were before where no. we're two years behind. This is a very explicit kind of like sub project of mm -hmm. FEMA good. that um, we work together on planning for. So what I'm hearing you say is, is that if a school has additional requests based upon the fact that they're a different setup, that they can make those not affecting their school budget, but actually make it and we can use the CARES Act and FEMA reimbursement for majority of those things. Correct, 100%. Beautiful, thank you so much. Okay, um, that, that answers a couple of these other ones. And then can you explain the school schedules will be designed to minimize congregation in communal areas cafeterias, gyms, courtyards. School teams will also develop arrival and dismissal protocols to minimize interaction. This is a big deal for a lot of the people around. Can you kind of explain that, how that, how that we'll process? Well, tag team, elementary, and secondary, so I'll let you. Jane go first. And if, and if any time I ask a question that may be in depth referred in the back of the document, please tell me and I'll wait until that point. I just didn't want to miss it and then not catch it. I've gone through it. But... Perfect, skip it then, just skip it. Oh, I don't want to waste time right now because I'm, I'm thinking about ordering lunch right now. <laughs> uh, we have um, <coughs>
Okay. Um, first, for secondary um, lunch scheduling is a really good example. Um, a lot of our schools operate under a power hour, and as you can imagine, not ideal for social distancing. Um, so they're adjusting their lunch schedules. A school that might have had two lunches is now operating three lunches, or sometimes even four lunches to, to minimize to the best of our abilities. Um, our presidential schools are working together. Their courtyard areas have some unique challenges. I do want to emphasize that this is one of those things that is a multiple commitment. It is going to be a commitment from parents and their expert expectations of their children, children and their respect for the guidelines that are set. Um, it is human nature to congregate around people you care about, and it's going to have to be some deliberate steps to be avoiding of that. And so um, I don't want to suggest that there'll be no pictures on Facebook at a congregation of people, potentially. Everybody's going to do the very best they can in the physical footprint that they can, but our, our principals are collaborating, uh, changing schedules, changing where kids get dropped off and wait. Um, we have some sort of cattle call areas um, and just adjusting some of those routines and procedures. Mr. Susan, I did want to, um, you were talking about plexiglass and Dr. Sullivan talked about the face shields. This is a shield, so teachers will have it. it it's elastic. Um, foam. That's great. Super so light. super lightweight and you can wear it and teach and do everything you need to do. So. Awesome. I, I would mention that we purchased one for every teacher and every assistant type. And it by no means implies they're required to wear it. We just wanted to have ample available at the start of school for any teacher or instructional assistants that um, felt more comfortable and felt that that was a good decision for their teaching practice. So those are, I think, here or here any minute, those will be at the schools, and the schools did not have to order those. We ordered those. And, and, and when that happened, it was at the right at the beginning of the, the end of the school year, right? and I had called because the, the shortages on masks were going, and I called, and they said, Mr. Susan, we got this. We and do. I just want to tell you, how happy that made me feel that this was already ordered mm -hmm. everything's already been in place you guys did a phenomenal job there okay. um, my next question is the communication liaison for the health department duties and responsibilities have we have we gotten that job description what they're going to be doing what that scope is any of that or is that just in flux right now we'll get it um, i will tell you that right now that is in flux although uh, i i imagine that the people who are already being the epi liaisons at the department of health they already have that in writing um, so it's just a matter of us collaborating on, on who that, that is. That, that need... person will be a, a, a employee of the Department of Health. Okay, not so a, we don't a, need a job description to no, come before we us. We don't need any of that stuff ahead Correct. of time. Okay. Um, one of the issues that, that I consistently had coming up was consistent messaging from one source. Um, a lot of our parents and individuals and across the entire district wanted to have one place to go to so that they consistently went. Um, is that the overall theme of what we're yes. going to be doing is one consistent place and that's going to come out of our communications or I remember you saying something about your team. The source for the, the I'm going to hesitate here for a second, source for what? I just need more information. Well, one of the issues that we have is um, source for information coming out of the district. Mm -hmm. So if we have school-based decisions coming out of this place, we have COVID-based decisions coming out of this place, we have other decisions. The, the parents are going to have difficulty finding that thread, that pipe. Understood. So the idea would be that we have one consistent place that all messaging is coming out from one platform, one website, wherever that is, even if it's multiple departments, to go through on one consistent messaging or a place they can all go. Yeah, our communication is going to come out through government and community relations. So they'll have a website with everything set up that they, they can go to for the messaging. They're not going to have to go to five different websites to find the information or anything like that? Um, right at the beginning of all of this, government and community relations stood up a website. Um, we have put everything that we have produced in the, in the district on, the, on that right. website. Uh, and they will continue to add to that as we, as we move and grow and, and add more, uh, more to our response. So parents will be able to go to that one spot to find out any communication or any issue that they need. And is it going to be in multiple education or in multiple languages? How do we how do we deal with the yeah, we, the multiple language piece and barrier? Yeah, it's currently stood up on our on our current uh, website, and there's a, a function on our website that translates it into multiple languages. So um, that's already taken care of. So that's not a problem. Um, the other question was, will, 
Well, so, and that's amazing, and you guys did that, and I wanted to thank you, because that was a big deal at the beginning, and I wanted our learner, our people online to understand that, because that was a big thing coming into this that I kept getting coming out of my Melbourne area. The other piece is, is that we have videos that we're gonna be talking about. We talked about doing these, all these videos. Is there a way to engage translators? I know Ms. Diaz over there was saying that she may be one of the people, but is there a way to do that in, in Spanish and in some of the other languages that are most prevalent? We have a, a I don't know what to call it, a mini group within the team, within the task force, mm -hmm. that is working on that project to include uh, you know, our primary second languages in Brevard Public Schools okay. and for them to all be easily accessible. Um, so yeah, there's a team working on that. Nikki Hensley is, uh, is our liaison with government and community relations and is working with um, the professionals in each area. So the, they're working on transportation videos, cafeteria videos, um, hallway videos. Um, the Chris Moore taught us the champ it or something like that, she said. <laughs> um, we're really just showing multiple videos on behavioral expectations and um, those will all be very public on one site, all embedded within that one current site as well. Beautiful. Um, so Nikki has joined Nikki's an unofficial member of the task force, um, but she's been in all of our task force discussions, and she and I meet regularly in the communications task force, crosswalking these topics. And that'll go something like a video with the words across the bottom or something. Somehow, mm -hmm. my families will be able to go on there and see it in the, in, in the other languages that they have. You are awesome. Thank you. Right? We're, I finished it out by just saying thank you. not that awesome yet, but it's, uh, it's at, in the works. <laughs> Everything's in the works. It's in um, the works. If you need any help in those, there's a lot of community organizations that are calling for it. It would be great to task them to help out in that area. Yeah, we, we are utilizing a lot of resources that are already available on top of the ones that aren't available, creating some that aren't. Um, but we have no shame in working with others and getting those things supported. Good, I didn't just that. And then we're gonna talk about the whole piece where you said in here about um, what happens when a student gets sick and what the policy is and Several the breakdown. Several pages on that. In got depth, it. lots got of it. Just wanna make in sure depth. I, I saw it back there, I just didn't wanna go. All right, page 13. Um, one of the issues that I have is, is that a lot of this says we're gonna have policies and procedures for teachers. We're gonna have policies mm -hmm. and procedures for this. The time period that we come back is gonna be a minimal amount of time to get all of these pieces done. And we're talking about, in here, these are all future print, future tense. We're going to, we're going to. So a lot so, of these, go So ahead. this was all the prior to school opening. So that is representing the work we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So everything on this list is being prepared for the start of school. They're not future, we hope to one day. These are the things that are already, we're in the midst of, that are, will be ready to roll. So okay. if you have a, do you have a specific question? With no, 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 what, here's where it's gonna come is, is that we're gonna have a new IEP that's gonna be a health piece IEP. I love that, right? How does that fit into if a, if a teacher does not follow that 100%, is it gonna be kind of like the other IEPs that we have? Or, or is that that piece right there, does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, well, I just wanna work on the language just a little bit. It's not an IEP, it's not related to a federally. I know, I know, but it's yeah. a it's a, it's a, it's a It's a health plan, right. and we currently have health plans. And the way we typically do health plans now is we say they're in the nurse, yep. uh, the, the clinic, I have a kid that has and, asthma. You, guys, and right. you guys come down and you review it so that you know what it is. We've just changed the process so that we are more deliberate in getting it into teachers' hands and ensuring that they've read it and ensuring that they've signed off on it. That's the piece that's different. Okay. Then the, net, the, the last piece on this page that I was gonna ask about is, is that there seems to be a log jam at the school level on the forms that the, the, the parents are filling out. So I have a student that has a, um, a health concern or anything like that, they fill the form out, and then the process by which it takes to turn that form in and return that form back is an extended amount of time. I heard that from four families from different schools. So is there a, I, I have a feeling that as students are registering, that we're going to see an abundance of individuals coming forward with medically needed mm -hmm. situations possibly. Are we ready for the influx of extra um, need in that area? And is that process streamlined to address it to where that time period may not be as long? So they, they could be talking about s several different things when they bring that to your attention. So I'm gonna need more information. They could be talking about a health form they could be talking about a 504 uh, nope, health plan, form. Or, health form. or are they talking about a chronic illness form? 
uh, chronic illness form and a health form were the two that I was that were they right. were talking about. The the health form is something that just stays at the school. It's reviewed by the school uh, nurse right. and then rolled out to the teachers. So I'm not sure that there would be a log jam there. The chronic illness form there there could be a log jam because it takes several levels of approval to say, yes, the, here's this chronic illness and we're going to waive these absences because of this chronic illness. Um, so uh, I. In terms of that, yes, I think there are going to be more chronic illness forms, uh, and we are going to have the same number of people handling them. And so we will do the best that we can. Um, but as long as we uh, continue to all follow the same health, health guidelines and we, the nurses will triage those chronic illness forms, um, we'll handle the most uh, concerning cases first and, and work through them. Um, if we could get, the more we could get in now, the better. Um, our nurses come back. The day school starts, isn't it? Well, they usually get a day before. The day before. Get their clinics. Mm -hmm. We bring them back to do an in service. Challenging right now with social distancing. Instead of doing 120, we're going to be a little fragmented this year. I, I will say that. You know, we have, we have a lot of students that have chronic illnesses. Their forms are on file. Their plans are in place. Um, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that as new students register, we're going to only be dealing with new students and that we don't have a lot of new and um, different chronic health conditions that have appeared in this time. But if we do, we'll deal with them. And we'll is that, the is that form paper? Or is that form something that can be digital to speed up the process? Um, I can look at that. That's a great suggestion. Right now it's paper. It is paper. We'll look at it. Um, it. It does go back and forth between a physician and the health department and the schools, and that's part of what the the uh, holdup is: is that it goes between three different agencies. Um, we can look at digitalizing that. It's that's not a problem as, um, at all. Getting that taken care of. Um, I just I'm I concerned. don't know that it's necessarily going to. It may speed up the process, and we'll take a look at it and try it. And then, I, if, if I could add, in my experience, um, when the parent contacts the principal, they'll connect them to the nurse liaison, mm -hmm. and the nurse liaison will look into that case, follow up, identify what's missing, and speak to that parent. See, I said all those words correctly. And so there is a layer um, outside of the school nurse that reviews and processes and follows up on the doctor stuff. And in my experience, the nurse liaisons have been very, very happy to talk to parents who are midstream. And so like many things, I would certainly encourage a parent to talk to the principal who can help connect them with a nurse liaison. Okay. And, I, and the, di there's a, the difference between what a chronic illness form does and what a health plan does I think is important. A chronic health condition is all about attendance, really. It's yes. about, I, I have migraines. Yes. And so I may not get to a doctor be, for every migraine because he knows I have migraines or she knows I know I have migraines and I may be absent more than often, be, more than normal because I have migraines. Yes. A health plan is one that I have a condition that all of us need to be aware of because we have to mitigate any kind of, uh, yeah, that would be a great Maybe. example, like a seizure. So we all need to be aware of it. We all need to know how to respond and take precautions because of it. So our real focus is on those health plans. Um, you know, those, those chronic the chronic condition forms, it's really all about attendance and we'll be working through them. In, in my, so my concern is we have a more than normal amount that come in. We have a longer time to identify. And, and I would show some, some concern there to see if we can't allocate some kind of resources, and I'm speaking as an individual board member, to take care of that piece so that we don't have students that are falling through the cracks when it comes to the form just taking some time to get around. I think doing it online would speed up the process like that. I think that as long as the individuals that are in the pipe understand that when they get those to move them through quicker, I think that that would be great. Um, that was just one of my, my major concerns was that form coming back in the event that we have a lot of parents that are concerned about making sure their kids are taken care of with their attendance because that's a whole nother piece. If, if yeah. I could add, uh, later on you'll see that um, we're going to have extreme generosity regarding attendance for this school year, so that might help alleviate some of those parents' concerns. Mm -hmm. um, when a parent makes a determination that it's in their child's best medical interest to stay home, we will be excusing that absence. Uh -huh. And so for this year, 
Um, I think your, your families with those concerns can be comforted to know that um, we will have a relatively low threshold <laughs> of documentation, and that threshold is parent telling us it's in their child's best medical interest. Okay. And so um, we have that ability through existing statute. And, uh, DOE rule. And uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, it, there's later information on it, but those parents won't need that form this year in regards to attendance. So that might help. Yep. Thank you. And if I could just jump in on talking about digitizing all these forms, you're talking about digitizing and transmitting digitally information that could be sensitive for students. So I would make sure that anything that we're doing goes through IT to make sure the proper yep. encryptions are being put in place. Yep. It'd be the same as if we were putting a telehealth inside each one of the schools for the teachers. You have to have a dedicated line to run it through. Right. And I'm and wondering, so, and I'm some wondering, people don't understand they don't that they got to do it a certain way, and they'll just transmit stuff with Social Security and everything else right. on it over email, right. and then it's not properly encrypted. So we need to make sure IT is there, and we're getting the proper training for anybody that's out there that you can't just email these documents. I think that comes, that training should come in general, because we have multiple besides just this. Like there's right. not just a critical incident form that needs it. Social security numbers are on every one of our forms. So that should be a, a, should be a training that is actually done at the schools already. I would be remiss if we're not training our people to watch what they're sending over their thing. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Belford, can I jump back in real quick on a related issue to what Mr. Susan was talking about? Um, I, Mr. Tiedemann, it looked to me like you were getting ready to respond. Oh. Did you want to Go address? Ahead. I was going to say, we, we inform our schools, but a lot of those emails come from parents, and it's very difficult to train a parent how to encrypt and do some of those things with, with emails. They just don't. That liability wouldn't be on us, though, if a parent did it. It would be their liability for coming into us. Yeah, right? yeah, we, we have no, I'm not worried about the parent. If the parent chooses the email to us, that's their problem. Once we get it, we got to make sure we're properly doing it. So as long as our people know, like yeah. once we transmit it to DOH, we, we don't really control what DOH does. I wouldn't yep. be concerned with them either. But if a physician just emails it to us in the open, that's not our problem. We don't control it. But if we email it to DOH unencrypted, that would be our problem. Yep. Ms. Campbell, um, did you want to tag on to that? Yeah, on the clinic issue, we, um, this year more than ever before, it'll be really important to have our clinics fully staffed. And I know sometimes that's been a problem. Um, so is there anything that we're doing differently this year just to make sure that every day we have a, um, you know, someone to run our clinics instead of having to sub in sometimes? And I know it still, may still happen, but sometimes our clerks and secretaries are having to jump in there. So what, any, any changes on that front? I, well, I can speak to half of it. You jump in. You jump in. Um, and, I, and I said this to the principals the other day. Um, so we start schools without teachers in classes because that is what we have to do and that is what uh, the current hiring and employee pool forces upon us, right? Uh, you can't hire teachers if they're not out there. Um, the same is true for nurses. So the Department of Health um, has, just like there's a teacher shortage, there's a nursing shortage. Um, they hire uh, their nursing staff as quickly as they can, and they hire, they actually have allocations for um, nursing subs. And last year, we still had vacancies, and we had vacancies in the nursing sub pool, and they continue to put out and hire. It is why part of our contract is that two people from every school has to be trained to man that clinic if there isn't a nurse there. We are unfortunate in that we have a 10-month contract with our clinics, and a lot of our nurses don't want to work 10 months. They want to, um, they work for us and then they lose some because they get other jobs in the summer. This year that was not the case because almost every single one of our school nurses was employed all summer long with the Department of Health because they worked with COVID. And so we're actually coming into this school in, year in better shape than we have in the past because we've retained all of those nurses. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say, but I feel, please add. No, I think Chris got it. Right now, I just got a report. I think as of two days ago, we maybe had 16 openings, and that's across the, the district. Um, the benefit that we've had, like Chris said, is because most of our staff have worked all summer, so they've been paid and they haven't had the opportunity or the, the urge to get out and get another job because they're currently working. Everyone that we have working, 
loves school health and wants to come back. But as Chris alluded to, in, in Blue Skies, you know, we haven't been in Blue Skies in a long time. In Blue Skies, they work 10 months and they only work 29 hours a week. So it's been challenging to get the amount of staff that we need at those, at those restrictions. Um, we, we have a constant hiring pool. We are constantly looking for nurses and health support techs. Um, it, it is challenging, and it's challenging every year. This year, similar to what we're hearing from everyone, I haven't had any resignations so far, and usually by this time we've had a lot of resignations. Um, my concern, and I voiced it to everybody, is if school's open, how many of our staff are not going to be comfortable coming back? I don't know that as of yet. But so far, they, they have worked, and you know, thankfully, we've been very blessed that we've had all of our school health staff. And right now, they have been working frontline COVID response. So I don't anticipate, or I'm, maybe I'm just being Pollyanna and hoping that it's not as much of a concern as I've heard it is at other organizations. They have been working frontline all summer. Where, and by frontline, I mean they have been doing the actual swabbing. They have been doing the screening. They have been doing the, uh, the registration for all of these, these testings that we're doing. So they, they've been pretty much in the thick of it. So hopefully that won't impact their decision to come back in August. Thank you. Mr. Susan, did you have a discussion? Yeah, are we going to get into that in depth, that entire process, or should we have that conversation now about the COVID clinics and the nurses and who covers and all that stuff? Yeah, we'll, we're going, we'll be talking about it. Perfect. There's a slide coming up. I'll yeah. wait until then. then. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, we have still 16 schools that won't have nurses, is that? No, that's 16 positions open. Some schools have got two staff in them. That includes the float staff. Okay. That includes the liaison for EPI. Um, Right now, all of the supervisor roles are filled. Right now, if I looked at it closely, every school has at least one person in it. There may be a few that I'm not up to uh, speed on as of today, but for the most part, I think there's about 16 vacancies. Okay, and if someone's watching right now and wants to be a school nurse, do they go on your website? <laughs> they can go on their website or they can call me directly and, and we will expedite the process. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Mr. Susan, do you have additional questions on slides 11 through 14? No, I think I'm there's a lot of it that we're going to cover in a little bit. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Ms. Belford, could I just yeah. can I just tag on to the the um, the nurse question? I, I, I just I, I don't know if they can do this, but will our nurses be able to test on site if somebody presents with um, symptoms? No, that's you know the logistics of doing that. Um, is very challenging. Anyone who's doing a COVID test, first of all, we don't have the rapid test, so it would have to be done and sent out to an outside lab source. They would have to be in full personal protective equipment, which means they'd have to be somewhere separate while they're doing that. There would be no one to man and to watch the clinic while they're doing that. And to have to get a child, we have done testing at our health department for children. Um, you know, we've been doing the nasopharyngeal, which means that it goes up the nostril into the pharyngeal cavity. And that is very difficult to do on a child. Um, they've just now changed the guidelines that we can do nasal swabs for children. But that's still a little uncomfortable for children. So, no, the, the answer is we're not going to be testing as of today. Now, things may change tomorrow, and that would really be a huge change for us. But any okay. child can get tested at the health department. Great, thank you. All right, are there any additional questions on slides 10 through, actually, I guess 11 through 14? All right, at this point, I'm going to ask that we take a, uh, a brief break and recharge, and we're going to come back and get into really kind of some of the meat and the details of things that we have touched on up to this point. So. We will recess for um, 10 minutes and we will uh, come back and resume, I think. With
All right, we are back in session after a brief break, and I believe we are picking up with uh, Ms. Klein. Yes, we are. So as Dr. Sullivan alluded earlier, um, we've been very involved this week in webinars with the DOE, uh, going over the executive order and what the assurances uh, will be to meet the state requirements for the reopening plan. So as you know, we also have to uh, add to this plan the instructional continuity plan. So there are seven assurances. I'm going to just go through them quickly with you. The first one is uh, we are required to open our brick and mortar schools in August at least five days a week for any student, any parent who wants that. So that is a requirement of the executive order. And that is assurance one that we have to complete on the, uh, on the document that we have to complete by July 31st. Um, the district will, assurance two, the district must provide a full array of services, um, including in-person instruction, specialized work for our, our students with IEPs, our students with, in the most vulnerable populations, homeless, um, foster care, English language learners. So we'll have to address in our plan all of those assurances. Assurance three is the district must provide a robust progress monitoring for all students. So that means we will uh, do our diagnostic, both elementary and secondary. We will look at where the student, if they have any gaps from the uh, delay in school from our um, summer emergency learning, as Dr. Sullivan says. Um, and then we will have to develop innovative teaching method methods to make certain we're meeting all those students' needs. So we are planning right now to do our diagnostic as soon as we can get the doors open and students rolled into schedules and teachers established, we will do a diagnostic comparing where the student was when they uh, physically left us in March to where they are when they come in. And then we will uh, develop lessons that will not only pick up where they were, but keep them on track to where they should be. Assurance four is the district will work with the IEP to determine any needed services. Um, we will also work in Assurance 5 to work with our ELL communities to identify English langu language learners who had regression. So one of the most important parts of this uh, reopening plan, uh, the Florida Optimal Innovation Reopening Plan, as they call it, um, is that we're meeting the student's needs. We are making certain we know where a student is. We're pro providing them a robust educational program and so that they're not falling any further behind. We're also going to make certain that our students, um, as Chris spoke earlier, our students in transition, our uh, students uh, in greater uh, finan financial need, all of our students, we are not going to, as our vision says, we serve every child with excellence, we're going to assure that our work is that we're serving every child. We're meeting them where they are and getting them caught back up to where they need to be. Assurance seven is that we will regularly progress monitor and we will send that data to the state. And then assurance seven is we will be collecting the reopening plans from our charter schools and they will be vetted through my office for approval uh, prior to it being part of our district plan. So there's been a um, conversation with our charters already stating that we will need their plans. Uh, and uh, the, plan, uh, the directions from the state have changed throughout this week. Um, there on Monday, we didn't believe every person, every district had to do a plan if we were going to just open brick and mortar and not uh, have different options. They wouldn't have to do a plan. 
yesterday, it very became very detailed in what the template was going to look like. Uh, the template was supposed to be delivered this morning to us. I have yet to see it. Seen it either. So um, the template will be coming from the DOE. Yesterday's uh, webinar, they went through every assurance and what the narrative will have to be in every uh, component of the template. So uh, I already have a team. Um, it's led by Tara Harris and Sherry Bowman from secondary and Patricia Fontan from ESC and the three of them are already working on making certain that we're going to meet the assurances within this DOE requirement. Like I said, uh, the plan is due July 31st to this day uh, to include the charter plans. The other part is the state uh, in, informed us yesterday by, that they will be survey, sending out a survey for every district on what is your progress monitoring plans, when you're, the dates, the uh, method, and then how are you going to look at the data. So that is coming and that will be due by July 17th, uh, but the survey hasn't been received yet. So let's talk about elementary options for the fall of 2020. Of course, based on the DOE requirements, we are going to offer a full time in person at all of our schools. That will be the same brick and mortar following our uh, standard focus documents and our pacing guides and quality instruction in the classroom. We also offer full time Brevard virtual school. Uh, that program has been expanded to meet uh, the needs of families who want to go with the Brevard virtual full-time. Of course, by state statute, we also offer a part-time in-person and a part-time Brevard virtual program. Very few parents Ms. take Klein, this. could yes. you please pull your mic a little bit closer? I'm getting notification that important people can't hear you. Oh, dear. Um, our Brevard, uh, we always have the opportunity for Brevard part-time and Brevard, Brevard virtual part-time and in-person. Very few parents take advantage of that because it's kind of unique. You would, so suppose you would want to do the 90-minute reading block for elementary at home through Brevard virtual and then come to school for math, science, and social studies and your activities or the reverse. So that is an opportunity and has been available for some time. We are excited to offer a e-learning from school at home. And so uh, that will be pending the DOE's approval on our plan that we will submit. So let me talk to you a little bit more about this full-time e-learning from school at home. So the vision of this is we know that there are parents who are like, I'm just not ready to send my child back to brick and mortar. But I want to be connected to my school. I want to be part of Vieira Elementary. And I want my child to be connected to that school. But I'm not quite ready. So what we have proposed, and I have an amazing work group of uh, principals and uh, directors working on this plan, the teacher will work from the classroom. The student will work from home. And so we will provide the same robust instruction that you would receive in your classroom at your home. It will not be the same that we offered when we had emergency learn, distant learning. So this will remain e-learning from home. So the title will be Vieira Elementary e-learning at home. So every school will be attached to their name. The student will be attached to the teacher's roster. The t uh, student will be attached to the school population and will be part of, uh, of the school's FTE. So I've put in here a couple um, part of our plan. This is not a complete list, but this is some of the options that we're looking at. That the parent 
would consider it in nine week increments. However, we're gonna be flexible because I might think that I'm ready to be the mom who's working from home and have my child at home working on a digital platform during the structured school day. And after about a week, I realized, mm -mm, that's not gonna work. Uh, my child needs to go back to brick and mortar. So I, I have that flexibility. I can work with the school principal to say, this is not working. Another part of this is after we do the progress monitoring and as we continue monitoring, if the data doesn't show that the child is uh, excelling with this digital platform, then we as a school and the school district, we have uh, to have the conference with the parent to say, your child is not being uh, successful in this program. We need them to look at a different program. And so that is one of the components of the assurances that we have to provide to the state that we will progress monitor the child and meet the needs of the child to provide their quality education, whether it be in brick and mortar at, or at the home. We, were asking, we will be asking parents to set up a space, an actual place in their home for um, this e-learning. Uh, we will ask the parent to have the supplies and the materials there ready for this child to use. Uh, the schedule, it will not be do the work when, you, when you're ready to do the work. The teacher will uh, begin class just as if she's, well, she will be in the classroom, but every student will log on. Um, we're looking at Teams, and the reason we like the Teams approach uh, for a live instruction is that we can put a background behind the child so we're not looking into the privacy of the child's home and the environment. So we will have a background that will go in so we're, we're not invading in anyone's home privacy. Um, we will ask our parents to help our children uh, get online and do the daily attendance and be there to support. Uh, we will uh, ask parents to make sure they have the teams downloaded on their device. Our teachers are going to plan with their grade levels. They're going to um, provide standard aligned instruction. Uh, the lesson plans will follow the pacing guides and the standard focus documents that we have for elementary. Uh, that we'll ask the teachers that are chosen or are volunteer to do this work to attend some online training on e-learning. And uh, our friends in ET, our Russell's team, Don Bronstein, oh my, that, she is amazing. And so Don Bronstein has been working with uh, Tara Harris and Patricia Fontan on ways that they can uh, deliver quality instruction using Teams, using the blended platform. You heard Chris say earlier the importance of blended learning from day one. So whether they're doing the e-learning or in the classroom, that blended learning has to be a component of every teacher's world. Uh, a teacher's gonna have a very scheduled day. And so the teacher will say, you know, taking role at eight o'clock, and we're going into uh, our ELA, our 90 minute reading block. And uh, we're gonna take our recess at 10 o'clock. And so the teacher will um, say to the children, you, you have a break, um, take, you know, you're gonna go do 20 minutes of activity, come back. Um, we're gonna have a schedule for, you know, you, you'll have your lunch schedule. Um, we're working with food service to try to do a pickup meal for families who need a meal, um, but we, but that will be part of the scheduled day. There'll be a schedule in there for activity, for um, recess. But the family will follow a a very scheduled day as if the children were in a brick and mortar classroom that they're going to be in their homes. So the day is going to mirror that of the traditional day. Uh, the student will follow the routines. Um, 
they will work without distractions, which is, uh, you know, going to be unique, but every family will need to set up that, that it is a, an environment where it is conducive to quality learning. Uh, the parent has made the choice to work, have their child engage in the edu education from home, but they're going to have to set those parameters so that it's not um, a distraction from the learning environment. And the student is going to have to let the teacher know, I need your help. I don't understand this. And, um, you know, just as in the classroom when we do small groups, uh, the child may need to uh, do some independent reading while the teacher pulls virtually some students around the small group. So it's going to be a um, something different, something new, but we're really excited uh, to offer this to our students. We are expecting um, the student also and the parent to have the flexibility for the diagnostic that we would create an environment at the school base, at the brick and mortar base where we might bring three children in to do the diagnostic or we would provide a secure location at home to do the diagnostic so that um, we're getting uh, valid results and authentic work from the child. So um, these are our are working in progress on the elementary school e-learning. The first next step is exciting for our parents. So uh, after this workshop today, we will be sending out a site specific, thanks to, uh, again, Russell's uh, tech team who has worked to make a survey that will is school specific all 57 of our elementary schools have a site specific survey the surveys will go out the parent the first question is you know what is your name what's your student's name uh, do you want to be part of this if you do not it's just going to you once you get down through the questions if you want to stop it will let you stop yeah I, I, this was not for me um, but every parent, and we're gonna run this for two weeks to see how many parents are actually um, excited about this opportunity and wanna take advantage of it. So we will provide this, this survey to, this afternoon. It will go out site specific. The principals will be able to monitor it in real time, everyone that's completed for their school. So then the principal can determine how many teachers they're going to need for the e-learning and how many teachers they're going to need for brick and mortar. So it's going to help us with our staffing plan for our elementary schools. I said a lot very quickly. All right, so um, I'm getting a nod from Ms. Campbell that she has some questions on there, Ms. Campbell. I do. All right. Um, and some of this may be preliminary, and if it is, if you're, um, you can let me know. Um, hang on. So I'm excited for the, oper the technology aspect of it. Thank you for going doing the research, Microsoft Teams in the background, because I know that was a concern a lot of people had. Why aren't we doing Zoom? Why can't we do Zoom during the distance learning? But it's it was all about safety and privacy concerns, and it's great yes. that we can have that option. And it'll still require, I'm sure, right, Mr. Cheatham, some signing off? Yes, and, and Zoom's still being considered. We're looking at the options. Zoom has, they've done a lot okay. know, over the past year, so it's, it's still being considered, and we're still looking at it. Actually. Okay. So, all these things could still change, but. Good, um, thank you. I, and I, I knew you guys were behind that, but a lot of people didn't understand why we couldn't do it. And it was really about the safety and privacy of students and, and their families and anybody else who might be running around in their underwear at the house. So, um, so <laughs> sorry, I have to bring a little levity <laughs> when I can, because it's the truth. Yeah, oh, we might have seen that. Right. <laughs> um, so is there a certain number of students that are gonna be required to make this happen at each grade level? I mean, are you anticipating like one, one e-learning teacher at each grade level? Or if, I mean, if there's not, the, what's the magic number to make it happen? So we are following class size, okay. regardless of where um, the, the students are located. 
that is why we need this window of, uh, uh, of how many are actually interested. We've heard a lot, you know, and, and when we re reread all the comments, yeah, I wanted my child back. Um, the state says it's about a 50-50 on their, uh, their global um, survey of where parents want to be. So we really need this survey back to, to, to decide. It might be one school that they're like, no, I want to be back. I want to be in my building. I want to, my kids to be there. Or it might be 75% uh, at another school. We, so we have to get some additional information before we can make the final decision. I hesitate to do multi-age, but just like with class size, occasionally we have to do that if we have, um, we don't have the allocation and we, we have to uh, make adjustments. That would, that is not my uh, hope. I hope that we can do it um, through um, a full classroom. The other thing that's swirling in my head, if you just want to know where my mind is, um, is, for example, I may have um, 10 third graders at Mila and eight third graders at Tropical. So I haven't made a full class, but I could use the one teacher to do e-learning and those students could be um, connected to their school, but it would be, they would be in one class, one teacher, but can teaching at, for, for two schools. And that's a lot of logistics, and it'll mean a lot of extra work for the teams. I hope everybody in the public realizes how much extra work all of this is. But to have that option, I just, I'm just, I'm glad you're thinking, that you have that swirling in your head, because there are some situations where we might only have 10 third graders at Mila but those 10 parents are like, this is, this is it, and it has to be it, and, yeah. and we need to have that option for them. Yeah, so lots of, lots of things are swirling in, in my committee um, that they are just um, nonstop with their minds of going of what do we need to do. Ms. Campbell, Ms. Klein, I'll, I'll just, if I can interject, Keep in mind, we're on daily webinars with the DOE, literally one yesterday until four o'clock related to the emergency uh, order and the expectations and the requirements around the assurances. So you know, to, to Ms. Klein's point, we need to collect the data. We have to submit our plan to the state. And one of the things that they have consistently communicated is a robust learning consistent environment that allows for the transition of continuity of a student from an e-learning or what the state is calling an innovative learning option back into a brick and mortar school so there may be limitations based on what is approved from the from the state with our plan so it's it's um, the ability to assign students across schools is still in great question it, it, it appears like that may be a may be prohibited or not, may be a limitation okay. um, so but again we're, we're exploring all of the options and, and looking at what what that could look like so thank you and I, I understand because you know as we said flexibility um, you did mention about you know the scenario where a parent may start e-learning and then say no this is not for me but in the in the expectations it, it it looked like you were asking parents to commit to nine weeks, nine week increments. Um, so I'm just curious if parents kind of want to trickle in as the semester starts, what, where will we, will those students join a brick and mortar classroom or what is that potentially going to look so, like? So just as Dr. Mullins just said, the most important thing, and, and so the um, assurances changed yesterday from the time we had this draft um, to giving more flexibility to parents to come in and out. Uh, and that's why it has to be standard aligned, robust instruction that is the same that you're going to get in the classroom. We can't be uh, using a different platform um, for one venue that we're not using for the other because every child um, will have this opportunity and flexibility. So we may have students kind of moving in and out. 
-hmm. And I know we're going to get to some of that later when we talk about cases and things like that. Thank you. Oh, one real quick question on, on the assurances. Do those charter school plans have to come to the board for approval, or that just goes to your office and then they're lumped in with So ours? they are it? not board, they do not have to be board approved, okay. but they have to be district uh, vetted for uh, that our office will um, make certain that the assurances have all been met. And then um, the uh, DOE will be the liaison if there are concerns with a, a charter school's plan. Thank you. Uh, I'll wait now. Quick questions. Ms. Campbell touched on this, but just for a little more clarification, and you might say, we don't know yet, but so a, a teacher is assigned, uh, I'm concerned about the teacher in this specific role. She or he has decided or volunteered to do these e at home, full time e learning from school at home. And students have started coming back. The other classes are full. Is there is there a possibility we will then have a teacher that's expected to have a camera on them e-learning at home and have live students at the same time? I hope not. <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, what I believe will happen is that um, if enrollment declines on the e-learning, then we will transition that teacher back to a brick and mortar classroom. Um, again, the um, assurances yesterday um, were a little bit more um, flexible. I, I find it interesting we haven't received the template yet today. Um, so I, I know that yesterday on the call they said they were making adjust adjustments to the plan based on feedback from districts. So um, my hope is that um, as we plan with teachers, number one, it's, it's going to have to be a teacher who wants to do this, but it's going to be that conversation with the school principal. This is, how, this is the number of students. Say I'm, a, I'm the principal of Vieira Elementary and I have four fourth grade classes planned. And now I have two full classrooms that want to go e-learning. So I'm going to sit down with those four teachers and say, here's what we have. Now, to understand with the e-learning, these children may go back and forth. They may say, but we've got to maintain class size. So there's going to be a lot of planning, a lot of commitment on everyone's part, and a lot of flexibility that and there's that word again, the no flexibility, right, T-shirt coming up. Uh, we are going to have to be very flexible as we um, provide quality instruction, but provide it in a method that makes parents feel safe and comfortable for their child and makes certain that that student is progressing at the same rate they would be in the classroom. That is going to be key, that progress monitoring. And we as a district, uh, we will be monitoring the students that are not successful and have to have that conversation with the parent. This is not, your child is not progressing at the rate they should in this environment. Thank you. So I get that the state has asked us to be flexible, and I agree that that's important, but I, I do like where you stated in the presentation that we would like parents to commit to at least nine weeks of, and circumstances change, but I, I'm hoping it's still fair for us to ask, ask that of our parents to commit to that, assuming something could happen, and, but oh, I think we're really gonna need that to be able to, to do our best to serve our students. I agree, and that's why I put it in there at first, is I, I truly believe that we need to be looking at this at every nine weeks. Um, the state is actually looking at it for the first semester. Um, so I think it's fair and, um, and a good ask, but we can't require them to stay in it. And it might not work. 
You know, we don't want our children to fall behind if it's not working. And we don't want a child that's sitting in brick and mortar who's having anxiety or, um, what is it, the trauma thing? Trauma fatigue. Trauma fatigue. So we might, we may need to make adjustments. Just like we do in the beginning of the school year every year. You know, we have to make adjustments based on enrollment, uh, projection, uh, class size. But now you have to make them every week. Um, okay, a couple questions. Is the progress monitoring for elementary school, is that going to be iReady or mm -hmm. is that a combination of iReady and some other things? And, hold on, uh, iReady was gracious last spring to allow us access, full access for little or no cost, if I recall. Do we have that same agreement now or is that good, their good graces has that ended? And what Their will, good is this graces going to have ended. Okay. <laughs> but we are fortunate uh, that through CARES Act, um, the um, hefty um, purchase agreement is coming your way very soon. It's in my inbox to review today um, for the purchase of iReady instructional and diagnostic through CARES Act. Because the progress monitoring is a component of a requirement in the uh, assurances, so it falls very um, nicely into the CARES Act. So we are um, purchasing that um, and adding on the instructional piece. And that instructional piece will be key if we have to go to distant learning or, um, I'm looking at my good colleagues here, uh, you know, emergency distant learning, we would still have the same platform. Okay, and then one last question, and I think I know the answer. Uh, if we are going to be using Zoom or something of that nature, uh, that's something else that we don't currently purchase, Mr. Cheatham. So is that gonna be covered in the CARES Act if we, we're obviously gonna have to purchase something, some new plan? Sorry, I feel like I'm in front of a, I'm not even a teacher, but when I've sobbed, right, the kid is not paying attention. You asked them the question. I didn't mean to do that to you. I'm, I'm sorry. No, I was just asking about if we have to purchase Zoom or something, which we are going to have to purchase, you guys just said. Is that coming out of CARES Act funding? And do we have any idea of the expense, the magnitude of the expense there? Yes, we do. Um, and it would come out of CARES funding if we move forward with it. We're discussing it now. Um, it's. It's about $66,000 or so. So is it a per Fisher user? Y. Is it a per user? Correct. Thing? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate Ms. it. Ms. Deskovich, I do want to add on the um, e-learning survey. We asked the question, does your child have a device or does, do you have uh, internet at home? Because we also need to find out how many devices, uh, because our devices are limited, uh, how many devices we will need to uh, provide for families who choose the elementary e-learning option. So I guess that brings up another question then, will we be providing like we did in the spring to those that want to choose to stay home, will we be providing hotspots and uh, laptops and such? And that's really what we have to figure out. Um, so when it comes to devices, we're still working on getting devices back. We still have about 2,600 or so out. That have not been returned? Correct. Um, and that's upwards to like a $1.3 million <laughs> out say that, still. Say so that. We, we can, I can't. Can you talk? you got to put your mouth like practically <laughs> on the microphone. What was the dollar value of devices that have not been returned to our district? Uh, about $1.3 million worth of devices out, and that, that's not including the damaged devices that we have to make sure, the ones we can get back into rotation versus the ones that we can't. Um, so we're still working our way through that. So it's very difficult to start um, to do a full assessment and calculating what we can get back out when we're still missing that amount. Um, and, and naturally, we had a, some device issues before all this hit. So we're, you know, we, there's a lot of variables in that as we're trying to, to determine what we can do, turning right back around and doing it without having these devices back yet. Who's, who's responsible for, I'm assuming you're going to tell me the principles, but do we have a device collector out there knocking on doors? <laughs> like what, how we get, what's our plan to get these back? Ryan Neal. <laughs> we, we work with leading and learning for our principals to, to actively uh, put some pressure, I guess is a good word, um, 
uh, on our families to get those devices back so that we can, there's a lot of cleanup, there's a lot of re-imaging, there's a lot we have to do to those devices to have them ready for our schools, to be in school, um, nevertheless to get them back out for people that might need them that way. Um, and then there's going to come the assessment of if we're giving devices out, what will the students that are in the school have available to do uh, the diagnostic and things like that that we're talking about as well. It's, it's going to be difficult. Sorry, one more question. Uh, if we find that devices are gone, lost, no response, not getting it back, are we just going to write that as a loss or are we doing something legally or? So through, through CARES Act funding, there is some, some funds to, to help us kind of <laughs> uh, rebuild our inventory. Um, but working through the, the actual lost devices or the devices that aren't returned, uh, we do have some funds for damaged devices as well. Um, but we're, we're going to have to work through that process. You know, we, we had about a week to get them out. Um, that didn't allow us to put great processes in place to, on the other end of it. You know, we just wanted to get them in the hands of our students. Um, and, and hotspots is a whole nother topic altogether. That is a very expensive endeavor. Um, you know, upwards from sixty to seventy thousand dollars a month for the district. Um, so we're going to try to use data that we found out as we did this the first time to see what we really need moving forward. Um, but that, that's that's pretty expensive when you think of over a long period of time um, starting the new year. Thank you, sir. One of the things that we're asking families to do is um, we learned that. We had families who asked for devices who didn't necessarily need a device. They um, just wanted an additional device at home. So it's, it's a really a need of a device, not just a want for another device. I, I don't know how we could have, I don't know how we can, we can guess, but I don't think we can, we can know no, that No, but we sure. can request that, is this really a need? instead of we had some um, we were very flexible in handing out devices yeah I'm I that's the first time I've heard that we still have 1.3 million dollars worth of computers out there in the community it feels a little bit like we just donated 1.3 million dollars maybe to some families that are now happy that they have a new computer in their house to use I'm hopeful as we start school we're gonna get a good chunk of those back um, you know, it's data that I'm, I'm accessing. Some schools may not finish, may, they may not be finished putting the data in, hopefully. Um, I have a lot of hopes and, and dreams in this area. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. What I want to add that Mr. Cheatham didn't allude to is we did do, we did have a thorough process in identifying the student and families who were checking the device out. So it's not a matter of us not knowing who has them. It's yeah. we do know that. It's just the responsiveness over the summer. You know, families are in transition. It's it's a difficult time for everyone. So the responsiveness is you know what we're working through now. But as students and families return to school, we know exactly who the students are who have have not yet returned the device. So we have a the ability to continue to work with families to retrieve them. It's just. Have you ever tried to get all the field trip notes back? <laughs> I mean, and that's just a piece of paper. So, I mean, I wish us luck. Thank you. Ms. McDougall, you've been incredibly patient. You have questions, I believe? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, a couple things. Um, I want to talk about um, the client. First, I really like this. I'm very excited about this journey. Um, let's say somebody's in the brick and mortar, and if I heard you right, and I just want to make sure I heard you right, that they say, oh my goodness, let's say for whatever reason, let's hope not, they got, they got sick, they got the flu. Let's say we'll talk about the flu. Um, and they're at home. Can they jump in virtually or in an e-learning while they're, let's say they're not totally incapacitated, but they could still, you know, work, they might have a low-grade fever. I mean, is that something that we're that flexible or no? So, Ms. McDougall, we're working out an uh, plans for all the different varieties of um, learning that are going to be available. Is that the right way to say this more? Um, so um, we're trying to develop procedures for each type of situation. Okay. And so my next question is, being um, a, you know one of the newer board members, and I'm curious. So. Teachers, who will and how will um, classroom assignments be 
situated. Like who gets to, who picks? And would we ever consider possibly giving maybe our more um, vulnerable teachers, some that are older, maybe high risk, um, priority? I don't know how that all works. So uh, it's a building level principal's decision of placement of, stu of teachers. And this will be a uh, very open conversation. For example, if I have four teachers and now I only need two for brick and mortar and two for e-learning in a grade level, I would hope that the grade level would sit with the principal and work that out. So it's not going, it's not additional allocation to the school. It's going to be worked within the school's current allocation. So what I'm hearing is um, it's really going to be with the team. If it's a fourth grade team or a third grade team, this is what I need. And then they would work as a team to decide with the principal, you know, you know, I'm 65 years old, let's say somebody says, and we probably do have teachers that are that dedicated and older and they are in a different risk category. Do you think they would get priority or is that something that's so school it, by school? It's going to all depend on the teacher's desire to teach uh, using a, uh, a remote learning device and mm -hmm. the teacher's uh, flexibility on using these tools that we use to um, teach because it, it's definitely going to be different than um, when you're pulling a small group you may be pulling a small one small group virtually um, and the rest is doing independent work, but you're, they're not going to be there in your classroom for you to keep eyes on and, and monitor what everyone's doing. So it's going to take a teacher who desires uh, teaching virtually and um, the skill set to teach virtually. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. That's all I had, Ms. Delford. Thank you, Ms. McDougall, Mr. Susan. Ms. Klein, I want to say thank you because I think that that piece that we're all discussing is the most important part for elementary for us to keep our kids inside of our schools. I also think it's the most important to make sure that we don't have a mass exodus of teachers from the schools to Brevard Virtual and then have to have them come back. I applaud you in all the efforts. I know that it's so difficult to put all of this together. Um, I know that it's not perfect right there because you're trying to find at the last minute teachers who are can do it online, teachers who are dynamic, and sometimes those are the people that are your best inside the brick and mortar classes are gonna be your best on the virtual. So there's just that dynamic that works in there. So I applaud your efforts and I wanna say thank you. Um, the survey, I almost feel like it should be mandatory because I don't know if, and I know, please, the, the thing is is that if we don't know, then we don't know how many teachers we're going to need, which means our PAR numbers are off, which means everything. So if we know that you're going to keep your kid at home or we know that you're going to come back, then we know that we have those numbers. Mm -hmm. Because the next step of this that not many of the parents understand that they have to take a responsibility here because this is very difficult. And I know that we're throwing it at them at the last minute. And I know everybody's gonna say that this is, but, but this is the most important piece. Because if they let you know what you do and you can prepare and plan, then the fidelity of their education is going to be higher. And I, I wanted to applaud you for everything you're doing there. Um, on the page, I'm sorry, I wrote over the top of it, 16, it references the department, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm guessing that's the Department of Education, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, assurance number six. Yes, um, a lot of A lot of what I heard was the department is telling us, you know, this might not, how can we help that? How can we lobby the Department of Education for, for the things that we need? Because to me, this is the most important piece that we're looking at to attract our teacher, our parents, to create the, the, the school within the school, to create all of the, the bond of the school, the same education, the same teachers, the same everything. My daughter, she's upset because she doesn't know which teacher she's getting next year. She's already got which teacher she likes because they all know the teachers. So when they're telling them that we, this may not work because of this, um, how, how do we help you? Is there a way for us as elected officials to help you through this process? At this time, I think that the, the state is trying to meet the needs of every district and um, and that and they have not um, the you know the timeline 
Sure, July 31st is tomorrow in my book. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand the why of why, you know, they need these plans and approved and then back to us to say, yes, you can go with your Brevard e-learning for elementary. So it is truly, um, they are very available to answer questions and support. Um, uh, you can email Jacob Oliva and he might personally just call you right back up, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, so um, they are really have been partners. I've seen a huge change in the relationship with our um, Department of Education partners in you know, supporting us. He was us. great when he was speaking. I think the key to here is, is that if this is, a, if this is done to fidelity and strong, I feel that the students, if, if we have to shut down a class, if we have to shut down, to be able to transition back and forth like that is the most important. And Absolutely. for them not to give us the approval would be, I think they'll be there. I just wanted to know if there's anything we need to be doing to help you and support you in this adventure in that route, please let me know because I would be there for you. Thank you. Um, the next thing is, is the charter schools. Did you say, I, I think I heard you say there's a date that they have to turn those in, those charter school plans? All their plan has to be part of our plan. So when we oh. submit to the state by July 31st, um, okay. so we have asked that their plans to be to us a pr week prior. So um, Ms. 24th. Archer is working uh, with the charters. Um, she was on the call to learn all about the assurances for charter and she's working directly with them and with me on getting those plans. Um, Can you email those to us when you get them? If I get them, I'll, yeah, I'll let's try. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I wanted to kind of tell real quick, there was some conversations about the, the, um, the, the students that haven't turned them in as far as the computers and stuff like that. Um, I, I want everybody to hesitate for a second before we start saying that there's kids that are trying to take this for, for you know, their own stuff. We have a lot of students um, through my mobile feed sites that I was feeding down in the Melbourne area in the O'Galley corridor where kids were at one feed site we're at another feed site. And I would ask them, how'd you get here? And well, my, my cousin, my aunt, my whatever, um, had to go to work. So now I'm living with my, my, right? So there's a lot of us chasing down those devices. So for the public that's listening, um, I, before we decide that we're going to start saying that kids are taking these things, it, there's a very large population of students that we are still trying to track down because during this COVID crisis, there's individuals that receive those that may not be living in the same address. And that's a very difficult thing. And the parents that they're living with don't have the contact information in order to get those back. So I wanted to just make that known. Um, the other thing I would like everybody to understand also when you're making your decisions on who gets multiple laptops or who gets a laptop, we have some families that have three or four kids. And the bottom line is, is that they can't share one computer because otherwise there's no way for them all to use it. So there may be need for students that are inside multiple student families to sit down and have multiple computers just based upon the time lapse. We were running into a situation where some, some students needed, um, some parents needed multiple laptops for their children that were then consolidating with other parents. And what had happened was that you had six or seven children trying to use two or three laptops during a day on multiple platforms with different areas. So please understand that in some of those low socioeconomic areas that we have, mo there may be a bigger need than just that for the families. So thank you for that. And then um, I wanted to ask this, it might be something to think about. Um, do we have like a parent guide for parents for the e-use? Like I'm a parent, right? My kid's gonna get ready to do this. Do we have a, here's how this X, Y, and Z, do we have that? That, that is part of the work that we're working on. Um, I believe you received a one page front and back draft of, yeah. of what the parents' responsibilities. Um, and like I said, the work team is still working on um, um, fleshing out all the components. I, I kind of asked this team to come together like, I don't know, eight <laughs> days ago, maybe seven and said, hey, what if, and uh, let's try. And um, they have been amazing at pulling this together. One of the things I did want to emphasize about the survey, we're asking that that be completed for each child. 
So if you have multiple children, you'll need to do one of those for yes. each children, each child in your home. And, and needs to be driven home the fact that we are, we literally have teachers um, who are waiting to find out what their decisions are going to be at their school-based location based upon those surveys, and that it is behooves those teachers or their parents to fill those out immediately so that we can start preparing for their kids' education. That is a massive thing. So anything I can do to help you there. And so you said that we'll have some kind of a parent guide for these parents that are may not be the best at their, their thing? Okay. And I think that um, I'll get back into the COVID, the, the stuff internally later on. So I'm good. Can I clarify on that? Do have an additional question? Can I clarify on the devices? I, d I didn't mean that to be negative. It was just, I just wanted to be clear. It's hard for us to do an assessment with that yeah. many devices yep. um, still out. And then not having those devices in school. Sometimes those devices are used by 10, 15 students through the course of a day. So yep. not having it at the school, it's going to affect a lot more students that are actually Absolutely. in the school. And you guys are amazing, Russell, for all the work that you did during that, that transition. Rapidly deploying, what was it, 15,000 devices? And how many hotspots? Yeah in that amount of time was amazing. So thank you. Ms. McDougall. So. Question about the survey. Ms. Klein, I, I want to just kind of mention, so this survey is going to be on our webpage or is that, how is that going to be sent out? Because I get concerned if it's all online that some of my communities, may, some of my parents may not have access. And I'm assuming it's going to be in, in also in Spanish. Um, I just want to make sure that some of my um, needier communities have access to that and they understand that. Um, I get concerned if it's just going to be online. So, Ms. McDougall, the, the survey will be sent out by each school. So it will be sent out because uh, they're site-specific surveys. Uh, we can make the survey available paper or pencil if they want to uh, make an appointment to come by the school and pick those up. But it will go out through all the communication tools that we currently have for families. So um, the Blackboard, um, through email, uh, we're going to do a mass uh, distribution of that at the conclusion of today. Also, I've talked with Nikki Hensley and Nikki's going to do a lot of advertisement about this on Facebook. But it ha to give us accurate information, it has to be site specific. And that way, the, t the principal knows exactly who's filling it out and how, how it's going to impact their allocations. So, I mean, I get that it's site specific, and which leads me to some of my sites. Um, some of my sites may sound odd, but would we even go to the home if we don't hear from them? Um, I, I'm just, at, I know that's COVID, is, but if we wear masks and we're protected, um, would we ever do something like that? So it will go to cell phones as well. So anyone oh. with a cell phone can complete this survey via cell phone. And our principals, It, They're amazing. They're amazing. I, I can't even think of a word to describe how amazing our principals are. They have gone, they are working like, makes me emotional. Um, they're amazing. And they're doing an unbelievable work to reach every family. So, um, Great. you know, the, they are still, in all of this, going out to homes, visiting families, uh, checking on kids that they're worried about, um, checking on families they, did, they just haven't heard from. Um, our principals haven't taken a break. And yeah. Um, yeah. I'm very proud of them. As you should be. I, I, I think we're very blessed to have the principals that we do have. So thank you, Ms. Klein. Mr. Susan. Um, <laughs> that's all I have. Sorry, Ms. McDougal. So no, that's good. are we doing e-learning e for pre-K through sixth, or is it just going to be K through sixth? How, how is that working? Is I knew you were going to bring up something for pre-K. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so um, yesterday on the uh, webinar, 
uh, there was a question about what about pre-K for e-learning and the answer is the Office of Early Learning will provide us additional information <laughs> at a later time. We know what time that later time is. <laughs> no, I, uh, Mr. Colucci and I have had several conversations about our VPK and our um, early um, Head Starts and all those programs, and so um, we're waiting on additional information from the Office of Early Learning. Do you have an address for that place so I can go visit them? Um, yes, they're in Tallahassee. It's a, okay. it's a there's division. There's a local one here too, and then there's one. But up the there. the local is only a uh, that's our office of early learning who gets their direction out of the office of early learning out of Tallahassee. Okay, I'm gonna visit them. And then sixth grade is it the same? Um, is it the same curriculum in elementary school? It's not being moved up to middle school because of the way we are the district it has still in elementary school, right? Our curriculum for sixth grade is um, elementary right now. But it's else. the sta it's the sixth grade standards. Right. I'm just making sure that there's nothing going to happen. There. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. All right. Miss <clears throat> um, Klein, what happens if our charter schools don't submit their plans to you? <laughs> Um, that will be a personal phone call first to say, <laughs> where are your plans? Um, so um, I'm working through this charter school processes and uh, the communication plan with them. Um, Ms. Archer is working on uh, the communication with them. Uh, if, in fact, we do not get a plan from them, uh, that's when the um, DOE will get involved as the liaison. Uh, the DOE said yesterday that um, they won't, don't want us to be the, um, the, they want us to have conversation and work with charter schools on their plan, but if it becomes something that they're not turning in things, they want us to contact the DOE and let them be the liaison if we can't move them forward. So will we still be able to turn in our plan if we don't have all of the charter school plans? Have they? My understanding from yesterday's call is yes, we will okay. turn in what we have um, before the July 31st deadline. Okay. Um, and then I, f I f feel like there's an elephant in the room that, that just needs to be addressed, and that is um, Assurance 1. And um, that is that we will assure that all brick and mortar schools open in August at least five days per week for all students. And I know there's been a lot of um, media coverage that some of, uh, some of our friends to the south um, are, I think the initial one was Broward came out and said we are not going back to brick and mortar schools, but I think he has backtracked a little bit since then. Um, I think there was a, a Palm Beach that came out and obviously our constituents, or at least my constituents, I don't, I don't know if everyone's hearing from everyone, but um, there are lots of questions as to why Brevard does not have the option to not go back to brick and mortar right now and, and continue just our online learning. Um, certainly from the board member perspective, I think there are some, some elements there, but I didn't know if, if anyone wanted to speak to that i feel like it's kind of an answer that we owe our our community so that they can understand why what we're dealing with might not be the same as what they're seeing in some of those media stories yeah so i can address or, or try to respond to that in our conversations with the department of education and their their direction the language the expectations have been been very clear for districts moving towards reopening brick and mortar I think we have to keep in mind that South Florida has been in a different place, in a different circumstance, you know, all along. Uh, they were closed uh, before other places were across the state. They're in a different place and stage in the governor's reopening plan. Um, the, the DOE has, in all of the conversations, beginning with the session on Monday, which was the first we, the first webinar received, acknowledged that South Florida districts were being given different considerations. 
um, uh, than, than other places across the state. And, and I, I would suggest we are one of the other places across the state in implementing the emergency order from the Commissioner of Education. So we have, we have not been given that, that place to give other considerations at this time. And, and like we've been on literally on webinars every day since Monday with the DOE uh, going through the expectations and going through the plan and uh, expectations and so on. So, Thank you, Dr. Mullins. Um, Ms. Klein, will the uh, full-time e-learning from school at home also encompass our choice schools? Yes. So even regardless of what elementary school they're going to, that option should be available? All 57 elementary schools. Thank you. Um, and with regard to our full-time in-person, um, and I, I'm guessing this will, I know you said that we have to meet class size amendment. Will we be decreasing the number of students that we are putting into a classroom, or do you feel confident at this point that we can, within class size amendment, maintain six foot social distancing in the classrooms? Do we need to cap our numbers, I guess is the easiest way to ask that. So we're gonna get deeper into um, the classes, the layout of the classrooms, but, and from the American uh, Pediatric Association, the six foot is not necessarily the requirement for in classroom, it's more of a three foot. So we are uh, working to that, to maximize uh, the classroom as much as we can, but maintaining class size and maintaining the social distancing that we can within the classroom. Okay. And that's the same thing with the bus, having two to a seat on the bus, we're gonna get more into transportation here in a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I, um, any other board members have any questions on this particular section before we move on to our next? If I could just clarify, uh, I had forgotten about that South Florida you said it was in a different, I don't know, they call them stage or phase, I can't remember. But there's, are they still in phase one and the rest of us are in phase two, right? Is that the or stage? That's my understanding. Okay, yes. that's it. Thanks, Dr. Mullins. All right, then I believe we are moving on to Dr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to talk about our secondary options. We're fortunate in Brevard that we already have a rather robust array of options. But in all fairness to our parents who may be surprised from some of these options, we haven't always um, amplified the use of the flexibility that we currently have. And so there are a lot of options for our students and their parents. And as opposed to in other years where we might have been really like reserved and controlling about flexibility, we're throwing caution to the wind and supporting flexibility. So. Um, first, of course, as mentioned, the DOE required full-time in-person at school. Uh, I, I do want to flip back to the assurances rather quickly. The assurances are necessary before the department will consider approving an alternate option. And so they're literally hierarchical in that if you don't do this, we won't approve that. And so I just wanted to clarify that. So your creative, or they're using the term innovative, innovative option, won't be approved unless you can guarantee all these things. So just a little point of clarification there. Thank you. Um, Full-time provided virtual school, as we know, is an option. A couple questions that continue to come up. Our virtual school curriculum is Florida virtual school curriculum run by Brevard public schools teachers within a Brevard public school. And so students who do full-time Brevard virtual school are full-time students of a school, uh, an accredited school on a degree earning pathway. Um, something that there's a lot of questions about with Brevard virtual school and some you know, potentially misinformation or misinterpretation of how the information is presented is it is a smooth transition for a Brevard virtual full-time student back into the regular school. There's a little misinformation out there that it has to be all or nothing at the semester. And that's true for part-time, but not full-time. Full-time Brevard virtual students do meet instructional minutes. So if a parent did full-time for a month, 
and then wanted to return into the school, they would get transfer grades and returned into the school just like a student transitioning between two of our standard schools. And there seemed to be a lot of confusion around that, so I thought I'd emphasize that. Any parent with any questions regarding Brevard Virtual School should absolutely call the school. Um, they are returning every single call. They are in a couple days delay because they are experiencing quite a number of interests, which we're thrilled about, um, but they will get back to you. They have an excellent FAQ on their website as well, and um, we certainly encourage parents to take a look at that. Part-time in-person and part-time Brevard Virtual School is a very, very common occurrence around our district. Um, it is not uncommon for a student to take one or two classes at their home school and then choose the rest of their day to be virtual school. We work with that all the time. Again, we may not have encouraged it, um, but now, of course, we're going to be more encouraging of that option. So, for example, a student who really struggles in math, um, that really wants that person being able to help, ask questions, um, perhaps their IEP is focusing on some processing deficits and related to math. They really want to have that as instructional assistant help them. They might come into campus, take one math class, and then do the rest of their virtual school at home. So the parent can choose to minimize their child's contact beyond full time, provided they're still meeting a full caseload of classes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. It's not uncommon for students to do virtual class and then come in sixth or seventh period and do a couple of in-person classes. It's very common. Um, it often happens with ROTC or some of those classes that those parents often want to engage in. So right now, without approval from the state, without waiting on additional information, our parents can choose that combination that suits them. If they take at least one class at the home school, they are still attached to that home school. And so, um, for example, if a student from Merritt Island High School um, is concerned about a lot of access, they might choose one course um, on campus attached to Merritt Island, and then the other courses virtual. Conversely, that class on campus, dual enrollment also counts. So picture a child who might choose one dual enrollment class. These would be students that are eligible from 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. One dual enrollment class, and maybe they choose it virtual. And then they choose the rest of their case also virtual. They are still attached to Merritt Island High School. And so there is a lot of flexibility there, particularly in 10th and 11th and 12th grade for our students who can also access dual enrollment. So a student could be off campus all day from 10th grade on who qualify for dual enrollment and have an integrated experience and still be attached to their original school. And so again, that may not have always been clear to our families that that has always been available, but we wanna make certain now, especially that they know it. We've spoken to all of our school principals and assistant principals and have asked them to speak with their guidance counselors and make sure that every family that wants to discuss their personal situation is given all the combinations that are eligible to them, not necessarily just the ones we would advise. We're gonna still give our advice, but we're gonna, of course, let them know everything that's available to them. And so that final bullet there, of course, mentioned dual enrollment. So some of our seniors are eligible to be full-time dual enrollment right now. Um, they could do an early admissions year through Eastern Florida, begin their college career or end their college career, depending on how far they are. Um, we did have an earlier deadline for early admissions, um, but through our great partnership with Eastern Florida, they've agreed to continue to accept students in early admissions who qualify. So maybe a parent right now originally thought, no, I still want my child on campus some, even though they qualify for early admissions. That answer may have changed. Eastern Florida has been very flexible and they're gonna to continue to accept those students. And so that combination of dual enrollment, the combination of Brevard Virtual School and in-person class gives our parents a really, like it, there, there's a math formula I'm sure that tells me how many iterations <laughs> there are. Um, 
but I know it involves like an exclamation mark, but that's all I know. And so I'm a social studies teacher, sorry. So uh, we, we want to encourage that. We want to encourage the parent that wants to make it work, maybe still has work obligations, but doesn't want their child there all day. And so we will make that abundantly clear. Uh, in the last couple days, we've really amplified our um, information to our counselors. We've given our school counselors additional summer hours. That was in one of the slides there, um, but I don't think we spoke to it. Through CARES Act, again, um, I know how to get blood out of a stone, so um, we've given our school counselors additional hours to be accessible for our families. And in elementary school, we also added assistant principal hours because they normally don't even have assistant principals in the summer. So we looked at the programs where our parents need more access. So I'm going to move on to the next page, which is, is going to be new for people to see and think about. Um, seven classes a day has, has weighed very heavily on me. Um, it, it is, it is a, a situation that offers a lot of transition, a lot of student contact, student to student, student to teacher, teacher to student, every combination thereof. Um, it generally creates a really like exciting, robust, interesting, interactive day. Um, but again, in thinking about the safety of our students first, I had to put aside some other concerns. So every situation we face, I had to weigh what makes more sense in that given situation. So at this point, I've asked all secondary schools to examine the feasibility of a block schedule for the 2020-2021 school year under our current staffing plan. And I want to explain what that single powerful statement means. Um, one, right now we're simply examining the feasibility. I'm asking the schools to see if they can pull this off with their current staffing plans. Um, every time we talk about less students in a class, more students in a class, we're talking about teachers and every Teacher, we're talking about a million dollars, right? So everything comes with a cost. Block schedule is typically significantly more expensive than a six out of seven period. Um, it, it is less economy of teacher units, and so therefore it requires more teacher units. However, with the flexibilities that we have in high school, we are anticipating a significant portion of students not requiring all eight blocks on campus. And so, for example, if a school already has several hundred students who do dual enrollment, several hundred students who regularly engage in virtual school, I'll give you an example. Last year, um, we did well over 5,000 part-time virtual school courses. And that was pre-pandemic. And so, if a school has students that are going to still be a part of that school, but opt out of needing all blocks, that allows the school some flexibility in potentially filling all their needs cost neutral. Um, it's a big, bold statement that I'm making, and I, I can't make any guarantees at this point. Um, the value of minimizing the risk to the students, to me, is worth attempting that. I want to be clear, it's on the backs of our administrators right now. Um, this was a tough conversation, asking them to relook at what is one of the single biggest jobs they do in the summer. Um, like Jane, our principals are unbelievable. Um, they, they, the work they've done is indescribable. Um, our teachers, our custodians, every person a part of the school operation has been impacted and their job has doubled. I'm just going to say it. I believe it's at least doubled. And this is no 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 small ask um but i feel strongly about minimizing impact to the safety of our of our faculty and our staff this is a recommendation only for 2021 because again it is typically a very costly recommendation that would require all kinds of meetings and budgets and discussion um, and that's why we want to be clear that this is a single year recommendation the, the configuration I'm most concerned about is middle school. Our, our middle schools will likely not have as many students taking advantage of the flexibility that our high schools are traditionally used to. Although there's no reason why in a middle school a student could take a math block, an English block, 
go home for lunch, and then two, two virtual classes. We would certainly encourage our middle schools to start looking at flexibility that's already offered you know, more robustly. And we are going to, again, be more vocal about those flexibilities that are out there. Um, but given we expect less students to opt out of in-person blocks, we know there might be a financial impact to middle schools, which is why we are at this point simply examining it. Um, if I were a guessing person, <laughs> and I don't like to guess, I, I would suspect that our traditional 11 middle schools might need an extra teaching unit in order to make it work. Um, and so, again, that's simply a guess at this point. There's a lot that goes into it, and parents choosing alternate options is part of the story. Before I go on, I, I, I realize I, I left something out of Eastern Florida. Um, Eastern Florida has just released their fall schedule, and their schedule is uh, full of a variety of options of online, synchronous, and asynchronous, hybrid, and in-person. So normally we would have done some high school scheduling by now with fall dual enrollment, but because they too are facing the COVID crisis, we actually haven't done that yet. So we're right at a sweet spot in time on making this decision because the schedules haven't been created yet. There are also more students eligible for dual enrollment classes than typically take advantage of it. Um, we have the 3.0 standard requirement for our uh, Associates of Arts students but there's additional students that could take advantage of it with a 2.5, and even students with a 2.0 that are interested in a vocational certificate. Um, although we've tried to amplify um, the communication around those options, I find that a lot of families still don't understand that even though their student might not meet what they've imagined is the traditional dual enrollment student, the dual enrollment student can be any kind of student interested in the offerings of Eastern Florida and we encourage people to ask if their student can meet those requirements, and all of that's outlined on our dual enrollment pages. So that said, I'd like to everybody take a look at the information that has swayed me to push our already overworked administrators to take the time out to look at this. Our students would enroll in four 90-minute classes per semester. And so they would be taking a year-long course within a semester. What that means is at the end of the school year, they will have had actually eight opportunities for a course versus seven. And given the challenges that many of our students faced or the desires that students have to accelerate, an eighth block gives them that opportunity. And so perhaps they need to retake a course that they were not successful in, it gives them that flexibility. Perhaps they wanna add a learning strategies course that they couldn't put in their schedule before, it gives them that flexibility. Or a student that might want to accelerate to graduate early also has that flexibility with an additional block. Um, they'd have decreased exposure. We're, we're cutting their exposure in half. We're cutting class change in half. That's a big number for me in, in how we're, we're decreasing contact. Smoother transition when distance learning becomes necessary. And I didn't say if, I said when. Um, for common language, we are choosing distance learning to represent learning when students who have opted for a traditional experience have an interruption in that because of COVID-related circumstance. Could be a, they themselves test positive or fragile, somebody in their class, we may need, the school may need to close for three days, two weeks, all those iterations that we expect to be coming, we expect to sometimes be short or longer term interruptions. All those students, of course, will be served through distance learning with their regular teacher like they've done, but now we have so many more skills at our disposal. So a student, um, one of the complaints we heard, of course, is seven classes, that's a lot. And so four teachers, four classes, a, a much smoother transition in and out in that circumstance. It also allows for extended class time for those that require more protocols, such as CTE, music, science lab, and other hands-on classes. Um, I know our career and tech education department, when they heard we were looking at this, they were incredibly excited. Um, that is a dream schedule for a career and tech ed program. Block scheduling is not uncommon at all in career and tech ed because of the time. 
but beyond having their kids for that extended period of time, it allows for more uh, cleaning protocols. It also allows for uh, credentials and courses to be completed in a semester and potentially allowing more students to do pre-apprenticeships or internships in the spring um, and allows us some flexibility there. As we look at our teachers, um, I, I, my heart is heavy for how our teachers are going to be expected to be magicians. Um, and um, they are, in all reality, they are going to have their class loads of students. Within that class loads, they're going to have little Tina that was on quarantine yesterday. <laughs> Um, Sally, whose grandmother is now sick and now is this level of quarantine, and since those are standard students in their class, they're going to have to continue to support them and juggle a little with distance learning. Sometimes for some students, sometimes for their whole class, they themselves may get ill, and to cut them from six sections of 25 students for that juggling act to three blocks of intense support for half the number of students, um, I think is really important. Um, more likely for a, a teacher to be able to manage that within that 90 minute block, but more importantly, it gives those teachers a 90 minute planning period. And uh, 90 minute planning period is still not enough for what our teachers do, but it allows more time for that juggling of those students who are ill um, them continuing to fine tune their skills in blended learning and instruction. And so it gives them half those total number of students and an increased amount of time for planning, which again is still a fraction of the time that our teachers spend on trying to meet the needs of all their students. It cuts the teacher's exposure in half. That's a big number. Again, this is a big lift, a big ask to try to pull this off cost neutral in our schools. but cutting their exposure in half is something that I can't ignore. Changes average total number of students a teacher's managing. And why is this important? In, in a, in a, I'm just using average numbers. Um, most teachers have about 150 total students. That means a lot of teachers have large numbers of students with IEPs, large numbers of students with health plans, large numbers of students with 504s, and all of the undocumented, unwritten plans, special, unique needs of their kids. And they have quick, rapid-fire chances to impact them in class and then move on to the next. In a block scheduling, their total would be about 75 students, meaning, again, minimizing all those percentages. And given all the other juggles we're asking of the teachers, we think it's important. And for our ESC support facilitators, instructional assistants, again, rotation, fewer in between classes. If you look at the next page, I just identified a few other opportunities and challenges. Again, fewer class transitions, less students in a space throughout the day, thus less shared materials, and of course, um, more opportunities to accelerate, allowing for more mid-year graduates, um, a lot of reasons our students who accelerate are in school for the entire full senior year is English 4. Um, and this would allow a student to complete it first semester if they chose and to work towards it. Um, maybe go early admission second semester or maybe take that diploma and begin their careers in, uh, you know, productivity in our community. Um, there are some challenges, you know, hurricanes. We haven't even mentioned the H word. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we haven't mentioned the fact that every so often we're closing schools for the H word. And, you know, that's a double in instructional minutes when we have to track instructional minutes. Um, obviously, professional development is an issue. Um, I, I certainly, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. I hope it sounds the way I mean to say it. I'm going to say it as a compliment to our teachers. It's honestly less of my concern than other things. Our teachers didn't get certified and become teachers because they thought 47 minutes. They came certified to become teachers to be teachers. And um, I know most of them would cherish the extra instructional minutes. We will absolutely share best practices and strategies on how to double up content in that time period. And I believe our teachers will be really receptive to all of that. Um, testing offers some unique challenges. So I do want to talk about that a little bit. 
In our secondary schools, we test a variety of assessments. In state level testing, we have traditional FSA assessments, and that would be in ELA. And then also in seventh or eighth grade math for students who are not taking high school courses. Those assessments would be continued to only be administered in the spring. And so um, for some of our schools, you know, they're just a little concerned about the disconnect for students who may take a course in first semester versus testing and assessment in second semester. Um, fortunately, we've had several schools in Brevard Public Schools use Block over the years, and they have done some great strategies. For example, a student who's a struggling reader, um, they would do a Block one semester in ILA, our intensive language arts class, and they would have their ELA in a second block during second semester. That way the student is in a really uh, text-rich environment all year long. So they have some strategies to combat that. For our AP courses, the administration is only second semester. So again, there's some unique challenges in there. Um, some of our schools have talked about the amplified resources by College Board. They've done a tr tremendous job of putting practice resources online, maybe using eighth block second semester for students to be able to engage in some practice content for courses they took first semester. IB and ACE <laughs> operate differently. They do offer a semester assessment for students in a block schedule. It's a little earlier. The classes would have a little less content, but those students could test it mid-year as well as in the spring. So there's a little bit more flexibility with IB and ACE. I think I covered all those iterations. And so we really thought about all the different courses. Industry certifications could be administered all year long, um, enrolled in earlier. Um, I've got a great middle school principal that's like, I could have a student do pre-algebra and algebra in the same year who is really motivated. And so our principals are really looking at those flexibilities. So for right now, um, our schools are living in two lands. They're living with their traditional work that they've done towards their seven period schedule and they're working in the land that they've known about for about three days um, of me encouraging them to look at if we can make block schedule work. Um, there are risks and benefits to every situation, but when I think about flexibility, the, the word that, um, that we keep living on, and I think about minimizing risk to our teachers lessening the number of students they have, increasing their planning time. It's an option that I just can't ignore. And so uh, we're working hard on the feasibility of it. Once I have a better handle on how many of our schools can pull it off um, and what additional support they may need, I'll be sharing that with Dr. Mullins um, because again, support means money. We always have to be direct about that and um, we will go from there. Normally, it would be super easy for me to give you a cost estimate. It's simple math, I could do it. However, I think we can cut that cost because of the flexibility in high school. And so um, these are the models that we're looking at. I, I know that there's not a definitive answer for you there yet, um, but our principals, our school administrators, our counselors, our clerks, um, everybody that you can imagine is working hard. Um, the schools will be looking to identify from their students, and I, I'm, I'm saying the word identify because it's different at each school, how many students intend to take advantage of virtual or dual enrollment options while still being attached to their school, so we can determine how many blocks that frees up, and a block is a section that needs a teacher attached to it. And um, they, I asked them to not communicate that till after today, because of course, uh, moving forward on that, I would only want to task our administrators to continue that exploration if it met the interest of the board, of course. And so I asked them to wait in soliciting feedback from their school communities. None of these plans that I described will require DOE permission. And because they are all using previously employed approved strategies, so I don't have that pending board approval notation. Um, these are all accepted, already previously um, vetted strategies that the Department of Education supports. 
and I'm ready for questions. <laughs> All right, board members, questions on the secondary options. Like I'm ready. 22 through 24. <laughs> she saw me lean forward. She knew I was coming. And I'm leaning back. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I taught in a block schedule school for two years, and it was an A-B block, which is very different because mm -hmm. you still have six to seven classes that you're responsible for. And I think some people are like, oh, why can't we do that? Because then we can kind of stay the same. But so because it, it reduces how many students you're exposed to each day, but you, you still have the repetition. So yeah, we, we were trying to picture um, did that student start the sniffles on Monday or Tuesday? Right, right. <laughs> when they were in my class or in the other class? And it doesn't minimize the risk for our teachers. Right. And it doesn't do the other important thing, which is to minimize the load for the students and the teachers when it comes to the amount of work. And I know having two secondary students myself, you know, even in distance learning, it was a lot to juggle. Did I get through all Me seven too. courses? of my my work um and sometimes they're more successful you mean your them. students work right my children <laughs> my children right sometimes they were yeah oh yeah right i'm, I'm speaking of their yeah there was no mom helping <laughs> with anything for my two girls um so i i really appreciate the the benefits of the block schedule option but my music teacher heart <laughs> just hurts thinking of this and I I'm just I'm gonna be Pollyanna too like a couple of us have been and this is just for this year and then we're all gonna be past it but it really because this is the kind we just need to be aware this is what's gonna happen for our choirs and orchestras and bands and I'm sorry if I'm leaving out other subjects that are similar but my mind thinks towards music first um, that you know if you're in beginning band you're only gonna be in beginning band for one semester if you're the advanced orchestra you're only gonna be in one semester and we've got to juggle are you going to go first semester or last semester and i know some of the things have changed this year i know i just we just got the announcement yesterday that um there will be marching band mpas this year and so some of the competitions will be different and they're all going to be flexible we're all going to be flexible all year long if i could speak to that miss campbell uh, fortunately we have a phenomenal example in brevard public schools at titusville high school okay. titusville high school is currently on this block structure and titusville high school without question has one of the district's most exemplary music programs. They absolutely do. Um, their band program is phenomenal, and um, it, it belies the concerns um, that people have with music programs. And of course, I share that I'm band mom too. Um, however, uh, Titusville, we have an exemplar in our own county. Um, several students double up. And so, you know, that happens now, the students who want to take jazz and beginning and regular. Um, I would imagine um, Mr. Schwent, who is already one of the prime mentor educators in our district on music, could teach a master class on block and music. And so um, I feel really confident that if, again, the, the board pushes this direction, that when it comes to those programs that concern people, Titusville, Titusville belies the logic. Um, ROTC, some of those other programs that get people nervous, we have our own in-district exemplary program. Well, and I would, thank you for reminding me of that, yeah. because I would say, I don't know about all their music programs, so I would say the same thing about their choirs, I know that have been fantastic. They're phenomenal. Um, through the years. Um, and I was actually not aware that that's the kind of block schedule that Titusville is on. Yes, ma'am. I'm in the south end, you know, we, yes. we stick down to the south, but I didn't, wasn't aware that that's the kind of block. So thank you. It, you know, there's, but there's going to be some big changes and adjustments, and again, everybody, if that's what schools choose, going to have to just hold on and for this year, and we can all make it through. Um, just the other thing that I would ask, oh, to one quick question, I think this is pretty easy, but what about one semester classes, would that be, like careers and things, would that be a one nine, yes, first nine weeks, second mm -hmm. nine weeks kind so of thing? Those semester classes are completed in nine weeks. Um, and, and that's a huge advantage. Again, we have Titusville High as our example. Um, and what we have found amazing for those programs is students have time to redo where they weren't successful. Um, and uh, they could easily redo another semester if necessary. So yes, semester courses are uh, nine week courses and backed up against them. Okay. Um, just going back to the first page of the secondary, um, because I think, I don't, 
think this is somewhere else in the presentation. Um, just for our, um, the conversation that you and I had a little while ago about the choice schools. So if, if we have a family, in elementary it's, it's a little bit simpler for the, because of the e-learning option. If you're at one of our choice schools or you're an ELO, you know, you've, you, you're going out of area, your school, if you do that, your e-learning is attached to the school that you're registered for right now. Um, but with our choice schools and our choice programs, um, whether it be West Shore, Edgewood, or the Cambridge program at the Cambridge schools or IB, whatever, um, if, if a parent is concerned they want to stay enrolled in that choice school or choice program within a school, but they're not comfortable full brick and mortar, what is their option to, to hold their spot? Because I've heard from a lot of parents who are concerned about losing their spot. Sure. I, I'm going to give a couple of answers because every scenario is different. And I, I don't want anybody to presume that my response right now is exhaustive. Because just when I think it was, the next story is entirely different than the first story. So first and foremost are students with documented medical concerns. Um, those are the students that obviously uh, we would prioritize and we would ask all those parents to please contact their school principal if uh, they have documented medical concerns and want to discuss if are there alternative options. Um, there are many of our families, of course, with concerns that don't, don't necessarily meet that criteria, but their concerns are equally valid, kind of like I mentioned in the beginning, everybody's opinion is a right opinion. Um, again, we would encourage them to talk to their school. Uh, it would simply need one class at your school would count as still being attached to that school. And that class could be a virtual dual enrollment course, for example. Um, and so we would encourage uh, parents to contact their schools. There, you know, we can't make a blanket statement and say seats would be available because if, if 50 students chose virtual school or homeschool or non one, we can't leave teachers there staffed and waiting with no students to um, staff that school because again, that's costs, right? And so um, it, it, there's not an easy blanket answer, uh, but we want to make something work. And we want to make something work for our families in those circumstances. Um, again, I, that's why I wanted to emphasize uh, um, maybe not with the West Shore Edgewood situation, but in other spots, the Brevard Virtual School is a seamless transition back into your school. Um, but call the principal and they will talk through the creative options. Have you thought about this? We could attach this to that course. Um, the student would have to have some technical attachment to the course and one course will do it. Again, that's always been true. We haven't sang it from the rooftops before, but we're singing loudly now that that is a flexible option. And so um, if the student is eligible for dual enrollment, I, I would suggest do one dual enrollment virtual class and you've secured your attachment to that school. So there's, we are going to be as flexible as we can within the guidelines that we have. Secondary is obviously a little different than elementary in that we run about 500 courses, each requiring unique certifications and combinations and numbers to warrant that teacher attachment to the section. So uh, there's a lot of complexities in really being able to guarantee a viable high quality curriculum without adding another spinning, spinning plate to the teachers that already have a bunch of those spinning plates. Um, and so uh, we want them to take advantage of all those legal options and help us work with them on what works for their family. All right, and let me just take what you just said and re-explain it in layman's terms, because a lot of people who are watching, who are watching, Sorry. who have said, no, 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 you said it clearly, but I just, you know, the teacher in me wants to, to not dumb it down, but just to amplify it just a little bit, because there's a lot of people who have said, why, they want an e-learning option like we're doing for elementary, they want it for everybody, and I just want to just clarify why we can't necessarily, I can't, it's what a challenge it would be to do something similar for our secondary, because unlike elementary, where there are, every elementary school is offering the same courses. When we get to our secondary classes, there's not an unlimited, but there is such a huge variety at every single school of courses offered. It would be next to impossible to offer an e-learning option from the school and the brick and mortar at the same time. 
if with separate teachers or you know you know unless short of putting the camera on the teacher and that's just it's just not going to work and it, it's too much to ask for our teachers so there's such a variety we might have at one school one section or two sections of a class let's say european history at heritage high school they usually offer two sections and you know to have those in the in the school building and also you it's just it's just too much because of the variety so we can't do it the secondary the same as we can do at the elementary because of the complexity of the courses offered which is a wonderful thing to offer our students so many um, and I, so. I would say that the what we know about children also is different and, and mm -hmm. the needs of an elementary school parent and family and uh, what we look for in terms of resiliency and grit in our secondary students is also a little different too. All right, thank you. That's all I've got. Uh, you mentioned early graduation. So uh, any plans to encourage some, I'm guessing a bunch of our soon to be seniors Very have Very aggressively. <laughs> like, oh look, you have enough credits. Here's your diploma. I mean, are we, are, are you, are we gonna be trying to facilitate uh, uh, absolutely. that? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, basically, we want, we, we, we want to make the information clear. So I don't wanna encourage a student not to be in school. I don't wanna be in, encourage a student to stay longer than they have to. I want them to know that they can do this if that's what works for them and their family. And again, it de-densifies our schools. And so we may not have sang it loud from the rooftops before, but before we didn't have a primary objective of de-densifying our classrooms. So yeah, we will make certain every eligible person knows that it's a good option, it's a viable option. I, I want to add some questions that I know people are probably posting somewhere if they're listening to this, but I, honestly, I hope they're not listening four hours later. Um, by law, by district policy, early graduates are entitled to all the benefits of a senior. So for example, we could have a senior because of maybe needing a semester course done in October or done in January, that senior is entitled to grad bash, prom, graduation, all of those extracurricular benefits that come to our seniors. It's a question that comes up all the time, so I was assuming some of these fingers were typing that question somewhere. That is without question the right of a student. And so we definitely don't want our students to not exercise that option. For some of our students, though, early graduation is not the best fit. Full-time dual enrollment is. Because if they're interested in Eastern Florida and interested in going in there, we would encourage them to stay on with us but do it full-time dual enrollment. So each situation is a little different depending on their goals. Some students are ready, uh, their family's moving. They want to get you know, graduation done or just minimize the risk for the students. Some are joining the military earlier. We can support those goals. Um, we always have been able to support those goals. We just uh, don't think we have done the very best job of amplifying all those rights that students have. Um, students have the ability, you'll see in another slide, to test out of courses that isn't necessarily amplified from the rooftops. We can all remember CLEP, right? You probably thought CLEP went away. CLEP didn't go away. Students could CLEP out of courses. Um, students could take an accelerated 18 credit option to graduate early. Um, we always give a handout that ends up probably in a backpack. <laughs> um, and so, and they're on our website, like all these things have always been true, but they haven't been at the forefront of that weird option. I remember hearing at some point in time, we should probably take that. So we're gonna make all that flexibility incredibly clear. Will it go on our COVID website under FAQs or something where it people can start that, that word, I, I'm going to write that down right now. I think that's a good and idea. And in fact, I, I might, for the sake of clarity, add a slide to that for this document, like an appendix. And then that way, if people are just looking at this, they can reference it as well. Perfect. Thank you. So the or back to the, or we're still on it, but the early graduation, what's the credit number where we're going to be strongly encouraging, questioning, supporting that? Because we have our credit number, and then there's the state, which is less, and then from my own experience, I know that there's a, an even lower number that yep. potentially can be used. So yep. are we going to yes. be flexible, more yes. flexible than ever, and be like, oh, you have this, you could yep. by state, even though we'd, we'd encourage you X, Y, Z. Yes, we graduate 
A significant number of students every year under all different grad plans. We probably have about 15 different grad plans, and that's probably not doing it justice. And so, yes, uh, we, we do that now. We graduate a lot of students at 24 credits. We graduate several students at 18 credits, several students at 26 credits, several students at 30 credits, and students at 28 credits in our choice schools. Um, again, I, I, I think the mystery is we have not been screaming it from the rooftops. And given the current situation we're in and the power of de-densifying campuses and minimizing students' contact, we'll be singing it more from the rooftops of all of those possible configurations. And with Block, amplifies those possible configurations because courses can be done in a compressed period of time. Perfect. Hopefully the graduation uh, number two will also be put on the FAQ page. Uh, you mentioned possibly 11 extra teachers for middle school once you potentially. I know the CARES funds are not this unlimited pie in the sky that we can just keep charging things to, yeah. but is there, could that potentially cover the cost of those 11 teachers? It, it, it could potentially cover the cost of one more, some, many. It, it really depends. Um, so we haven't depleted the care, and we just keep saying, oh, that care is going to pay know, for that. I, I mean, at I, some point, it's going to be I, empty. Have I'm we depleted gonna, it? From my grant experience, um, kind of let you know where I believe there's an opportunity to capture some of those expenses. When we budget, we have to budget for maximum costs. We have to assume uh, big numbers. And in fact, we had to make up some numbers because we didn't know how much stuff was going to cost. And so we always know that there's going to be a bucket of flexibility at some point in time that's unencumbered. And in that case, we submit an amendment to our grant. And so it's not written in our current iteration because again, it's not an, an identified cost or expense. We know some places in our grant that are not likely to max where we have them at right now. And so I would suggest that there is a decent possibility to capture a chunk of that any necessary cost with the CARES Act, it would absolutely um, qualify on the scopes of work that are in the grant. Um, we are living, breathing, and dying those scopes of work, so I feel really confident it's a qualifying expense. And I feel really confident that there will be some offsetting that will be available because we knew we budgeted high in some cases. Um, because you have to. So you have to budget maximum, but you also know that not all those things um, you know, cost at maximum expenses. We, at the time, we had no idea how much a plexiglass thing would cost. We didn't even have like a ballpark. So we had a really high number there that we know is, is a little high. And so, um, yes-ish. Okay, and this gets in the weeds a little. Tell me if, if we'll get to this later. And I know we're gonna talk about transportation later, but I'm super curious about middle school, probably because I have an incoming middle schooler. If he chooses to do half day, half day, first of all, I think that's gonna give him options for more foreign languages potentially and, and that the school may not offer. So it, Correct. I'm, I'm very interested in that. Is transportation still available? Obviously not in the middle of the day, but uh, say he's done, say he doesn't do the, for the morning and I have to take him at noon or whatever. Transportation is still available home, oh, yes, as long as we're Absolutely, like, and thank you for asking that. If I want to be clear, absolutely. But there's also, to be clear to the public, transportation in the middle of the day because you choose one or the other class or an hour Correct. in between. We can't, as a district, provide random transportation. It's still going to run at the same time. Correct. And preferably, if you were going to do half day, half day, you would. So that Right. Block schedule makes that nifty, too. Mm -hmm. Two blocks in the morning, two blocks in the afternoon. Um, so that it makes it really easy, I think, for a parent to choose a flexible option. Okay, I think that's my questions for now. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ms. one Klein, more thing. You? Just thank you uh, to you and Ms. Klein, uh, not to leave you out, Ms. Moore, but just with these two, um, you know, we've looked at the thousands of comments and we're watching the debate go on, and I think the, the options that we're giving our community and our family within the parameters, I am extremely grateful that we're allowing parents to, and families and, and students to, to choose where they feel safe, where they're still gonna get a quality education. You know, all the things I've learned this past few years on the board kind of 
are, are coming together here where you can get distracted over here and distracted over there, and a pandemic is certainly distracting, but you all seem to be laser focused on, especially the students that maybe don't have an English speaking parent at home and they haven't heard a word of English since April or they haven't seen a book since April. Uh, I think this gives them opportunities to get the quality education that they deserve. So thank you. Yeah. Ms. McDougall. Sullivan, I have a quick question here. It's related to I, the IB program. Um, I think I have some parents that are concerned. How will that look, a black schedule, the IB world, um, especially if they're a senior at this point? Yeah. Um, what I can tell you is that I don't believe it won't work. <laughs> Um, okay. and, and as an IB mom, just had an IB senior, I know exactly what an IB senior schedule looks like. Um, the students are taking uh, six mandatory uh, sections, um, and the IB framework allows for semester by semester block. Um, I, I should amplify to the board that they are on a, a rather tight deadline for us to make a decision because of they have to be able to commit to first semester testing. So a student in block um, would still have those six courses with the IB program. They'd actually have two additional courses. And, and I'm gonna speak to you as a mom. Um, I had an, an IB child myself who her senior year had to drop band um, because she was choosing between band and science research. And our IB students don't have a ton of flexibility in their schedule. And this actually gives them another course. And I uh, have been part of the program for the last four years and around all the students in the program. I believe the students will really appreciate having a flexible course for their passions. And so um, testing will be a little unusual. I've already reached out to at least one um, IB coordinator. And um, there are lots of uh, schools throughout the country that are currently on block. And we would hope to connect our school leaders. And, and same with Cambridge. Um, we're going to set up some focus teams between the Cambridge and IB personnel. Our coordinators, Molly Vega, is the director that's over all those accelerated programs and connect with high-performing schools that are on block throughout the country. Great. I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for answering Of course. That. Is that it, Ms. McDougall? Yeah. I. I um, well, let me just throw this out, and I don't know if this is a true thing, but um, so for band, you know, Miss Campbell brought up the band and with black scheduling. So somebody brought up the example that that a teacher's working an unpaid block schedule. Would that be a true statement? Would that ever happen? Um, Does that make sense? <laughs> if you said the words unpaid. I would say no. Um, okay. Um, I would certainly encourage a person with that concern to contact my office. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There, there are um, there are teachers where we have a win-win on decreasing costs through extended day, and so there are teachers who would uh, want to teach a fourth block, and uh, they would receive the extended day supplement and teachers uh, wanting extended day and it being a synergy to what the, the uh, school requires, it's a much lower expense for the district. Um, it, is a, it is a fraction of the cost of another teacher for those same three blocks. Um, again, we have Titusville as an exemplar. Astronaut was also recently on a block. Um, sometimes a teacher might do an extra block just one semester, sometimes both semesters. And that helps with the schedule as well. And, and, and teachers of certain courses want that option. And we try to find a win-win where they want it and the school requires it. OK. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's all my questions. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. Um, first thing is, is it, uh, it's 1245. I didn't know if we kind of wanted to put together a plan for lunch the fact that we're only on slide number 22 and we have 45 <laughs> to go 
Um, does anybody else have the feeling? I mean, I'm, I'm eating power bars over here like crazy. And I don't think that's going to last me a couple more hours. Um, I'm always hungry. So okay. whenever you ask that question, assume there's a yes from Sullivan. Um, would there be a direction of the board that possibly after this set of questioning we could do something? Or would we like to order food and deliver it? What do you guys think? Would you like to just keep pounding and do that? Or you want to take a break and come back? How do you guys want to do that? So we got to eat. Ms. Campbell, what's your preference? I am also usually hungry, so I'd, I'd go for a 30-minute break for everybody to run and do whatever. Um, I, whatever. I mean, I've been, you know, <laughs> so I'm full of chocolate, chocolate as usual. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I eat, just chocolate, chocolate. It seems like maybe we should order and then it'll be here and we can eat on a 30 minute break because I don't know that we can all get out and back. Yeah, the meat of this is... Because the cafeteria is not open, correct? Food services? It is, it is, Caf it is open. The cafeteria is open. Mr. Novelli is going to make a run and see if they can make some accommodations quickly. Because they close now, right? The meat of this is... That would be ideal. I mean, I don't... If we all have to leave, it's just going to take forever. But yeah. That's my two cents. Cafeteria food. Our delicious food services team, food. All right, Mr. Susan, if you want to go on with your questions while Mr. Novelli is checking into sure. our options. Sure. So me. the first one is, is um, okay, full-time Brevard virtual school sports activities. Mm -hmm. Yep. Homeschool, kind of like the, the homeschool option where where you sit is where you go. Is that how it works? Ish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to get the ish t-shirt. Yes. So, um, for students who are full-time Brevard virtual school, they are eligible for athletics, mm -hmm. um, just like any other non-traditional student. So they, they would still go through all those qualifying procedures. There's no limitations. I'm saying ish because of activities. Um, they, they wouldn't be able to take a class, and some activities are attached to class. So activities, I'd rather those be one-on-one -on -one questions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just pausing on activity. Um, but athletics, yes, that is a, that's already a practice. It's already, um, it wouldn't be something new for us to figure out. Right. It yep. just kind of follows the same. Mm -hmm. the the, same there's framework. a non-traditional student set of guidelines. Um, so they can still be attached to athletics at their home school. Um, no problem. And then, um, how does the part-time, you know, part-time, you know, half and half work with attendance for sports how do we how are we checking on a friday yeah to make sure that they're they've attended their that, that's a great question um and we do that all the time now with our dual enrollees and our virtual um we obviously a lot of those courses don't have an attendance requirement so if a student is let's say three periods on campus and four periods off campus the off-campus courses if they're virtual school they don't have an attendance requirement so they don't count and they we would count the ones where they're on with attendance with us i got you i, I say that with a slight clause um, because there are some cases with dual enrollment match where you know that might be a factor but we don't manage the attendance at dual enrollment right. so we are accountable for the attendance with us and i taught block schedule also at space coast and i actually roamed one of the years in between so i'm familiar with it how does it work with dual enrollment? How does it piece up? How does that line up? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Right now, again, we have Titusville as our exemplar, thank goodness. Um, our students take two dual enrollment classes per open block. And so a student might have uh, three classes at the school, two dual enrollment classes. One of the things that we are investigating is, do we do that out of practice or is that a required part of the minutes? And that we're not sure. We do it in practice that way at Titusville High. And what we're trying to break down, is that practice or is that required? And so uh, our team is looking at that. So uh, again, luckily we have a model for that and it's right now two dual enrollments per open block. Got it, okay. So I started looking like, because we got this, and I started last night putting my head around trying to figure out, okay, I'm a teacher. And there was a couple of angles that I was moving here. How, how did this work? And I remember my classroom when I was a teacher teaching American history, 
for the block schedule. And the reason that I asked earlier about the Socratic circles and all of the other pieces is because the only way I could keep the fidelity of my classroom in a 90 minute block for a social studies class was to move those kids around. I couldn't lecture to them. I couldn't have them sit in seats. I couldn't do that. It was almost, it was almost impossible for me to do that. I mean, I would lecture for seven minutes, then I had an activity, then I moved into, I mean, it was just constant movement, right? Mm -hmm. With the COVID plan, I have extreme concerns over that going to block with the fact that you have those kids who have the highest number to you have students who don't do well in a classroom setting to begin with that need to be moving around that are now going to be locked into being sitting in the seats and they're not going to be able to be doing the group work and everything else as far as the Socratic circles and the different pieces um, what is the what is the piece like what are you are you, was there any concern about the students that can't that have difficulty getting through a 90 minute period and, and, and having them basically sitting still like that? Does that make yeah, sense to you? Yeah, of course, that's a super valid concern. And, and that is uh, the difference in what we are having to deal with right now in this current situation. I, I think I mentioned earlier, what we know is really great and vibrant for an exciting learning environment is contrary to what we have to prioritize in terms of student safety right now. And, and there's not a magical solution to it. I, I will suggest that um, the perception sometimes is that a struggling learner would be more difficult in that situation. And, and, and I would suggest that that is not necessarily true. I, I think some kids, the constancy of uh, the change and the, the rapidity of it isn't necessarily um, better for them. And some students need to decompress for a minute and then potentially engage. So I would absolutely agree that for some learners, it's not going to be ideal. Um, for some learners, they'll love less transitions. And um, I, I am banking on our teachers. And um, I, I don't, it's not an easy answer. It's, it's what we're dealing with, trying to educate students in a school in the midst of a global pandemic. And sure, I would much rather those teachers in a block do everything that you just said, but we want to keep people and our teachers safe too. So yeah, is this gonna be difficult for some of our kids? No question. Um, it, but this, this is the hand we're dealt. And I believe our teachers are gonna utilize their, their maximum toolkits and their strategies to really uh, savor those minutes. I, I think there's, there's students who don't wanna leave that class as much as the students who do wanna leave that class. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully with the skill set that we have, we can, we can try to do the best we can, but your concern is dead on. Yeah, every the, one of those concerns, of course, is, is run through our head. I just, I know my, I know a lot of the kids that are in some of the areas that we have where we have our discipline problems and one of the specific common threads, whether it's diagnosed or not, um, whether it's ADHD or any of the other issues becomes very prevalent when you start putting them into a block schedule. Yeah. And, I, and when we were talking about dealing with our discipline policy, um, this becomes a, a piece. And, and, and to be true, I mean, I taught two years and I only wrote, I think, three referrals during the two year period. So it's manageable. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying it's part of your factors, if you would put it in. 100%. And, and uh, I, I think we will be pleasantly surprised at the students that actually respond to the longer block of time, too. We have several courses right now in our schools that operate on a double block, um, primarily in career and tech ed. Um, the students double up and are doing 90-minute blocks right now. Mm -hmm. And those are often those same students. And they, we can't drag them out of there. We have a lot of students double blocked in ROTC, and we can't drag them out of there. And um, so and in some that. cases, it'll give students more of the environment that they thrive in, and then maybe the environment they less thrive in a little bit more palatable. And that, and you, you gave specific examples of what I would love to see more kids be a part of if we were in block schedule, which is the ROTC career and technical because the problem is is that those kids that don't want to sit in that classroom would thrive in the ones you just said because of exactly what you said, they're hands-on. And when we take away that hands-on option inside of a block schedule is where I started getting concerned. Mm -hmm. The other concern I was going to ask you if you had looked into... Susan, can I stop you for 
one second. I just want to check and see if we need to take action on um, getting to the cafeteria's dry food services team. Um, based on that, Mr. Susan, do you mind if I interrupt your questioning? Yeah. I just don't want to yeah, keep yeah. the food services staff later no, than absolutely. necessary to accommodate Please. us. Do we have options or? Uh, I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. So um, we are going to go ahead and recess for approximately 30 minutes so we can get some sustenance and we will plan on resuming approximately 125. Is that right? Great.
Can you hear me? Am I on? We good? Okay. And Ms. Belford, that was not a, uh, an interruption in any way. Anytime you offer food at any time that I'm speaking or in doing anything, that is definitely a well-received interruption. So I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, getting back to the block. Um, so the next thing that I was going to ask you about is when we, Dr. Sullivan, when we, one of the issues that I had was pacing as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So in social studies, we had, I was an American history teacher, and we always found ourselves stuck somewhere between World War II and the Vietnam War on a block schedule because the pacing was difficult. There's only so much that you can actually put into a classroom with content where they're going to absorb it, right? So you find that, that balance. Um, but I, I, I did notice that there were a lot of teachers that transferred in from other schools that were not on block that were not used to that, that actual pacing, right? So when, I, when we talk about moving from a seven period day to a block period day, it, I felt like there needed to be, have you guys put together like how that pacing guide works, how we transition teachers to it? Because I think um, I had some concern in that area, that's all. Yeah, those, those are really good concerns. Um, again, we've been working on it for about three days. <laughs> um, so uh, right now, our principals are examining the feasibility of it. And so I've asked them to turn their schedules upside down. Um, and I, I imagine those challenges will be true. Uh, you know, again, I, I want to restate, this is a one-year recommendation given the current climate. And so just like you said, Mr. Susan, I, I'm my own worst, you know, angel devil, like what's better, what's worse. Yeah. And then whatever the argument was on this hand was always beat by half the contact, half, 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 minimizing the safety. So those are definitely hurdles that we will work through. Um, I feel really good about our team of content experts and resource teachers who are hearing it for their first time only if they're listening and they don't even know yet. Um, because again, we started doing some just behind the scenes feasibility. We didn't wanna do anything more aggressive until we presented this suggestion to the board. And so um, all I've done is ask principals to start looking at their course requests and their blocks try to potentially tomorrow get a handle on parents opting for other options. So no, it, depending of course on the board's informal keep going or whoa, slow down Sullivan is where we will go next. Um, I think you know the vast majority of our secondary resource team, I, I believe they can make um, the best out of anything. Are we still gonna have some of those problems? There's not a doubt in my mind that we will. Um, but I think they will really adjust resources um, to try to minimize some of those problems. Um, yeah, we were, we were weighing that. Like there's, when it comes to academics, you guys know that's my, that's my big hat. And I had to turn my hat a little just to really support safety. And so uh, I believe in the team. They don't know this yet that we're even considering it because um, we felt like the board should be the first uh, formal discussion of it and minus three days ago asking the principals gotcha and then that that was the other piece was is that um i remember this was years ago um putting together a schedule is really really difficult yeah um and i at the time was married to somebody who was in charge of putting that schedule together building it out for that seven period day was really really difficult and when i heard this in the time period it was do we have those individuals? I mean, I remember her putting that together and just being, she was, it was a lot of work, right? There was yeah. a lot of PT from the, um, help from the district and everything like that. But is there, how would we build out a schedule like that, a master schedule on a block schedule when they have never done that before in the time that we have? Is that a concern? That is a huge concern. Um, and I, I want to thank Chris. She said something the other day as we were, as a cabinet, grappling with, do we bring this forward? And she was quoting a principal mm -hmm. who had just gotten off the phone with me and hearing this, oh, by the way, I know you're planning your third version of graduation. I know you're planning this. I know you're planning that. Um, and where we landed is uh, 
hard is not something we want to get in our way of something that we really think is important for student safety. And it took a lot for me to say it to the principals. I know how hard they're working. I've built those schedules. I know exactly what you're talking about, Mr. Susan. Um, it took a lot for me to come to terms with and asking our principals to pivot in the middle of everything we've asked of them and to maybe just talk to their assistant principal and don't even tell anybody yet, but turn upside down thousands of course requests. Um, Russell Cheatham's team is, is a critical part of master scheduling. Um, it's gonna be taxing on them. All of it will be taxing. I, I'm not gonna minimize that. This, this is gonna be a heavy lift. And um, it took a lot for me to ask that of our leaders in the midst of everything they've done. Um, but in the end, when I thought about our organizational values, when I thought about our strategic initiatives, when I thought about everything that we stand for, I had to not use hard as a reason not to. It's gonna be all hands on deck. We're gonna be relying on our friends at Titusville a lot. Um, our friends at um, uh, both Madison and um, Astronaut were recently on block. So we have some skills there. Um, we've only got one new uh, curriculum assistant principal, so we're gonna rely on the fact that even though block is a pivot, there's already some skill set built there in scheduling. We're gonna rely on the directors in the division. Um, again, right now, we've just asked them feasibility. I didn't even wanna tell them to go too far. Obviously, the board's perspective was critically important to how aggressively we followed this path. So it is going to be a big lift and um, they will have to uh, work extra hard to put up a schedule before the start of school. And um, I absolutely believe in them. Um, I'm confident that they will succeed, but I'm also confident that it's a big ask. And I appreciate you thinking outside the box and I, mm -hmm. and I really do, like I'm not, please don't find this in any way, um, I, I enjoy being innovative. So thank you for that. Um, now, your questions are my questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and I was just I'm yeah. trying to work through it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that I was, I mean, in the short amount of time, and I'm sorry, like, I'm, I mean, I got scratch all over here trying to figure it out, but I was going to ask, I was trying to do the numbers in my head, and it just didn't add up with how many classes and everything else. Is there a, is there, I know that um, when I was on block, I taught four out of four, and I, and I think that you had mentioned earlier that there was going to be a request um, the teachers that are standing out there right now are saying, wow, that's a great 90 minutes, but how many of them, how many teachers would you have to hire if you didn't actually go on block on average, say for every thousand kids, or how many teachers are gonna be asked to teach that extra class? Uh, that was all. Yeah, and, and we don't know. Um, normal, in a normal year, I could give you those numbers, simple math. It would normally take, uh, we, we, we use two additional units at, at Titusville. And so we've got, again, we have a model. Um, so on average, it would, that's a good framework for you. What's different is the number of students that won't require all eight blocks because of the flexibility with virtual school, dual enrollment, early graduation. And so that's why the first thing the principals are going to do is inquire from their families. You know, these were your original course requests as we're building out the schedule, what do you plan to do in terms of virtual and dual enrollment? Because then those are two sections that they don't require for every 25 kids who do it. So it is a guessing game right now because of the fact of COVID and people increasing their use of the flexible options provided for them. And in part because of COVID and part because we're gonna be more transparent and vocal about all the flexible options. The, um, so that was a long answer to say, no, I don't no, know. No, 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 but you had, you had <laughs> in, I don't know what the population of Titusville school is, but. Um, about 1,500. Okay, so you've got two extra teaching units, but I think the key is how many of those teachers are actually teaching four of four, because that's the key. Yeah, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but it's a, it's a really manageable number. It, it's, it's, I want to say for sure low single digits. Okay. Um, I, and I don't have that in front of me, and I apologize. No, and, and, I, and I wouldn't but expect you to. It's I, manageable, and again, it's where 
When we do extended day, whether it's six, seven out of seven or four out of four, I go back to the principals. Is this what this teacher wants to do? Right. And the answer has always been yes. Um, and as opposed to, is, is the teacher willing to do you a solid? Like, we want that yes, this is what the teacher wants to do. Um, and I signed up for it every yeah. time, too. I just don't know the availability of what it would be in the middle of the COVID tornado that teachers would be signing up for the extra We have no period. idea. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the numbers because every time I do it, does this mean that, the cl that there will be larger numbers in like activity classes? I mean, is that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it and I can't figure it out. And, it, it, and, again, and uh, we're all feeling the same way right now. Um, so what the, what the schools will do is for the students who do eight blocks, right now they're looking at seven course requests. They're gonna go to the student's eighth course request because we do rank alternatives and use that kind of as a base to try to build out a schedule. In a normal world, that would mean more sections for the school, ergo more teachers. Again, in a non-normal world, it's gonna rely really heavily on the choice options for the students. Um, we're doing some double checking on that dual enrollment, like I mentioned, in terms of uh, what's required versus what our practice is in instructional minutes, um, and review that. So. Super easy for me to tell you what it would cost you and what it would take in non-COVID. Not easy now. I think we have a really strong possibility in our high schools of at least half the students not doing a full day at the school. I think that is a very reasonable guess. Um, okay. But it's only a guess, Mr. Susan. No, I understand. I, I don't want to convey um, confidence in the numbers. I, I'm happy to convey competence in the concept, but I don't have competence in the numbers right now. Absolutely, no, no. And, I, and I appreciate that. Does, if the CDC changes its guidelines next week, would that change the impact of moving to a block schedule or not? Does that weigh into anything that you're making a decision on? Well, I guess it depends on which way they change their guidelines. Um, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that cutting the teacher's exposure in half and the student's transitions in half would be a bad idea in this emergency. Right. Um, but it only works, again, on the presumption, it only works financially on the presumption that students will take advantage of those opportunities to minimize their contact. So could changes change to that? Um, for sure. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people are changing from what I read in those 11,000 comments, I don't know that teachers' emotional, uh, the parents' perspectives would change as readily as CDC recommendations might change. I, I just, I didn't know if, I didn't know if, um, because I know that we're trying to throw a dart in the middle of the dark and, and hit a, a target, but if, they, if we decided to move to a block schedule and then all of a sudden all of the kids decided to come back in the secondary, um, then that becomes an, a situation of, 100%. A, of a problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, is that are we going to offer zero blocks in because that was part of, and I know that Titusville's banned. One of the reasons they're successful yep. is, is they have a zero block, right? Um, what is the thoughts on that? Yeah, they, the Titusville makes it work within their schedule. Schools do zero blocks now within their schedules. Sometimes a teacher might, out of their standard six, a zero block might be one of their standard six, or a zero block might be an extended day. And so those decisions are absolutely continue to be up to the discretion of um, the principal. It's usually gonna come down to availability of section and seats, and can I give up you not teaching that block in the regular school day? And are there enough students that maximize it so principals would continue to have discretion with it like they do now we have zero block uh, zero period in several classes the difference with zero block is there's not enough minutes for, act, for it to actually count as a whole semester um, but there are solutions to that and then is there less course offerings because of the, the block schedule no more i um, in fact our middle schools are uh, working with us right now on how to increase because students take an eighth period and so there's actually more course offerings. Okay. I think that that's, that portion of it I'm, I'm pretty good on. I, um, 
The other question I had that I wrote down here was Brevard Virtual. So the question is, is that if we have all of our schools, our high schools and middle schools on block, is Brevard Virtual on block? Yeah, Heather Price and Brevard Virtual is part of our team. So she's in the same loop of uh, potentially pivoting to block as well. Oh, so they have a possibility of taking the virtual schools yeah. and turning them to block scheduling. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. The, the virtual school courses are actually already built out for the student to select a 36 week pace or an 18 week pace. Mm -hmm. And so a student could select the 18 week pace and the modules are paced out for the student to complete it more aggressively. Um, that's actually the easiest pivot of all <laughs> is, is that site. Okay. Yeah. So just to bounce off of that one really quickly, it almost seems like if we're gonna do this, it has to be all or nothing. You know, and so if we have students transferring from one school to another, yeah. we can't. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, it, it's going to happen if they're coming that's, in and out of that's county. Obvi but. That's a decision point for the board for Dr. Mullins. Um, Every school has to do it. That's that's one of the decision points. Um, it, you know, at this point, like I said, I've directed schools to explore it. Um, I believe that it, it should be district wide, or I could be convinced not. Um, it, again, we're we're. I, I believe that the benefits outweigh the disadvantages in this year, in this circumstance right now, based on what we know today. <laughs> um, so our, our recommendation right now <coughs> is the exploration district-wide, um, but uh, it's not unreasonable to suggest not. Right now, we have students transferring between these schools all the time, where some students are on block not. It's messy, it's icky, we deal with it now. Um, Astronaut and Titusville swap students with great regularity. Um, Space Coast, um, even when I was at Cocoa High, we'd get students from Titusville and Astronaut and Block. So counselors, schools are accustomed to that. Um, I'm not gonna say they love that, <laughs> but they are accustomed to that challenge. And then the testing schedule you had gone through. Yep. So a kid takes an AP course or anything in the first semester, they still have to test per state standards in the second half. Yes, sir. So what we used to do is just double those up and put a uh, semi class you just ran them through from one to the next so like in some blocks they would have like an American government and the AP government or something like that is that kind of what your thought process is there? um ish you get another ish answer okay. um it, in some schools yes in other schools it's not possible because the volume of AP courses students take mm -hmm. um we have schools with 27 28 AP course offerings and students take a really heavy load so um Government is a great example to do that because it's really only a semester course. It's an actual AP semester course. Right. So when student, when schools do that, they're providing students additional content. And that's a really common model. Um, other students might have a full array of AP courses students at. Um, our big AP schools, of course, West Shore, Edgewood, Satellite, Vieira, Merritt Island, they have huge AP enrollments. Um, that's not necessarily gonna be possible in that framework. And that's why I mentioned we'd be looking at that potential eighth block, second semester, to provide students an opportunity to engage with practice materials in preparation of the exam. Okay, thank you. And then I, yeah. and I had just one more. I, did we look at, and, and, and I'm sorry if I get slayed on this one. Um, we, when I was teaching, I took over, I, I started the teaching academy at Space Coast. That was our, we wrote the curriculum, we were part of the adoption process to the DOE, and then I taught it. And in that class, we had the students stayed inside of a wheel so that we all taught the same kids so meaning that the same kids that were inside my classroom those 25 30 kids went to they were a cohort mm -hmm. that moved through did we look at and i know this is kind of outside the box thinking but have we looked at setting up tracks classes of academies meaning that if you're a teacher if you're a student these are the classes that you can take and then you're on that together. Did we look at possibly putting as many of those kids in cohorts together? Yeah. Like that, that scheduling to me on a seven day seemed a lot more than the transition here. Did we look at that? So um, we do some cohort pathways right now and those are typically four classes a year. Um, and all of our academies by design have cohort pathways. Right. Um, however, with a cohort pathway comes a limitation of options and choice. And um, in just my interpretation of what this board and district has stood for, <clears throat> choice and flexibility has always been high on the list. 
And so our, our students that choose the academies opt into that cohort plan, and it's a really great fit. It creates a common culture. But a lot of students and families really want to have the flexibility and choose the courses that they want to choose. And they also have uh, math is always a unique situation. We want to make sure courses are leveled for students. We don't want to, uh, some students are really strong in the language arts. They might want advanced placement there, but they might really struggle in mathematics or the sciences. And so um, a cohort pathway assumes commonality in choices and commonality in levels. And um, so yeah, we absolutely thought about those things. However, I'm always weighing things. I, I weighed with what I've seen as this board always really uh, championing choice and options. Mm -hmm. So again, in a, in a COVID crisis, we're, and, and I'm happy to, to pivot in my recommendations as well. Um, and so in preparation for today, I just keep in mind what I've seen and heard from the board and tried to honor what I've seen as the value of our district. But again, nothing's off the table. <laughs> Right. No, yeah. and I and I agree with you. I so you're looking today for a recommendation from us of whether we want to move forward with exploring this option, and would you like that at the end? Is what what are we, what are you asking from us today over this? Um, you know, I I'd, I will not pretend to understand like protocol, um, um, but I believe Dr. Mullins and I in general, the team, the entire group on different points, just keep working the direction. We want you to pivot on that direction. I think there's a process the way you guys consensus what you tell him to do. Um, Dr. I'm Mullen. gonna assume you're gonna tell me as a group if you don't want me to proceed down that option or uh, whatever, I've got my pen in hand, I'm ready to go. But I'm gonna defer to the boss, Mr. Gibbs, and you all on what that looks like. Dr. Mullins. So, yes, uh, by the end of our conversation, uh, by the end of the workshop today, we do need clear direction from the board that uh, we proceed down the path that we presented or we put something on pause and look at, look in another direction uh, <clears throat> or the board makes an explicit decision that, no, we're, we want this wording or this expectation or this uh, requirement to change so that we can do the work that needs to be done in preparation for Tuesday, uh, Tuesday at the board meeting when we present the final. Because everything you are receiving today and, and the public is hearing is in draft. So when I'm asked, so I, in a, and I'm sorry I'm taking a lot of time on this. This is just my area that I, I lived, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're supposed to tell you kind of what, what we're, you would like us to move forward or not. You're going to go back to your principals and say, guys, you've, you've thought about this. Give me the feedback. And then some of the questions that we have will get answered between now and then. And then we come back on Tuesday for a technical vote. But if over the weekend, two or three of us change our minds and we come to that meeting, at that meeting would be the discussion point of whether we're going, we would be able to pivot at the meeting from one to the other. Or are you looking at once we do this, that recommendation's coming and you've put so much into it that we gotta make that decision there. Well, I, I would suggest that, you know, every, every day we're prepared to pivot. I mean, because that's what we've been living for three months. So we would ask for the best direction the board can give us at this time in preparation for Tuesday. We would bring forward what that represents and if for some reason there is new direction or there is different direction from other uh, external circumstances or sources, we would have to do that anyway. Um, Dr. Sullivan, with her administrative team, is continuing to explore uh, and examine the feasibility of the block recommendation. I can't tell you today that that is even going to make it to Tuesday, uh, yeah. but that's what we're working toward. Um, if that is something the board is not supportive of at this moment, we'd appreciate feedback today. from the board today <laughs> so we can put just put that aside and not move forward. Um, okay. I, I would at the same time ask the board to be cognizant of how many additional directions we're requested to take because um, the capacity of, of our, our team is, is really taxed at this time and time is of the essence. Um, we're down to approximately three and a half weeks before teachers report and 
three and a half weeks and two days when typically we start providing schedules to students for first round when they return, particularly to secondary schools. So uh, at the same time, we were just presented from the Department of Education confirmation of funding for innovative learning options that our, uh, our elementary team is putting together and so on. So, you know, at the same time, we are a very malleable organization at this time, but uh, we're, we're running out of time to be, become, you know, continue to be super flexible, uh, just because logistically meeting the demands of all of the, the details of what we need to do uh, is, is running short. So I, uh, is that what you're looking for, Mr. Susan? Yeah, I just, so the, the plan is due on the 31st to the, to the state. The 14th is our board meeting next week. I just didn't, I mean, this is a plan that we just proposed today. That's asking the district principals and everybody else to make a decision in five days. Ms. To Mr. switch. Susan, let me clarify what's due the 31st. Yes. Um, the, our plan is inclusive of a number of things that has nothing to do with the state requirement. The state requirement is really targeted at instructional models differ than what is normal. So in this case, it's primarily the elementary e-learning model that is what needs to be to the state for approval. And so all of our documentation on it will be how that meets those assurances of a high quality education. All of these other things are local decisions. No, and, and I appreciate that. Dr. Mullins, one of the greatest things about you and I is we're kind of a yin and yang on the things about making decisions fast and then thinking about them and going through the process, right? It scares me to think that in five days we would flip the entire district to a block and make that decision without really thinking it through. Like I just, while we were sitting here, now I'm gonna ask is um, what about ESC push-in and all that mm -hmm. stuff at the schools? We have some of the higher ESC population schools how does that work? How do they work on block? How does yeah, that? Good question. So all of those services, of course, will continue to be provided for students. There is uh, one risk to uh, a data indicator, so I want to be clear about that. Um, one of the measures that we look at to make sure students are being served in the least restrictive environment is their number of minutes with non-disabled peers. And it is calculated based on the percentage of their day in with non-disabled peers. And so typically in most of our high schools, we would want our students in the vast majority of their schedule with non-disabled peers, typically six out of their seven classes. Maybe they have one class that's learning strategies, that's all students with disabilities. That percentage in a six out of seven is still a really high percentage. So a huge percentage of their day is still with non-disabled peers. In a block schedule, if they have a period of learning strategies or social emotional learning or a class that's really designed to provide targeted support for students with disabilities it is inherently a greater percentage of their day and so um, in a in a case i gave where lre is what is the number we use least restricted environment in a six out of seven with that one class that's a high percentage <clears throat> in a block schedule that's automatically going to be down to 75 percent so again, this being a one year recommendation for the district, it would be something we probably have to explain and justify, um, but there is an explanation. We didn't start putting kids in more restrictive classes. The framework of the district changed um, and there would have to be some creative professional development along with Chris's team. Again, learning from our, our friends at Titusville and Astronaut on some best practices. Um, but there would be no elimination of services. We would just have to turn our, our heads a little bit. And Chris, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, the IEP teams are gonna need to meet. It is, mm -hmm. it is we discussed this at length, it's, yeah. it's hard. Um, the pivot's gonna be hard. And the fact of the matter is, um, I, 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 when first this came to me, I was going through my heads of, head of all the reasons why we couldn't do it. Um, but after dealing with COVID cases for the past um, two or three months and ever increasing stories of it um, uh, here or near here or in our schools or near our schools, 
and thinking about what that's going to be like when we have 2,200 kids that show up at a school and we have to start talking about excluding kids from school and, the, and kids that they came into contact with. Um, I have to weigh safety over hard. And so it, it's going to be a challenge if that's the direction that we go and it is going to have an impact on the work of, of the people who work with students with disabilities. But as far as the services to them, um, you should not see a change in that. You, you should see that students are still being supported. Um, IAs are still going to push in, support facilitation is still going to happen, um, classes are still going to meet. It's going to be a matter of IEP teams meeting, LRE being an issue, working with the state to make sure they understand that and don't penalize us. But um, I think you summed it up well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think Ms. Belford said that we're going to, I guess we'll give you that direction at the end of the meeting. Sorry to go with the, it's just this is my, my please, thing that, please so thank don't. you. Please my, don't. My response is the same to all the comments. Like, this is what we're here for, and I'm so thankful of the board's time. This is not something, this is hard. This is not something that we're going to sit and say, we should do this, it's the right answer. It is, let's keep massaging these <clears throat> answers to try to do the best we can in the situation we're in. And then I just had one last one was on page, or slide 25. Schools will identify students not equally supported in self-assessment at home and develop a plan. We, we haven't gotten to we that, haven't gotten that yet. one yet. <laughs> okay, I'm turning that one over to Chris Moore. Hang, hang with <laughs> me. Sorry. You're ahead right, of the game, it. Mr. Susan. I have a, Ms. Duskovich. Uh, the more we're talking about this, I'm concerned about, it was it AP classes you said that you can only test at the end of the year, right? It wasn't yes, IB year. Mm -hmm. so, I just keep thinking about West Shore and Edgewood, and I'm wondering if block scheduling is going to be, what is the percentage? Of, I, I think all their students take AP classes, and some of them, if I recall, have pretty much all AP classes at some point. So is this going to be a harder fit for them, is question one. And two, uh, Ms. Campbell said that it's kind of an all or nothing thing. Is that, or she thought maybe it would be an all or nothing thing. Is that true or could there be an exception for West Shore and Edgewood or would that look inequitable? I, you know, how, how could that play out? Could we single out two schools? Because they're smaller schools too. Yes, they, they're not yes, facilitating 2,500 yes. kids. <laughs> like um, yes, yes, schools. yes and yes. I mean, that's obviously a direction that um, we could, we would uh, look at it the direction of the board, no question. Um, so yeah, it, it presents unique challenges in those two schools. Um, so the question is, what's the bigger risk? So uh, again, I, I wrote down something Ms. Campbell said earlier that grieving the loss, right? So that it's, it's, it's in my mind. Um, we, we keep doing this dance of, I still wanna do this, but we have to do this. I still wanna do this, I have to do this, right? It, and it's normal, it's normal that you guys are going back and forth. We have been living in this dream our principals have. And so at some point we have to say, if we're trying to suggest West Shore and Edgewood could look exactly the same, it would imply that they're insulated from all of these other issues that are causing us to make these recommendations. And so if we were not in a global pandemic, <laughs> I wouldn't be making this recommendation. And so the question is, what is more important in those students and those families? Um, less contact, less transition, less class change, less touch, or preserving what they've always done. I will leave the five elected <laughs> officials along with my boss to try, you know, we've weighed out our recommendation painting over exactly what you're saying. So will it look and feel differently? Yes. Will it be exactly what they're used to? No. Will there be some things that are better for some students? Yes. Uh, as, as parent who's, children have been through these programs, there's also a lot to be said when you have seven of them at the same time, right? So mm -hmm. having four of them at the same time with the load that they have, there's also a positive to that too. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine in our West Shore and our Edgewood communities, much like the community feedback we've gotten, there's gonna be very different opinions and perspectives within the teaching population. One teacher may want to be um, unwavering on the way we've done it. It's really worked well for them. It's effective. Another one, the concerns about contact may outweigh their desire to keep it the same. And that's the challenge that we're in as public educators right now, that 
every human being experiencing this pandemic has a very different feeling on the right fit for them. So it's your recommendation that this is all secondary schools go to block scheduling? It's my recommendation okay. that if we can make the schedules work, that all do because of the protection of less context, less class exchange, less class change, and the, the, the safety to our students and staff, given the calls I know that Chris Moore gets, <clears throat> given the fact that that AP teacher that wants those seven classes and those kids may get ill, um, given that it's not all things equal, given all those unknowns, this school year is going to turn us all upside down. And as much as we think we can anticipate what it brings us, and you would think the three of us more than anybody would be able to feel it because we live every comment, we're just beginning the unknowns. So will it make some people unhappy? Of course. <laughs> but again, I pick safe. Okay, just one more question, and this actually goes back to Ms. <coughs> Klein. We can go back, you know, 15 pages or whatever. Um, Only four. I think it was yeah. like three. <laughs> it feels like 15 pages. I was thinking about in our elementary schools how uh, s some and not all uh, switch classes by sixth grade. They rotate around. Uh, that didn't seem to be addressed in here. Maybe are, are, we, are we doing something in that area, limiting to just two switches, or all, are we still letting them switch for all classes, or how's that going to work? So. Um, we want to minimize the risk for our teachers as well. Um, and so we are in discussion whether uh, we m allow teachers to departmentalize um, because that's putting a teacher with four different groups of students. So that's adding more exposure to our elementary teachers. Mm -hmm. Everything we're trying to do is minimize the risk to not only our students but the adults um, every adult in our building. So when you think of things that keep us up at night, it's that safety of everyone. It's the safety of everyone in this room because we laugh and joke, the three of us, that if one's going, we're all going we're all because we've been together way too much lately. But we have to think every person we're in contact with and we're not totally socially distancing or we're not wearing our mask, we're at minimum, you know. So when you're in contact with me, I've been in con my husband. So there's me, my husband, and now our, uh, uh, Stephanie and, and Chris. So now I've exposed my home to them through what's on. So I don't want exposure. I want to minimize the exposure to all of our teachers. So we're debating and, and really debating and, um, and the team that's working on that, on this uh, e-learning, it's been in great conversation with them because we don't want anyone to become ill. Uh, we don't want a child exposed, I don't want a teacher, I don't want a cafeteria worker, our custodians, all these people it, you know, Brevard Public Schools is one, we're one. And it doesn't matter how long we are and how narrow we are, we're one voice, we're one community. And we support each other. We, all, we don't all agree, and we're not always going to agree on most things, but we do agree for one thing, and that's we take care of each other. So if nothing else, we have to take care of of, I have to have the responsibility of taking care of the 57 elementary schools and the contact that we're having with others. So long drawn out uh, answer is we are taking departmentalizing under consideration. We're also taking under consideration um, some of the activity classes and where do we have the teacher move or the students move? Do we have kids moving down the hall when it's not necessary? All of those things are swirling in our heads. Thank so you. I just I, I just want to add some context and some numbers to that so that you have this in the back of your head as you weigh out these decisions. If there is a student who is COVID positive, 
we may, and I use the word may because it can tend, it, it, there's a lot of factors that weigh into it, have to close a building down for three days, 24 to 48 hours, so that the rooms are safe to go into before cleaning and then a day for cleaning. All of the contacts to that case would then be excluded from school for 14 days. So when you look at students transitioning through four, first, uh, four fifth grade teachers, that means every fifth grade teacher would be excluded from school for 14 days. That means all of those students would be excluded from school for 14 days. And that's why the minimizing contacts is so important because it's the difference between possibly shutting down a school for three days for cleaning and excluding a small group of students from school for 14 days and giving them services through our continuity of instruction plan or having a large group of people have to be excluded from school for 14 days and then having to shut the building down because we don't have enough people to safely operate it. And I'll be talking more about that when we get to my, uh, the COVID section, but um, it does weigh into this decision making as we talk about why minimizing contacts are so important. Thank you both. Anyone else have uh, questions to revisit? <clears throat> um, Dr. Sullivan, one of the things that, and first let me say I, I appreciate immensely uh, the work that you, you have done with your team and, and the tough decisions that you're making, all of you. Um, what is our, how does Brevard Virtual versus in-person, in-building versus dual enrollment impact our funding per student? So we earn an FTE on all those enrollments. And so where we don't earn FTE is on Florida Virtual School. Florida Virtual School is very hard on our budget. And so we certainly want any students who, and parents who are exploring a virtual option to consider Brevard Virtual School, and it's our teachers, there's a principal to reach, you know, all those things that are really powerful in a school. Um, so homeschool and Florida virtual school are the two greatest hits to our funding. Um, there are some, you know, minor tweaks in, in all of the rest of it, so I, I can't give you a perfect breakdown, but the way dual enrollment works is we earn the FTE for the student in that dual enrollment class, and then we pay Eastern Florida for that class. And so we earn it and then we pay, and, and it's not a perfect dollar equal, and there's, there's some discrepancy in that. Um, so yeah, increasing flexibility you know, has a potential for some impacts to our budget. Um, I, I don't believe dramatically, but we've, this is new territory of sort of explosi exploding flexible options. Mm -hmm. um, and I can promise you that weighs very heavily on Dr. Mullins. Um, <laughs> He has paced down to my office more times than I can count um, on those very same questions. And so we'll be doing a little bit more exploring with our FTE team here and the DOE. And um, sometimes the public communication on how that's funded is fuzzy. So we are pulling it apart to make it unfuzzy on how the state communicates it. Um, that being said, uh, this year will be the first year there'll be bonus funding for dual enrollment. So that's a positive as well. Uh, we do receive bonus FTE in certain circumstances, and um, bonus FTE for dual enrollment is something we anticipate this year that we have not had in the past. Um, and they've also added bonus FTE for capstone, and that increases a student's potential with another block and block scheduling. So there are some things that might be a stressor on the budget. There's other things that might actually assist the budget because of students' ability to take more accelerated courses, students' abilities to pass more industry certifications. So that's why it's a, some of the things that cost us also help us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's why the math is a little <clears throat> difficult to assess um, in that circumstance. Thank you for that explanation. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> just in, in trying to think outside the box. Um, 
and you probably have looked at this and probably can tell me why I'm ludicrous to think that that would be feasible. Um, looking at our classroom situation and just trying to make all of these pieces fit while addressing the um, contact issue, right? Minimizing contact, minimizing exposure. If we have a classroom, say, um, I'll say a middle school algebra class, right? Um, and typically that middle school algebra class would have 28 kids in it, would that 28, 30, something like that, maybe? I'd like to say 25, but it'll okay. be a 25. whole bunch of teachers telling me otherwise. Okay. Um, <laughs> so on <we're> average, 25. <laughs> okay. Um, so just from just a numbers crunching game, mm -hmm. right? It would seem to me like if we could get 13 of those students to want to stay home but participate in the live classroom with the other 13 students that are in the class and that teacher, it would seem to me like that would decrease our contact, the, the number of interactions that we have, the number of people that we have, the number of bodies in the class, um, but would still maintain that student's ability to be a part of that class, to um, we, we would still be well within class size and it wouldn't shift so much funding. And w was there any consideration given to that when you were looking at our options? Oh, for sure. So a situation like that in a secondary setting would only work if every teacher in that child's schedule is serving all those purposes. Mm -hmm. and. And I can assure you, Dr. Mull and I have talked about that scenario at great length. So for example, that math teacher would be um, servicing the kids in front of them. We absolutely need them to serve the kids in front of them who are in a weird state of distance learning and provide an equally assurance-driven, robust experience for those kids in their classroom at the same time. And so picture the math quiz, the math test, picture some of those things that we know in terms of integrity around authentic student work went a little by the wayside in our emergency at home learning. And um, that's a really big lift of the teacher. And so given all the other adjustments, the fact that that teacher might be out themselves for 14 days, and then I have a sub, if I can get one, doing that live and synchronous and this child's story. And I just landed at reasonableness, because the only way that works in a secondary is if every teacher in that student state does it because of all the different courses, unlike um, our elementary friends have come up with a great solution that makes sense with a K-6 certification. Mm -hmm. And so, again, we've talked about it a lot, and I can certainly um, take whatever feedback the board provides. Um, I don't know that we have the capacity to stand up another option, um, but I was uncomfortable with what that would require of our teachers. Okay. And um, we would have to ensure that child at home Part of those insurances are they're getting their therapies, they're getting their supports. Like we, the, the DOE will only support it if all of those aspects are guaranteed for those students. The other two considerations on that were if we're doing a, a live class and streaming, um, there's a, an equipment concern that also has an expense attached to it, and there's also a FERPA concern um, the teacher would not be able to address uh, kids by name. The camera could only be on them. Um, th 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 there's, there were a couple of other layers of concerns added to that as well, just to keep in mind. It, 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 it would be the capacity of our teachers, the, the, the asks of them, when they too are concerned about their own medical fragility, <laughs> and just all of that combined, um, I, I think was the challenge where we landed at that not being our key recommendation. Okay. 
And then follow up to that, and, and similar, you had, you had mentioned, so what if the teacher is out? Mm -hmm. um, if we have a teacher who has to go out, is there an opportunity for that teacher to continue to teach from home with another responsible adult in the classroom rather than, like, I trust me when I say I know it's not ideal, right? But if we have the opportunity to have a skilled teacher who is willing and able to teach their content from home, I would think that that would be a better solution than to have a substitute who's unfamiliar with the content or... Um, so I'm going to say when a teacher goes out. Yeah, and I really um, think it goes to, to Beth Betty because, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> where, where I was going to uh, say is those are all kinds of terms that I, I, I don't know how, what is appropriate when a person is home on leave and all those kinds of things. There's, so I, I'm going to defer to Dr. Thetty on that question, and I would imagine it's a question in progress. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. It is a question in progress, and I, if, if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us that there are things we can do that we haven't considered in the past. Um, it's a good question. It's something that we have thought about. Um, some of it has bargaining implications that we would have to work through, um, but it depends. You know, We want our teachers to be safe and healthy also, and if somebody's ill, having them teach at home is probably not the best idea, but um, we'll have scenarios where somebody's quarantined but they're asymptomatic and they never become symptomatic. And I believe that's what you're talking about. Right. And I think those are all things under consideration. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that that was all of the questions that I had for you, Dr. Sullivan. Does yes. any board member need to circle back with Dr. Sullivan on any <laughs> issues of the secondary thank plan? Thank you. Thank of you so course. much. Thank of you. Course. We appreciate you and, yeah. and your team and all that that you're doing. And thank you for changing your schedule all day long for this. I, she's amazing. Yeah. I, I, by my. I already texted her and said, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so I need to ask I, you some questions. I so do that believe, you, yeah, uh, we are getting it. I have lots of questions for Patty. <laughs> should we start thinking about dinner, Dr. Mullen? No, <laughs> Mr. Susan, we should not. <laughs> We're only halfway. All right, I think, uh, Ms. Moore, we are coming back to you. All right, this next section, it, it has a, a, lot of, um, a lot of things that we grappled with in a lot of different areas. And so just so that you know, uh, we looked at several different factors. One was the community input, of course. Um, the second was of, uh, the feedback from medical professionals. But two of the other factors that we had to consider was our ability to implement and um, our ability to manage. And so when we start talking about things like health screenings and uh, face masks and trans, uh, tr uh, transportation, and, um, a, a, oftentimes our conversation rolled around to our ability to implement and our ability to manage. And then the final factor is, of course, uh, school board input. So it won't surprise you to hear me say that there are several things in, in this section that that you guys are going to grapple with and, and come and hopefully come back to us with a, 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 a strong direction on which way to go. So the first area is um, health screenings. And one of the things that we know is that we are dependent. We are absolutely 100% dependent on um, our community and our families. Um, all of this starts in the home, parents um, taking precautions with their kids parents uh, or guardians ensuring that if their child is in contact with somebody who is case positive that they um, know what to do and know how to inform us and for health screenings is the fact that parents will start their day with a health screening now yesterday at four o'clock the cdc sent out new guidelines for health screening so that's not included in this i've already forwarded it to mike alba because he's developed the uh, him and his team developed the screenings for employees and we want to stay consistent and use the same screening so we'll be we'll be already modifying this based on the cdc guidelines that we got last night um, but one of the things that i think everybody needs to be aware of and, and jump in here and correct me if i'm wrong um, but the last number i heard was 50 percent of our um, covid positive uh, cases they don't run temperatures thank you so it's the, that temperature check that everybody um, that I'm reading about and that everybody's asking for 
uh, is not necessarily going to be the thing that's the indicator that a child is uh, is sick. Um, and so one of the things that we ask is, parents, you guys know your kids best. You know when they're just not feeling well. Maybe they're a little bit paler. Maybe they're a little bit listless. Um, but if they're not feeling well, keep them at home. We also know that there are going to be students with different levels of support at their family. You know, their parent might uh, work a late shift and, and be sleeping. Um, there might not be the necessary supplies at home to take a temperature. So one of the things that we said is, all right, we're going to we're going to depend on parents to do the first level of health check and we're going to give them the questions that to ask and the steps to take um, but we know that there are going to be students coming to school every day that aren't necessarily asked those questions and so those are the group of students that we're going to identify and each school is going to set in, in place a, um, a process for making sure those students get screened uh, we are dependent on the um, uh, the nurturing of our schools and the understanding that this is a very private health screen. Um, so we are, we are going to manage that at the front of the house and not at the back of the house at the classroom level. So that's, that's step numbers one and two. The second thing is we wanted to make sure that parents knew if your child is sick and you keep them home, that's an excused absence. We are not, we're, we're not giving any awards for perfect attendance. If, uh, you know, I apologize to those parents who um, are, are looking at a, a, a long stretch of, of a perfect attendance award, that is not happening next year. We are not, uh, we're not even, not, there's not a school in the district that's going to do it. Um, and so back to your point about the chronic illness form, we need to make sure we're getting the message out long and clear, uh, loud and clear. Parents. Um, we're, you, are, you are going to be the determinant factor of whether your child is excused or not from attendance that day. For those, um, for those students who are asymptomatic, uh, they, they either are sent home because they're ill and are awaiting testing or have been tested and are asymptomatic, we're going to make sure that we have a continuity of instruction plan for them. We're going to have so many different scenarios. Uh, to Stephanie's point when she talks about, um, you know, all of the ways in which we already serve students. We're going to have students that are out because routine normal illness. We're going to have students that are out and they're too ill to work. We're going to have students that are out for three days, for 14 days. We may have a school shut down and we need to be responsive to all of that. And so one of the things that we have said repeatedly is as soon as we get this plan done, then we have to look at all of those scenarios and how we are going to work with those students. And finally, uh, on this page is just that we want to prioritize health. We want to prioritize health over anything else. Um, we're going to work in the background and make sure that instruction happens and we're going to be doing monitoring. Uh, we're going to do our best to meet all of the services that students are, are, um, are uh, required to get. and um, and through all of that, the context has to be, we're protecting the health of that student, we're protecting the health of our employees, and we're protecting the health of the rest of the students in the school. But all of that kind of depends, not kind of, it does depend on our parents and our parents being responsive. And so um, we wanted to make sure to list out some of the things that we just have to have. Um, the first thing we have to have is absolutely accurate information on parents' contact lists. Um, you know, some of those lists are, are, you could call six phone numbers and, and none of them work. Uh, and so one of the big asks is make sure our contact list is accurate. The second thing, and probably, probably the thing I've been questioned about the most, um, quite frankly, be, besides, besides my COVID questions, has been, well, what do we do if a, if a, if a kid is sick and the parent just doesn't come and get them? And so that is another area in which we have got to have parents uh, responsive to the schools and cooperate with the schools. If we call you and your child is, is ill, we need you to come and pick that child up as soon as you can or to make arrangements for your child to become, come and pick up as soon as you can. In, in the meantime, the schools are going to be working on a management plan for that. But, uh, you know, one student 
uh, is manageable to students. We've, we've now crossed a bridge where we, we can no longer have a functioning um, clinic and manage two ill children and keep them separate because we have now just exhausted the three people that we have that are trained to do anything for the clinic. Um, we need to make sure that our parents are completing accurate medical uh, information for our schools. Every year they, they complete a medical card. And uh, as you guys know, sometimes as we go through elementary school, things are really specific and detailed. And then as we get up through middle school, less so. And by high school, some of our information is, is not at all as complete as it needs to be. We want to encourage parents to really take the time and make sure that medical information is filled out uh, absolutely correct. correct. We want to ensure that if parents are leaving town, that they complete it uh, in the local parentis form, and we know who's responsible for that student. There are any numbers of occasions when students are sick, and we try to call and reach a parent, and we find out that mom or dad uh, or the guardian is out of town for uh, you know for work or for for whatever, um, and that they're staying with somebody else. And that somebody else, we don't have authority to just hand a sick child off to. So um, we're going to make sure we push out to parents. If you have to leave town and you leave your child in somebody else's care, we absolutely have to have an local parentis form done. And finally, it goes without saying, all medications do need to be brought in directly to the clinic by the parent uh, as needed. That's, that's always been our policy. It's just a helpful reminder to everybody. As we begin looking over uh, face coverings and reading um, the feedback from parents, we were pretty much straddling the line between 50-50. Um, you should know that when the first, and I, I don't know that um, Dr. Sullivan said this, I, but she said it in every, every meeting I've been at, so she probably did. Um, as uh, we began to ask for information, we were running pretty much 50-50 on any issue, 50-50 on face masks, 50-50 on temperature checks, 50-50 on school starting. Um, as we've gotten deeper into the crisis in Brevard County, there has been a shift in some of that feedback, and I imagine you guys have felt it and heard it in your offices. Um, I, we included the American Academy of Pediatrics information on face masks. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet, um, but we included it in there so that you can have it. And I'll be quiet for just a minute to give you a chance to at least skim it. And so this is one of those areas that we need, um, we really need to hear the, the will of the board. We really need to hear what your input and feedback is. Uh, currently, our recommendation is that we strongly recommend um, our employees and our students to wear face masks, and that there are going to be certain circumstances in which it is required. Um, face masks uh, will be required in certain CTE labs, certain instructional settings. Uh, face masks are expected on the bus. Face masks are required if somebody, uh, uh, for example, as critical infrastructure workers, um, if a teacher has a, is a contact to a case, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be quarantined at home for 14 days because as critical infrastructure workers, um, they are allowed to come back and teach as long as they take a, a health screening in the morning at the school and wear a face mask. In those cases, it will be required. Um, any student who is sent to the clinic and is exhibiting symptoms will be required to wear a face mask. And we will have those face masks available both for children and adults at school, um, the disposable ones, if, uh, if students come in and, and want to wear a face mask and, and one isn't available to them from home. Um, there is also going to be face shields available to all faculty members, as Stephanie said earlier. Did I miss anything on face masks? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not implying that all classes all the time. We're, we're, we're suggesting that a teacher could have a lesson where it puts the kids in a vulnerable situation. Um, we're picturing a culinary lab, and so we're picturing they might center around a work block, all be working on food product. In that case, we would anticipate the teacher for that lesson having the students put on a face covering. We do that in a lot of our CTE labs now, some safety precautions. I'm picturing the group of kids under the car in auto body. And so our, our teachers will have discretion if a lesson is better served in that. And to, to some of Mr. Susan's points earlier on some of those activities that are better than spread out, that might be a situation where teacher says to the principal, hey, I wanna do this activity if they wear face masks, you know, so we could see uh, a non-required situation in general the teacher being able to make a decision to be able to conduct an activity, especially um, in some of our career prep courses that require certain things have to be done in order for the students to earn those credentials. Sorry, Ms. Moore. I just, no, 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 I appreciate yeah. it. Um, and I think it's really important to talk about the words strongly, uh, strongly encouraged, because it means different things to different <clears throat> people. Uh, the number one thing that, that we know is going to make a difference is if it's modeled. Um, when you walk around ESF, um, I know for people who may be watching the live streaming, they're looking at all of us saying, you're not wearing your masks. Uh, when we walk around ESF, uh, the, the building here, we all wear masks um, in, uh, in, unless we're in a situation like this where we're talking, um, presenting. Um, so we know that, number one, we're going to ask that uh, our leadership model that. Uh, number two, we're going to make sure that we put out lots of information about how face masks um, do mitigate the illness. Um, it, it, it is, it, it, uh, we have the information from the CDC and the Department of Health that shows that me wearing a face mask protects you, you wearing a face mask protects me, and the two of us wearing a face mask when we're, when we're with each other protects everyone. So um, we're going to make sure to put that message out very strongly to our community and our kids. Um, but like I said, this is one of those areas that we knew we needed to kind of hear the will of the board to know what direction you wanted us to head in uh, for this. Uh, the next year. Ms. McDougall, we have our next question and answer session coming up after slide 33. So we have Ms. Moore from 25 to 32, and then we have Ms. Han at 33, and then a Q&A session. Okay. Yep. Um, so it's not going to surprise you to see hand washing on here, um, and that it is one of the best ways to protect um, ourselves and our families from getting sick. Uh, we're going to make sure that we spend some time teaching our elementary students the proper way to hand wash. Um, and believe it or not, we're going to we're going to take some time to present to our secondary kids the proper way to hand wash. We're going to build in time in the day to make sure that they are uh, have the ability to hand wash, and we're going to make sure that every school, every classroom has sanitizer. It's going to be a concerted effort that as kids enter and leave a room, they hand sanitize. So you can expect, you know, when we always say to the, the teachers, we want you at the doorway greeting kids, it's going to be a greeting and a pump a hand sanitizer, <laughs> and then they're going to see the same as they leave. Um, we're going to make sure that hand sanitizer is available in all the common areas, in the gym, the courtyards, in the cafeteria. Uh, we're going to make sure the bathrooms are fully stocked with, um, with soap and the supplies needed to wash their hands. And we're going to make sure that the outside areas have different uh, stations for hand sanitizer. Uh, transportation. Uh, it, it absolutely provides some unique challenges for social distancing and uh, everybody is going to need to work together to make sure that um, this is a safe environment. Um, so we really want parents to um, enforce with their students what appropriate social distancing would be at bus stops. That's an area that uh, we, don't, we don't really manage and so we really need to make sure that parents are, are working with their students on that. Students are expected to wear masks on bus. Um, the only exception to that would be uh, students that already have a documented medical condition that requires them not to, or students that have um, a sensory issue that is already documented as well. Um, 
again, we're going to have hand sanitizers on the bus. And I talked to Dr. Miller. I'm like, mm, I saw a YouTube video where one caught on fire. And he's like, yeah, we're not using that one. We're using the right one. I'm like, OK. Um, so they, they will have hand sanitizer as they get in and off the bus. Um, students will be assigned a seat. And they will be expected to sit in that assigned seat, even more importantly. Um, we were, we're going to uh, work with our bus drivers and our students to ensure they know what proper distancing is entering onto a bus and, more importantly, exiting off of a bus. The seats will be wiped down in between, uh, in between the routes. And when weather permits, we're going to ask that the buses operate with open windows. Uh, as always, as always, any misconduct on a bus uh, uh, will be brought to the school and could include a, a suspension from the bus. Uh, food and nutrition services. I think that you guys have all seen that probably one of the most vital, I may say the most vital program that we have in our schools is our food and nutrition services. Uh, you know, you go back to what Dr. Sullivan said about Maslow hierarchy of need. They can't learn uh, need. They cannot learn if they are hungry. And Kevin Thornton, and I don't know if you guys have heard this number, him and his team stood up 2.2 million lunches. 2.2 million during this time. And so we want to make sure that um, they were an integral part of this plan. And so uh, he, he has met with us on a, a couple of occasions. Um, and this is their plan. Uh, they will wear masks and gloves during all preparation. Um, there will be hand sanitizer, as I said there. Um, they really would like to minimize the, the exchange of cash money, that, that passing of dollar bills. And so they really want um, for parents to utilize the Meal Play Plus program uh, so that it can be, you know, that there is no, that, that touch interaction isn't happening. Um, they have moved or are, to, are trying to move to all prepackaged items so that there, again, isn't a whole lot of touch moving back and forth. And the lines, much like the line you see in our own ESF cafeteria, have been rearranged to minimize contact as well. Um, uh, I already talked about the grab and go meals and do. Oh, and in between each of the lunches, um, those areas will be cleaned. All those high-touch surfaces will be clean. Uh, and then, of course, there will be a deep clean every day on that area. Uh, we are planning to do a mobile, uh, a mobile lunch. At least he's looking, looking toward that for our e-learning and distance learning, our e-learning option out of elementary, and if we have to go to distance learning because of, of school closures. Uh, needless to say, school nurses are a pivotal, uh, pivotal role in bridging that health care education gap. Um, I, we reiterated here, parents are that first level of health checks, and we're going to keep saying that. Um, clinics are going to be cleaned throughout the day and uh, at the end of the day. Actually, the way it was described to us is different areas have been designated with priority levels, and um, the clinic is the one the, in the highest priority level. Uh, we, again, want our students and staff who are sick to stay home. And uh, we want our parents to understand that any, any student that presents with symptoms of COVID will be sent to the clinic. And they will have a mask put on them. And they will be screened by the clinic. And uh, if there is a temperature over 100, um, they will be sent home. Uh, we all have to keep in mind. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have woken up and you went, oh, my, my throat is scratchy. What, what does that mean? I can just tell you that I've had any number of conversations with the people around this table where we went, oh, my, my, I had a cough. What does that mean? We all have to remember, all of us, our parents, our teachers, our community, that kids get sick. And it doesn't mean they have COVID. We get sick. It doesn't mean we have COVID. So we cannot react in the extreme every time we think. We think something might be COVID. If a kid coughs or if, a, or if somebody comes in and says, my nose is dripping. It is part of why we rely on our healthcare professionals. They have a saying called the, 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 the worried well. The worried well. And I think we're all reaching that point. 
So um, it's really, I'm, I'm grateful every day that we have actual healthcare professionals in our clinics um, that are gonna help us kind of dis discern who is the worried well from who are the truly ill. Again, we expect, we, we just have to rely on our parents to pick up students when they are ill. And um, that child will be, while we are waiting for that pickup, isolated in a separate area, monitored, not alone, but we cannot have a child that may, ha may be COVID positive to be in a room where other kids are coming to pick up medicine and they may be medically fragile. And then once the child leaves that ill area, um, custodian will come in right after that and deep clean that area. Speaking of deep cleaning, I'm gonna pass it over to Sue. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess from the custodial perspective, um, a couple things I wanted to just highlight for everyone is that keeping our schools clean has always been important. And really the, the ways in which we are uh, keeping our schools clean have, have already been in place. We have products that have been validated for keeping our schools clean. So from the custodial perspective, the things that really are changing are more along the lines of the frequency of cleaning some of the tools that we're using for cleaning and some of the ways that we prioritize what's being cleaned, where um, dusting my desk might have been a priority last year at this time, it's definitely not a priority this year at this time. So with limited resources, we're having to look at how we are prioritizing our efforts in keeping our schools healthy and safe for our students and our staff. So in that respect, there's not, there, there aren't a lot of changes in the custodial practices other than the ones that I mentioned. What we're doing from a district-wide perspective is our uh, environmental health and safety team, Jim Powers, Pete Trudnifka, and Jeb Bynum and the guys in EHS have really done a good job trying to, um, trying to communicate protocols. They've written things down that our schools can use, our head custodians can use, our technology folks can use. How do you clean computers? How do you clean business machines? Things like that so that there are reference materials available for folks to use when they're doing really what is, is standard cleaning protocols. We've, um, we have more, more materials. We have more uh, uh, hand sanitizers, hand sanitizer stations. We've experimented successfully with, um, it's, it's a small machine, it looks like about a half size R2-D2 machine that has a, a wand so that you can get under spaces like after I leave this area, you can use the wand to wipe underneath the, the ledge. And it is a way to quickly deep clean a surface. Uh, when we have a positive case, we have some protocols that we can use to do some deep cleaning. Um, and the, each school will be getting one of these small machines to help them do more intensive cleaning when that situation is warranted. But really, as Chris and Dr. Sullivan and Ms. Klein have been saying, uh, the responsibility for health and safety is really shared among the custodial staff, the school administration, students, teachers, everybody is going to have to be diligent and it's gonna have to be thinking a little bit differently and behaving differently than they have in the past for all of us to be successful together. But our team, our EHS team, as well as the rest of the facilities team, we have been and will continue to be a support team for the, for the leading and learning side of the house and for student services, and just to make sure that we are there to support them in whatever ways they need uh, in order to deliver education to our, our kids in our community. So, thanks. Thank I think you, just for, um, Oh, I'm sorry. I think just for our community's sake, um, when we have a, a case or a contact to a case, and I th I've said this before, but I think it's important to reiterate, um, we, we know what the action plan looks like. The area in which that person was, uh, and we do a, a contact tracing our, ourselves, where, where were you, who were you in contact with, that, all of those questions, that gets shut down for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, Jim Powers, Pete Trinica, and his team uh, contact the head custodian and the principal, make arrangements to go out to that area, deep clean that area. I don't think you talked about the mister. I did. Do you want to, you did? Mm -hmm. Oh, 
I, bl I blinked out on you for a minute, Sue. Um, they can, in, in, in larger areas, they can bring um, those pieces in. It, it, we have a plan and a process in place, and we have actually already uh, been implementing it. Um, so I, I, I am interested when we get the strike team um, up and running, as soon as we get those five people hired, I know it's gonna be a huge help to our schools. Thank you, Ms. Moore, and thank you, Ms. Han. Um, <clears throat> I must say that I think that um, we probably have the best, most mission committed facilities team that I think exists throughout <clears throat> definitely the state, if not the nation. Um, we are so very appreciative of, of your, uh, your entire team just has really wrapped their head and their hearts around the mission of the district. And so thank you for, for all that you do all the time as well. Um, Ms. McDougal, I believe that you had indicated that you had some questions based on this section of slides. Do you want to go ahead and go? I do. Thank you. Um, first, let's go back to page <clears throat> excuse me, 26, which is the responsibilities of parents and legal guardians. And I think we all know that, all, I won't say oftentimes, there are some parents who feel, for whatever their circumstances are, that they have to bring their child to school. And they will do whatever they can to make sure that child goes to school. So let's say the, the student comes back and has a few symptoms. And of course, you know, it may not even be COVID. It could be something else. We, we don't have any consequences when they don't pick up their kid and it's still, you know, 3.30, 4 o'clock and the poor student is still sitting in the clinic or not in the clinic, in the um, room that's separate from the clinic. Um, so are, do we have any consequences? Is there anything that we can do or is that just like, we're gonna trust them to do what's right. And I wanna, most of our parents do do what is right. But I am concerned of what about the parents that let the students sit there all day? Yeah, we, uh, consequences, I, I don't, um, yeah, we don't have the ability to have consequences, but we do have um, tools. And so, you know, we, we have social workers uh, who help us in areas where, you know, some of the reason why parents maybe are unable to come and get their student is because they don't have transportation uh, or because they're not even, I mean, we have some parents that work in jobs where they're not even allowed to take a phone call, literally are not allowed to take a phone call. And so working with our social workers to figure out what the, uh, what the impediment is for them picking up their, their child, it goes a long way to building relationships. Um, but we, but you are correct, we also have, um, some parents that, uh, that, that, that that's not the case. Um, we do work closely and collaboratively with our partners at Children and Families. If children are in, in our schools and are at risk and aren't being taken care of, uh, we have good relationships with um, our school resource officers as needed. If students, uh, for some students who are left after hours for a lengthy period of time, they help us um, get those students home into a responsible family member. So we have tools. Um, but I, I would not say we have consequences. Okay. Um, kind of along the lines, let's say we do have a, um, a student uh, that shows symptoms of COVID. And they're symptomatic. They can't smell. They might be running a fever. They may not be running a fever. Um, what's the... How do we know that either they got tested or that they're symptom-free? How do we how do we deal with that? How is how are we going to handle that situation before returning back to school? So um, again, th th that is one of our biggest challenges. It's a great question, and it's our biggest challenge because again, kids get sick, um, and so we can't necessarily assume every child that's sick has COVID. Uh, and to be frank, I've had a lot of conversations with our, our, our partners in the Department of Health. Uh, they cannot force anybody to be tested. Uh, we cannot force anybody to be tested. What we can say is we can determine if there is a presumptive case, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. But a presumptive case is you have had contact with somebody who is uh, COVID positive and you have some symptoms. Um, we do not have to wait on a test 
to tell us that you should be quarantined at home for 14 days if you have a presumptive case. Um, so we can make some decisions based on symptoms, but um, we, it, it is one of our biggest challenges that there are going to be factors that are protected by HIPAA and um, that, we, that we have no control over. And so we'll work with our Department of Health partners and we'll work with our clinics and we'll work with our families uh, and we will still have cases that, um, uh, that we have to deal with later. Okay. Well, That's a horrible I'm answer, uh, Ms. McDougall, I'm sorry. Well, no, 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 it, it is what it is. And I, I just think people need to know um, some of the things that we struggle with. Yeah. Um, so here's one that I know that will be very divisive for many people, but I feel I need to bring it up. And, you know, we are a, a, a organization that bases things on data. We're data driven in so many ways. And so now, with the data showing that if people wear face masks, that it mitigates the disease, I don't understand why we are strongly recommending. And I know I will upset so many people. But on the other hand, I know other people won't be upset. So if students in Great Britain, if students in Japan, if students in, other, in Korea can seem to wear face masks and their teachers can, are our kids less capable? I, I really don't understand how we, how some people feel that our kids are less than um, able to learn like everyone else. I have been, when I go out, I certainly wear a face mask, and I salute um, the admin that people will start wearing face masks because I think it's important. We're protecting each other. And safety is our primary concern along with educating our children. And we can't educate them if they are sick. So I am really um, concerned that we're just strongly recommended. So that's my soapbox for face masks. But I feel that I needed to bring it up and needed to talk about that. My last issue is um, the cafeteria. I can't imagine how that's going to look. Um, I've been in the cafeterias. And, you know, kids are sitting side by side. They're talking. They're having fun. This is one time where they get to interact with each other. <laughs> um, I, I don't envy our principals on trying to, to solve this, but there's a question. How, are we going to have, I heard, I think, staggered lunches. Um, some schools might have picnic tables, but even picnic table, what do you get? Two at a table? You can't really get six. You don't want six anyhow because, again, you're not the minimum three to six feet apart. But anyhow, I, I just wonder how that's going to look. Um, so those are my concerns and my questions at this point. Ms. McDougall, uh, this is Jane. I can answer um, what we have done with elementary cafeterias. Uh, Mr. Thornton and his team and I went out to Creole Elementary and used that as a um, sample school where we set up that cafeteria to minimize um, students sitting next to each other. And so because of the elementary uh, t uh, cafeteria tables are the bench type seats, we can separate those. You can get three to a side. No student is facing face to face. We flip them around so they're basically in rows just like in classrooms, and in a um, four feet space between the rows. Um, also in the cafeteria line, there are some items that will be prepackaged and some items that will be um, served. Everything will have a covering. I was extremely um, impressed. I, I thought we were going to just discuss um, how they were going to lay out things and they had a full plan with how uh, cookies are going to be packaged, how um, everything down to the way students gather items on the line. So, um, and on the cafeteria line, they're actual um, kind of um, not stickers, but spots on, along the line where a kid needs to stand 
so that they're minimizing distance within the cafeteria line. There's a hand sanitizer uh, just, um, system right before you walk into the line. Students go in. Typically where milk has always been first in the line, it's last in the line. Um, so the order in which um, the food service team has, has put things together. I know that Mr. Thornton and his uh, team are actually working now to get some mock plans up for our secondary schools some, for some alternate uh, locations. We also have the opportunity, um, he was able to purchase, I, I, they're not carts, but they're more like um, probably six foot by three foot mobile devices for grab and go meal options and grab and go breakfast so that students don't always have to come into the cafeteria to get their breakfast. They can be, we can put different distribution stop, uh, spots out. So uh, the plan for the cafeteria is, uh, is a lot further down the, the planning than uh, I had anticipated and it is well thought out and uh, the food service team here at the district is working with all the cafeteria managers to make certain that everyone understands the process. Of course, we're gonna have to do some teaching, uh, but that's what we do. Uh, we're gonna teach our students the processes of going through the cafeteria line. We'll have one entrance into the cafeteria, one entrance out of the cafeteria. So the cafeteria processes are well thought out. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, other board members have questions, comments for this particular section? Sure. Ms. Campbell? Ahead. I'm gonna go backwards just because I think that'll be easier. Um, if I can start with Ms. Han, just I, we have some staff and probably students as well who can be sensitive to cleaners. Mm -hmm. So if I think I heard you say this, but are we basically gonna be using the same type of, same products that we've been using all along just more frequently? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, that, that helps with that. Um, thank you guys for talking about the worried well, because one of my concerns in all of this, and I'll touch on it again when I, I will give my thoughts on the mask issue, is that we're gonna have, you know, mental health, the, the importance of mental health and what we've been talking about over the last several years nationwide, um, globally, I guess, really, um, of our students, that doesn't go away, and if anything, it's ramped up. And I have a specific concern that, that we all have been in living this for the last three or four months, that we're so warped <laughs> that it becomes a, oh my gosh, she's not doing it, oh, she's sneezing, ah, and we're all gonna get ourselves so warped and our students. And I, you know, I have a particular child who, he, he is absolutely a reflection of the emotions of the people around him. And if everybody is getting all up all the time, it's gonna just be disaster for many of our students. And so I just appreciate you making that comment. I think we're gonna have to continually train our brain and encourage one another and remind one another to just breathe and not count coughs. You know, I mean, we need to be responsible, but we just, um, we just need to just realize that there is, there is out there. We live in Florida, nine months out of the year are allergy season for my family. You know, I worry about that sometimes um, with people thinking, oh my gosh, your kid's got a runny nose. Well, sorry, it's the same runny nose every day, it's allergies. Um, but we just, that's just something that we'll have to continually preach as well, along with all this other stuff that every kid who coughs, every kid who sneezes, is not someone you need to send to the clinic. Um, uh, on the bus, transportation. Um, we, no, I think I'm, yeah. So that for masks first. Um, what says for the safety of everyone on the bus, it is expected that all bus riders wear a face covering while on the bus. So that sounds like more of the mandate there mm -hmm. than in other situations. Are we providing those if the students don't already have them, if we're gonna mandate on the bus? Anything we mandate will, uh, and, and again, we didn't use the word mandate, but right. yes, anything we expect, we'll make sure to provide the, the supplies for. Okay. Um, okay, so now I'm just gonna end with my thoughts on the mask. I, um, we, this has been the thing that we've probably got more emails out in this, this week than anything else is masks, along with, you know, alternative virtual programs and things like that. 
um, you know, I haven't been in too many situations in the last few months where I've had to wear a mask all day long. I know many employees around the county are, especially if you're in food service or health or whatever, and so I know it can be done. It's, but I have had recently an opportunity for my children to have to wear a mask for a, an extended period of time, and it's hard. It's very difficult. And there are times when I have looked at my child and said, hey, just pull it off for just a second so you can breathe, because I could just see that buildup of tension, and actually, honestly, he was getting a little pale. Um, and so I know, I hear Ms. McDougall, I hear you, um, about people in other countries and all that, but I just, <laughs> can I just, you know, a lot of times people are saying it's political. It is not political, okay? My opinion my, is my opinion, and it's not based on what anybody told me, because nobody from any political party sent me an email or a text or a phone call and said, hey, by the way, you need to say this about masks. This is my thoughts and my input and the research that I've done, and, and, and some of it's just personal. I just, when we start to say you must, then we're not, we're gonna be in those places where if a kid just needs to breathe for a minute, unfiltered, just breathe and have that space, that's gonna be a no-no. Can't do that. We're gonna have students looking at other students who have these medical reasons why they can be excused from wearing masks and say, why don't they have to wear a mask? And we can't really tell that kid why not because we can't reveal medical personal information. Um, I think we're gonna have a lot of students who do. And I honestly was, has been pleasantly surprised at how my children have dealt with it when they've had to wear it for a long time. They dealt with it. Um, but it's just, there's so much, and, I, and as much as we have had people be very vocal in our county about wanting mandated masks, I have also heard from parents who have said, if that is required, I'm gonna find another option because I'm not sending my kid to school if we have to wear a mask all day. Now, nobody thinks that anybody else thinks differently from them, but that is the case. Um, so I just, I feel like this is good as far as strongly recommending, I, I don't like the idea of mandating for all the reasons that I just stated. My only question to, as far as masks go, is are we going to limit um, in our recommendation of what kids are allowed to wear as employees, are we gonna limit the yeah. types and kinds of masks? Yeah, you're, you're, you, uh, we're putting it in the student code of conduct and you're gonna be getting a policy change from me about face masks, right. it was never an issue before. So uh, we ask that it can only cover um, half of the face, the student has to be identifiable. Right. We ask that it complies to the other, uh, the other requests of the student code of conduct, it can't uh, have an inappropriate um, I I image or saying just right. like we wouldn't allow any other a t-shirt or a hat to have on it. Right. Well, I thought it was because, you know, you go out and you see people with the medical looking ones, you see mm -hmm. people with ones they sewed at home, go behind the ears, whatever, or then there's the really cool ones that are, you can wear around your neck all the time, you <laughs> scarf, it still <laughs> covers half, to fa half your face and mm -hmm. actually those down pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, are we, if we're gonna make it flexible so that, you know, a bandana, you know, whatever it may be. Just well, a bandana would be against dress code, okay. but our, our friend Brian Neal was the one that came over and said, it's a safety issue. We need to be able to identify students. So okay. we, we do have, uh, we have the language in our code of student conduct, but we have to get the policy in front of you as well. Okay, good. All right, well, I think, sure. Yeah. I, I just wanna add a little to transportation because it's been a really robust discussion point amongst all of us and, um, we, we chose the word expected with a lot of deliberation um, because this is a unique situation where the driver's primary objective is eyes on the road, not if Katie in row 18 took her mask off. And so in terms of like deportment and safety and people and the fact that a bus is a uniquely extra vulnerable situation, it, it is expected. However, it's also expected that our bus driver's primary responsibility is eyes on the road and safety of children. And so we're not gonna ask our bus drivers to deter from that either. And so it's a really uh, delicate balance. We, we definitely think a bus is one of those special circumstances where we should say, even if you're not taking the strongly recommended for the rest of the day, we really expect you to do it in this environment but we're not gonna have a bus driver not allow a five-year-old on the bus mm -hmm. because they don't have a mask. And so we, we were very deliberate in the choice of expected
because we think even all of the varying opinions that are true and valid and meaningful to families, I think everybody recognizes the additional vulnerability on a bus. And so um, we do not want to give the impression that a bus driver would be deterring from their primary objective of eyes on the road, just like all of us as parents know the annoyance of our children behind us. Um, imagine your children behind you for 18 rows. And so um, at no point is, is that more important, even though we expect it and believe that even in other environments, we, we think most people would agree that's a pretty extra vulnerable situation. Thank you, Ms. Correct, okay. me, correct me, but we will also provide masks for students as they board on our buses in the event that they don't have one to meet that expectation. Any additional comments or questions, Ms. Campbell? No, I'm done, thank you. Okay, Ms. Duskovich, you wanna go next or? Sure, I don't have any questions, um, but I'm thinking I guess I have to weigh in on my opinion on this whole segment, including the masks. And uh, I know it's a controversial topic I am amazed at what a great job you all did. I think it, it strikes the right balance of expectations. I think our community parents and students are gonna have to step up and have some serious personal responsibility here in doing what's right uh, at the right times. We're gonna have to have a lot of common sense, which isn't necessarily always very common in the world, but we're gonna have to have it in each of our classrooms, by all of our leaders, by all of our teachers, and by our parents. Um, I, I do hope that we're gonna provide masks, especially in the classes where, Dr. Sullivan, I think you mentioned that there might be activities where you, where you have to get closer together. I hope that we have masks available for those situations. Um, but uh, you know, I don't have a ton of comments. I, I like the balance. I like that in, a, in the buses where we're closer, you have higher expectations. Uh, the truth is, is you all have offered a, you know, a whole smorgasbord of options for families and parents, more than honestly I thought we were gonna be able to come up with. And there is a place for families that are still really worried, and rightfully so, worried with, with the status. There's, there's multiple places for them. They can. Um, within our system, right? They can virtual school, they can the e-learning at home. There's just, there's so many places for those that are still really concerned. And the only option for people that are a little less concerned and ready to get their kids back to some normalcy and kids that are maybe struggling with isolationism right now and maybe a little bit of anxiety just from being alone and the only option for them to get back in is to go to a brick and mortar school. And if you're, if you're gonna mandatory mask them, mandatory, um, make it already more uncomfortable. It's already gonna feel weird. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here with only walking one way in a hallway. It may not sound like a big deal, but for kids that have been in the school since kindergarten, and it's now third and fourth grade, and they've been out of school for months, so now you can't go that way, you have to walk this way. Uh, no, you can't turn your desks around, you can only face this way. This is all, these are all things that are already going to feel stressful and uncomfortable to them. And so a mandatory mask on them, I think is, I, I don't, I just don't think that's fair. I think they're going, they're, you know, parents that want to send their kids back want a more normal environment as much as we can with still keeping them safe. And I think you guys have provided this. And so I am I'm thankful for all the work. I can't imagine the hours of debate and discussion and what ifs and, and uh, but the decisions have to be made. And this is the option for those that are ready to move to this. Uh, those that aren't ready, there's still two, three other options for them. So thank you. Uh, Ms. McDougall, you indicated you had an additional question. I did. Um, I just want to put out there, I know that Hillsborough is mandating math in their schools, um, but I also know that Cocoa Beach um, has mandated in their city that if you're in businesses or out and about, you're, you must have a map. So will that impact our school at Cocoa Beach? Or Roosevelt? Or... Yeah, uh, so we, we actually, um, uh, as we have received those orders, we have sent them to your wonderful legal department. 
And so I know that Mr. Gibbs is ready to speak to that. Yes, Jen. Um, as far as uh, cities and other entities regulating us, we are our own entity, and I do not believe that they can mandate us to require masks while in our schools. We are uh, not a public business. You, the, you know, Joe Smith walking down the street can't say, hey, I want to go into that elementary school and check out their kindergarten classroom. They aren't allowed. So we are not open for business like Publix or your gas station on the corner. So they don't get to say your school has to have masks on or your students while they're in your school. This body determines what its students are going to have to do while they're in their school. So that, that's my opinion um, based on the statutes and the interpretations there. We're our own governing entity. They don't get to do that. Um, I know Leon County had issued a directive that even included schools directly and their attorney called them up said hey we're our own legal entity you don't get to regulate us and they are amending their ordinance now to exclude schools for that very reason so i think that that conversation is taking place and the the entities are working it out amongst themselves so i don't anticipate anything i know one of the other cities has a mandate just for public it's like specifically for public places like stores and I think they said they had like six in their entire city so it's like we are not a public location as that's defined normally so I'm not concerned with any of those ordinances coming out now if uh, they're out walking down the street once they're off our campus they might get hit by the cop when they're driving down the street if they're not wearing a mask we can't control that absolutely thanks mr. Gibbs and I, I guess you know my thought about math is there will be times if people, if our students are truly social distance in the classroom, um, I don't foresee them always wearing the mask if they're sitting there quietly doing their work. I, I just don't see that. Um, that wasn't what I envisioned. But I do feel that when there's conversation and there's interaction that uh, this is for the safety. This is for the safety of the people and themselves. Um, so I, I struggle with people thinking that it is unreasonable. Like I said, it seems like other countries can do it. I don't know what's wrong with, um, I know there's nothing wrong with our students. I know they're very teachable and I know they're learnable. And you're absolutely right, Ms. Eskovich, things are going to be different. And I'm sure that things right now for students at home are different also. And I'm assuming that parents are talking to their children about some of the changes that are going on. Um, if you've been out to the supermarket and you're wearing your mask, you look around and you'll see kids in masks. It's not a new thing for some of our kids. So I, I just, I, as you can see, I'm very passionate about this. But anyhow, um, because I care about the safety of our teachers and of our, our students at this point. So I will stop and that's all I have to say on this issue. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. McDougall. Uh, Mr. Susan, I think you're up. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to run through. Uh, I'm more of a visual type follow through. So I think I'm going to wait for the whole COVID shutting down schools and all that stuff to kind of run from beginning to end through that. Um, what I would like to ask is we, we deployed um, a series of these touchless thermometers that are going to be at the school. Mm -hmm. um, the process of those kids coming off the bus and doing all that stuff, would that be appropriate to ask now or talk about that later on? I saw the other slides. When do you think that would be to ask that question? How uh, well, that process is going to work yeah that process is going to be different at every school the schools are coming up with their own plan what what we knew and when i talked about our ability to implement and our ability to manage what we knew is uh in a school of 2,000 kids or even in a school of 800 kids um, we don't have the personnel to screen every student every day and in fact even if we put all of our people out there to screen students every every student every day then what isn't being done uh, because those people are going to be pulled out of, uh, of, of um, monitoring the, the kids in the hallways, in the cafeteria, um, pr doing cafeteria services, to, you know, all of those pieces. So what, what we depend on is each school developing their plan. How are kids getting off of buses? How are we 
figuring out which of these students need additional screening. How are we doing it in a respectful and private way? How are we managing if a student is sick and getting them to the, cl to the clinic? I mean, all of those pieces, that, that student walk from the minute they get on the bus to the minute they get back on the bus and go home, we're, we're trying to walk through in our head. And one of the projects that uh, we didn't talk about today was out of com uh, government and community relations. They were waiting for this plan, and then they're creating a video. And the video starts with the student at the bus stop and the expectations there, what the bus looks like, what getting off the bus looks like, what it might look like if you get screened at the school, and then it takes you kind of through that student's day so that everybody, exactly what you said, has a visual, a picture in their head of what looks different now. No, I, I appreciate, that was actually one of my follow, my final requests was to do a video from soup to nuts from beginning to end of the day to show them what this looks like and everything else. That's great that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. The team's great. Um, how many, how many, uh, Miss, Miss Han, I apologize. How many of those guns did we deploy and by what number did we determine each school gets? Was there a factor of a formula, something like that? <laughs> if you heard some of our no, formulas, that, you yeah. would die. <laughs> you would just. This formula's, oops, I'm sorry. This formula is easy. Every school is getting one. <laughs> the high schools are getting a bigger capacity tank. So they're, they have a little bit more capacity of material. And we'll see how often we use them and should we need more. We'll certainly um, order okay. more. And hand are you talking about the monsters? Oh. oh, that's not hand a hand question. Did Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. We thought you were talking about the misting machine. Oh, no, I don't oh, want to talk okay. about that. I want to know how many thermometers we gave to each schools and then what the reason was behind the theory or the, the equation. So, so um, we made it up. Um, and so uh, we have ordered, we have dispatched about 700 already and have a couple uh, hundred more on hand to uh, work through departments. Um, I think our minimal is five, and that would be at our smallest elementary schools, up to just shy of 20 at a Vieira High or a Mel High. Um, our high schools were given uh, considerably more so that in extracurriculars, the sports or the band teacher or the whatever could have some additional resources available after. Um, the elementaries received enough for their aftercare programs. Um, we're certainly uh, prepared to order more. Um, we've got a good contract in place for those. Um, so we made it up. No, it sounds Less like- Less for small, more for sounds, big. <laughs> no, 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 it sounds, yeah. if I did the numbers, 20 at Vieira, that's 2,000 students there. Five at the elementary schools, it's looking like it's about one per hundred or something. Yeah, like we that. started. That's exactly what we did. Yeah. That was the formula. We did. Our, our, our formula <laughs> is um, three academics in a room was we started with a minimum of two at 300 students plus additional for extra aftercare. For any one above 300, that was another one in those increments. And then a bunch more. <laughs> it's just for me one of the one of the um, number one ways to 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 identify that we've I, we've seen across the country is to use the thermometer check. Right, individuals are coming in, and it would seem to me that if there was a way to deploy more to do more tests to block the actual spread to do that, it would be um, advantageous. How much are these things a piece? They're about sixty dollars um, each. We're um, actually down to what? Um, yes, because uh, Don Richer in procurement's amazing. amazing. We're down to about forty-six dollars nice. a thermometer. But but just remember from earlier, uh, about fifty percent of the co positive COVID t t uh, cases do not have a temperature. So right. um, if we're reliant on that, and that's my biggest concern, is that we get reliant on one thing. If it's if the kid doesn't have a temperature, then they're well. Yeah, it's you, you have to monitor across a, a lot of the symptoms. So, um, well, you know, know, nobody here thought that we were done ordering, not a single one of us. We figured as soon as we stand up school, we're going to be like, none of us thought of that. Um, but there have been many of us that have woken up at two in the morning and come in the next day and said, we forgot to talk about this. And I will tell you, 
that almost every time one of us had already thought about it and put in the order and taken care of it. So um, yet to your point, if we need to order more thermometers, we'll, we'll order more. I just want to be cautious that that's not the, uh, that's not, uh, that's that's not the most reliable factor. It's about it's 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 a case in about fifty percent of the positive cases. Are we requiring right now in every activity that happens for our coaches to give a test? That is correct. Test? Yeah. Okay. If I could, our, our. But it's not just a test. They have to. They have several uh, questions that they go through with each each student. So it is the temperature plus. A, I think it's five or six other questions that students get uh, screened on daily if they're in the return to activity plan. We, and it had. I'm sorry. We we um. We we felt that when something is optional and extra, um, that we could really look at that circumstance and situation and, and have some restrictions around its option. But compulsory education as our requirement to provide for all students a free and appropriate public education. Um, so we waffled in that land, right? Like what makes sense for somebody who wants to put themselves in this additional risky situation with a coach versus our obligation to educate all students. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, because we had these discussions at strange hours, but you know we wanted to make sure every student could be adequately educated. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what yeah. we were thinking about. Well, I, I just, we have the thermometers, we're using them. It comes down to some person saying, I think that person might have a th temperature. I'm going to run up and check them. I, I don't understand the process there. Like, what? Why? Why do I have a thermometer if we're not checking the kids when they're coming in? What is that process like? What are? How are we identifying those children coming in to check their thermometer to check them? Like, what is that? Like, what do we have them for if we're not checking every kid as they come in? So, it's not just the tool; it's the personnel. That's that's the first thing. This the second thing is that. Um, what you asked is, how are we identifying the, the students? Mm -hmm. So every single school has a child study team. And every single uh, child study team has students that they know are more vulnerable than others, uh, that they know may not have the foundation or the support that, of others. And that would be the first place we turn to to say, can you identify the students that you know may need an extra screening or may need any screening because they might not be, be being screened at home. Uh, that might be in some schools two kids, that might be in some schools 200 kids. And then they have to determine how we're going to do it, where we're going to do it that, pr that protects their privacy and, and is done in a respectful way. And then they have to decide who's going to do it. So in the case of, let's just say, 200 kids, if we're at a large high school and we have to screen 200 kids, who are our available people? Well, our, our teachers all have a very solid contract that says what their work hours are, but they also shouldn't have to perform uh, a, a medical screening on a student before hours. Um, we do have uh, clinics. We do have a uh, uh, support team. We do have administrators. But all of those people have jobs before and after school. So we can manage 200. We can manage. Probably more than that. We can't manage screening 2,200 kids. And so when we look at what we're able to implement and then what we're able to manage, screening 2,200 kids daily is outside the scope of what we can physically do. Um, if that is the wish of the board, we'll figure it out. Um, but then something else goes because because something else goes. Uh, and and you, I guess we'll have to figure out what that thing is as well. Um, we felt confident that our child study teams in each school could identify our vulnerable students. And we felt confident that our principals would develop a process that was fair and respectful and private. And so that's why we wrote it up the way we did. Does anybody, maybe the DOH can answer this. Are you finding that more children that are in areas that have maybe not the parental support are having higher COVID rates than kids that are in high socioeconomic areas? Is there any anything there?
I think you just have to pull it closer. Actually, I don't think that one's turned on. Thank you, Russell. <laughs> just a nurse. It's a button. Um, what we're finding is most children that are testing positive, and we are getting more and more children that are testing positive. Most of them are because it's a familial group. Someone in the family, for whatever reason, they're exposed at work, they're exposed at home, whatever. They come in and they bring it home, and we're finding a lot of positives in family clusters. Um, the thing with temperatures, you know, temperature is, as, Beth, as um, Chris was saying, is not an indicative symptom right now. Yes, it is definitely in the, in the older population, but in the younger population, temperature is only within about 50% of, of children. And with a, with a child, you, know, you, you run into a couple of things. If a child, or even a teenager, gets Tylenol at home or gets some mm -hmm. kind of fever reducing, then temperature is, is pretty much, taking temperature is useless. We've all um, done that. We've sent our kid to daycare by exactly. packing them full of ibuprofen and hoping they can make it through the end of the day. Then that's exactly, and Don't we see that in the clinic yourself. all the time. Um, so the temperature is really not the guiding force of what we decide the kid has to be sent to the clinic or should be sent to the clinic. You know, in my years of nursing, when a kid is sick, a kid is sick for the, for the most part. You do get some that, you know, that, that try to for a better word, um, scam. But when a child is sick, a child is sick, and they usually don't play games. And you can tell by looking at a child. You know, I've had kids that have had 104 temp, haven't been as sick as a child that has 100 degree temperature. So a lot of it is an assessment, a visual assessment. Um, does that kind of answer the yeah, question? Yeah, no, 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 that's a great question. Can yeah. somebody tell me what that visual assessment looks like? I'm a teacher right now. I'm getting ready to start the class day. What am I looking for in my visual assessment? If a child is, is sick, sometimes they'll be listless. Sometimes they'll be, they can be pale, they can be sweating, and a kid who's running around is going to be sweating. So you have to, you know, their eyes get kind of glassy, just like most of us see with our own children when they're sick. What I always tell everybody and what I tell the clinic nurses, you know, look at your child. If the child is acting sick, if the child is listless, if the child is just sitting there, or if the child is just not themselves, and our clinic nurses get to know their children in the school, as do the teachers, that's, that's where I would say, you know, look at the child. If the child looks sick, call the parent. Err on the side of always putting the child's health first. So it's, it's kind of, you know, and every child is different. Every child presents differently. Obviously, so, if a child has a fever, then that's, that's entirely. My, my son, my daughters, they, if they, were, they will literally hit 103 fever, and mm -hmm. you can't even tell. Correct. They're running around the house. Their, their, their fevers are up. But unless I check them, mm -hmm. they won't know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I need to have, I, Ms. Moore, I need to have more here. Like, I, I need to know. I need to know that there's, because identification is the key, right, to before and, and everything else. And if we're only truly trying to check the kids that we leave it up to the teachers and people to identify and maybe some of the kids that we think are in areas that we don't have are, you know, these, these, uh, uh, these students that we've identified, I think, I, I feel, and I'm only a board member, that there needs to be a stronger plan there. I don't know, do you guys, want to care to weigh in on that 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 to me like would you allow a school if they wanted to screen every kid that came in for temperatures to, to would you give them more of these thermometers well can I just I mean I just want to offer some perspectives you know when we talked about security we talked about um, uh, metal detectors and the reason why our sheriff in particular and many other sheriffs don't recommend a metal detectors is because you create that what's the word I'm looking for when you're all yeah, you got a bottleneck, and we're getting people through. I think you, we create the same situation here, which not only is a security issue, because you've got 800 kids standing out line, then you also have 800 kids standing very close together while you wait to, and those things are pretty fast, but still, you've got 800 kids. So even if you had the personnel, and even if we did it, you know, we're still, we're, we're creating problems that actually are working against the problem we're trying to avoid. 
Um, so you, if you have a kid who's positive and has a fever standing in the midst of 50 other kids, because how are you gonna six feet apart, 800 kids waiting to get into the building? It's, it's just not feasible. Um, so I would, I would argue that if you had a thermometer for every teacher before the student came into the class, they could temperature check every one of their kids. I do them, I bought one of these thermometers, I checked it, it's a second and a half that it takes. It would take less than five minutes, you could socially distance the kids. I just think that when we turn around and say that, well, we're gonna have 800 kids standing in one location, we know that's not gonna happen and we know we can, I feel we can do better there. I think that there needs to be a stronger answer to that, that barrier to that. I don't think, and, and I've been in schools. I mean, I've been in schools with 2,000 kids. I taught at Vieira. There's multiple exits, there's multiple points. There's, there's never a point where when the kids are coming in that you're gonna back up 600 kids, especially if you have multiple areas. I just. I truly believe that, that we, we can't wave the white flag here. I think that this is an area that, that needs to be stronger. I think we need to identify these kids before they come in. I think they need to be sent over to the, to the area to be quarantined if there's an issue and then go. And I think that also that we need to have a stronger, um, what that looks like for our teachers right now that are coming in. If the teachers are gonna be sitting there and we give them the thing that, hey, if they look sick, send them down, Man, that's that's got to be stronger. We've got to be better there. So that's, that's I'm just some red flags are coming up right now on this thing. So, um, what is the other board members okay? I mean, you want to talk about it, Ms. Deskovich? Ms. Ms. Moore said something about we can't require teachers to do checks. Is that is that in contract? What can you? Ex I think that's what you said. Can you expand um, on what we you said? typically we typically have not been able to require teachers to do any medical. Uh, procedures unless it was in the health plan so I mr. Susan I'm not saying that's a horrible idea but I don't I don't know how that's gonna go play out with BFT maybe it's an optional thing like are, you, are would you be comfortable with we would provide a thermometer to any teacher that wants to check their students every morning yeah, on the I way mean, in like I I think that's a fair thing especially if the teacher wants to protect themselves we as an organization can pr provide that for some screening but I don't know how we make that mandatory without uh, approval from BFT and I, I don't you know that's a whole nother I just problem. think it and, and you're right um, to mandate certain things is very difficult in the multiple areas that we have different school settings different class se segments but I, I truly believe that if there is a group of individuals or schools that would like to create that, I would like to give them that option. And as far as making BFT do something or not, I think that if I'm a teacher and I wanted to make sure that the students that were inside my class, if I could use a thermometer check as they walk in and it was legal, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But it's just an option. I can't speak to BFT. I just, I'm literally looking at this right now, but it's a huge concern that if we have an individual come into the school and we're talking about classrooms being shut down and schools being shut down, that we need to do everything we can at the perimeter of that school to make sure that those students aren't coming into that school because once they're in, then all of a sudden it's like the popcorn effect where one school, this, the cafeteria, everything else starts to happen. So if we're so concerned about turning an entire secondary program into block scheduling, then I think that one of the other things that we can try to do is a stronger perimeter defense as far as identifying kids inside the thermometer checks. That's all. So. Does anyone, uh, maybe Mr. Gibbs or I don't know, maybe, um, I know your name, Dr. Thetty. <laughs> Just <laughs> sure. It's, it's going to be a lot of hours. Uh, is there any concerns with if this was random, like class A, B, and C gets screened every morning because those teachers choose, but class D, E, and F doesn't get screened because those teachers choose not to? Is there any kind of is there any legal problem there, or does it look like we're calling out certain kids and only screening them, or you know, is there any issues that you see with that legally? And add on that extra screening that we're talking about. To, to what end? Are we sending them home? Every kid that comes in that's got a 99 or 100, we're sending them home? I mean, I, I could see this turning into, I wanna screen kids so I don't have 20 kids in my class every day. There's not day. a single teacher, Mr. Gibbs, in this school district that would ten temperature check kids to try to get them not to come into their classroom. I, I think that that standard may be come from that. Uh, Miss Patty over there, right? You would, what's the standard temperature that you say is, is sick? I mean, I've read, you know. We, DOH says 100.4, um, the school district's gone to 100 just to make it a little bit more. Um, yeah. Like for the schools. schools. <laughs> well, like the other hundreds. thing is, is that those pointless thermometers are a, a, almost a degree less than the underarm and under tongue thermometers. 
So I, I have, I'm just gonna lay out concerns, um, and I know that we're getting feedback. Um, two big concerns are, uh, we take for our screenings that we do now, our vision screening, our hearing screening, um, we go to great lengths to protect students' medical privacy. Um, and I don't know, given the scenario that you gave, that I could say that same thing. The other piece of it is that once those temperatures are checked, then those students have to go somewhere. And in elementary school, we don't send kids alone anywhere. And so if a teacher has one student, they're sending that one student and a second down to the clinic. And if we have 10 kids that on that any given day have a temperature, it doesn't mean they have COVID, it means they have a temperature. And now our clinic staff has 10 kids down there. Um, so there's some logistics there in terms of uh, what, is, what is happening there. My biggest concern remains to be the availability of staff to do that while they have other tasks that are supposed to be done in the morning. And, and my bigger concern is the private, respectful screening of, of children. If, if a student is identified as sweating and sick and everything mm -hmm. else, what's the process when they walk into the classroom? Well, it, 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 there, there's more to the, the student is, you know, if a student comes into my, my classroom sweaty, I have to look over and say, well, he's sweaty because he was just running, or he's sweaty because he looks sick. And then typically, I, I mean, I could just tell you, typically a teacher will say, are you okay? And if the kid says, I'm feeling sick, him and a partner in elementary school walk down to the clinic together. That is a safety measure. In this case, it's not really what we want, is it? But that is what we do. Um, that's, yeah, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Um, and that, you know, I don't mean to, to minimize the assessment of a, of a student, but I guess what, what everyone has to, you know, what do you do on a normal day when a child is sick in the school, the teachers decide when to send them down. Is that, I mean, I've never been a teacher in a school. That's an so idea. That's does it, it's the teacher in the classroom who decides without taking a temperature based on what child needs to be set down to the clinic. I envision the same, the same level of assessment from a teacher, not that they have to decide, is this a COVID positive or is this a varicella or is this something else? It's just, if, if the teacher knows in previous COVID that this child is sick, I don't think that should change, or even suspects that this child is sick, I don't think that should change what they do now that we're in a COVID situation. They're not, it's not the teacher's job to decide who is truly sick and who is not. That's no. the clinic's job. Is we just that, went through a process where we said that the teacher would be able to identify via training if there's a student that exhibits certain symptoms to get to send, be sent down. Exactly at like that, they do now. Exactly, and at that point, they just say, are you not feeling good and you should go down, right? Correct. So what my point is, is that if I have a thermometer check and I'm checking those students, what's the difference between saying that you don't look good and hey, you do have a temperature, go down? The entire process that you just walked through where you said, I'm not sure if we really wanna walk them down, you're saying that that's what's gonna happen anyway if the COVID test is positive through that evaluation, what's the difference between the thermometer doing the same? We, um, you know, our recommendation was on the, the aggregate of information on um, what we heard from our health department, what we know of routine clinic operations, um, the feedback we've gotten, the research we've done. Um, but we, with absolute certainty, the three of us as leading the task force are presenting you our recommendation based on that information. Um, we believe that every aspect of these preventatives, there's, again, all sides to it. And we will absolutely respect the direction of the board. Um, and we wanted to provide where we landed after many, we talked about teachers, we talked about all of those things. We were actually a little uncomfortable requiring it of our teachers. Um, but we absolutely respect the board's direction on this topic. Um, and this, this isn't a topic that we're drawing a line in the sand because the information every day is different, right? Kind of like with masks. 
And so uh, we are here to support what the board directs um, Dr. Mullins on this topic. And I, I feel like I'm, we've, yeah. we discussed this in advance because we knew, right? We knew this is a tough one to decide how in where we draw the line on our level of screening in the schools. And we are not um, surmising for a second that we have the right answer because we don't know that there is a right answer. Um, it was our recommendation just based on the aggregate of information, but we totally recognize some of the questions you're asking are valid and reasonable and not illogical. And so, um, I just, my, my, did we, when we required the coaches to do a test and do a checklist, did we check in with BFT to make sure that that was okay? Because that's what these were, these were extra events. These are this, this is not part of the Remember the summer workout is voluntary conditioning. Okay. But what I'm saying is, is that I am asking to be able to do something that is already in place in policy and being required of athletic coaches at a number that is higher than the actual numbers of a classroom. And you're coming back to me and saying that the that it's it that we would have difficulty with BFT, that we wouldn't be able to do it because of time constraints, that we would have people that are backed up because of groans. What I, I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is find out if there's one if we're allowing it or enforcing it to be done on one end. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we're not on another end? Or Mr. Susan, mad answer, add to that. We have summer school going on live and um, right now in third. 13 of our elementary schools, uh, and we are not doing temperature checks. Doesn't mean we shouldn't. No, but I just wanted to let you know that the athletics is different to the instruction that's incurring right now. But we are um, transporting students, and uh, we are not doing temperature checks. The thermometers are available in the school right now at all these sites, as well as hand sanitizer. Um, and we're seeing if any of any of these processes that we've developed are actually working in real time. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware we are not doing them right now. Also, Mr. Susan. We are meeting with BFT and uh, we're meeting with them, uh, I believe a week from today. And I know this will be a topic of discussion and um, you know, so I don't want it to be surmised that we're going to have trouble with that because I, I don't believe that to be the case. I think it's um, ultimately the guidance that we get from the CDC and the DOH and guidance from the board and direction from the board on what you want us to do. Um, but BFT is part of the conversation and we are absolutely meeting with them next week to work through an MOA. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Is there any way to meet with them prior to us actually implementing the plan and asking them if they're gonna have any pushback on us actually allowing our teachers to temperature check? at the doors, here's, here's where, and I'm sorry to keep beating a dead horse, but if we know that 50% of the cases that are coming into our schools are gonna have a temperature, right? And we're not identifying a solid plan to identify those with either thermometers or whatever it is, then I, I, I think we need to do a better job there. And if we're already requiring our coaches to go through a, a format list of all this other stuff with teams that are actually larger size than the classrooms, I would argue that we are not in an area that that is an issue to require it. If I, if I may, I just keep thinking back to two years ago when I was having a fit about our lice policy. <laughs> and you remember this, Ms. Klein? I do, and I had already had, we've had that conversation. The same discussion. <laughs> like I, the school was not allowed to tell us even which classroom the student was identified in that had lice so that the other students could be aware. And I, it, it's still a ridiculous policy to me. But the reasoning you all told me, you said it came from the Department of Health, I think. <laughs> it didn't, no, that policy didn't come from DOH. That uh, came from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Okay. And the CDC's recommendation. Some of the reasoning was the student's privacy, and I guess, you know, historically, other students now pick on that student because they, and we couldn't pull the student out right then. I, I mean, it, it's a huge deal for lice. And I, I know these are very different circumstances, but if we have, a line of students at the door and we pulled Joey and Susie. You hear it right now, right? Ooh, they got the, they got the Rona. They, you could hear the kids. Kids are kids. And so now they've been identified. Then they don't come back for 14 days. I'm not saying we don't do it because of that, Mr. Susan. I'm no, just it's saying, a, it's an, it's is, this a, is this now a concern? Because you guys, I think you all told me the lice thing was violating their, 
their privacy rights. Does this violate their privacy rights? Or if we're going to allow teachers, I don't think, I, I'm not comfortable with the mandating. If BFT wants to come forward and put in their contract that teachers, they want us to require, then I'm okay with that. But I, I, I like the idea of maybe us providing if a teacher wants one for their classroom, but not if it's gonna violate the privacy rights of the student. There's I, my. I think there's that balance there with privacy rights of students because you know, I do recall the argument over head lice, and oh, I yeah, know exactly you, where the policy came from, and, <laughs> and it is CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics. And you know, I think there's further discussion that needs to happen. I think we've got, we, we are on, um, we're on the, the two sides of the fence on that, on safety and, and health of everybody around and maintaining privacy of teachers and students and staff members, and I think it's a delicate balance. And we just have to work through all those balances to make it work in our schools. And I couldn't agree with you more because I know that that's what's going to happen if an individual is identified. But I feel that we have to be stronger here in this, poly this, this part of the thing. I think that there needs to be some way of identifying these kids. Because if you're, saying that we're not, if you're saying that we're not identifying kids as they're coming in, you're saying that we can't, we can't pull them out, we can't, we can't send them down, we can't, I mean, then, then all of a sudden everything we're trying to do to protect the kids from COVID becomes, you know, not as, as valid as what we could be. So all I'm asking is, is that if you guys can find a way to, and, and maybe I'm speaking as an individual, not for the board, but just to find a way to set up a stronger perimeter to try to stop any of this, a, a way to catch the kids before they're coming on. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, buses? If I, if I can just, just summarize where we're at, just you know, so we know the direction of the board and, and moving forward. Um, I don't believe we have a reference card or reference sheet of typical symptoms or signs to be aware of and look for for, for illness. Um, perhaps we could work with the health department to put that together to make that resource available to our teachers. Um, you know, that Patty referenced to some, some things as, as well. The committee met, obviously worked through a lot of the same struggles and challenges that have been presented. We're presenting the recommendation based on all of that consideration but clearly we're this is why we're here for the discussion is to receive the direction of the board if we if it is the wishes of the board to move in uh, a, a, either a different direction uh, a modified direction or so on I would I'll perhaps dangerously speak on behalf of the team I believe it is feasibly very challenging to daily screen every student as they walk into the school just by sheer numbers, whether it's a small school and the availability of staff or a large school and the availability of staff. Is it manageable once they reach their classroom? That seems like it could be more feasible uh, than otherwise. It would, re it would require uh, discussion with BFT what about the bus? Uh, agreement from them. I think that conversation, I don't see any reason why we can at least have a conversation with union leadership prior to Tuesday. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, and we could certainly pursue that. Um, the only other element that I want to make the board aware of for the discussion and then ultimately direction, if we move in the direction of additional thermometers for staff, rough estimate at 46, 45 to 50 dollars a piece for the additional teachers who would require them outside the ones we already have. It's probably a hundred, just under a two hundred thousand dollar investment. Could it be paid for out of CARES Act? I, I fully suspect it could. Um, quick question: Would it qualify as a FEMA reimbursement? Yes, I feel very strongly that it would be one of those items that we could do a CARES Act FEMA split on. And so two issues, and um, Ms. Lazinski is trying to keep from having a heart attack over there. Um, we we're front-loading expenses, right? So none of these funds are magically here. So all of these items we talked about prioritizing to be in people's hands, we have funded through district funds and then anticipate as soon as CARES Act arrives to be able to do expenditure transfers on the expenses that can be covered with CARES Act and then um, submit all the reimbursements for FEMA. And we feel really confident that a thermometer would be a qualifying expense. Um, and I don't foresee any reason, and I've 
read it all. So I feel really comfortable about that. And again, you know, we await uh, your guidance from the direction of the board. And, and we would need, um, Mr. Gibbs, we would need to know that line that Dr. Thetty was talking about. Uh, it, is, it is one thing to send a kid with symptoms um, to the clinic because you have evidence that the child may be ill. It is another to screen every child uh, and, and, and have it not be a private screening where, um, where you don't have a presumption that you are protecting the common good. So if you could do a little research there, I think that's my, my biggest missing piece here. And if I could just say, if, if, the, if the confidence of the public doesn't, isn't there and they don't send their kids to our schools for every 100 kids is $800,000. So when I say that this perimeter and everything else, it's, it's part of me as a father for my daughter, but also other parents that are out there trying to say they want to know that our schools are the safest they can be. And this is a big deal for, for me as a board member, I feel. And I may be wrong. I may be, we may come out of this meeting and everybody might say, no, we're fine. That doesn't matter. But just, just from my gut right now, this was a scary part. So, all right, we good? I'm, I'm happy got, to look at that. Um, my question still is, to what, what, to what end? Do they go home for that day? Or are we saying you're out for two weeks? Or until you bring us a negative test? We can't make them take a test. We can't send them to DOH and say, you have to be tested. They're not going to force them to be tested. So my question is, to what end? Because there's also going to be due process. Because if, if you're kicking them out of school for two weeks, you're denying them education. So at, Can somebody tell me at what point we are going to tell kids to stay out for two weeks? Since it's pointed, it's brought up. Yeah, sure. A couple, a couple of there's. Well, when we get to COVID, I'll tell you, but I'll, I'll say it now. Uh, a student is going to be out for two weeks if they are a contact to a familial case. So, if a family member is positive for COVID, um, they would be, and uh, they would be. I need to wait till we get to the COVID section. Okay. Do you know how many times that Patty Siebert and I get on the phone and I say, I know I know this, and then we, go, we walk through it again. We can, um, we can just so wait. they would be out for two weeks. If they're a presumptive case, they would be out for two weeks. How, what is presumptive case? A presumptive case is they have a family member who has COVID and they're showing symptoms. So a student shows up at our school and has symptoms and we are capable and able to send them home for 14 days. Uh, if they have a family member that has a positive case Which that they live with. Which is going to have to be self-reported. Which has to be self-reported. When I started that whole section, it was based on the premise that our strongest ally is our families. If, if families do the temperature check and do the health screening, if they don't send their students to, to school sick, if they tell us when they have a family member that tests positive, if we don't have them as an ally, that perimeter, uh, there's no way we're going to be able to do like you said and have a strong perimeter uh, because we're going to have a whole lot of asymptomatic kids coming to school that may be shedding the virus because they have sick family members or they, they took a Tylenol before they got on the bus. So, um, so those are some of the reasons why students might be sent home for two weeks. So I'm, I, I, and and I'm, I'm trying to get this straight. There's a student that is in a class of a teacher. They identify them as having the symptoms. They send them down to the front office, and they can't be. They can't stay there. They can't be sent home. They can't be anything. I mean, can oh, they can be sent home, but not for the question was for two weeks, uh, based on based on what? Uh, we can't force them to take a test. The family can say to us. Okay, but the, that process yeah. is something that we can identify and send the same process through if they're identified with a thermometer, if they're identified by asymptomatic, or are identified as anything. And he's asking, at what point do we start? Well, that we'll get into those in the next in the next couple of slides, right. I guess. But the identification process is that we can identify a kid that has symptoms and put them inside of a as the health and call their parents. That is part of the legal process. Okay. We've all, but we've always been able to. Do yes. No doubt. That's why I was quite. I was. Questionable about it. Okay. How are we going to verify to fidelity the contact information for each one of the legal guardians? So I'm, I'm trying to call, you know, and, and I don't get this because that's a key, right? In, in many of the areas where we have students that may not have guardians that come pick them up, this is the hardest area. So what is the plan there to make sure that the fidelity of all those are taken care of? Yeah, that starts at registration. So um, we've, we've continually added word uh, verbiage to our registration paperwork about what an emergency contact is, 
who they are and how they get inputted. We ask that that registration paperwork be done every single year. We input it every single year. Uh, once parents um, have notified us that it's an emergency contact, that doesn't mean that person has carte blanche to show up and pick up a student. If somebody comes in to pick up a student and they're on the emergency list, list, we still have an obligation to call the parent and say, do you know this person is here to pick up your child? And in a case of an emergency pickup, we would make the assumption that we've spoken to the parent, they have informed us who the emergency pickup is, and we ask for ID. So I and I get that I, I, I was just saying we the first bullet says all parents we, we should verify that they have accurate information. So are we going to take all of the registration and then somebody is calling each one of those numbers and emailing for verification. So meaning that how do we know that the numbers that we have inside the system are valid. Who is verifying that? What is the verification process of that? With all due respect, Mr. Susan, even if we verified it on the day of registration, we have so much mobility in our community and people who had change phone numbers and change, like, it, we could verify it today and tomorrow it's gonna be wrong. For, the, for, for a portion, so I, I, it just said, when, I, when the speech came, when the piece came out, it said that one of the most important things is having verified contact information of our people. And that's what I was asking. Sure. So are we not, we're not verifying, we're not following up, we're not doing yeah, any of that me, stuff, we're just taking it in at registration and we're good? Yeah, or? It, I, I, it may be poor, a poor word to put there, but the, the, the way that we viewed the verification is that every year we ask parents to update their information and every year a clerk gets that updated information, brings it up on AS400, fixes what needs to be fixed, and, um, and then that is, what we are considering our verification. It might be better if we had used the word updated as opposed to verified. And then we wouldn't know until the, the time of, uh, that we have an incident, something happens, whether that's you know, discipline or whatever, that we contact the parent if that's a valid one. And, and you're right, Ms. Steve, because there's a lot of the kids move around. Um, if we have a student that's inside of, if it's showing symptoms that's inside of the clinic, and their parents don't come up and get them, what's the plan there? Or is that later on in the list? No, 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 we, that's, in this, that's in this section. They would, be in a sep they would be put in a separate space. Uh, each school was asked to identify a separate space. That is one of those cases where the student would have to wear a face mask, and we would continue to make efforts to call the parents. Um, at some point, we would, you know, we would, what? We would, yeah, at some point, we would have to get an outside agency involved if we couldn't eventually uh, reach a parent. Um, That's at like the end of the day, teachers are going home, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, we, we are aware there are certain areas in our district that uh, certain employers that do not allow parents to get phone calls, uh, you know, period, the end. Uh, but we're also aware that there are, and that there are some limitations uh, to communication, but uh, at some point we need to get outside agencies involved if we can't get a sick child. Absolutely, and then if there's a, um, I know that if a student breaks an arm or does something like that, we mm -hmm. transport them, right? Mm -hmm. Is Correct. there a level or a threshold at which the student is exhibiting signs of a high fever, the parents aren't going, that we transport them to the hospital? Is that true too? That, that is absolutely true. Our nurses make that decision for us. Uh, well. Uh, in combination with the school administrator. Um, anytime there's a question if a child's health is in danger or life is in danger, we call an ambulance. And, and then, then we become, uh, to be frank, we become in local parentis up until the point that we can pass off to a parent. So here's the next question. The, the extra room that you're talking about that's mm -hmm. set aside for the students to come into, mm -hmm. that nurse then has to go sit with the students inside that classroom? or that area, and if so, who is covering the front medications and all of that stuff? Um, that area has to have line of sight supervision. It doesn't necessarily mean the nurse is going to leave the clinic because you're absolutely 100% right. That's a, that, that point we, we went over and over is that that nurse has another job and that nurse needs to be available for that other job. So that student just has to be in an area where there's a line of sight and be quarantined in an area that is not with anybody else? Yeah. And all of those rooms that you're talking about at each one of the schools is going to be within line of sight of the nurse? I can't answer that. Um, it's, it's going to be different in different schools. It might be a clerk that's in there. We might have to put an IA in there. It, it might be a, an open door uh, from the, the secretary's office to the hall. You know, it, there's, all, okay. there's all different variations of that. And if you have two kids? We're getting, we're getting rough. It's getting tough. No, but I mean, can you put two kids in the same room? Shouldn't. 
So now we have to have multiple areas. Could happen. And our principals know that to set off a couple of extra areas, right? We, we've, they, they are all working on their plans. Um, okay. It is, all of these conversations, every last one of them have been kind of ending with, this is a no-win scenario. We can't solve all of these issues and we can't address all of these concerns. What's the best that we can do? Um, and so as it relates to the clinic, we know we need to isolate kids who might possibly have COVID. We know we, know we need to depend on our families to, um, to answer our call. Um, and if we don't have that answer, we're gonna, be in a, we're gonna be in a rough spot. Let me ask you this. We have 16 locations that we have vacancies for our school nurses or our, our what we have a, so we will have a nurse at every location. I can't say we're going to have a nurse at every location, but we don't have 16 locations without a nurse. When, okay. Yeah, when Patty was talking about uh, vacancies, a lot of those are the floaters. Um, so uh, I think when we left last year, I think we had less than four vacancies. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be training the staff and they'll be hiring. But, uh, you know, I, I, I know this is a horrible answer. Um, the health department is in the same position as Brevard Public Schools. Sometimes vacancies go unfilled, and we do the best we can. And if, the, if there's a vacancy at the school, the responsibility of the transition from students and dispensing medication falls upon the secretary that's there that takes training? Can you explain that to me? Sure. Um, there's actually the part of the contract is that two school board um, uh, employees have to be trained at every site. It's not necessarily the secretary. Um, it can be any two employees that are designated by the principal. Um, typically, it is a clerk or a bookkeeper or the secretary, um, and they go through training with the Department of Health, and then they get an individual training at the school to go over, um, you know, specific medications and, and, and health plans of students. Um, and when the nurse is out, if we can, if there's a floater available, they'll put a floater in there for the day. If a floater isn't available, we, we depend on the, the school-based personnel. Okay, thank you. Hang on just a second. Let me just make sure I don't have any more notes. Did I miss anything with that, Patty? No, you didn't. Okay. Oh, real quick question, in elementary schools, in, on slide number 29, it says all bathrooms will be cleaned and stockpiled multiple times throughout the day. Students go to the restroom consistently throughout the day inside of our elementary schools. Is it going to be the guidance that they're to clean the restroom every time after a student uses that? Or are they looking at allowing time periods to, to, use, to clean that restroom? Sue, Does can that make you sense? better able to answer that question? That's a very good question. We're going to have to think about that. Just because of a teacher, um, there, was a, there was some data that showed that after the launch, there was some stuff that went through our sewers and that there might be something there. So if there's an opportunity there to have to clean, we just need to let our staff know ahead of time mm -hmm. that that's something that they need yeah. to do. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. And then I read down here on page 30 at the bottom, the last bullet says misconduct on the bus will result in disciplinary action that may include suspension from the bus. Um, are we redoing our entire disciplinary policy that this is a number 10 when you are, you know, we see the, the, the behavior of individuals that is not conducive to the health of our healthy environment of our students. Um, the behavior of individuals that may think that it's funny to run around and act a certain way that puts kids at risk. Are we putting that at a level 10 when it comes to disciplinary policy mm -hmm. or are we just going to kind of continue down the same? You see what I mean? Yeah, Is there I understand. A, are you bringing a, a change there for us? Um, we had not gone that far. Um, a lot of times when we looked at the infractions that could cause, um, y you know, for example, spitting, biting, um, uh, uh, misconduct. Um, um, I'm trying to think of all the other ones I could touch on. They were already there. Uh, but I think that we do need to take a second look at that, which we haven't done. Uh, so I can bring that to the discipline committee, and they can take a look at behaviors that students might engage in willfully. Willful disobedience, that's the other one I was trying to think of besides misconduct. Well, and, and um, we, a lot of times it falls, a lot of their actions fall under willful disobedience. And so we can use the range of uh, corrective actions under willful disobedience to handle that. 
I just, I, I know kids are going to fight. I know they're going to do stuff. We know it's all, it's kids' nature, right? But it's those individuals that are using this as a, a, a game or something like that mm -hmm. to play. We've seen it in the society where people are doing it. Um, I, I, as a board member, would like to see a stronger disciplinary policy on students that think that this is something that should be played around. So if they're on the bus and they start trying to, to goof off and stuff like that, we need to, we need to stop that before it starts. That's all. And, and I don't know how to do that. That's your guys' job, but I, I just. Yeah, I think what we could do is get our discipline uh, committee together just to look to see where within the scope of our plan as it is, those things fall and if that needs to be addressed. So we'll, um, we'll look at that for you. And then um, just a curiosity, because this is my, my kids, um, mobile feeding will operate for e-learning and distance learning, mm -hmm. right? Um, is that going to be mobile to me means my O'Galley corridor kids that are getting fed inside those, you know, the meadows and all my, my low in, my uh, housing developments. Mm -hmm. um, is that what that is? Or are we talking that they're able to come get, like you said, a meal at the school? What are we looking at there? Yeah, I, I believe, and I would have to. Do it, it is the same plan yeah. that we use this summer. We'll have sites. Um, some, uh, if we go to distant learning, it'll be site-based. If we're at e-learning, we can, uh, Mr. Thornton's working on his team on, is it a school by school elementary school? So depending if we're distant learning because we're closed or we're e-learning because a parent shows. Do is it, it, more so, clarification, if uh, a single school is closed for distance learning, that school would be the site. It wouldn't be a central site. And so central sites would be if the whole district closes. Uh, Mr. Thornton would ensure that all students have meal options if we as an organization close the school. So operations sits on the response team. And I think it's really important for everybody to understand that the response team is going to be responding to different situations across the district. And we can't begin to understand how often or how different that they're going to be. So I know that everybody's tired of the word flexibility. But in some of the answers to the questions, our answer really is, we don't know because we don't know what that situation is going to be, that specific situation. But our goal is to meet the needs of kids. And I think Kevin uh, Thornton has demonstrated that and, and, and He's will been continue phenomenal. to do so. Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK. Um, and then on page 32, it says uh, clinic areas will be cleaned throughout the day. There's, there's a lot of, I guess what I'm, I'm asking is, is that there's, there's what I'm getting at with a couple of these is there seems to be this massive amount of cleaning that needs to be done. And I think it, 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 when I look at it, it says custodians, it says areas, it says custodians. Are we looking at a com combined effort site by site? So you're leaving it up to the principal to come up with, this is you tell us how you're going to do it um, because that's the appropriate or are we going to, are we going to try to make the custodians be the cleaning force behind it? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Um, I can say I know Jim has uh, worked with the head custodians to develop a, a, a plan for how often and where. And part of what we have talked about is what happens uh, in between. Like, uh, it'll be very challenging for the, the way we staff custodians right now to be able to push into every class in between classes and clean. So something has to ha happen there. And whether how we're going to help, uh, help in, those, in those areas. I, I doubt I framed that very well, but I know that Jim Powers has been working on it. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have much to add, but I think it's, a, it's sort of a combined logistical challenge. The schools have to be part of it. We at the district have to provide some guidance. And it's just a matter of these are the boots we have on the ground, and we have to work within those, those resources. In, it, in my envisioned mind, it's a combination of the teachers taking care of their classroom, the custodians taking care of those other areas. Is that what you're saying? It's a kind of a combined effort that's locally based at the school in order for them to do that, and that comes up with the principal working with their staff on identifying those things? I would say that's accurate. Okay. Okay. 
And if, if somebody, and this may be inappropriate now, it might be better for the end. Um, I'm looking at today being the 9th and the students coming back in early August. Do you guys have a timeline of we will have all of our trainings prepared and ready here? Custodians will start to receive training here. Students will come back here. You know what I mean? Like a timeline of this is what we do. We have that somewhere for the for the staff to see. We do not. No. Okay. 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 Let's see. One more. Okay. That was the training timeline. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. McDougall, did you have any additional questions you wanted to circle back to? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I have, Patty, if you would, would indulge me with some, maybe not exactly on point questions, but I think they're important for our community and for us to understand kind of going forward. Um, looking at recommendations, and we've got within this, we've got the recommendations from the AAP and the CDC, and, and you all obviously have been working closely with our team as well um, on recommendations of various aspects. And one of the things that I found in going through a lot of those and, and looking specifically at um, the intensity of mitigation strategies, I guess is probably the best way to, to put it, there was lots of reference in, in all of these plans, really, that talked about um, level of transmission in the community. And even the executive order has indicated that, you know, we should work with our local health officials to identify the level of transmission in our community. And the um, what I'm struggling with as far as, as communicating with folks in our community around the issues is that there seem to be lots of data points around our community's condition with regard to COVID. But there don't seem to be a lot of functional metrics. So for example, we can identify how many people have been infected since the start of it. We can identify hospital beds. We can identify death rates. We can identify um, percent of positives, right? But we don't really have any way to measure what that means. So if my child comes home with a 50, I'm going to assume that's an F because we have a grading scale, right, of, of so many numbers. Um, but maybe in someone else's grading scale, an F, a 50 is an A. So how are we measuring our community's health with regard to COVID? And what functional metrics should we be looking at as leadership in the organization to determine we're going in a good direction, we're going in a bad direction, what we're doing is working, what we're doing isn't working? What I can tell you in the past month, our positivity rate has increased significantly. And that's what we look at. What is the amount, what are the amounts of people that are being tested that are actually showing positive? We don't look at whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic when you're just looking at the overall. I can tell you as of this morning, our positivity rate is 11.5%. And that means of all the tests that we did, and I don't have the exact number of top of my head, but um, I can tell you the Eastern Florida State is doing 1,000 a day. We're doing 150 a day across the street. And then you've got different agencies and organizations that are also testing. Right now, our positivity rate is 11.5. Last month, we were down to around 4. So we, we have had a significant change in the past month. Um, Will that mean that we will continue on this path? I sure hope not. I hope our mitigation and our education is out there and is, I mean, everywhere you go, especially the DOH, you hear us saying face masks, social distancing, hygiene techniques. So hopefully that, that will do a turnaround. The other thing we look at are the hospital rates. How many people that are now getting infected and are sick enough to be in the hospital? that has been increasing significantly. We are not at a critical point in Brevard County. I know if you listen to the news, there are other counties and other parts of the state that may be, but Brevard County right now, we're okay with our hospital rate. Um, the, I, hate, I mean, our death rate, today they reported six additional deaths in Brevard County. 
So, really? you know, it's, we are in the wrong direction right now. Hopefully we can stop that and mitigate it. But as of now, we've changed significantly in the last month. So if I'm putting you on the spot and, and you do not have the authority to answer this question, please feel free to say so. But um, I feel like I owe it to our community to ask the question because when the executive order came out, the statement was made that all schools would go back to brick and mortar open in August unless our local health officials deemed it unsafe for us to do so. Is there within these metrics that you identified, do you, ha have you all internally identified if we have a 30% positivity rate, that would be too dangerous to go back to school, or? Locally, we cannot make that decision. We are an integrated health department with the state. We don't have freestanding county health departments like some other states do. In the state of Florida, we are all operating under the state Florida Department of Health. If there was something in our community going on that was significant based on when schools are going to open, that would be a consultation with Dr. Rifke, the Surgeon General. And he would make the decision based on what's going on in each individual county, similar to what you see when we were talking about um, South Florida, where they said they're not opening based on their current statistics and their community spread. So that's something that I can't tell you or nor is it my decision or is even a local decision okay. that would be made in consultation with Tallahassee. So when the executive order says local health experts, they're really referring to the Surgeon General? Correct. Okay. We, what we would do is because local health, we would go to the Surgeon General and we would consult with him, giving him what our community activity is and what our community statistics are at this point, and then meet with him and discuss it with him. Okay. So when you say that at the health department, you all are talking, um, you know, you're, you're constantly talking about social distancing, wearing masks, and what was the other one? Hygiene. Hygiene. Hygiene, Hygiene. yes, thank you. Um, do you qualify social distancing and wearing masks? So do you, do you suggest that masks are appropriate in this situation but not this situation, or you just say these are all important aspects to stopping the spread? Our recommendation is masks at all times and six feet social distancing. Masks, especially when you cannot maintain that six feet social distancing. We also, um, hand hygiene, wash hands, use the hand sanitizers whenever you can. We don't mandate anything, we recommend. And that's okay. our recommendation. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry if I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot no, on that, okay. but there's been, it's, it's just been very ambiguous in trying right. to have those conversations with our community and help them to understand. They are difficult. I've had the same conversations with our clients at our clinics and staff. It's, it is a difficult, um, which is why we just recommend this and go by the best data that we can. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, with regard to this specific session, section, and I, I apologize to all of you for getting off on a, a little bit of a tangent there. Um, <clears throat> I think there are a couple of key, key things that came up in here, and um, one is the face coverings, and I think that, um, I, th I think that's a sticking point for me at this point, um, but I don't, I, I think there's a way that we can make it work. So if we look at the language that's in here, I personally feel like it's perfectly appropriate for us to expect that everyone wear face coverings. Um, and with common sense in place, right? So we know, we know our kids in our schools, we know the kids that, that truly probably can't successfully wear a face mask. Um, But I think for us to say, well, we, we would hope that our leaders, we're going to ask our leadership to model. Um, we will require it in some instances and we will expect it on buses, but then we have kind of this whole other gap where we say, yeah, we recommend that it happen. Um, I just, I, I feel like expecting it establishes that expectation and then we're not saying we're gonna throw you in jail to fine you $500, you know, if you're a five-year-old who can't wear a mask in your classroom. I think we have to have some, some common sense there, but I think our general expectation, based on everything that I've seen and the fact that we're, we can't do six feet, 
we, you know, we, we have a lot of limitations, we're indoors, all of these things. I just think that we need to at least come out with an expectation um, that that be the norm and understand that there may have to be some exceptions that will be handled individually, but <clears throat> I don't think it's too much to expect um, that, that we will follow these recommendations for the safety of all involved. And, and I'll tell you, I am incredibly concerned about our children because I think that we have some misperceptions about the severity of COVID in kids. Um, the secondary inflammatory response that we're seeing in kids is especially troubling to me. Um, and I think that unfortunately, you know, a year from now, two years from now, we're gonna look back and we're gonna see that our kids were much more affected from COVID than we anticipated. But on top of that, I am feeling enormous, enormous stress around the health and safety of our faculty and staff. Um, and this plan, we, I, I think there have been some recommendations brought forward that are geared toward doing our best to, to protect our faculty and staff by all means. But our faculty and staff don't have anywhere near the same options that our students have to accommodate their individual needs at this point. Um, and we know from looking at our health insurance data that we have a lot of people that are on our team that are in those really high risk areas because of pre-existing conditions. And so to me, the least that we can do for our team who has worked so hard to make sure that we're providing the right services to our students and helping them to be successful is to expect that people will wear masks to keep them safe. Um, and know that it's not gonna be perfect in every situation, but I just feel really, really strongly that that expectation needs to be there. Um, we simply can't, we can't run a school without teachers and staff. Um, and, and part of that is keeping them as safe as, as possible. And I think the, the higher we can increase the number of people who are wearing masks um, in the schools and in the classrooms, the better off that our, our team will be, um, which is also critically important to keeping schools open going forward. So. That's my, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. Um, I don't think I had any additional specifics on these areas other than um, I think we need to circle back for uh, discussion from, with Mr. Susan on thermometers at some point. But I'm wondering, looking at where we are and what we've, we've gone through at this point. Do we want to revisit our elementary plan and our secondary plan before we get too far away from that and provide some feedback to the team on that, some consensus from the board? I, I think it's, you know, we give it a thumbs up to move forward as, as far as the recommendation stands or do we need to have additional um, discussion around that? Would the board members be? okay with me facilitating that discussion so we can what are you saying stop moving forward with the rest of the presentation and go back to the beginning temporarily um my feeling is, is that there's a lot in here that pertains to the front half um and i would like to plow through and then go back okay um but that doesn't mean that the rest of the board doesn't and the reason the reason for that is is because I think that when we talk about moving to um, block or a lot of the other decisions, I was really, really waiting to get down to the medically vulnerable students, the, the process of how these COVID tests, all this other stuff that's in the back. But that, I, I, it, to me, it's six or one half dozen. That would be nice. But if you've got an angle that makes sense for them, um, I'm okay with it, whatever you want to do. Just trying to make sure we don't get too far away from the issue before we Forget provide more. the direction that the team needs. All right, then. I, I don't feel like I have a clear understanding if, uh, for the face masks before we move, move on from that. I know that, oh. I, I know that Ms. McDougall feels strongly and I know you would like expect and I get someplace in the middle. So I was trying to, if we have consensus over expect or if we have consensus, I don't, I don't know if this is the point to get that or if we come back to it. Yeah, I was going to ask the same. Would the yeah. board like to come back? Because I, I think there's still unanswered direction on thermometers and face, and masks. face masks. 
and then of course the academic plans. Do we, right. I, I make keeping a list. Do you want okay. me to just keep the list and we come back and work through them at the end or uh, would the board prefer to work through those, that direction now? So Mr. Susan is requesting that if you would not mind Dr. Mullins to continue your list um, of those things that we need to circle back on and let's see if we can work through the remainder of the packet because he uh, believes that there may be some impact in some of the things we discuss here to the prior issues. Sure. All right, then Dr. Sullivan, I think we are with you for 34 through 36. Yes, thank you. Um, to get us back on track with sequencing, um, as we went through the plans, we then focused on some in-school guidelines regarding some operational, medical, um, health and safety. But of course, academic and social-emotional learning is at the cornerstone of our core mission. And so um, we wanted to be really explicit about some of the things that are um, an emphasis on current practice and some of the things that are a, a slightly more expectations, um, in part because of our concerns for our students who haven't been in our building since March, and in part um, with state regulations. <laughs> and so we're, we're living in both those lands. Um, Ms. Klein mentioned it, and I, I believe Ms. Moore too. I'm not even sure anymore. Um, <laughs> But in accordance with the state expectations, in accordance with our concerns for our students with disabilities and their progress towards their goals, um, and of course our teachers' ability to make sure they make really good lesson plan and instructional decisions, all students will be assessed within the first month of school to identify strengths and weaknesses in content areas, skill attainment, behavioral expectations, and readiness in the event distance learning is necessary. And some of that will be through formal structures like our required progress monitoring that um, will be responsive to the state. And some of it will be with some informal structures. Um, teachers are always doing uh, pretests and assessments and information. Some of it will be guided by um, individual education plans and a review on students' progress towards their goals and other informal and formal structures combined. Um, one of the things that's really a um, strong push for us, and I, I'm, I'm pleased that in our informal conversations with our union leaders, you know, they share the understanding of the importance of maximizing digital tools. Um, each teacher will integrate resources into their courses and ensure that students are regularly accessing it. What we'd like to see is um, when a student is potentially um, home, either for a personal medical reason, exposure to something or the class has to be shut down, they're continuing to utilize resources that they're familiar with. They've used the digital book in class with great regularity. They know exactly how to go to their teacher's Google Classroom and that it's a super easy pivot. And I, I believe our teachers are ready for that. I, I know every teacher that I've spoken to is really excited about some of the new strength that they um, feel confident in and the tools that they use during the shutdown and realize the benefits of integrating. So we wanna be really explicit. We don't want a child who's home to be suddenly, oh, create a log on for this or that. We want it to be a natural part of their coursework. And to further that statement, the teachers will work in a blended format to minimize those challenges when in individual students hold classes or the entire school must pivot for those short or extended periods of time. And uh, Russell, who just had to step out, his team has been doing a phenomenal job of creating additional training resources for our teachers and our teachers themselves. They've been collaborating informally from the beginning and sharing um, the use of those tools. And for some of our teachers, it was a refresh on those, um, the fact that many of our resources we already had digital access to. Um, it just wasn't as high a priority in the past. Um, teachers and staff who provide services to our students with disabilities, they will work with those students, their families, district support teams, and administration to meet IEP goals and related services to the greatest extent possible in the event of distance learning is necessary. Um, we learned a lot in this shutdown. Um, we learned a lot about things that went well and things that didn't go so well. 
And Chris's team um, has done an incredible job of actually leading the way in providing services. So we feel really confident in their ability to continue that work. Um, and of course, as always, if we have distance learning needs and devices are essential for education, we would never uh, prevent a student from having access to the digital tools that they need to succeed in the classroom. Um, we've talked a lot about stress and trauma, anxiety. Um, I, I, I might go home and read the required mental health curriculum myself tonight. Um, <laughs> But uh, as you know, the state had previously already prioritized um, their commitment to all students receiving um, mental health instruction, and that will continue. That will continue um, in whatever format is available to us. Um, I think we've all heard the in a, in a room or with Zoom, um, those things will continue as well. And of course, the additional social emotional frameworks that um, Ms. Moore and her team um, outlined not too long ago, and we may have thought those curricular programs for social emotional were critical for one reason a year ago. They're critical for another reason now, and um, those things haven't changed. Um, each school will implement an academic support plan to provide additional instruction, and, and I want to speak to that a little bit. Um, we will be providing schools additional financial resources to enhance academics. So we, we've made a lot of references to CARES Act going to things like thermometers and hand sanitizer and all those things. We're also expending a significant amount of CARES Act to be able to allow schools to provide additional services. So for example, if a teacher wanted to provide tutoring before school, the school would have the funds to pay that teacher um, before school, after school, and other innovative methods. Um, some of those will be attached to services. That would be an extension of what students need who have an IP. Some of those will be for students who are struggling, and some of those just students who would like extra help because math is hard. And so um, the schools will have additional resources in addition to what we already allocate for them to create academic support plans. And um, some of those could be digital, some of those could be on site, um, but they have the resources to support their teachers in providing those services. Um, each teacher will utilize focus, and I think a lot of our teachers um, realize an additional power to some of those tools um, to regularly update parents and students on academic performance. Um, and we mentioned this earlier, secondary students will continue to have access to programs that accelerate learning, um, albeit uh, career and technical education, industry certification, credits through our college credit programs. Um, credit acceleration program, CAP, that actually represents those tests we spoke about, like a CLEP test or something like that, that could accelerate a student's performance. And Excel diploma options are the diploma options that are um, designed to have students graduate with 18 credits. Equally rigorous diplomas, um, but recognizing that some students may choose not to engage with the full compendium of electives. So uh, we mentioned it briefly, but our 18 credit option is the same core diploma. It just uh, takes away electives primarily, you know, with some exception, and recognizes some, that some of those students' choices in other areas are more valuable to them. Oh, I have another one. <laughs> um, so um, You're almost there. because, of course, of uh, this is a tough one. Um, we love a lot of the things that um, increase a child's experience with our schools, their connectivity to the schools, uh, parent connectivity to the schools, all these things that um, make school awesome. I'm gonna flip back to my notes again for my Miss Campbell quote on grieving the loss. And um, the fact of the matter is, all the reasons you guys just talked about, all of our concerns for the health and safety, all the things Mr. Susan has mentioned about strong perimeters, minimizing, limiting, all those things you all talked about. Um, these are some um, things that we're gonna have to prohibit for right now, um, but we want it to be really clear that these things are re will be reconsidered throughout the year as hopefully conditions change, immunizations are developed, um, whatever the circumstances are, but in support of the things that each and every one of us have felt about our concern for our students and our staff. Um, we will not uh, be authorizing field trips, and, and this was true uh, prior to our shutdown on March 12th, when we had a teeny tiny bit of cases, when we were following that single digit rise, 
We had already prohibited field trips because of, I mean, I don't have to think, I have to tell you why. Um, that prohibition will continue until further notice. Um, playground equipment use is prohibited. Um, I want to emphasize, and, and Ms. Klein is, is going to give me steely eyes if I don't, play is encouraged, playground equipment is not. And um, again, we have confidence in our teachers' abilities to work through that. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Campbell, um, but chorus uh, singing is it, it, all roads lead to an incredibly risky activity. Um, even with our disagreements and different passionate perspectives, I think all perspectives understand the risk that comes with singing. Um, and of course, our national organization has provided guidelines as well, and we're going to encourage um, singing outdoors and encourage our chorus teachers to use the gift of space that we have outdoors in many of our schools um, and then utilize some other strategies indoor in teaching music, musicality, and all those things that I hope make me sound like I know what I'm talking about with chorus. <laughs> um, and I said other courses because we have Spanish classes that sing, we have um, chanting um, that happens, and, and we're going to ask them to save those fun activities for outdoors. I mentioned briefly earlier, we are not going to do dressing out, um, sweaty, spitty, wiping, right? I think I can go without saying. And as uh, we know, we have several locker rooms without AC and the addition of that. Um, we're going to ask kids to bring their sneakers and um, get some fresh air outside when they can. Um, uh, labs and shared hands-on materials, we mentioned that earlier. Um, there will be supplies to maintain cleanliness in between use. I, I can't give an example of how that will look in every scenario because there are so many scenarios, but I want teachers to feel confident to talk to their principals and for their class, their course, their stuff, work together and figure out a plan and we'll certainly make sure they're supplied to the best of our abilities because we still can't get our hands on enough wipes. And so, um, but we do have plenty of other materials. Um, Students will be encouraged to bring their own water bottles. Again, the spitting over the water fountain thingy, kind of icky. Um, and um, will be prohibited from sharing them for obvious reasons. Schools should not convene assemblies. Again, some of this is common knowledge, but we think we need to be really explicit about it. Um, there's just, again, if we can eliminate a risk, we want to eliminate a risk. Um, athletic and extracurriculars will continue to follow the return to activity guidelines and I realize I forgot to link it but in the presentation we present to the public we will make sure that's linked and that parents can quickly see those return to activities and we want to continue all those wonderful parent nights we're just going to continue them virtually um, and our schools have really done remarkable jobs of finding unique ways they're already talking about video in classrooms um, so that people can feel a part of it, but we are not imposing on a teacher's space in a teacher's classroom and adding any unnecessary um, germs to a situation. And, um, and so those were just some uh, things that we felt were noting. It is by no means exhaustive, but those are some of those comments. Again, reading the comments that were coming up, we thought it was worthy of outlining. And again, um, for those that maybe haven't been with us since 9 a.m., um, we will still have our uh, resource teachers working with national resources and working with all the teachers in those specialty environments like art or um, media centers and things like that. Um, I'm going to turn the podium over to Ms. Klein, who's going to talk about additional ways we're going to protect our students and staff. So visitors to campus, this was extremely, um, well, one of the many difficult conversations we've had. Because we value our volunteers, we value our visitors, we value our parents who bring their children to school. But we have to minimize the risk of others coming on campus. and. Just as Mr. Susan likes to bring his daughter to school, he can drop her off. Um, but the visiting of campus, um, we're going to have to limit that. Um, we're going to have to totally prohibit the use of volunteers, visitors. So how are we going to do that with kindergarten? OK, so that's like, oh my goodness, first day of school. That is such an important part in a family's life. So I'm going to be asking um, all of my principals to create a 
video of what a kindergarten classroom, a probably a Facebook Live because that's a platform they love to use, or maybe YouTube, YouTube video of what it looks like in their school, what a cafeteria looks like, what the classroom looks like. We're also going to ask our teachers to do some virtual messages for their class for their students because we know this is extremely difficult. I have principals who think are trying to think outside the box of what they can do prior to school opening to let that happen. We have to also put the cleaning protocols in place after that because remember every footprint into a building could impact negatively the first day of school. So we're really, um, while we believe this is a requirement that we have to um, uphold, it's a very tough one, but it, I believe we can make people feel comfortable about their school setting by providing some very um, virtual meetings, vir virtual visits into the school, and perhaps um, having those conversations with teachers to do the virtual uh, classroom visits with the parents. The other thing that we're going to have to prohibit is that non-essential visits. You know, um, the cupcakes, <laughs> the cupcakes, the popsicles, the we have seen an increase in um, restaurants being closed and food being a care, you know exposure. So we need to limit that. We need to prohibit that classroom cupcake celebrations and all the things that we as moms loved um, and dads. Um, we're going to, our world is different and we're going to have to approach it differently. So all those, although these are very, very difficult um, situations, we have to protect our teachers, we have to protect our custodians and the students within the building. So we are going to uh, limit visitors to emergency situations, enrollment processes, or any required meetings. But Chris's team has been amazing at becoming the um, role models, the examples of virtual IEP meetings, uh, virtual uh, parent meetings. So we're going to learn from their successes and put more of those in place. So um, these are tough, but um, we believe it's the right recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Anyone have any questions for Ms. Klein on that particular? Oh, you have questions. Ms. McDougall, any questions for Ms. Klein? No, I'm. All right. Um, well, I'll just a quick comment. I don't have to like that we can only sing outdoors, <laughs> 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 but I saw that coming. Um, so I, it's a year. I'm praying it's only a year. Um, we can stick it out. I mean, I, it really stinks, but I will say, just to set up a couple examples, I know Meadow Lane, because none of, the, none of our schools were able to do their kindergarten roundups, they did a virtual kindergarten roundup, took a tour, showed all the kindergarten teachers, showed Ms. Campbell, uh, their Ms. Campbell from the media center, and did all that. Excellent, loved that, so the community could see what was going on. Junior Achievement, who is one of our groups of volunteers that comes into our schools, they've already developed a full spectrum of yeah, virtual we met with them. speeches and you know interactions with professionals so we're just going to have to get more creative in the way that we do this just like we're getting more creative in everything else that we're doing and so, i will say my child's choir teacher said at the end of the year she was already picking out her spot on campus where she was going to have rehearsals outdoors so you know so if there's any um silver lining that doe is looking at it only at the first semester so maybe we reevaluate so uh Ms. Dusker. I have two concerns. One, the playground equipment. It's open.
open now in all of our community parks. And we have this handy dandy machine that I've seen sprays down and sanitizes. So um, we know that it's outdoor, it's open air, kids will be playing. Why is the playground equipment banned? Do you want to, Sue? Start. Uh, uh, <laughs> Nobody I have playgrounds. <laughs> Nobody wants to own that one? <laughs> I'll talk on it, and then Sue can back me up. Um, the reason was um, if we could clean it after every class, that could be a possibility. But again, the risk of, um, you know, kids get pretty gross on the playground and uh, on the equipment, and there's bodily fluids that so and unless I could not say absolutely go go forth and play everybody all day long unless we could clean after each class um, and perhaps Sue there's a answer there well, I, I think a couple things cleaning after each child, each class, the ability to social distance while using the playground equipment. It's designed for interaction in many cases. So we're, we're concerned about it. And then just the ability of our custodial staff to really keep up with, with cleaning. I, I'm sure you've noticed through 37 or 8 slides that there's a lot of, and we're going to do some cleaning. And so this is something that uh, you know has got to take a second seat to making sure our classrooms are clean and our restrooms are clean and our offices are clean. So I think the idea of opening playgrounds is one that we'd like to pursue when we can, but really want to make sure that we can support the educational mission and the classroom cleaning and the restroom cleaning as a priority with the staff that we have, and then see how the, the science sort of evolves around the playgrounds and what we can do to keep them clean and safe for our students. And we know we want our children to be outside. We want them to be playing because play is developmentally needed in every child from birth. You know, we know parallel play. We know uh, the importance of play. Um, so we want play, but it's the equipment, the social distancing, the movement on the actual you know, an actual playground elementary is about the middle, probably from Miss Campbell to Dr. Sullivan, this middle section. That's not a lot of space for 18, 15, 14 children. But we will definitely try to work that out. So, like, swings, there's no, no one's near each other on a swing, so we're going to rope off a swing set because of touching? Is that because that child has touched it before? We're going to say no swinging. I, I, I mean, you can, I can almost be convinced of the, the little play thing that all kids are, are mounted on each other. But even with that thing mm -hmm. shut down, we're talking, say, about a class of kindergartners out there, five years old. How are you going to keep them social distancing at recess, even without that structure? It's going to be a huge challenge. We can't. I mean, really, is that what we're, what's we're going to ask our teachers to do? You can't play near him. Like, I just think at some point we have to be a little realistic. How, how is this going to really look? And are we okay with it? And why are we okay with it not over here but not on this equipment? I just want to make sure we're being consistent and, and realistic on our expectations. On paper, we can say something. but. And, and so many of our schools don't have swing sets, to be honest with you. Uh, and that, you know, we know that that movement back and forth is another developmental um, step that we need to have for children, but not all schools have swings. Um, swings, to me, would be a little bit different because it's one child at a time and they are separate. But the actual playground equipment that most of our schools have gone with don't have the swings are an added um, part of the playground. It is, um, like I said, it is something we will continue to look at. Um, but we heard it in the survey that you know the playgrounds were a concern, um, and to be honest, I'm 
I'm very concerned of the bodily fluids on those plastic playground equipment. And that's just my uh, opinion. Okay, and then my second concern is volunteers. I understand wanting to get yeah, this one hits me. Uh, I understand general volunteers, and we're usually reaching, begging for more volunteers for all kinds of things to keep our parents and community engaged in our school. But I feel like there's this category of essential volunteers and that are almost like employees in some of our schools. We depend on them sometimes five days a week. They are the extra hands in the front office, or they're really another adult on campus who has become part of the school. Um, I don't know if anyone else is interested in I don't know if it's a, just a bomb waiting to go off calling certain volunteers. Everyone's going to think they're an essential volunteer, but I hate to see those. It seems like we need more hands on deck right now, helping with all these things instead of cutting hands off the deck. But I think there's a difference between someone we're trying desperately to get involved and someone that's an essential volunteer in our school right now, helping man the, the media center, for example, while the while the Media, not the assistant, the actual specialist. media specialist is with a class, right? We have, I know at Hoover there's, there's volunteers that work. I work Monday, Wednesday, not me, but someone works Monday, Wednesday, Friday checking out. And, and so I think that's a level of volunteer that maybe needs a little bit more consideration. Thank you. Anyone else have comments or questions for 34 through 37? Ms. McDougall? Did you have questions or comments for Dr. Sullivan or Ms. Klein? No, I, I was just, you know, Ms. Klein really um, started off right away about the kindergarten, uh, the first day of kindergarten. So I'm glad you addressed that because that is a rite of passage for many parents. So I, I like that. And I, I do think that, okay, so we're not going to have in-person um, assemblies, but I'm sure there's ways to do things um, via Facebook or, or video that individuals could uh, do things. So I, I think some things will happen. I, I do support, um, you know, we're trying to be safe in our schools. We're trying to make it as safe as possible for our employees and for our students. And I, I don't, I understand where Ms. Desovich is coming with volunteers, and yes, they are very important. But at the same time, right now, my concern is for our staff that are working there, and for our students that go there every day. Um, so anyhow, that's just my two cents on that. Thank you, Ms. McDougall. Mr. Susan, did you have anything for those few? Yep, these couple. Um, so the first bullet on page 34, all students will be accessed within the first month of school to determine strengths and weaknesses. Is that K through 12 or is that just kindergarten? What is that Everybody. right there? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, from an ELA standpoint, um, it is all students. Um, for math, it is through geometry. And then those informal structures that our teachers typically utilize at the beginning of the year um, for all else. Um, okay. It is our belief that the DOE is expecting ELA and math. Um, and so the, the good news is we have tools for both of those. We, we've been utilizing ELA and math progress monitoring tools. It's not a departure. Um, and then the others will be informal structures. I, I think it's great because yeah. it's going to be much needed yeah. after what we went through. I, so I, I said you. informal, but again, some of them will be directly tied into monitoring the, their attainment of their IEP goals. Sure. And then the next one is, is it says each teacher will integrate digital tools into their courses to ensure that all students are regularly assessing and utilizing high digital materials. Um, do we have those digital tools for them? Yeah, what is we that? do. Okay. Um, we, we did a lot of work on that, on this emergency at-home learning situation where we identify digital tools for all 450 plus uh, secondary courses. Um, and we've provided those links and resources. Of course, some of them are being, were being reviewed at, yeah, not that, this. Um, but yes, we are ensuring that there are uh, quality digital tools for every single subject. Some of them are um, direct digital versions of their textbooks. If you recall, it's been about ooh, six years now where we've been required to spend a certain percentage of our budget on digital textbook materials and then also our ancillary resources as well. In elementary, not all of our material is digital, but we're getting there and 
with our CARES Act, uh, with the instructional components of iReady, we will add that component. It's awesome. I knew a online digital program that we I really liked that we cut last last month. So that would have been great. Um, all right, the schools figure out. Uh, there's a lot. There seems to be a lot of press. Um, a lot of a lot of push onto the principals because of site base being so different, 72 miles long and everything else. Um, I, I, I did just want to say a big shout out to the people who are on this call that are, are thinking about this. A lot of what we're doing today not only hinges on the safety of our students, but each one of those principals. Yes. And I Thank think you. that like literally when I'm looking at this every step that we come into, it's basically school-based decisions. This is what you're coming up with. The time frame that they have and the short, small limited time to get this done um, I think that every single, I'll, I'll just say it, every one of my parents that usually calls up with these little issues, um, I think that I'm going to request them to not call the principal and bother them so much because of the amount of stuff that we have. Um, we need to send a message that these principals are, are on the front lines, the tip of the spear, and that they're about to do something that they've never been requested to do before. And I think that our community needs to understand. I think that, in a way, a lot of our principals are going to be heroes in the situation for this, the situations that, that are transpire at our schools. So I think that part of our communication, if there's any way to, because we always do talk about our kids, we always talk about school board members, but very rarely do we put our principals out in front of the in front of the spotlight and say, "You guys are amazing." So if we can somehow find a way to do that through this process, that'd be great. Um, all right. Uh, uh, Mr. Susan, I just want to thank you for saying that, but I'll also add, it's our assistant principals and our deans that are going to be, I mean, it is going to take the entire school community working extremely hard to get to accomplish this for Ms. all Clark, of you, our children. You realize you just put me in the doghouse, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we appreciate you saying Perhaps. That. <laughs> um, fourth bullet on page 35. It talks about each teacher will utilize focus. That's going to be the one point that our, our parents go to for all of their academic needs as far as this goes. Is that? Um, ish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Bronstein, we've mentioned her a few times um, with Russell's team, uh, his other side of the house, Randy George and the tech folks. Um, they've been working through some modifications with focus that will directly connect things to uh, Google Classroom. So majority, a lot of our teachers utilize Google Classrooms. One of the changes we're expecting to see, um, I don't want to put pressure on day one, but shortly thereafter, um, the, <laughs> Dr. Bronstein said they've already worked with Focus on it. And Focus, it'll link directly to the Google Classroom. Because that's where a lot of our teachers and parents were frustrated, because teachers are doing really great things with Google Classroom. It will now link in it. Perfect. And they're working on, um, with some other vendors, on potentially adding that link. So I know that they've secured the linkage to Google Classroom, and I know that she's looking at other linkages as well. Perfect. That's the one thing that I think we could clean up in, in Mr. Cheatham. Everything that you've been doing is absolutely amazing to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that having the parents have less points really helps in the whole delivery process. Um, and they're all pros now, so we're not worried about our parents. I don't know. I was with one yesterday for a while. It, he's he's going to take a while. Um, next thing is, is that on page 36, uh, we were talking about a lot of the playgrounds not being able to be used. We were talking about not dressing kids out. Um, have we given the PE teachers some kind of adaptive activity stipend to help develop some kind of other activities? Because we know if some of those kids don't get their energy out, but they're literally going to drive us crazy, right? Like my son's included in that. Yeah. I may be too. Um, but if you have activity, is there, a, like, yeah. have we worked with them um, on that? You've met Rachel Winston. Yes. And so you know she's living, breathing, Force, and dying this. Force um, of nature. And we've had several emails. Um, she is putting together resources in the confines. I just had an email from her last week. She's like, all right, we've got a new plan rolling. So yes, um, she'll be uh, working with some of her leadership team and teachers to be identifying some of those best practices. Um, this summer has been a gift and, and, and a, a, a struggle in that our, our resource teachers, our content specialists, our 10-month teachers, 
um, but a gift in that several of our national organizations have put together some really great resources. And so I think every single na national organization has done content specific guidelines. And so yes, they will be getting additional resources and strategies. Perfect. And then on page 37, the volunteer piece, love the virtual IEP meetings. I couldn't tell you, I remember going to those as a teacher, having that as an opportunity to be inside your classroom possibly in the future. I love that, thank you for doing that, that's amazing. Um, but I did, and then um, I had one question down here, contracted service providers, uh, self-screener prior. Can you just tell me what a self-screener is for our contractors? Yeah, sure. It's it's the same one we're asking employees to do, um, but again, we've just got new guidelines for the CDC. So we're looking at those uh, people like our uh, our um, you know our behavior uh, techs that may be coming from a private agency to come in and work in our schools, having them complete a self screener before they come in, um, and and it includes now a couple of questions. So we that's going to be adjusted, and it may end up being a couple of questions that they're asked upon entering the building. I, I just haven't had a chance to really look at what we developed versus what the CDC put out uh, late yesterday afternoon. Yeah, and, I, and I'm so sorry you're having to deal with that consistently over and over again. Um, so there is, so, so I'm hearing you say it's a couple of questions maybe, or is it a temperature check we're doing? What, what are we doing here? Sorry to bring up Do temperature you wanna, Yeah, because you have it sitting right in front of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is what we do for people entering our clinic. We ask them, have you been in contact, close contact with anybody with COVID, have you been diagnosed with COVID? Because people still come in even though they know they're positive. Um, have you been tested and are pending results? And the biggest one, do you have any symptoms? And we go through a list of symptom screenings for them. So those are the four or five questions that we ask everyone that's coming in our building. And that's what the guidance is to ask anyone coming into any of the schools as well. Perfect, okay. And then my last question is, is um, we had some volunteers that came on campus last year, specific, and I was wondering if we're allowed to use those, and that is goats. Are we allowing our goats to come on campus? Well, Sue, what is the classification <laughs> for the goats as far as volunteer status and working status? Volunteers. I don't think they, they, they were volunteers. volunteers. Well, they, they were, were contracted service. That's right. So, so they'll they be screened. So I'm hearing you say that they fall under contracted services and they will be screened prior to coming on our campus every time. Is that true? Uh, I will. I will personally meet each of them because I need a. I need a goat break. <laughs> That's all my questions, Ms. Belcher. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suzo. All right. Uh, everybody, good to roll into Ms. Moore with 38 through 42. Would anyone need a break? I know yes. we've kind of been taking by all means. <laughs> yes, take it as you need it. No worries. I did the same. All right, Ms. Moore, do you need a break before we go into your no, section? No, I just, I actually, I just took a break, and I was hoping you would cover all these slides while I was out, yeah. but that didn't, <laughs> didn't happen. Maybe I, I need to go on a break. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I, I feel like I need to thank uh, Dr. Mullins and the board, because since having this job, um, I became an expert on threat assessment and had to attend trainings with Secret Service and the FBI. and. I became an expert on EKG and ECGs, and um, and I will tell you, uh, I, I, I keep pumping Patty, saying, I have 31 years in, Patty. Will I be hired at the health department? You got a job. There you go. <laughs> that's oh. dependent on a reference. No, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and I can't do that myself. So, okay. so um, this next section is all about, it's, it's all about the actual illness itself, COVID. And I think it should start with kind of understanding what happens when somebody is tested. Um, so when somebody gets tested at the health department or, or at another agency, the results go to the health department. And they do um, kind of close contact tracing. So who is your immediate family? Who have you been around a lot? That kind of very, very close contact tracing. And then they say to the individual who is tested positive, now you tell everybody else you make sure that you make contact with the other people that might be rippled out from there. Is that pretty accurate? It, that's very accurate. Okay. In the beginning of COVID, we would do extended contacts. Now with over 2,800 cases, trying to get everybody, what grocery store have you been to? Where have you been socially? We can't do that. So we focus on the immediate household and the close contacts and then leave it up to the, the client or the patient 
to tell their extended contacts. So in this first category of students or staff <coughs> exposed, it relies on that very first piece that we get informed of it. So, you know, I think it's good to understand right there, there's a human, there's a human piece. Um, so taken from that understanding, I'll kind of go through the rest. So if a student or staff uh, is exposed to contact, um, so the first, the, the first group of people I wanna talk about is um, somebody who is a contact with somebody who is diagnosed or has a presumed case. And I talked about a presumed case earlier. All a presumed case is, is I, I, I know somebody who has been diagnosed, I'm close to somebody who is diagnosed with COVID and I too have symptoms. We are gonna presume that you have, um, that there's a presumption that you have COVID. So for a student or staff that lives with somebody like that, they are quarantined for 14 days. The critical infrastructure piece gets set aside if you live, if your husband, if your daughter has COVID, you are quarantined with them for 14 days. The little asterisk on the end of that is that if you start developing symptoms, you are now a presumptive case. So you're in a different category. So a student whose mom has COVID and we're made aware, they're uh, excluded from school for 14 days and are put on an instructional plan a teacher whose husband or wife or child has COVID, they are excluded from school for 14 days. The questions that relate to that, like leave and can they work, those are all, those are all HR questions and they're working through them. Because right now we're under a memo that expires on July 31st that says if you can work from home, if the essential functions of your job can be done at home, you're gonna do them. But now we're entering into a bargaining process so I think there's a lot of discussion to be had. So I don't know if you wanna talk to that at the end, Beth, at all? Whatever's best. Okay. Um, for a student or staff who traveled out of state in which the CDC guidelines still list it as a state that you should quarantine for 14 days, we're upholding those CDC guidelines. I'll tell you, we get, those are basically phone calls that we get. Uh, we've, we've labeled them, we've labeled us the tattletale police. Uh, because we get a lot of phone calls, you know, my neighbor's son's brother went to North Carolina and now they're in school. And we, we track down every single one of them. Uh, we get sent pictures and we, get, and we track down every single one of them. Um, so the other half of that is then we get on the CDC website and see what areas of the country are still under, uh, under an order and quite frankly Arizona Texas and Florida right now are I think the highest growing areas if I'm correct um, if a student's uh, absence is directed to by a doctor or by us uh, to be quarantined we're, we're considering that a doctor's note just so that you have that in your heads for all of these absence absences um, and we are telling employer employees right now that um, if they have already, uh, if they have the option of applying for COVID leave, if they've already used their COVID leave, they do have other leave to, um, to apply for. And so that's kind of where we're, we're at with that one. I think it's, before I go on to the next slide, I think it's important to understand uh, what a contact to a contact is and a contact to a case. Because it's not on these slides, but I think it's important in some of the questions that might be going through your heads. So I imagine every single person in this room is a contact to a contact. It means that I know somebody who knows somebody that tested positive. And in terms of what we do with that, not much. If we're a contact to a contact, we get on with our lives. There should be no presumption that we've caught COVID. There's, there's no additional precautions that we need to take. If we become a contact to a case, not somebody we live with, if we become, as adults in this area, contact to a case, the government has already identified us as critical infrastructure workers which means that we now have to, have to, required to wear masks, 
and we are required to, to have a screening done at the school each day, which would include a, a temperature check and a series of questions. What I was talking about earlier is if we were contact to a case and that case is in our own home. If that case is in our own home, we are quarantined for 14 days with them. So those are the instances of exposure that we have dealt with so far. Um, at one point, uh, somebody said, Chris, you just need to, to write out a checklist and say, here's what you do in this case. Um, I will tell you, I've probably handled I can't tell you the number of cases I've handled, and no one has been exactly the same um, because the series of questions that I have to ask to be able to get to what really is happening in the building, it is not just contact tracing, but, but place tracing and, uh, and just going through to figure out, you know, what parts of the building do we have to shut down, who do we have to bring in to clean it, who needs to be, uh, who do we need to exclude from school or from work, uh, and in each case, I call Patty, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, sometimes Patty and I answer the same question the same way 10 times, and on the 11th time, both she and I go, wait a second. <laughs> okay, That's wait a second, true. we know the answer to this. So uh, it is important to know that, and for the community to know, we talk to the Department of Health on every single instance. <laughs> Much to their dismay sometimes. No, no. So going on to the, uh, the next slide, now it's when a student or a staff is diagnosed. And again, it is dependent on uh, them notifying us. Now, the Department of Health, when they are able, they will notify us when a student is ill with an infectious disease. Uh, but right now, what has, uh, what has happened is there are so many testing sites that actually you get your information about whether you tested positive or negative before it actually gets sent to the Department of Health. A lot of our families are choosing to go to Orlando because they have the rapid test over in Orlando. That takes a while to get to our Department of Health. So um, in order for us to really get the information quickly, we're dependent on uh, people to tell us that I have tested positive. So when we have a positive response in coordination with Department of Health, uh, we will determine how much and for how long some, some part or whole of a building needs to be shut down. So in the case of um, other infectious diseases, so I'll give you the case of chickenpox, when the Department of Health notifies us that a student has chickenpox, uh, our first step is to pull the immunization records and anybody who is not immunized for chickenpox is excluded from school. In this case, there is no immunization, so there's no immunization record, so anybody is equally as likely in that school to have had contact with that student. And we don't presume to know all of the, all of the places that a child goes in a building or the siblings that they may have. So um, we quickly started down the path of, if we have a case, we know we're gonna shut down buildings. And then we quickly started listing all of the exceptions to that. An example would be a student who is transported on a bus, who only attends one classroom, has no interaction with any other student there because they're in a special needs program. That would not be a case where we would look at shutting down a whole building because they would have had very, very limited exposure to the rest of the campus. On the other hand, you might have a student who has three siblings and that student tested positive and the other students are, are awaiting and we know we need to shut that campus down for three days. And we shut the campus down for three days because those rooms or areas of the campus that were used need to be vacant for 24 to 48 hours and then need a deep cleaning before we can allow students in. So when we talk about uh, right there, the BPS response team in coordination with the Department of Health, the Department of Health actually as, is a member of that response team uh, in terms of that coordination, and we will make a recommendation to the superintendent of how much of a building or if an entire building needs to be shut down for three days. In addition to that, that student that tested positive and everybody who lives with that student would be excluded for school for 14 days. So the next big question I get asked a lot at is communication and how much we can or can't communicate. 
So the Department of Health uh, uh, in Tallahassee has generated a letter that, um, that we have been using uh, in the return to activity uh, plan. And I've sent you guys a copy of that. I think I've sent you guys a copy of that letter so that you could see it. Um, if not, I'll be happy to. But it basically says uh, a child at school X, uh, your child may have come into contact with a child at school X who, who has tested positive. It's very general. It is specifically worded. The only language that's changed on there at all is changed by our Department of Health, and they add the school name in there. And it is uh, provided to the students who are direct contacts to the student that was uh, positively impacted, uh, who was positively identified. In the case of a whole school having to be shut down, that communication is going to come from us. It's going to come through district communications. And our biggest concern right now is if we get a test positive case that we find out about on a Monday evening, how do we let parents know we're having to shut down a, a school on Tuesday morning? So uh, we're working through that process and we're working through the response team process. And that's going to be basically our main focus for the, my uh, main focus with that team for the next two weeks because we need to be on solid ground for what that looks like. When a building is shut down, uh, the custodial strike team will be, um, uh, will be implemented. Um, right now, that strike team consists of Petronica and Jim Powers. Uh, Jim Powers uh, has been my main contact through all of this and has been outstanding. He coordinates with the school where they, need to, where they need to go, all of the areas in the building that have been impacted, that they were shut down, that they have the appropriate supplies, and asks if they need support from the district in terms of manpower. He then follows up with um, us here at the district as well as the uh, principal. Here's, here's everything that we have done. Here's everything that we have implemented. Do you need additional support? Um, the return to school, I'm going to talk about a little bit later what it's going to take for, um, for the students in, infected uh, with COVID to return to school or who are in, under that, kind, that quarantine order because a family member is infected. But um, the return to school for the rest of the uh, campuses is, is going to be decided by the response team and the Department of Health. Um, again, we, our goal, our goal is that we want to keep kids in school. Um, but we want to keep kids in school safely. And we have to follow past, pres past precedents. And we also have to follow the guidelines that we know um, and keep kids safe. I will tell you the number one question I get now is uh, somebody calling up to find out if there's a case someplace. Uh, parents parents want to know, parents are scared, and they want to know what we're doing about it. Um, and so I think it's important for parents to kind of know that process and what we're doing about it. it it's going to impact our whole community when we have to shut down a building for three days. And much like Dr. Sullivan, uh, I'm using the term uh, when. Uh, in the case when we do have to do that, we are going to implement our instructional of uh, our continuity of instruction plan and our continuity of food services plan. Um, so we already have that have that being developed uh, that have already been developed that we're going to implement. I'll tell you um, one of the tasks that I know leading and learning and their teams are looking at is. Uh, what happens on a three-day closure. You know, if you have to implement um, a continuity of instruction plan and you have to uh, get out technology, you know, <clears throat> three days isn't even enough time to get out technology, uh, much less get it in. So what would a three-day uh, instructional continuity plan look like? Um, and then there's going to be cases where we may have to shut down for longer periods of time. And what does that continuity of instruction uh, plan look like? So um, they're going to be looking at phased out and phased in continuity of instruction plans. So when can people return to the building? So an employee or a student who has an asymptomatic case of COVID-19 uh, may return after 14 days meaning we can't tell when, uh, when the symptoms started or stopped because they never had any. So from the point of the test, they can come back within 14 days. 
Uh, we are looking at the legalities of whether we can require a negative test result prior to them returning. We don't have that answer yet. Uh, an employee or a student who has a confirmed or a presumed case can return 10 days after the last symptom has passed without medication. So if you remember, I said somebody who is quarantining with a family member and they're a presumed, uh, and they're not a presumed case, they're just quarantining with a family member, I said they have to stay home for 14 days unless they become symptomatic. Once they become symptomatic, they are now a presumed case, and so they have to stay home for 10 days beyond their last symptom. Um, and again, we're, we're looking at the legalities of whether we can require a negative test prior to anybody returning. Uh, and I think I already covered this. I'm pretty sure I already covered this. I did. Employees or students who live with someone with a confirmed case, uh, they are not allowed to return to school or work for 14 days unless they become symptomatic in which case they have to stay uh, 10 days out uh, past their last symptom without medication. So our, our medically vulnerable uh, students, we talked a little bit about that uh, individual health plan. Um, we're, spending much, we're spending much more time on emphasizing student teachers' responsibilities for understanding what that health plan is and how it needs to be implemented. Um, we expect those plans to be fully implemented for each of our uh, medically fragile students. Um, we also want to make sure that we're looking if those students actually have a 504 plan in place or a chronic health condition or if need be, uh, if, it, if it's appropriate, an IEP. So we sometimes will get a student that uh, has a chronic health condition and you know, five years later, we're looking at a loss of academic achievement, and we realize that that student uh, should have had a 504 plan. Um, and so we really want to take a look at all of our medically fragile students and make sure all of the appropriate legal paperwork is in place to protect them, uh, their, their um, medical needs, and their educational needs. Uh, an another big ask of our parents is to work very closely with our school clinics as they go through this process. I'll tell you one of the things that has been, I'll be frank, very frustrating to me is my negotiators. Uh, when I say you have to stay home for 14 days and people start negotiating with me. But what if I get a, a negative test result? Um, well, you can get a negative test result if you're in an incubation period. Well, what if uh, my, my spouse um, gets better and gets a negative test result beyond the 14 days? Well, now you could be in the incubation period. Uh, I, I will tell you that I started asking all of the negotiation questions to the Department of Health. I would say, but what about this? But what about that? Because I really, really wanted to support our people that want to be in the building. Um, and after they answered each one with with a medically logical sound answer, I realized there's a reason why 14 days was put in place and 10 days beyond the last symptom. And so I, I'll tell you, um, now I, I, I just answer the negotiators with, this is, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, if I get something different or new, I'll be happy to share it with Patty. Um, but right now we're, we're kind of getting the same, the same questions. So when we talk about school closure, um, it can be closed for two different reasons. And I think it's important for our public um, to understand that we have to be responsive for both. The first reason is for health. Um, if we have a case positive that we know impacted a, a large section of the school and we know we're going to have to close it down for cleaning, um, that's a health concern. But our other concern is when operationally we can't function. Uh, we asked uh, some of the principals, the secondary principals, because I haven't uh, been on with the elementary principals yet, to send me their estimate of when they can no longer safely operate the school. How many people have to be out sick before you are unable to run classes? Because if, if we don't have teachers and we can't get subs, uh, and we begin to use all of our auxiliary personnel to be in those classrooms, at some point we're um, combining classes or putting kids into close quarters that are dangerous. And so we know operationally that there is going to become a tipping point where we can no longer operate schools with a lack of personnel there. 
I'll tell you, um, the percentages have have surprisingly all come in from the principals at around the same percentage. So I'll be sharing that with Cabinet on Monday, and we'll be uh, we'll be kind of looking through the mathematics of that to see what that means for us. Um, but we will have kind of a standard when we reach this point. The response team will review the case and bring it to the superintendent for a recommendation. It is important to know that um, the the cabinet does not uh, close buildings. The Department of Health doesn't close buildings. The superintendent has to make that recommendation. So we'll be making the recommendation to him based on the conversations that we uh, that we have as a response team. The other thing that we've talked about in an effort to keep buildings open and running is there may be there may be and and I don't even presume to guess where we may end up in this a situation in which two buildings um, might be at 50% capacity and the loss of personnel is causing an, uh, an inability to run that building there may be an opportunity for those buildings to be combined to keep running with the personnel there I don't know what that looks like but I don't want to not have it here and surprise you with it later. Uh, I don't view this as a first, a second, or even a fifth resort, but I do see this as an, uh, as, as an opportunity to keep a building functioning if we've fallen below critical mass and able to, in, in, uh, able, with us being able to run it um, safely. Brian, you've waited all day. You're up. Okay, none of us got a yay. None of us. None of us. You didn't wait all day, though. They're waiting for me to say something so different. So, anyway. You were just trying to wake him up. Yes. I stayed awake, Dr. Mom. Well, I looked over at him, and I thought I needed to ease him into where we were. <laughs> My battery went dead three hours ago, and I didn't rate enough to get a packet, so I apologize. So, hey, first of all, I want to thank the board and obviously thank Dr. Mullins and all the leadership team for, for bringing in on uh, – to the task force early on. So we're part of the big picture and see what's occurring. Um, clearly, you know how the sheriff feels and all of you feel. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. Um, with, with security obviously being a, a priority for all of us. With that being said, um, I was tasked with some questions about our drills. We're obviously fluid and flexible, just like the whole conversation has been today but within the confines of what the statutory requirements are. So there's some news media outlets reporting that there may be a reduction in drills for this upcoming school year. We have gotten no guidance on that whatsoever from the Office of Safe School. So there is a class, a conference at the end of the month that Mr. Novelli is attending. There could be some additional guidance come out of that, but it, for right now, we can't wait. We want to be transparent <laughs> with, with our community, with our parents to say, hey, here's what we're trying to do with our drills. So again, all drills must be completed for Florida State statute. It's not an option for this district. We must do it, and we should do it. So we do lockdown drills. We're not getting into the weeds of our security procedures. Our lockdown drills, everyone knows, involves lights going out, and, and our children, our students go into a safe place. We have to think globally here during this pandemic. If we can avoid putting all of those kids our students into a confined area, we should. And what we should be doing is talking about the procedure from A to Z with them. We don't suspend the drills, but we, there's things we can do to mitigate the drills, mitigate that, that particular, you know, put them in, in that particular situation and spreading any type of uh, virus. So that's what we're gonna do unless we receive guidance a week before school starting from the Office of Safe Schools or, or someone else that tells us otherwise. So that's what we're planning for now. Uh, evacuation drills, uh, you'll see the bullet point here, will be conducted with consideration of social distancing guidelines. But again, we gotta remember where that's practical. Um, our students will evacuate in an orderly fashion during the drills, try and maintain that social distancing to the best of our extent, and still go through the motions. It's so important that our students know what to do during an emergency, and we can't ever lose sight of that. Now, on the other side of that, if there's a true emergency, we all know if we order a lockdown, we expect our students to go into their safe place. If it's a true emergency, there's no other way around that. And I think that would be the expectation 
of everybody here and, and our parents. Uh, when it comes down to our SROs and our, and our safety specialists, their roles haven't changed. Obviously, you know, some of the procedures they do, they'll have to social distance as well uh, throughout the day, but their roles haven't changed. They'll be there doing the same thing. They'll be there assisting with, with our staffs at the schools. They have a daunting task with all of this. So we're just there to help out in any way we can. Thank you. So that takes us to Brevard After School, I think, Jane. Yes, it does. So okay. they're, I'm they're supposed to take. I was apparently supposed to take questions after 42. Or, or it, it's your, it's your decision. We go through these two. Are you guys good? If we, good. We've got two more with Jane, and then we can go back and take questions from 42 on through. Is that good for all? Miss McDougall, you good with that? I'm good with that. All right, Miss Klein. So. Um, New to my world, uh, Brevard After um, Care, uh, we are working on protocols to have a program because it has been requested. Uh, it is part of so many routines, but we have to put the social distancing and other procedures in place. So we are currently uh, working on a uh, plan to have both before and after school in, our, in all of our 57 elementary schools. We'll follow the same guidelines to include the hand washing and the cleaning protocols. We're working on developing a staggered entry plan of the parents dropping off, uh, where the drop off will be, um, the sign in, sign out form, and doing that electronically, as well as the pick, off, pick up procedures. Uh, we are going to ask students to keep their backpacks and their personal items with them instead of uh, typically they keep them, you know, kind of put them in the corner and everybody grabs them. We're asking students to keep their own items with them. We will use the cafeteria social distancing plan that we currently have for food service. We'll be cleaning between each, um, each time uh, students move about the program. We will use uh, small group activities following social distancing, but we may have to limit enrollment if, um, based on the capacity of the room in which is available in the school and how many students we can safely uh, put in there. For example, right now we're um, at 50 for a, a group, so we would have to limit that unless we had more than one space within an elementary school. So that's where we are. Uh, we're meeting with um, Dr. Karen Ivory from my um, division has um, um, put, been uh, given the task to take over uh, the leadership of Brevard Aftercare as the director. And then uh, we've hired a new coordinator, Teresa Kavanoff. So the two of them are working on plans to uh, activate this in a social safe manner for opening in the fall. And then the last slide we have is, this is not a complete list, but it is the beginning. Um, some of these things are already in place and some of them are just reminders for principals. Um, they have to develop a registration process that limits direct contact um, and, and large group gatherings. Um, that includes our faculty meetings uh, because if the faculty is more than 50, we have to um, figure out a way and we have to do that with social distancing. A lot of our schools are already thinking about outside, uh, in the, under the pavilions, uh, different places to have their beginning the school faculty meetings. Um, we have to make sure that not only our teachers and our custodial staff, but any of our substitutes are trained in the uh, procedures and protocols related to COVID-19. Uh, we have to, they have to plan for how they're gonna replenish the PPE equipment that we've given them using the monies that we've set aside through CARES. Um, they have to plan the classroom cleaning protocol when the classes rotate. 
And this is also when a class may be at recess. Our custodians could be in cleaning that classroom at that time. Uh, the hallway movement patterns, we've talked about a little bit, but minimizing that face-to-face -face contact. Um, ensure that all our custodians have completed the training and the protocols about infection control. Uh, we have to place posters, and as Dr. Sullivan said earlier, Molly Vega has taken on the role of uh, ordering posters for our schools. But we're going to have the COVID-19 educational materials. We're going to strategically place those throughout the, the school and the classrooms. Um, we are verifying that the classrooms are set up to maximize, di maximize distance. I think it was Mr. Susan said, earlier said, how are we going to verify that these things are going on? Well, the directors uh, and Dr. Sullivan and I will be working directly with the principals to make sure that these things are in place and are followed up. We have to plan for the family engagement activities to be virtual. We talked earlier about kindergarten, and, but it's not just kindergarten. It's transition from sixth grade to seventh grade. It's transition from eighth grade to ninth grade. Parents want to know what the school looks like and it may be their first experience in that school so we have to provide that virtual experience um, we have to um, it came up a lot in our um, feedback the arrival and dismissal procedures you know in elementary we use our patrols they're opening doors well, we have to rethink that because we can't expose a patrol to opening a car door and not knowing the situation in that car. So uh, a lot has gone into, uh, our principals are already working this, and I know all of you said, you know, hats off to our principals. It is truly um, a very unique and very different time for our principals, but um, we are trying all of us are trying to guide and support them and direct them and give them additional uh, support. And I think that, um, you know, we, like I said earlier, we have, I have work groups that are working around to, to help solve and be the thought partners for our principals. And, um, and that work is ongoing. So that is the principal's checklist. And I believe we have covered it all. Woo -hoo. Good job, team. <laughs> yeah. We're gone. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do you want to break before we circle back with the uh, revisit list, Dr. Mullins, or do you want to trudge through? I'd like to go through the list just then go to the next one. Yeah, we, we didn't take the question, the Q&A, after that last section. You are um, correct. So I, I would suggest we do that, just to follow where we've been. Um, if we do break to get food, I would propose a working pizza yes. discussion. Um, right. And uh, so. All right, so I will take questions from slides 38 to 45. Ms. Campbell? Um, so, just, where did it go? Um, on the principal checklist, the replenishment of initial supplies and PPE, that is, that is going to be expected to come from their CARES funding that you've set aside for each school. That is correct. That we talked about this morning or whatever yes, it was. Yes, sometime today. And um, our um, procurement team, Don, Bronze, no, Don Richard has, uh, is developing a list of where we've already purchased things and so okay. that the supplies are. So we have the, the bulk pricing, whatever. They'll just need to keep track of their own, how, it's, how their supply list is going, mm -hmm. how their supplies are going. Okay. And then um, I would just say this, this part, the closing school part, this is the part that makes me nauseous. You know. In and out, in and out. And I'm sure you guys have been nauseous for weeks thinking about it too. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about 
is we've briefly it's been mentioned every now and then is the sub the substitute situation you know i've got teachers emailing me saying you know we can't do the oh we can't, don't have a sub so we got to split classes and combine them and we can't do that so are those the kind of situations if we consist and i know sometimes even principals will step in and sub for a class and 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 cover and you know subs don't get a planning period so because they go cover you're not as a sub uh, guaranteed a planning period anyway but if we get to a situation where we're just not covering are those the kind of circumstances where you're talking about we we'll have to close yeah. temporarily we're, we're looking at what the threshold is for the response team to review it um, and it's not just we have a one day where we have 20 percent of our faculty out it is a, we have 20% of our faculty out and they are projected to be out for so many more days. Right. So um, it's, hard, it's hard to talk about it right now only because we haven't determined that threshold. Um, I've gotten feedback from maybe five or six uh, secondary principals so far. Haven't uh, been able to speak to the elementary principals yet since we started talking about this part of it two days ago. <laughs> Um, uh, but we're, what we're going to do is, is just try to get some feedback from them. I mean, they know how they can safely function in their building and, and continue to instruct students and meet the guidelines of the plan. Uh, and then we'll take that percentage uh, to cabinet and we'll determine what the threshold is to review. Okay. Um, I started out kind of really black and white on things that, you know, we're going to absolutely do it this way. Uh, and now having, uh, I'm going to say, I've, I've been through probably 30 or 40 different COVID scenarios. I realize that there's all kinds of gray in there that needs to be worked through. So that's our plan. Gotcha. Ms. Campbell, if, if I could add, it's going to seem strange at first, but this was a strong factor in our block recommendation. Yeah. Um, because a, a student who's found out to be positive is gonna in almost certainty have four teachers seven you know so I can wipe out seven. seven teachers for 14 days in one fell swoop and that's one student attending seven classes in a day and um that was one of the reasons we pressed past it's hard it's this it's that it's whatever one student seven teachers one fell swoop and that's okay. assuming there's not other subcontext with the coach that's his buddy, you know, and this and that. Um, one student can have that kind of impact on a school. And not that four is better, um, but it's better. Right. <laughs> and so uh, those, those people in contact in are a potential risk for being on the 14-day quarantine. Right. And, just, and, potential, and potential risk because they're critical infrastructure workers. So there's, right. there's, we got to always keep that in mind. Right. And the other thing that's going through my mind, and because I just, I know you're, you're, we're still tweaking how this is going to happen, but uh, on our FSVA call a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you're listening in, Ms. Belford, but we had um, the lady who is, uh, I can't remember what her name is, but she's at the State Department of Health. Um, one of the doctors, the, epi the main epidemiologist for the Dr. for the Blackmore. state. Hmm? Dr. Blackmore? Probably. Blackmore. <laughs> <laughs> I can find it in my email. But one of the things that she said was, because they, they specifically asked, and I remember typing in this question in the chat, so you're telling me if there's a positive case in a classroom that that whole classroom plus the teacher, all those people are to be you know, quarantined for 14 days. And she clarified, she said, well, it's going to depend on who's directly around the student you know and, and and even to the point of saying well every teacher every day needs to kind of have a picture of who's there and where they're sitting or whatever and you know your assigned seat because she said you know a student who was 20 feet across the room all day is not necessarily a contact point so are we going to get down to that specific or we're going to say there's a positive case in this classroom so the whole entire class plus the teacher they're all well except for the teacher because they're an essential worker they're all they're all going home or are we going to say all right this group of kids around that positive case mm -hmm. and i plus i saw them you know smooch in the hallway or whatever mm -hmm. you know they're all going home so no smooching on campus but you know what happens uh, i'll just tell you the cases just uh i want you to think in terms of of your parents the parents that are in uh that are going to call your offices the parents whose kids are in our schools um so in the elementary setting um, basically, the guidelines are within six feet for longer than 15 minutes. 
So we can assume any one of our kids is in, uh, is in contact with her, their peers for longer than 15 minutes in either the elementary setting or the secondary setting. In an elementary setting, uh, when they're in with the same teacher all day long, there's no way, no way I couldn't say that kids weren't around each other uh, closer than six feet, uh, farther away than six feet. Um, in the secondary setting, now you're looking at not just contact tracing one classroom with 25 kids or 28 kids, you're looking at contact tracing across seven classrooms and hallways and cafeterias. So I, I hesitate to give you an answer other than um, we're going to do the best we can with the information that we have. We will be sending students home. Uh, we are going to use the guidance that um, if we cannot prove they weren't within six feet for longer than 15 minutes, we're going to err on the side of caution. And the phone calls that you are going to get are going to be on both ends of the spectrum. How dare you send my child home for 14, as well as how dare you not tell me that there was a COVID case and you did not do something about it. So um, I, it is a lose-lose uh, proposition, but the win is that we're keeping kids safe and healthy. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I said earlier, I don't have to like it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Campbell. And Ms. Moore, Ms. Duskiv or Ms. Campbell, did you have more for this section, or are you good? No, the only other comments I have are, are just, or questions rather, are just general, not on this section. I, they can be. Okay. Ms. Duskovich, did you have anything for this particular section? No, I'm good for right now. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McDougall, did you have anything for this particular section? Mr. Susan, I'm afraid to ask. Yep, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> nope. Um, so one of the so going to first page, which is 38. Uh, does the DOH have the capability to cross the addresses and notify us of the tests? Meaning, out in the random world of of this testing environment, um, you know, this guy tests. All of a sudden, we look back at the address. And that matches, ding, 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 BPS's addresses, and we notify. Is there a back tunnel like that or no? For BPS to notify? No, for us to be notified by you, if a test in the county is positive, that is also at one of our addresses, so that we can be notified prior to the families. Because I know in some cases, and this is just my thoughts and not fact, but I know in some cases some parents would, would, they may not tell people because they're afraid that their child is going to be labeled, so they just keep them out, right? And that's okay. But for the, our protection, we may need that. Is there a way to do that or no? I can tell you, just like with any other contagious disease, if we get notified, and we do get notified of every positive COVID, if we know that the child is school, we go to the school district and say, hey, there's a positive case in this school. So we can't identify the address of the, of the person. Okay. We can't even identify the student um, to anybody except we can tell them what school they're in, but we can't notify anybody else. So of the you know the school that the, peop the student attends, but no other information? We, as DOH, no, we know, we know everything about the student so you know all of so whether it's a student or whether it's a person that tests for the covid they have you have their address you have everything right for us to do contact tracing correct is that address then provided if we give you a list of our addresses a ping that says call caller because no. no we don't do that we can't do that that's that's hipaa that's all that okay correct okay. Okay. We notify the school district when there's a child in the school that's positive, and then they take it from there as to what school, what classroom, okay. and they do that. It's just something I was wondering yeah. because it would help us identify. Um, okay, so we have a lot of these things, 14 days, 10 days, all of that, and I'm assuming that that is directly from the CDC. We talked about that, right? Um, yeah, so the the... Guidelines that we got from the CDC, um, the 10 days, I kept saying it was 10 days plus three days beyond our last fever. Um, and so I combined those two things and looking at the way it's written now, this is the way it's gonna be written in our plan. It is 10 days from the onset of symptoms 
and 72 hours beyond the last fever without taking medicine, and 72 hours since the symptoms have improved. So it's a, it's a longer standard, but that's, what, that's how it's going to read. And if for some reason the CDC comes out next week and says, we changed all that. Yes. Are we going to adopt hours to follow the current CDC guidelines next week, or will we, in your mind, try to continue down the path that we're currently on with the 14 days and everything else? Yeah, one of the, uh, my recommendation would be that we follow the CDC and DOH guidelines. Um, if from they the, change, we change. If they change, we change. That okay. would be my recommendation. Okay. Um, this one caught me, and I, I wanted to get a little bit more in depth on it. Um, the sick leave employees would be able to apply for COVID leave and or, if it's already been used, to use their personal sick leave. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of when somebody in our district would have to use their sick leave? So if an employee... Um, already took their COVID leave if they were uh, either they were symptomatic or they took it for other reasons and then they came to school and then they got sick with COVID and their leave no longer existed their COVID leave no longer existed because they used it for the other reasons that they were allowed they would have to apply and use their sick leave okay so if, it's, if, if I'm an employee and I got I have test positive for COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm told to go home for 14 days. After the 14 days, I apply and get um, another test, and it shows that I still have it because we're seeing some symptoms up to 50, mm -hmm. 60 days. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that there's a window where I may have to start using my own sick leave based upon the fact that I've already used it during that 50, 60 days the, the COVID? Uh, right now, the way we operate, and this is really HR, so if I step on it, Beth, would you rather me just shut up? No, you're actually doing very well, but if you want me to take over, yeah, I can. Yeah, take it, take it. <laughs> yes, they would be using their leave. Um, and we do have cases where somebody has already taken COVID leave or a portion of COVID leave while awaiting a negative test, uh, you know, and they've gotten a negative test and they've come back um, and then get sick later. Um, I'm anticipating more of that. I'm also anticipating uh, rather robust discussions with our unions about it as well. How long is COVID leave? There's um, under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that um, was put out, I guess, in March at some point, the emergency sick leave provision is 10 days. And there are six prongs to that emergency sick leave. Three of the prongs are at 100% of pay. Three of the prongs are at two-thirds pay. So we force everybody to stay out for 14 days but we only pay them through the sick leave piece that that 10 days right so there's four days that they would have to if they tested positive under the current ones use their own sick leave or not get paid yes that is correct there's potential for that and is that money from the covid backed up by a federal money or is that part of our cares act money that we already have no it's not part of cares act money this is the um the the expansion of uh fema uh, not fema i'm sorry the um, FMLA, and it's through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So we have, do we, uh, I'm, and I'm sorry to go through this because I just need to learn about it. We, we um, apply for that after the fact, or we've been given X amount of dollars that we tap into? We have not been given a specific amount of money. Um, in fact, right now we're just collecting the data on people who are out and we're paying, you know, we're just, we're working through payroll the same way we always would. Um, it's, as I understand it, a reimbursement kind of like FEMA we're applying for it it goes back we don't know how long there's no direction as to when we would get return pay on it or anything that's correct but just a second because I clarify the 14 and the 10 days the 10 days that we're required to pay those are working days correct and the 14 days someone have to be out those are literal days those are cal calendar days so that that's actually correct. would most of the time equate to 10 working days would be the 14 days does that make sense so it's not that they're going to be out 14 days and they only get paid for 10 of no, them. I couldn't agree with you more on okay. that. I, Just there's to going to be, that. but there are, there may be instances where that's not the case, but that, that's not where I'm going. I, I just, I, and maybe we need to discuss this now or Dr. Mullins tell me if we need to discuss it later, but I just got a problem with somebody that comes into our schools that tests positive for COVID and then all of a sudden they end up having to stay out because it's not their fault. They may be more symptomatic than anybody else, and then they're out 40 days. And then because they chose our profession, we end up not paying them for, the, for 30 of those 40 days, or however many that are actual 
work days. I, I have an issue with that. Like, I think that that's a big deal for me. So is that something we need to talk about later because we're going into negotiations, or is that something we discuss now? I don't know that we're prepared to talk about it now because it, I, it, what you're suggesting I would propose has uh, financial implications to the district. Um, so if that's a, if the board wants us to do an analysis of what that could be, that, that would take some time to do. We're not prepared to discuss that today, but we can certainly take direction from the board. So I was looking at this because I knew that it, when I was looking at it last night, I was trying to put together as fast as, as, fast as I could the numbers. We already allocate the amount of money that we need for the individuals that are inside of our schools through our budget. So the budgetary items that we would be referring to to get paid back for would be actual substitute costs. Is that the cost that we would be referring to? Dr. Thetty, do you know? No, not just substitute costs because with the, with the COVID leave, the, um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act would pay that amount of money for that leave, not for the substitute. Because keep in mind, many of these occurred while we weren't using substitutes at all. Right. We would still bear the cost of the substitute should that scenario that you just explained happen. Okay, so maybe now is not the time to talk about it because you're right, we need to do it. But how do we, what is the process for that? Being the fact that we're coming back early August um, and you want to, plan together that probably includes this to be signed off on what is the time period when when would you uh, when would you know the the ramifications behind this go to the teachers union and present it when would they i mean how where is that do you understand what i mean if it's now is not the time to talk about it and we're ramping up on a short schedule when is it that we should be discussing this as a board to give direction whether we support paying our people or not past the covid leave um, that we have I would I would first it's not part of this plan because it's really an employment factor not okay. a reopening factor okay so it's really two separate issues um, I, I'd have to get with the team and we'd have to develop a proposal of I, I anticipate it require doing some research knowing what the impacts are because it it will have implications on other employees requesting leave and being out as well so uh, it would require likely another board workshop just around that topic. Dr. Thetty, would you agree? I would concur with that. So is that something, can you give me a timeline that that normally would be occurred into? That way we can... Uh... We'll have to get together with financial services and do some uh, forecasting because right now we don't have that information. It's basically looking at, um, uh, I won't say guessing who that might affect, but the scenario that you're talking about, I'd have to work with the Department of Health to figure out how many people potentially that could affect. Um, if you're just talking about the additional days for somebody to be isolated, that's a different scenario. The other piece of it is what uh, Mrs. Moore talked about, which was you could have somebody who is a contact to a case that's a close familial relationship, right. and that person is, a, person is asymptomatic, but that person is home for 14 days and on the 14th day becomes symptomatic and then they could be out another 14 days. Sure. So those are all forecasting pieces that we would have to do, and that will take some time to make those projections. I just think that because they are part of a risk class, it makes them think that I, I, we are dealing with right now um, retention and recruitment. And if we're creating a system where people aren't going to feel confident about being paid back for a situation that, you know, is, is that they're walking into that they normally don't walk into. It's a conditioned environment that we have. I, 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 I don't know. I, I think that that becomes part of the conversation that individuals are going to have prior to coming back. That's all. So however, you, and I'm only one board member, and I don't mean to speak for my board in any way, but I'd love that thing to be as fast as possible because I see that as a huge issue with the teachers union and, and, my, and the teachers that we represent and staff. I would propose I need at least need Monday to meet with staff to develop a plan and a proposal, and I could bring an update to the board on Tuesday at the board meeting. Beautiful. Okay. Page 39. Who is on BPS's response team? Uh, right now that team is being formed, so I have a primary and a backup that represents HR. That's Beth Eddy, and the backup is Mike Alba. I have um, Stephanie Sullivan and Jane Klein representing leading and learning, and they're going to pr provide me both backups. Uh, I have uh, Jim, I think it's Jim Powers as my primary, and Pete Trnifka is my backup. 
I have Robin Novelli, who is my primary, and um, Kevin Thornton, who is the backup, and Patty. <laughs> and me and Jana Jenkins is my backup. Uh, I may have missed somebody, but that's, that's basically the, um, the makeup of the team. Is there a way to put the chair for the school district in that conversation at all, or is that not appropriate? I'm just trying to. I would suggest it's a day-to-day -day operation of the district, and, and uh, I would, the board would certainly remain informed of the direction or the discussion of the recovery what response, the response team. team. Response team. Um, I don't know that it'd be appropriate to have a board member on that team. Makes sense. In I can the, understand uh, that. In the governor's plan, that team is called a crisis team right. uh, because we already have that. It's we we chose to call it a, a response team. But just if you're crosswalking in the governor's plan, it's called a crisis team. Okay. And then we have our custodial strike team, and they're going to respond in the event that we have a. Um, an issue at one of the schools and in the event that we create multiple schools and we start getting to a point where the critical response team can't do we have as part of our plan that this has gotten to the point where we need to go virtual because of the amount you, I think Ms. Um, Belford had mentioned it earlier that there's like a critical point where we just say this we're shutting down the, the this this area this district and everything else can we make sure that a part of the district that that's part of the plan or no we're looking at uh, on Monday when I, we start talking about thresholds that's part of the conversation and I I don't know how far we're going to get in that discussion um, but it is part of the part of what the response team is going to be working through is those thresholds now keep in mind I think we have to get direction dr. Mullins and permission from the DOE to shut down the district, if I'm correct. Yeah, Ms. Mr. Susan, I, I, did I hear you correctly to say if we get to a place that we need to close the district? I think if we all close schools, the, if we close the district down, I apologize. That comes from the DOH. That comes from from the DOE. top, right? DOE. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. It just seems like there's the. the so to um, clarify, are you you speaking of actually closing a school? Like, yeah. No one reports for a period of time. Yeah. So. Um, so a pile of, apologize what was the question the related thresholds to that thresholds that you're going to adopt on Monday can you bring those to the board on Tuesday so that we can see them oh I don't know that we're going to adopt those thresholds on Monday that that's the beginning of our conversation um, I, I can't say that we're going to walk out with a defined plan on that the response team isn't meeting for the first time until th Thursday morning I believe um, so I, I don't know that I'm going to be ready to present that to the board on Tuesday no so the thresholds of when we shut down a school, when we, where we, if we shut down a classroom, if mm -hmm. we shut down, all of those thresholds are going to be developed by a team that starts on Monday or Thursday of next week. And when would those thresholds be available to us for approval, stuff like that? Well, well I, I, I hesitate to use the word threshold. Threshold is when the response team meets to review the data. Um, because if we say the threshold is 15%, let's say it's 15% of your faculty is out, the response team is going to need to look at that individual school circumstances and say, well, they've met 15%, but tomorrow, even though they're at 15% today, they're going to be at 10% and they can operate. So it's, it's, it's not going to be something where we say, boom, this is it. It's going to be when is the, what is going to be the threshold by which we need to meet and review that school circumstances and make a rapid response uh, recommendation to the superintendent. Okay. I think the other piece of it is availability of substitutes and length of time. I mean, we may end up with, um, with enough substitutes. We've sent out our response letters to our substitutes. And of the ones with active records that uh, have responded, we've had 541 responses. And of those 526, as of today, have indicated they're returning. What does that mean when school starts? I don't know, but that will all play into that rapid response team and how we can uh, function within a school. Thank you. Why three days to shut a school down? What is the the number behind that? The three days. What is that? Sure. The recommendation is that an area needs to be um, empty for 24 to 48 hours, and then we need to uh, we need a day to clean. Uh, you know, if we get notified on a on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday would be two days and Monday would be the day to clean so uh, again it's it, we're not putting out hard fast numbers um, you know my original 
my original words were like three days and we're out until we really started having those those discussions about all of the possibilities and what ifs. So um, that's why we backed off giving you a definite number of days and a definite threshold because there's just too many what ifs and, and different circumstances that, that may arise. Mr. Susan, in response and for the board, we, we can certainly provide the board an update as the team, the response team is developed and they're working through uh, the, the, the process. Um, but also, the board will be part of the, the informed piece of when the response team is met and any decision is made that a school has to be closed for any period of time. So we'll make sure that we include in our process when the response team has made a recommendation to me and the decision is made to close a school that the board will receive prompt notification that that's coming. That, that's part of what it is, just yeah. somewhere looped inside there that we get it. Absolutely. I, I did miss two members of the response team and they're critical members. It's Nikki Hensley and her backup. Um, so that, the, so that we do have a coordinated response and communication plan. Okay. I just, uh, a quick comment. When we spoke about a response team, I, I'm not sure we're all envisioning the same thing, so I think it's really important. Um, these are the key players when we have to make a decision about school. These aren't people who are replacing Department of Health guidelines or anything like that. The players you represent is, I gotta call the principal, we've gotta deal with busing, if we're closing the school, we don't have to deal with, you know. So we're not, we're not anticipating this team gaining expertise on these things. We're anticipating this team coming around, um, some quick decisions on student cases that reach a critical mass when the principal is like, okay, I've got this, 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 and then we need to all be in the same story so we can rapidly deploy um, once Dr. Mullins, with knowing Dr. Mullins, is gonna be making five phone calls and then we make a quick decision. And so um, that was our vision of the team. I just wanna make sure it didn't get warped in, in how we presented it. Very similar to the team and the actions that we deploy on an other, other critical incidents those other critical incidents start with Brian at the top of the pyramid, and then we begin uh, communicating. These would really stop, start with Chris at the top of the pyramid and beginning to deploy that communication and those conversations and those teams. Um, I just, I thought No, it was I understand, I understand yeah. what you're saying. It's just, it's a gray area that I'm just trying to poke at to try to figure out all the answers. Um, okay, so I'm moving on to slide number 41. Um, I've got, so there's some talking, there was some talk, and I, and I may have just written the note down there. We, we have a time period because we're waiting on tests, right? So we send people out yeah. for a test. We, we do these things because tests. Um, I know right now that we have our, our there's certain classes inside our, inside our county that are able to move to the front of the line on the testing procedures. Is there a opportunity for us to do the same as teachers? So that if a teacher tests positive or a student that we're concerned about testing, because part of our, and, and let me explain so that it, if I'm sending a student to go get a test or I'm asking a teacher to go get a test or whatever, and they go to test, we're waiting six days to find out the result of that test, which may push back the time period. Is there a way to shorten that time period is what I'm asking. The state and the labs have priorities. Priority one testing are first responders that are symptomatic and hospitalized patients. Priority two are, and then, I'm sorry, priority one is also long-term care facility workers because they're concerned about the long-term care facilities. Priority two are symptomatic people, um, healthcare workers. Then the last priority are the asymptomatic. So we have very strict guidelines as to who is what priority. If someone is symptomatic, they take a higher priority than someone who is just going to be tested because they just want to know they're asymptomatic. Um, teachers, I would consider a first responder. Um, is that up to do, your determination? Um, I would they, love it if it is. <laughs> <laughs> what they have is that they have first responders as a whole category. When someone comes to us, my assistant nursing director and I discuss, you know, who's, who's a first responder? And it's, it's anyone who's critical infrastructure 
is considered a first responder, of which teachers are considered critical infrastructure. Um, law enforcement, EMS, healthcare workers. That's what I was wondering, yeah. because it, if we have to shut down, like you said, a Absolutely. popcorn situation with seven different classes and all the teachers, I would consider that. So Absolutely. that would work to where a teacher would go to, the, go to this testing location and be able to move up in the line to be tested and do the results on the back end the same amount of time, or? It depends on the lab. Um, I know Quest and the state lab have the priorities, and we have to identify who we're testing, and we identify who's a priority one, two, three, or four, or asymptomatic. Um, the state lab, we only send priority ones to because they're getting inundated. Um, there are so many other private labs out there that I can't answer for them. I, I don't no, know I understand. how they do it. If I come in and I'm priority one and I test on Wednesday morning, how long until that test is, comes back to the school district to tell me or me? I can tell you priority ones come back within 24 to 48 hours. Got it. But we as a school district, if, I'm un if I understood you guys today, can't say to a teacher or a student, go get tested. Correct. And no, those no, no. results not, wouldn't I, come not back? That's not what this is about. This is about me figuring out this testing piece. That's all. Oh, Thank okay, you. I understand. But you're, you're starting with the premise that if we tell a teacher to go get tested or we're waiting for them, we, that's not part of this conversation because we can't do that as much as we might like to. So a teacher goes to take a test. This is what They have at. to report okay. to us so, that they're positive. Otherwise, we wouldn't even know. So we, so we, the teacher goes to take the test. We can get them to be in the first class, priority class, right? They can get that 24-hour test and be available if they needed it. That's what I'm hearing you say? Okay. Um, and that is at your locations. And do you know of what is the cost, I'm sorry, to the district for us to have an employee go take that test? I believe it varies depending on the lab and, and depending on where you go. But I believe the last estimate I had was between 80 and and $100. Does that sound correct, Patty? I don't know what the private labs, I can tell you if they come to us. Yes, ma'am. It's free for anybody. Yeah, I, um, I think I should share my experience because I think that would help. Please. Um, I, be, I was a contact to a case. And I was a contact to a contact to a case. I was a contact to a contact. But it was driving my family crazy. And they were on me every day, you need to go get tested. Sure. Um, I called Patty. I said, Patty, where do I go get tested? And she said, if you want to wait a day, you can come to the Department of Health. If you don't want to wait a day, you can, you can without a prescription and without an uh, appointment, go down to Eastern Florida State and be tested there. Um, I drove down there um, midday. I waited in my car for about an hour and a half, which was fine. I had a book. It didn't matter. Um, it was handled very privately. It was handled very safely. Um, the test was not at all uh, as, as I had been led to believe in terms of what it was. It was like a, a tickle. A, it was like a tickle in my sinus, to be honest. I hate them. Um, and I left. And they gave me a little, a little code in which to download an app. 30 hours later, I had my results, which I was happy to report to my mother so she could get off my back were negative. Um, <laughs> But I will tell you, the whole process uh, from start to finish was um, pretty, pretty painless. And uh, it took me 30 hours to get my results and cost me absolutely no money, no prescription, uh, in order to get the test and no appointment needed. Is that, is that consistent with, is like Eastern Florida State right now, 30-hour turnaround? Is there like a list out there that, like, is there somewhere that the teachers can, they know? Yeah, well, let me back up a little bit. Eastern Florida State, in addition to all other labs, are now anywhere from five to ten days out for results. Oh, wow. the, the labs are extremely backed up. Um, if somebody is a first responder and they're symptomatic, and I know the sheriff's office, we've done a lot, we've done a lot of EMS, if we will send them up to the state and they're coming back quicker. Okay. Um, I won't promise it's 24 to 48 hours any longer, but first responders and priority ones and twos, we get back fairly quick. And that's free to our health care? Anybody com comes to us, it's free. We if don't they go, check if, insurance. We don't do anything. Eastern Florida State is free. If they go to any one of the clinics right, I don't want to name any, any, any place yeah. that, um, that's not what she right. just mentioned, any place right. that's not in Eastern Florida, there is a charge to our insurance company. Correct. And that's the number I was giving you. Do we have a way of telling all of our people 
what these charges are? Or do they, do you see what I mean? Like I'm a, if I'm a teacher, one of the issues that we're dealing with right now in the insurance is, is to try to steer them towards lower cost options. Um, I, you know, is there a way to identify where the lower cost options are for our teachers to go get tested? Or do we just want to start steering them towards the DOH? Oh, we don't want to do that. We have typically not steered them in one direction or another when they've asked. They know where the free tests are and, you know, we've given them that information. But some want a different kind of result and a different quicker result and they'll go to a local, a, a local place that does that and charges the insurance. Are we... Can, what is our stance on this test as far as insurance goes? Are we co-paying, deductible? What is it if they don't go to the Department of Health and they show up at MedFast and they take the test, what is the breakdown for our employees? Do you know? They're paying the MedFast copay at that point. Okay. And then we are charged, I believe, $120 for that MedFast visit. I got you. Okay. So that's how it's breaking down. Okay. On page 43, what is the idea that we could make a recommendation to not do these drills? Or as many of them? Is there a conversation that we would, would you recommend against that? I mean, I, I understand that we want to do them, but I have a serious, I, I know how this is going to go when we go to do the drill. Everybody has to get outside. There's just only a limited amount of time to do it. You know what I mean? And I would try to avoid it as much as possible. Where, where are we at with that, Brian? You're talking about a national argument okay. uh, discussion, uh, of course, here in Florida as well, okay? Uh, when, when legislation was in session, there was a bill before them to reduce the drills. Um, they ran out of time. The pandemic hit, the building gets signed, and they were extremely close. Uh, so here we are. We're just getting ready to start the school year, and, and the statute's very clear that we will do these drills. The only folks that can advise otherwise will be out of the Office of Safe Schools if that direction comes. Like I said, I know Mr. Novelli is going to a training at the end of July. Office of Safe Schools will be there at that time. There's a lot of districts waiting for any type of other guidance. So is there a possibility? There is, but right now we got a plan otherwise. No, I understand 100%. Thank you for bringing that forward. It's something that we have to do, but maybe that's part of the conversation is, is that, you know, we as a school district make a serious request in, into the fact of reducing the amount of those because I think that that's a point where we have to be of concern for safety. Sure. So. Mr. Susan, I have a call into Joy Frank with FADS, uh, the FADS attorney, to bring this to their attention as well and ask that FADS appeal on our on superintendent's behalf because that's a concern for all of us to the state to get a and, waiver or something like that. And if FADS does it, then our school board association will do it, and that would be something that's there. All right. That can be later on. Oh, last thing, principal's checklist, plan for the replenishment of initial supplies and PPE on page 45. We're going to use CARES Act to replenish all the supplies for the CARES Act stuff. That was all. It didn't have an asterisk on it, and I just wanted to make sure. Okay. All right, I am done with the minor questions. So, we're good. With the minor questions? Yeah, because we're going back to the other major ones. Right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I believe we are going to take a very brief break, like five minutes, run to the restroom, grab some pizza. We're eating on camera, so. Miss, Miss Belford? Yes. Um, are, is the board going to want uh, Miss Seibert to stay? Um, <laughs> I think I'm good. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I, Patty, thank you. Amazing that you have, I mean, this, we're accustomed to like this. <laughs> occasionally but for you to have committed to be here with us all day really thank you so so very much i'm willing to stay um, if you need me to stay but i've got issues at work that i have to deal <laughs> yes. with i think if you notice i've been texting and getting all these these things <laughs> so, yeah are you sure yes go thank right you. ahead and take care of your stuff thank you thank you um you're welcome anyone have anything for lieutenant neil Oh, he's got to stay with us, doesn't he? Are you our security? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. You're out of luck, Don. I tried. It's all right. Uh, and I'm guessing everybody else is probably going to be on the hook for some part of that discussion. So we will take five. Guys, the pizza.
and we are back from our recess. Before we get too far into our questions, um, I did want to send out a huge thank you to Kyle Savage, who um, on his own uh, sent us pizza to feed the entire crew who is here this evening. What? Um, yes, yeah. so this, the pizza was courtesy of Kyle. Um, and for those who have not been watching us uh, all day, <laughs> these folks have been in this room since 9 o'clock this morning with the exception of a 30 minute lunch break and a couple of really quick bathroom breaks. So um, the dinner was much appreciated, Kyle. So beyond, beyond measure, you just don't even know. So yeah, thank you. Um, okay, we wrap. Wait, can, we, can we say where that was from? Since it's right locally here, Vieira Pizza. Can we say that? <laughs> I guess you, you can. never miss an opportunity, can we, do you? Can we, can we say, I mean, he's a huge supporter of Vieira High School. <laughs> And I just want to give Savage a shout out because he doesn't even live in the area, but he figured out that the best place to get it is here. So just want to give him a shout man. out. Yep. <sighs> okay, so uh, we finished working through our slides. There was an indication that there were potentially some general questions that were not slide specific before we circle back to our um, more complicated discussion item. So, um, Ms. McDougall, are you still with us? I'm <laughs> Did you have any general <laughs> questions that you wanted to ask? this question and I guess I want to know the ramifications so this plan is very robust and very um, aggressive and our staff have been working tirelessly and probably around the clock on this especially if you're dreaming about this um, what would happen if we push back opening our school or are even are we even allowed to legally do that in the state of Florida I'm just asking the question what would happen? Uh, Ms. McDougall, I'm going to ask Dr. Thetty to, to talk about the school calendar. Uh, I will say that the state has, you know, has always given school calendar jurisdiction, if you will, to the local school district. Um, but there are implications of changing the school calendar at this time. Dr. Thetty. Thank you. So currently, we're, students are scheduled to start on Tuesday, August 11th, and um, the emergency order from the commissioner does say starting school in August. Making an assumption that we would still start school at some point in August, you would, you would change the rest of the calendar by the number of days that, we, that would be potentially starting later. So if we start 10 days later or some other model, we would end up moving the calendar along 10 days, which would push, uh, there are a couple of implications. One is salary, so I will, I'll get to that in a minute. But what it'll do to the student calendar <laughs> is it'll push the end of first semester into January, which has implications for our dual enrollment students who um, attend Eastern Florida and uh, the, the few that attend um, Florida Tech with our program with Palm Bay High. It makes, a, it makes a difference for those students. And then it pushes us at the end of the year into June. Right now, I think we're scheduled to end the school year May, I wanna say 28th is the last student day. Depending on the number of days that we would adjust the calendar, potentially, that would change the ending of school. There are also implications to pay. Um, right now, our, um, our teachers are paid on an August 15th to July 30th schedule. If we delayed starting school, and they weren't working on a delay, there would be a, a pay implication to that. There would also be a pay implication to our other employees in our 1010 unions, our 10 month employees, our nine month employees, and some of our 11 month employees that would have start dates changed and that would, that would affect pay, not affect their overall pay, but affect pay checks. Because they are the, for example, our teachers are under a contract for 196 days the, the amount would not differ. It's when it gets paid that would be potentially a problem. Ms. McDougall, I, I appreciate the acknowledgement of the tight timeline. I'm, I will potentially speak for the task force. I believe that they have been operating consistently under the expectation and anticipation of a regular school start date. They, we have not had any discussion uh, about any alternate start date. Okay. I, I see there's a lot involved if we should push this back, but I needed to uh, know that and I needed our community to hear that also. Thank you, Dr. Thank Thetty you. and Dr. Mullins, and thank you, Ms. McDougall. Any other general questions, Ms. McDougall? 
No, I, just some of the old questions that we're going to go over again. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, Ms. Campbell, any general questions before we get into issue specific? Yes, um, and I, these are, I just have some uh, financial questions. Ms. Lasinski, you haven't had to say anything all day. <laughs> um, so, and this may be a Dr. Mullen's question as well. So if I read our emergency order correctly, um, you know, when it first came out, and, and Ms. Belford, you mentioned this this morning, there was a lot of, oh my gosh, this is, this is horrible. But as part of it, if I'm reading it correctly, there's some good news in here in that our funding will be much more stable than we anticipated or, or worried, at least for the fall semester. So it looks like to me in the governor's orders, it says that, um, at least for the fall, that they're planning on giving us, no matter what our you know, October numbers are, giving us the funding that was projected in our conference reports that were given back in the spring, which would be our normal pre-COVID numbers. Um, am I reading that correctly? Yes, you are. Um, so, and I'm, I'm trying to get clarification if that would go all the way through the third calc, but then, um, so that will give us an opportunity to get an idea of student enrollment and where we will be. Um, I don't want to give us any false thoughts that after the election in November that we would not have a um, reduction as we had talked about before, but this allows us to start the year and be able to take a look to see what kind of enrollment that we have and then try to adjust down and prepare for what we think that that cut will be if we are cut after the election. Okay. In November. And the reason why I ask that is because, and I know you guys can't give me the answer to this right now, and I'm not going to ask it to give me the answer, but when I first read that, I thought, okay, this is great because then we can fund our schools with the allotment of teachers that we would have expected, but we're probably going to have fewer in our buildings and you know, we're going to have some parents do different things, virtual school, whatever, but we can, that, that will give us smaller class sizes to start out with and as people become more comfortable and the students trickle in, then we can you know, fill up. But I realized that, that there's a risk involved in that and in that if we go ahead and do that and we have those smaller class sizes and the legislature come back, comes back and says, okay, for the spring semester, now we're adjusting your funding to how many students you actually have. Um, that would be really dangerous because at that point we can't let go of staff um, or it would be very difficult to do that mid-year. Am I also thinking correctly along you, those lines? You're absolutely right. That's what I, I, I tried to say that I, I okay. still think we need to be concerned about a uh, reduction in funding um, in November or December with a special session. So the funding now, holding harmless, allows us to go into the year and then we'll, we'll be able to understand better of, you know, what kind of enrollment we have and then start planning for what we think that will be. But I don't think we should go all out and spend everything because we know that that money's going to so we may have a little bit of flexibility, be not, but not as much as we have we more might. time to. This gives us time to plan. Might be a better way of saying. Okay, it. so it gave us time. Yes. All right. Miss Campbell, if I can add to it, just to put it in perspective, the timeline and and how tenuous it could become, because we don't have clarification from second calc to third calc. So the the order. Did I get that right? Second calc is in October, correct? Yeah. No, second calc will be uh, the nineteenth of July. Okay, so we're third to fourth calc. Third is October and fourth is February. Is that January. right? January. Why am I? The, the FTE period is October and February. Third calc comes in, I believe, in uh, January is when we got it this year, and we got fourth calc, Ms. Lisinski, mm -hmm. I believe, in May. We just received the fourth calc in May. Right. So the fourth calc comes based on second semester enrollment, and Pardon? February. Yeah, February FTE. So the order does not address the fourth calc. It only addresses the start of school. So to your point, we could potentially find out there is a reduction in funding based on enrollment for second semester, but not until April. 
So in which it, that money would have to be returned to the state if correct. that's what they chose. It, it's so it would be very dangerous to to go into second semester with fully you know, with enrollment or with staffing based on enrollment projections from last year when we may be held accountable to true enrollment at the on the for, on the <coughs> February FTE. Does gotcha. that make sense? Yes. That is what occurred this year, correct? We took a $1.3 million hit on 4th Calc? It was, right it, around, was it was right around a million dollars. Okay. I don't remember exactly. I think it was 999000 Okay. Well. Very close to one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ms. Campbell, any additional general questions? No, that's it. Ms. Duskovich? I'm good. Mr. Susan? Um, all right, so we're going to do get a percentage of students that signed on that were in free and reduced um, is this the longest meeting in BPS history for a workshop, Panel, uh, workshop. I think it is <laughs> it might be at least since the recession <laughs> is that how long you all right um, and then we're gonna do a practice day video I love that from communication uh, okay I mean for teacher COVID leave <laughs> Any single point of communication, we're going to work towards a single point of communication, follow up with issues and address. Okay. Um, what is the idea for Tuesday's plan for the board meeting? Are we allowing public input as we normally do? Is there a time period that, um, since everybody's watching here, if there's any family members that want to, Ms. Han, can you explain that process with the day that they're supposed to, when they're supposed to put in? Are we having it here in person with people coming in? What's the plan for it? So the plan is similar to how we've been running our previous board meetings during the pandemic. The link will be live tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. So you can go on our website and they'll be right on our front page will be a, a note that says register here, click this link to register. Uh, you just fill out the form and that includes a phone number when you put your phone number in, compile those. We close the link on Monday morning at 8 a.m after which I send the roster of folks who would like to speak at the, the board meeting to our uh, vendor, and then they do a call at 5.30 p.m. on Monday. And we generally just call people in the order in which they signed up and <clears throat> record everyone's three minutes, and then we play that live at the board meeting on Tuesday morning. And then is there any idea of when we may be going back to being in person with people and, and everything else? Is there a plan for that? I think we said something about July, but didn't so <clears throat> Mr. Gibbs and I have been um, discussing that, and I think the plan at this point, um, keeping in mind that every plan is is fluid right now, depending on on how things look numbers wise. I think, um, but the current executive order um, for <clears throat> excuse me for restrictions for our meetings, I think, ends on July thirtieth. Um, and so there's strong possibility, given the numbers continuing to rise, but that that will be extended. Um, but what Mr. Gibbs and I had talked about was potentially um, beginning with workshops in August, um, have those open to the public because we won't have so many people that likely attend the workshops on a regular basis um, to give us an opportunity to kind of ease back into it and make sure that we can handle people appropriately. One of the things that I was explaining to Ms. Campbell earlier today is um, you know, even though we have the boardroom space, we, the board and the superintendent, and we can't socially distance up there. So us being up there um, is, is not doable, which means we would have to be down here and then we would have to figure out a way to make space for an audience as well. So um, the plan is to work toward that starting in August, though. Is can I ask the question, there are other municipalities that are inside of our county that are meeting with different guidelines. Is there a guideline that was set by the governor saying you have to follow these, or are we following a list? Where is where is our overarching, these guidelines that we're following currently, where are they? Where Like, where are they coming from? Uh, it's basically come from uh, direction from Mr. Gibbs and discussion between Dr. Mullins, Mr. Gibbs, Ms. Han, and myself. Um, as to how to how to best ensure the safety of all involved moving forward. Is there any any the, guide, the guidelines right now are just sunshine law. Um, the only thing that's suspended is the in-person quorum. 
So we don't have to, we have to account, we have to allot for everything else. The public participation piece and every other element has to be allotted for. So not having people come in and sit in here or us standing on the dais or any of those decisions are our decision as a board, not being guided by right. those are federal government, that's us. Those are operational decisions. So I would like to move towards a different format if anybody else wants to have that discussion. I support that. I'm wondering, uh, I was just listening to Ms. Belford's concerns, though, could we sit like this? And I, I, I'm not exactly sure how the Cam county commission did it, because I was only watching it online, but it seemed like people waited outside and came in one at a time. So if the podium was like over there by the door, came in once, spoke, left as public comments. There's just something about the public feeling heard when they can look at their representatives in the face. I don't, I don't know if that's an option, but I'll just throw it out there because she's right. We can't sit up there, but we could sit down here. And, and so here's, this is Cheryl. And I would, um, if you all want to wear a mask, I don't have a problem showing up, but I don't see anybody wearing masks. <laughs> so I'm protecting you, but no one's protecting me. Can I ask the question then that we're getting hit on on social media? Um, if we are not going to have the meetings, how are we having kids coming back to school if we're not going to sit within the same parameters and perimeters that other people are? And I, that's the reason I pointed the question is, is that I, I have an issue with that. I have an issue with our kids having to come into back to school and to go back into the meeting and us not do it. And I would make the recommendation that we return to the dais. We put the chairs out socially distanced and we move on a meeting like that. I mean, if, we, if we're going to send the message that we're going to send pre-K kids back to school, if we're going to send the message we're coming back to school with 72,000 or 68,000 kids, I think it behooves us to meet in a normal stance, especially when our other municipalities and governments are. Um, I would suggest that they all are not, but... Uh, There's some that are. There are some that are. The other thing that I would say, Mr. Susan, and I understand people saying, how can we send students back to school in, in August? Um, <clears throat> as Ms. Hand spoke earlier about prioritizing where we put our energies, um, one thing that is absolutely certain is the more that we change things up right now, um, and the more expectations that we put on staff to handle our time here in the building, um, is the more we're pulling them away from the work that they need to do. And so I feel like <clears throat> we have a process that's working right now. Um, and I think absolutely working toward bringing people back into to the board meeting um, in, in August is perfectly appropriate. My concern is if we um, say we decide, oh, well, next Tuesday we're just going to go to regular public comment that is going to be a whole lot of people that the staff here at ESF are going to have to figure out how to manage, how to socially distance, how to clean up after, how to, um, we can't sit up there six feet apart because we can't access, uh, first of all, six feet apart, there's just too many of us. We can't, we can't fit up there and be six feet apart. So we have to be down here. That's or some guide. of us have to be down but here. But that's our guidelines. At per the thing. The six feet no, is six the, feet is CDC. Yeah, those are the recommended guidelines. So the other municipalities that are within six feet are if, breaking if you go the, to the CDC county guidelines? You have only like four county commissioners spread across the top in the county manager. So uh -huh. the other one is calling in remotely and the attorney is on the floor. So that's the way it was this week when we went okay. over there. Um, so they are spread out. They're every other chair. So City of Cocoa, some of the other areas that I've been into speaking at, they're not, they are a little bit tighter, but here's my, here's the ultimate argument, is that if we're going to put kids inside a classroom shorter than six feet, then I don't think that we can be respectful. I, I, I personally believe that. I just, that, that's my thing. And I may be one board member that's speaking to this, but we're about to ask all of our kids to do the same. We're already asking them to do that. I think that we stand with them. And that's, that's my feeling. So I would like to see what everybody else's feelings are on that. I and agree. I understand I, that changing it to July 14th may be a little difficult, but moving that ball faster, I think, would be what I would be asking. But I did have one question. You said that the staff's time would take longer if we did that. Besides the public comment, they're already in here, right? Yes, I just did not, that because I'm trying to understand if that's correct. Practice. No, I'm, I'm not talking about the cabinet because the cabinet is typically available during the meeting anyway. But what I'm talking about is how many people do you think would show up for a meeting next week to, to speak at public comments? Mm -hmm. 
um, and all of those people have to be managed, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to have, we have to manage where they sit, we have to manage when they're coming into the building, how they're coming into the building, we have to manage everything being cleaned after they leave the building. Um, and that's, that's pulling people in general away from, from task. Um, not to mention, you know, exposure uh, as well. So I absolutely understand your point of we're sending kids back and we should be willing to do the same, and I get that. Um, my only suggestion is that we phase it in through starting with our workshops in, in August um, so that we can gradually manage it instead of opening up, um, you know, a huge floodgate of people coming into the building that we have to figure out how to manage in a socially distanced and safe way. We could, an idea that I was thinking about, because I've thought about this, is we could have, just like you have people testing, you could have a number system where people sit in their cars out there, and if they want to give public comment, they can walk in, stand there, or we could give another location inside the building where they walk in and give it a look, just like they do at the county commission. I think they let them come in, they let them speak inside of a, another area, and then they leave. But that might be another area to do, and that would take less than two people to monitor that. Um, I. I just feel strongly. I mean, I, like I, I, and I know that I don't want it to seem like it's a pandering thing to the public. But the bottom line is, is that I feel strong about it, and I, and I really, I really think that we should be together. And I think it also sends a message that we're together. Also, um, I know that we're trying to do socially distance, but if we've got kids that are inside there that are tighter, uh, we can get tighter. And that's that's what my feelings are. And I, I'll leave it up to the other board members to make comments. I'm sorry. Uh, this is uh, Cheryl again. Go ahead, Cheryl. I, I, I haven't. I didn't hear anybody say whether they would be willing to wear a mask to protect me or to protect anybody else that walks in that room. I did not hear that. Sure. Is I there think a problem with that. I mean, really, is there really a big problem with that? I don't think anybody in here has a problem wearing masks, Cheryl. I wanted to sit next to each other. The issue that you have with the mask is that when you're speaking into the microphone and when you're doing other things, it makes it difficult, that's all. But if that's what it requires for this board to meet up on the thing, I do not mind doing it. But I, I don't see that, I mean, you can still call in virtually. I'm not requiring, asking you that you have to come in. But I, I don't have a problem doing something like that if it meant that we could be together on the dais. While we're going around, I'll just weigh in on, you know, since we're trying. I, I've had similar thoughts to Mr. Susan. I feel like we need to come back, not next Tuesday, because it's too short of a turnaround. Our next meeting after that is July the 30th, I believe, our budget, our Thursday night meeting, right? Um, that would be right before everybody starts coming back. August, we manage it. It's my understanding of the phase that we're in. We can have meetings of up to 50 people, you know. Uh, as far as you know, we still need to be spread out. It's also my understanding of CDC guidelines, as, uh, and Ms. McDougall I'll just address that. You know that if the that idea of masks still, you know, it depends on where you are. and Different governments are doing different, making different decisions. But masks are for when you can't socially distance. If we're, we're sitting actually eight feet apart today, if we can sit eight to ten feet apart, you know, and I've got my mask on when I walk in the door and I take it off when I sit down, I I don't have a problem. But I you know, for right now the the executive orders are that we can still, you know, we don't have to have the quorum, so Ms. McDougall can call in, can vote, and all of that that she might not normally be able to do. But Ms. I mean, she can always call. As long as you have a physical quorum, you can. The board can still allow remote attendance. Right. So but we, but under normal circumstances, remote means that you, you can still. You as long as you have the physical quorum, they can still call in. It's left up to the board. They can still vote yes. also? Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's a board decision. It's okay. Like, uh, in okay. Marion, and we would never want to take away a vote. In Marion, they had a rule that you could not vote. They would let you speak to an item, but okay. board members that were not present in the room could not vote. Gotcha. So. Uh, I mean, as far as, you know, we can do remote as, as for long as any of one of us. And, you know, truth be told, we talked about this way back in March. There might become a time when one of us tests positive or it needs to be quarantined and, you know, or three of us or four of us. I mean, as long as the executive order is there, we can, we can call on whatever. But I'd like for us to start moving in that direction as well, as long as we can, you know, follow the current uh, guidelines for gatherings. But not next week. Ms. Duskovich? Oh, I thought I chimed in. 
I, I, yeah, I think next week is obviously too soon with everybody scrambling to finalize the plan and with all the feedback coming from today, but I definitely um, want to get there, and I, I think that August workshops only is a little slow for, for my taste. Um, uh, Ms. Campbell, that's everything I've read, is that if you're more than six feet apart, the mask is, and that's what we seem to be practicing with the, with the students, with your recommendations is when they're on the bus and can't be further apart, masks. If they're going to be doing close contact things, masks. Uh, and maybe that's, that's our, like right now, we're eight feet apart. I don't see a need to wear a mask. If we're on the dais, I don't know, somebody want to measure if it's too close, maybe you have to wear a mask. But then, you know, I, I just have trouble hearing people. I, I was around three people last night with masks, and I literally had to get like so close to them and go like this with my so I could hear. I don't know, maybe I, my hearing's not that good and I read lips more than I thought, but it's, it's so awkward for me because I'm not a personal space. I don't like getting in people's personal space, but if I can't hear you, then I start getting closer and closer, and yet we're in a pandemic, and I'm like, well, now I'm like practically touching you so I can hear you. I'm just, you know, the whole thing is way more complicated than it needs to be. Short answer, I think we need to get the public back engaged. We're making really big decisions that is affecting the public. Um, not just the, these, these things, but uh, on our budget, we'll be voting on the media assistance, what we plan on doing with their positions. These are all things that I think the community needs to be able to look at us and, and share their concerns. Does that give you all the information you need from me? And just to add, since we're talking about public comment, I, we may still have some public who want to comment but don't feel comfortable coming in, and I want to be aware of that. Um, just like Ms. McDougall's not comfortable coming in right now, we may have some public. If there's a way for us to, uh, to continue the phone-in version, I, I you know, if we can, I, you know, to make things more complicated, but if we can do both and at least for a little while, well, because I don't want people to be silenced because I don't feel comfortable coming in. Is that making it too complicated? I, I think we're just complicating it at a time when there's already a whole lot of complication going on, but if that's the wishes <laughs> of the board, then that's the, the way that we move forward. Um, so um, I'll get with Pam and find out what has been advertised and how it's been advertised and uh, look at the calendar and, and then Dr. Mullins, I think the board has given you a charge to figure out how to get people in here safely. We will work toward, uh, we will work toward that. If we, if Cheryl's not coming in and Pam's not on the dice, we might be able to start saving some space up there, if that makes sense. If we we'll can. take a look at all the combinations. All right. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, did we talk about possibly moving the well care centers into focus on COVID or anything like that? Was that part of any conversation? that our because they're well care centers right the focus of our well care centers is to focus on the well-being of our people focused on the people that need it the most would it be behoove us to move our well care centers into kind of a covid focused area to help those people get the test to help them move you know what i mean to help that process that is a discussion that i've had with mr langdorf um, and i can explore it further uh, I, I'm sorry Mrs. Seibert is gone, but prior, I don't even know what time it was, she talked about the PPE mm -hmm. that those who do the tests have to wear, and that was one of the impediments in making sure everybody's isolated and those well care centers aren't set up for that. But it certainly... Not know, so much testing. I think that that wouldn't be appropriate at the time, but I think that helping those individuals in this process through getting the test from the other place, being that, you know, there's Cigna supposed to follow up with follow-up care and everything else and making sure that they have the, the responsible piece. I mean, part of well is being well. And I think that a lot of people don't take into consideration um, that during this process, the, the better your immune system is, the better off you are. So if we're focusing on people that are taking the test and we're calling them to say, hey, here's some of the things you can be doing in order to you know benefit yourself and come back at an earlier time, I think that's something that we could be looking at, that's all. And then the other one is is um, the, the, the whole hurricane plan that we talked about, don't say the letter H. Um, I know that it's part of what we're going to be doing, but we're going to be smack dab coming right into hurricane season. And I don't know what the, the, what the guidance is going to be for cleaning and, and disinfecting and all that stuff. So it's just something to put on a radar. And then... Mr. Susan, uh, Mr. Novelli is in regular communication and work with the... Uh, Bart Emergency Operations Center, specifically John Scott. 
uh, and we've got we've been given direction in, in that. I, I can ask Mr. Novelli to provide the board an update on where we are with. Uh, I, we don't need an update. I just I just wanted to make sure it was, and if that's good, <clears throat> we're there. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say was this: is that um, we have a message to to get out, and I think that I am going to, and I, I would I think that a lot of the other board members were going to do this too. Is that we need to message the positive in this, the heroes, the people that are doing it right, rather than pointing out the ones that don't. And meaning, meaning that when we're messaging and we should be telling our parents that we should be honoring the kids that are wearing the masks, um, not pointing out the kids that aren't, if that makes sense. Drive the positivity as opposed to um, pointing out the negativity. I think we could get to a good place with that, that's all. And if we could message some really positive things about kids doing the right thing with the masks, doing the right thing with social distancing, doing the right thing. I think that that helps sometimes too. That's all, and that's it, I'm done. All right, um, circling back. Um, oh, Dr. Mullins, did you have additional things that you wanted to address before we go back to the big issues that were on your list? Well, just for the benefit of making sure we've got our, you know, everything covered that we've discussed, if I can take a moment to just go through my notes, some of the things that we've already agreed to follow up on and provide uh, to the board, either by way of an update or at the next, or at the board meeting on Tuesday. Mr. Susan, you alluded to the, the request for free and reduced lunch um, and distance learning from the spring. We'll get you that, in, we'll get that information for the board. We'll also be following, uh, ensuring that our videos uh, for um, training uh, will in, be also accommodate uh, Spanish version or uh, other languages. Um, we'll be looking at the chronic illness form as a possible digital form to expedite the process. Um, and actually, if there's any way to put more resources towards it, if, if, if there's a help, because that's going to be a funnel point. Okay. Sorry. I had a couple more, just a second. Um, we're going to be developing an illness indicators quick reference card for employees as they um, are in contact with students so that they have, you know, uh, an, a sense of what, what are some of the indicators that they need to be aware of to potentially send them to the clinic for further evaluation. Uh, we'll, the discipline policy team committee will be coming together to look at the transportation willful disobedience are there additional considerations that need to be made uh, when behavior is increasingly dangerous um, other consequences and that sort of thing um, also there's a request for a timeline of the training videos for staff we'll provide that to the board i don't know that i'll have that ready for tuesday but that'll be coming forward and Rachel Winston, our PE resource teacher, I'm not sure that's the right title, but um, she's gonna be continuing to work on developing uh, adaptive best practices for PE teachers across the district. So they've got options outside of the traditional um, gymnasium. And uh, Dr. Thetty is following up on developing a plan for board discussion or workshop around uh, the potential of, of employee leave related to COVID. I just again for the board, I have a call into Joy Frank related to the active assailant and fire drills, particularly in the first uh, 30 days of the school year, and hopes that FADS will take a position or statement on that for, uh, to the state, looking for some uh, allowance or a waiver for that. And then uh, Dr. Thetty's gonna follow up on the well care clinic focus related to COVID. Those are the things that I have, uh, we certainly will be following up on uh, for the board. Uh, the topics that I have listed for uh, additional direction from the board in preparation for Tuesday's board meeting. Uh, feedback, uh, direction on our academic plans, both for the elementary level as well as the secondary level. Uh, the utilization of temperature checks. Uh, there was discussion, uh, we have thermometers, touchless thermometers in all of our schools, uh, but there was discussion around expanding the utilization of temperature checks. Uh, we did not have that as a recommendation in the plan, so we do need further direction from the board. Uh, I, I 
summarized or surmised that doing temperature checks upon initial entry of students onto campus would be very difficult from a capacity standpoint. Uh, it, it is more feasible once students arrive in their classroom, but that would require uh, some discussion with the union. Uh, there was an optional discussion, so we would need further direction from the board what the expectations are there. There was discussion, uh, we need further direction on face coverings and uh, the language expectation or enforcement of utilization of face coverings on campuses. Um, there's discussion about volunteer access on campus. The, we had re recommended that volunteers not be permitted on campus, and there was some discussion that that be reconsidered, so we need further direction on the, from the board on that, as well as utilizing swing sets. I, got a, I believe there was um, consensus on the board that playgrounds should not be accessible, but there was some discussion specifically around swing sets. So I'd appreciate um, board direction on those items. If I could Mike, um, circle back with two things on the, the previous list, um, two general questions that I would like to pose or, or comments, I guess. Um, <clears throat> one is for uh, Dr. Sullivan and Ms. Klein, um, you guys did, well, and, and government and community relations did such a phenomenal job with the videos um, last time during our distance learning. If there is the capacity and the patience and the desire to do so. I think that it would be phenomenal um, if you could do one for elementary education options and one for secondary education options. Um, just kind of highlighting, especially I think Dr. <coughs> Sullivan, some of the secondary stuff gets really complicated. Um, but I think it would be really good information for our parents. So if you have the opportunity to do that after we, we finalize where we're going temporarily finalized until things change again. Um, I think that would be really helpful for our families to really understand. Um, and then my second thing is um, one of, I think one of the challenges that I have in really knowing how to best move forward and what things I should be paying attention to uh, within our reopening plan is kind of a lack of knowledge about what we currently have going on with regard to COVID. Um, and Ms. Moore, feel free to tell me if this would just be an absolute nightmare for you, but I would love for the board to have updates similar like uh, to what we have with our incident reports. We get the daily incident report of things that are going on in the district. Um, I, I feel like it would be really helpful for us to know where we're seeing problems and where what we're doing is working. And i not not divulging private information about anyone, but um, so that we have an idea of the types of challenges that we're facing with regard to COVID and, and potential issues. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand. Is that is that a huge ask of you? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. I think, I think that would, that for it'll me anyway, I think it would help me to gauge, you know, as we're going forward. Um, what we need to do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Ms. Moore, I think you had something as Dr. Mullins was running through his yeah, list. I didn't want to leave out the concerns um, that uh, Mr. Gibbs was going to look into in terms of what it would mean to, for our teachers to do a, a, a scan, a medical um, a screener on students every day and whether or not we would need parent permission to do so I, there's just some complications in there we need to get answered as we move forward on that good dr mullins all right um <clears throat> then let's go ahead and start with the elementary academic options does anyone have um concerns questions suggestions recommendations or do you want to give a thumbs up to move in the direction that they're currently moving I'm going to give a thumbs up. I think that is uh, the e-learning is absolutely what the public has been asking for. Parents have been asking for the ones who aren't ready to go back to brick and mortar. They want to stay in their regular school, but be able to do it from home at least for the time. Ms. Deskovich, thumbs up with uh, just the small caveat of um, or the comment of, and I'm sure we're already planning on it, keeping 
the desks as far as part as possible. Uh, we seem to be getting a lot of concerns already about the three feet instead of the six feet. So if we can manage the six feet, I think we need to do everything we can to get that six feet in. And um, Ms. Campbell and I were chatting on the break just for a minute about potential. We can't promise class sizes will be smaller, but it seems like if more people choose the option to not be in the school, then ultimately the class sizes will be smaller. So. I know everybody's panicked that they're gonna be at max capacity 18 to 22, but if it if the trend is the same as what the state is seeing, that half the kids are choosing other options, I would think the classes would be not half size because we're still gonna have this, you know, I, I, a lot of those teachers are gonna be teaching virtually, but it seems like the numbers would come out smaller. Am I incorrect? Because you're looking like I'm incorrect. <clears throat> We will. We are certainly required to meet class size, and we will. We will. We would do that. Uh, but I can't make any assurance that class sizes will be smaller because we're not funded for them to be smaller. Yeah. So Understood. Understood. If, if students aren't coming, and they're taking advantage of e-learning or BVS, then those teachers that would have been in brick and mortar will be diverted to those other things. So. Understood. Uh, and I know nobody in this room wants to mention it, but somebody may choose something else that's not in our choices and our numbers could potentially go down. We will lose the funds, yes, but we will still have the same allocations. No, we won't. No, no? We, we will have to make adjustments based on the allocations, particularly with uncertain funding second semester. So we that was the conversation. I, Ms. Yeah. Ms. I, I just don't want the public. I, I don't want the public to leave this conversation believing that we're going to be able to provide smaller class sizes than we have before. That is okay. not the case. So we are leaving this meeting pretty confident that classes are going to be 18 and 22 in elementary school, or thereabout. We will adhere to class size. You uh, keep saying adhere, and that makes me think we're not going to pass it up, right? Like we're going to we're going to adhere, but you're saying not we're not just going to adhere. It's not like we want to have 18, we always max it at 18, right? Or 22, whichever the grade level is. Our, our obligations to class size amendment are average class size by school. And we have met that consistently as a district and that would continue to be our practice. Okay. That, that what well, we have instances where there was a class with 19. We will certainly work to avoid that, but we don't, we're not being assured the funding that we're gonna be able to sustain that. I understand our funding issues, uh, but I think, and I've been fined with the averages that we've used in the past, but I'm wondering now if we really need to strictly adhere and try to figure out how to, I know that that's dropping a bomb after a nine hour meeting, uh, but if the averages end up putting 20 kids in a class, I mean, that makes a difference right now, more than ever. So do we have any idea what the cost is if we strictly adhere to the, 18 and 22? Uh, we, I, I can't provide the board a cost. Didn't we at some point strictly adhere and then we switched to the using the averages? Uh, when we were not a full choice district, we didn't qualify for the average school. Uh, I wanna say that was at least five or six. Okay. Year, several years ago. Even more than that? We have been utilizing the average class size for the last several years. Okay. Okay, well, I, you ultimately have my thumbs up. Yes. Ms. Falford, sorry that was a long, long way around. Mr. Susan? I was, Dr. Mullins, I, I think you're hinting on it, and, I, and I, I think everybody needs to know that we will not know our numbers and how that's gonna allocate until they, figure, they put that survey together. And again, we need to back into that survey and fill that darn thing out. But I was getting at, if you have a teacher that's in that classroom and we're trying say 13 kids leave the classroom and there's 13 kids left, just say for instance, so that everybody knows whoever's teaching those online classes is gonna have to have more than the actual amount to compensate for the fact that we only have 13 in this teacher's classroom. Because we only have so many teachers for so many kids. We don't have allocated more allocations for more. So the online classes are gonna have to be more kids than the kids inside the classrooms to compensate for the 13 less seats. Does that make sense, Dr. Mullins? I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know that that will necessarily be true, that the e-learning, because we're gonna have to adhere to class size for the e-learning classes as well. What may occur, and Ms. Ms. Klein alluded to it, is that we may have a multi-age class, which yeah. we have had in the past as a result of needing to meet class size uh, uh, amendment. So 
there may be a fourth and fifth grade e-learning class combined, if that makes sense, to get to, to yep. maximize class size. Ms. Klein, did I reflect, uh, represent that correctly? Ms. McDougall, you want to weigh in on the elementary plan? I, I want to give it a thumbs up also, and I also would much prefer that our desks are six feet apart than the three. Um, or as close to six, because I think that will make a difference also. All right, and I will give you a thumbs up on elementary as well. Um, same concerns, you know, just doing, doing as much as we can to ensure distancing. That brings us to our secondary plan. Um, Ms. Campbell, you want to weigh in? Oh, I get to go first. You want me to start with Ms. McDougal? Yes. Yeah, uh, start with <laughs> so uh, I for me I like the block schedule um, I think it will provide some safety for our teachers I think it uh, will be more beneficial for some of our students um, so yes the thumbs up for the block schedule mr. Susan oh you want me to go before everybody else I was just going in order from uh, um, when we're giving direction here you're asking for direction to continue to look into it you're not looking for direction to completely drive the actual we're going to block right now because you said you're going to go back to your principal correct um, I, I'm asking for your support if um, we can make the math work, um, utilize some CARES Act funds where necessary, and, and Dr. Mullins is in support of what the financial impact would be for us to proceed with that plan. Um, it, it is, uh, again, a big lift. Um, so I can push the teams to move further on that. Um, but. What I need to know is if we can make it to his satisfaction and, of course, Ms. Lazinski and those things, is this something that you support? Um. Okay, so where I'm at with this is, is that we just decided in this decision right here to move the entire secondary possibly to block scheduling, which I feel we need some time to get to the principals to do all those things. Um, I would love to have that decision come back to us on Tuesday, whether we do it or not, because I think some conversations need to be had. I'm hearing from both sides that it's good, it's bad, right? I need some time to look at it. Mm -hmm. But when I look at this from the beginning, I see we are going to have less teachers coming back than the ones that we had before. We're going to be asking teachers to take on more because even though it's block scheduling, there is a a need inside that block scheduling for teachers to teach four of four so they're going to have to there is going to be a need for that there's possible par which means that we're going to need more teachers in the schools which if it was one or two that's no big deal but when we have 18 a couple of extra units so there's the, the, the cost of it all but then the, the other piece is is that when you start looking at how much time we have to teach a bunch of teachers that have never taught block on how to not only teach the way that they're supposed to for COVID, but now all of a sudden they have to take what they would have had done in 47 minutes. And some of these people have been teaching 20, 30 years on 47 minutes to then shift it to 90 minutes, confining a class for disciplinary issues, um, time that staff needs. We normally take a year when we move a school to block schedule. I remember when we did it at, um, I think it was Space Coast, it took a year for them to transition, or it was Titus Filler Astronaut. Somebody, it took a whole year. We were talking about that when we first came on, is that it takes a year for them to transition, and we're gonna be putting that down into like a week. And then on top of that, the other thing is, is that a lot of those kids that are inside those schools have gone through the block scheduling, so they've continued to do it over and over again. And so they, they're conditioned for it, and I just, I, I know that the way that they're successful in some of those things is that they teach zero blocks. They teach extra blocks. And um, I, I have a concern there. But I do know that the bottom line is is that you're trying to do contract tracing. You're trying to make sure that when, when they get 
test positive that you can control that. And that's a big piece here. So I need some time on this one. Um, I'm okay going forward, you know, to take a look at it, but I don't want this thumbs up right now to mean that if you can make it work, you just go. Because I might find out tomorrow or the next day that it's uh, completely a disaster. We might all find out. We need to have that ability to come back to you. I don't think with the current time period that we have that we can do that. So I would request that it comes back to us for further discussion if we have any issues. Does that make sense? On Tuesday. I'll go next if you're done, Mr. Susan. Yeah, I just, I mean, it's just, if I have to say it, less time to, less time for them to plan. Scheduling, nobody's done the scheduling for block and any of the other schools except two. The ESE becomes an issue because now we have to coat, we have to make applications and do those pieces. How does a substitute work into block? Have they ever done it before? So all of our substitutes need to switch over. I just think that it's a lot to put on a teacher at a time when we didn't have time. That's all. All right, I'm good. So um, I don't like block <laughs> going to this really quickly because of the reasons that I shared, but everything that's positive about this is outweighs what I don't like. And uh, as far as, you know, and our teachers, yes, they're going to they're going to make some huge adjustments. But from the feedback that I've seen, even already coming in the breaks, checking different things, I'm already seeing positive of I would feel so much more comfortable coming back to school if I only am exposed to three classes for, of kids versus six. Um, and the changes, you know, less passing periods, which is one of the things we're so concerned about. And um, more time to plan, more time to adjust, especially if we're going to be in school and out of school. Our kids only having four classes of work, you know, full long classes, but four that they've got to focus on in the weeks when we're going to be distance learning because we have cases pop up in schools. Um, I so I'm I'm ready to tell you yes, move forward and checking with our principals. Um, I would just at just ask, very seriously ask. I'm making my serious face that very strong consideration to students' schedules and their preferences, especially when it comes to, you know, if, you know, I don't know how Titusville does it, but if they do band all year long and then they've got three other classes, but whatever, that, you know, students are all of a sudden, their preferences that they put in in the spring of what classes they wanted, everything kind of gets readjusted because you don't get to pick, am I going to take it in the fall and take it in the spring? Uh, and with the academic classes, I know there's probably a better way to do that and it all gets shuffled out. But just, you know, that's really going to rock some, some uh, of the performing groups and the, the arts and the elective classes world in doing this. And so I'm very cautious to do that, but I just, ooh, I, but I can give you my yes. <laughs> I, I, I share a little bit of Mr. Susan's concern on making such a big decision with I mean, I'll admittedly say I know nothing except for what's been spoken today about block scheduling. On the surface, you've got my support, you've got my vote, basically because it reduces by half the contact. And I think that that's, you know, that's what this meeting is about today, is how we're going to go back to school with 68,000 students as safe as, as we can in the most normal fashion and this still allows kids to have their classes and to, I mean, it, it's going to cause issues. I'm really concerned about AP and some of the advanced students. I, I've got a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of concerns, but I think, and you didn't even speak about that. You said it later in the meeting, like not even when you were presenting, and it hit me just as this wasn't an easy decision for you to even bring forward. You know what this is going to do in the disruption and what it's going to put on your principles, and I know how you like to protect them. So I, I, I'm assuming you feel strongly that this is going to keep everybody the safest, and so uh, you have my thumbs up. So I'm living block. Um, actually, I'm living block, and I'm living a seven period because I have one, uh, one on block, and I have one on seven period day. Um, and I will tell you that they make it work very well. Um, the feedback I've heard is it would be great if we could have more time, if maybe if we could start school like a week later to give more time to train teachers and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I understand that, but um, 
you know, having, having taught at the college level, some days you are teaching a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and you're teaching for 50 minutes, and some days you're teaching a Tuesday, Thursday class, and you're teaching for two hours, and, um, you know, I, I think content-wise, teachers can adjust um, with some coaching along the way and, and make it work. Um, I, I, I believe that they are absolutely professional enough to, to step in and do that. And will it be phenomenal and ideal day one? Probably not, because it is an adjustment. Um, but I do believe that they can quickly adjust to, to the block schedule. Um, you know, the, the Titusville community, when we got rid of block at Astronaut, was very upset because it was what they had already known and they really appreciated it. The Titusville High community loves their block schedule because of um, the CTE and the extracurriculars and uh, it works out really, really well for them. <clears throat> Perhaps most importantly, I will tell you that when we did have to go to our uh, emergency, emergency at home learning, um, it was much easier with my block schedule kid than it was with my seven period kid. Um, and when I say easier, I don't mean like academically easier. The, the rigor was there with the four, four classes. Um, but being able to manage four classes as opposed to managing seven classes and seven different teaching styles and seven different ways of putting the assignments out, <clears throat> it just, the, the block schedule was so much easier for, I think, everyone to adapt to our emergency at-home learning platform. Um, and I anticipate a significant amount of that coming in our future, unfortunately, just to be realistic. Um, but my big driver in, in supporting the secondary plan is, um, you know, as I said earlier, I am, I am incredibly nervous about our responsibility to keep our faculty and staff and our students safe. Um, and I, I feel like this probably has one of the larger impacts on really minimizing those exposures um, for our, our secondary faculty, staff, and students. And so you have my thumbs up, Dr. Sullivan. The only thing that I would say is I still love the possibility of being able to do some in class and, and some at home if it comes to that. Um, and, and looking at those ways that if we have a teacher that has to go out on you know, 14-day quarantine because she was in contact or he was in contact with someone, um, looking at ways that we can, you know, keep them engaged with their students. Um, yes, yes, so, yes, I was looking at you both, so. Um, but but I, I thank you for, for making this a possibility. Um, and please thank your, your principals if they move in that direction. The only thing that I would say is if you go back to your principals and they're like, you are absolutely going to kill us, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to push them over the edge. But if they truly think this is doable with the timeline that, that you have put before them, then you have my blessing. Okay. Um, was that enough guidance? Do you, did you need further? So to summarize, I, I, the, by far the, the board's uh, consensus is to move forward with block and, you know, uh, if Dr. Sullivan determines and we uh, evaluate the fiscal um, viability of it, we will bring that recommendation forward, you know, hopefully on Tuesday um, or at least an update of, of what that's going to look like uh, for further consideration. But um, my... What I'm sensing is the board is supportive of moving forward with this as the primary consideration for our secondary schools next year. With the auspice that the principals are supportive and that our union's in support too, so that we don't I, have a... I, I, I think I feel comfortable living in both lanes um, because in reality, there, there's not going to be a ton of movement between now and Tuesday. And so um, I would certainly anticipate um, our board members, you know, having additional thoughts and things like that. Um, I want to empower them a little to start taking more steps and reaching out to their school communities. And so 
what I hear is that I have the support to go ahead and have them start reaching out to their school communities. Again, prior to today, only the principal and assistant principal knew because they didn't want any discussion prior to the board. And so um, what I'm hearing is enough support to go in that direction. But again, of course, this actual presentation to the community is on Tuesday. And of course, the board you know, can certainly weigh in again on then as well to Mr. Susan's point. I think it's for me, it's, just, it's the principles and just learning more about it because what Ms. Belford just said was great. You know what I mean? You made some great points. I'm learning as we go on it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So elementary and secondary, we are good, Dr. Mullins, with direction? <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. Moving on to temperature checks. Um, I know it's Mr. Susan's issue, but uh, we received a message somewhere along the way here that other districts are doing, like, spot checking in a sense. So it's not every single student, but it's... Um, Monday, kids that come through the front gate get it. Tuesday, kids that come through the side gate get it. And it's not a perfect system, but it's something for us maybe to think about. I don't, I don't think something like that should be hardcore in policy, like every Tuesday. I, I don't know. It, that's, it sounded like maybe it's something we should discuss. Um, I'm interested in, after our discussion, at least allowing if it's legal and doesn't infringe on privacy, uh, us providing a thermometer for teachers that request. I don't know how we budget for that because we don't know how many would want one. Or How long does it take to get them in? I'm gonna hedge my response. You get another ish um, because inventory changes with great regularity. This amount that we ordered, we got very quickly. Um, and when I say very quickly, within two weeks, um, at this, the next scale, and as we get closer to school year, I certainly can't, um, nobody can speak to that supply chain issue. The sooner we get the order in, the better. And so, um, obviously, as you guys are thinking through any changes you want us to make before Tuesday, um, we would want to get the order in as soon as possible. Um, and it would have to, in all likelihood, be enough for all teachers um, only because I I think that's odd if I we don't and so what we like we did with the shields we did all teachers these are way more expensive um, but we could expedite we could order tomorrow um, that's not my decision to make that's the board's and dr. Mullins decision to make but once that decisions made we can place the order quickly we're working with a vendor Again, unless supply chain is choking closer to the start of the school, I, I can't guess. If I, if I could speak, I, I felt that we just needed some kind of a stronger plan there. And I was looking for us to reevaluate how to do that. Um, I will say that pulling the trigger on purchasing one for every teacher, we would have to check in with the teachers to see if this is something that they really want. I don't even know. I may leave here and they may say you're crazy I don't want one of those things or they may say yeah um, I think that needs to come in but you know Disney is literally going to temperature check every single person that comes into Disney there's got to be a way that we can figure out if that behooves us to be stronger for parents to come back that we can do it that's all they also check bags and have metal detectors and you know Miss Campbell was 100% right like when we were visiting all that we don't have the manpower we don't make money like Disney does <laughs> to, to, to. And theme parks have staggered entry. I mean, keep in mind, we're trying to bring in hundreds of kids thousands. within, yeah, uh, or thousands, thousands high level. Uh, within 20 to 30 minutes at best. So that's, that's what, time. that's what presents the, the uh, capacity challenge. If it's, if it's upon entry. Well, and if, if, if every, so let's break it down from there. If you have 100 teachers at Vieira, which you have more than that, and you have 2,000 kids, then that's 20 kids per teacher, right? It takes one and a half seconds to actually register the thing. Okay. So if we have the teachers have them in their hands when the people are coming in, and they're able to figure out a way to where that student does not enter into that classroom, we may potentially stop what would become one of these breaks where an entire classroom and teacher and everybody else has to stay out in 14 minutes. The fiscal cost of that, I think, 
far exceeds anything of preventativeness that might be out there. That's all. But I didn't ask to purchase one for every teacher. I just asked if we could look into what that looks like. There's probably a thousand ideas. You just found out that there's this spot checking that goes on. There may be other ideas out there. I just think that our public would want a stronger response than if we can or we can't even test them then we're just gonna give a couple and just hope that we test some kids that don't normally have family support to be, you know, I, I just think that that was not a strong one. I think we can do better, that's all. That's all. Um, uh, okay, my turn. Um, I thank you for clarifying. You're not asking for us to have one for every teacher. I just don't think that's feasible and I'm thinking about a new routine as we're, we're asking every teacher as students line up to walk in pump up hand sanitizer, and that's about as long as we want them standing in the hallway all together waiting to get into the classroom. So you think about two classrooms right next to, to each other. You know, we're trying to avoid situations where they're standing close together. Um, and so, um, and the younger they are, the more difficult it's going to be. And so we're just, you know, hand sanitizer on the way into classrooms, that I think we're just adding an extra step. I do uh, wouldn't mind us just not necessarily purchasing more, but having, if we can find out what opportunities can we have to, you know, random, <laughs> if the clinic nurse doesn't have anything else to do, um, you know, in a period two, you know, maybe come around and just doing, you know, random checks. If, that, if that's, I'm, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that, but I just don't, I think this is, um, I don't know that this is the, be all end all thing that's going to just to save the day. I think when we talk about all the things that, that you guys have planned to put in place, we're doing all those things not to keep COVID out, but because we're actually expecting it to come in, not wanting it to, but expecting it to come in. So that's why we're facing all the same way. That's why we're strongly recommending masks. That's why we're you know limiting, we're changing to block schedule. We're doing all those things because we expect it to come in and all these things are going to mitigate the spread when it comes in. So. You know, I understand uh, what Mr. Susan's thought is to, you know, kind of put a stronger wall defense around around the thing. But I think we're we're going to have to rely on um, our teachers and our staff to and to recognize uh, beyond what our parents are doing. But sometimes a kid comes to sick school and they're just fine. And once they get to school, then they start looking sick. To do what they have always done, as far as sending kids to the clinic and um, and then moving through their, our procedure from there. I. Did that tell you what, how I feel? I think so. Yeah. I'll, I'll summarize at the end, just so there's no, you know, no confusion. Are we, are teachers holding the san sanitizer and actually pumping it at everyone? Was that was something that we asked them? Are we setting it to the side I, so they I can do it coming I imagine some in? will want to do that. So our, we did not imagine that when we ordered them, but honestly, could I see that? Absolutely, 100%. I could see that. Um, we imagine yes, that uh, like a little table when you walked touching. in, but to to uh, Miss Campbell's point, I, I could see that as well. Um, we just got the biggest jug we could get for teacher, um, just for economy of scale. But I, we hadn't planned to mandate how the teacher utilized said right. hand it's sanitizer. It's going to be another step in the process. Yeah. Dr. Thetty wanted to ask a clarifying question as well. I just need to have, I need to go back for a second to the thermometers. I heard volunteer. I heard um, something that sounded a little bit like required, and I want to make sure that when I walk out, I understand where, what we're looking at. I know I don't remember when, but a while ago, uh, Mr. Clucci shared survey results with me of teachers um, that BFT had done, and there was some agreement about 60% of volunteering to do temperatures. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page with volunteer versus required in keeping with what Ms. Moore said about the privacy. So I just wanted that clarification because I heard two different things. Can I jump in here? Can I have a turn here? Is that possible? Yeah, go ahead, Ms. McDougall. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, teachers, oftentimes teachers know when a student is not feeling well right away. And so that, that student goes to the office. And let's say they come back and they have a, a fever. Um, at that point, wouldn't it make sense that maybe we check more students in that classroom as a as a way to maybe do it? Um, and I, I like the idea of, um, and I don't know if it's possible, it's random, you know, okay, so Mondays we do this classroom and Tuesdays we do this classroom, but if there's a, somebody who is has showing symptoms, 
would it be feasible or okay to check everyone in that class? I'm just asking. Just some way to um, have a check, because I don't think it's a bad idea. I just, it, logistically, I think is where we're struggling at this point. Sure. I would, uh, my recommendation would be that if a teacher wants a thermometer check to check the children coming into their class, that we make that as one of the, that they should ha not have to pay for it. That would be my recommendation. And I would try to check that out. I would also remind everybody that's on, that's in here, that at arrival, dismissal, cafeteria, sports, these kids are all together. And although we can try to, you know, socially distance and keep them three feet apart and everything else, there's, there's gonna be more places than just the classroom where these kids are together. And I think that just because we're able to make sure that they're socially distanced in the classroom, it's gonna be even harder to do that outside of there. So creating some sort of check system before they get in is good. That's all, because once that argument comes in of who they were in contact for for more than 15 minutes, when you start talking about cafeterias, you start talking about sports, you start talking about things, you start shutting down whole, whole areas like that too. So that's all. Thank you. Clear as mud for you, Dr. Rollins? Yeah, I'm going to need a lot more help. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, <laughs> So I will say that I'm not sure that we can move forward on an enormous amount of clarity on this issue until we get some uh, information from Paul that Chris had requested on the, the privacy and the legality of, of doing that. I think we're probably going to need that information. Um, for me personally, big fan of doing whatever we can to limit contact and, and exposure and, and risk for our, our team members, right? But um, so. My preference would be that if we have teachers who would like to be able to take temperatures on their kids, um, that we support them in doing that, provided that, one, it's not violating anything, um, two, that they commit to privacy for that student and not, you know, pulling them aside right in front of everyone and, and calling them out and that sort of thing. I think, you know, there would have to be some, some communication of expectations there if, if we were going to open that door, if Mr. Gibbs felt like it was an appropriate thing to do. Um, but I, I don't know that we necessarily go out and buy enough thermometers for all teachers. I would say, you know, maybe let's wait and see what the response is and have the teachers understand that it may be a little while before they get their thermometer, depending on how many want them. I think that might be our better way. So I'll make a suggestion and you, the board, you, uh, if you would let me know if this is acceptable. What I'm hearing is, is there seems to be board, some board consensus on voluntary teachers being provided a thermometer to do temperature checks in their classroom. Assuming we can meet all privacy and legal, legal uh, implications of that practice. Um, I will work with uh, Mr. Gibbs and see if we can't get that clarification for Tuesday. We will hold off on the purchase of any additional thermometers at least until Tuesday, but we can get our procurement department ready to do something um, in the event that the board gives us a go on Tuesday, assuming all of the implications, the legal implications, et cetera, are in place. Does that seem to represent where the board is at this time? Yeah. But the part of it with the teachers is just part of the, we need to develop something stronger. We, we, whether it's teachers te testing them right at the gate when they're coming into their classroom, or whether it's a school that might figure out, hey, we can do this, we can test every kid that comes in. I just wanted a stronger plan. And if that plan requires more testing, um, you know, guns, then I would love to be able to provide that to them. So if that's a school where the teacher says, yes, I want one, they should get one. If a school says, hey, if we get 10 more, then we could test everybody on the campus because we figured this out because we have all the duties that teachers do in the morning already that are supposed to monitor, are supposed to do all that stuff. If you deployed them into certain areas, you probably could get them to be tested coming in. So if there's a plan out there that a school has that they can test them all coming in, man, that would be amazing. And if we could deploy the, 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 the tests to them to do that, that's great. Or if the teachers want them, I just think we need a better barrier. That's all. That's all. 
<laughs> I, I don't think we've ever suggested that schools couldn't develop a plan to do enhanced thermometer check or temperature checks. And if they need more, uh, we give it to if, them. If they need more, we can certainly, you know, particularly because they are uh, FEMA qualifying, you know, that makes it much more affordable. Mm -hmm. So we will pre be prepared to do that. And these would be covered if they if they were to go buy them on their own with their their lead money that they have for the classroom, that 250. No, 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 no. I, I don't. If they went out and bought one, could I they get know, reimbursed for it? No. I think that's something we have to check with uh, Mrs. Lisinski on for that answer regarding the uh, teacher lead money and how that's used. And if other districts are already testing kids and that's part of their plan, then the legality of it is probably allowing us to do this. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Was, was my summary acceptable? I... Sounds great. Okay. Any other board member have concerns with the summary put forward? All right. Moving on to masks. Um, who wants to start? You made a recommendation for strongly advised? Expected. Expected. I support it. What's, what was, I mean, I'm, I have the American Academy of Pediatrics page up in school guidelines. I wholeheartedly agree with that whole page. What are you all proposing as far as language or otherwise Ms. Belford came up with some language. Is that the language you like? You want something different? If you look on slide 28, 28. our in school guidelines for face coverings is on page 28. So the committees or the task force recommendation is all members of the school community are strongly recommended to wear a face covering. Standard rules apply on school appropriateness. Masks should cover the nose, mouth, and not the full face. And then there are additional criteria over on the right. Okay. Which includes the expectation for buses. I am in favor of the it as, as it reads I would not be in favor of a, a kind of mandate that would cause discipline for students who um, take it off for a moment. Or but I strongly encourage the community also to uh, to wear one. But I, I I like the way the wording is as it is. I could I could um, I could go along with ex, uh, with expected. But again, it's it's kind of like. Some of the ones that are in the community, there's no teeth in it, but we, we just want to encourage as strongly as possible people to do it. I can go along with that. So the proposal is just to change the words, all members of the school community are strongly recommended to all members of the community are expected to wear a face covering? Understanding that we're gonna to have to use common sense where we have, you know, kids that have sensory issues and Asthma. people who can't breathe and, but I, I think the expectation. What does, I, I, I yeah, I, I mean, I'm okay with the, I don't think the word bothers me, but I went back and I've been reading this over and over, the Pedi American Academy of Pediatrics, and that last paragraph, if not developmentally feasible, um, I'm thinking about, kindergarten a lot and VPK. I mean, those are, you, you all have kids, four, five years old. Yes, they can wear a mask, but it specifically says in here, if they're touching their face more than they would otherwise, because the mask is on. And every four-year-old I've been around, that's pretty much what's going on. So I, when we, are we expecting four-year-olds? Is it a high expectation that every four-year-old in that, what, what does that language play out like is my question in the classroom. Like we can say that's the language, but now we've got a VPK teacher standing there with 12 four-year-olds who are like ping, ping, ping. Yeah, I mean, she's like, well, I'm ex they're expected to keep it on. How, what, how, what does this look like for our teachers? Yeah. In fact, I, I, I'm gonna back up and I'm sorry, it's my prerogative to change my mind. I'm actually gonna back up because there is that 
it's kind of like the cities who are saying it's mandatory to wear a mask, but you don't, you can't get fined and you can't whatever. They're just, they're saying to the community, we really, 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 really want you to wear a mask, but we can't make you. Um, and honestly, that's kind of that's kind of how I feel. I really, really want to say, hey, wear a mask, wear a mask, wear, but we're not going to make you. And staff, students, uh, both because I just, I just can't get beyond the fact that even if we say expect, there's going to be that discipline factor that's going to come in. You don't have your mask on, you know, you know, or whatever. And I, you know, kids point to other kids, and then the little kids, and I, I just, I, you know. This, this is, that is about as far as I can go. And I think you guys have done a lot of work around this and you've taken into consideration parent input. And for the people who are emailing me all day today, actually I've had from both sides, I'll check on the breaks. Um, you know, people saying don't mandate them, people saying mandate them. Everybody needs to realize that everybody doesn't think like everybody else. So I just, we're gonna, that's just, that's just, this is the way you guys have worded it, I think is great and um, here, and then we, you know, we're developing videos, we're gonna tell people the benefits of that, we're gonna give them options, you know, they can express their style, you know, in their mask, we can have our leadership, you know, I don't have a problem when I go visit a school having a mask on um, to set a good example and all of that, I just, um, yeah. Ms. McDougall. I think people understand how I feel. I think science has really talked about the it it mitigates the spread of the virus. It protects each other. Um, and you're absolutely right. I would never expect a pre-K or a kindergarten child to be able to arrest, wear a mask, and they don't particularly recommend that. Um, and I am concerned. I just think that um, at what what Ms. Campbell's saying, she's right. She says there's, we have people on both sides of the uh, issue, but again, I still feel that we need to be stronger on it. And um, and I don't see students getting punished for it. That that should not be a discipline issue. Um, if it is, there's something quite wrong. Um, but anyhow, I I really feel that we should be stronger on the issue. And science supports that. And like I said, other countries can seem to do it, but for whatever reason, um, people feel that they can't do it here in, uh, in Brevard. I would not suggest discipline for mask wearing, but I, you know, I, I do think that expect is a little bit stronger than um, strongly recommend. So I would, I would continue to suggest that we move in that direction just to ensure, I mean, we're, we're putting people in less than ideal situations, and uh, you know, I think we have a, a responsibility to do what we can to, to protect them as much as possible. Um, if Doctor. I could, two comments. I, I just sent you guys an email that lists the full text from the AAP. Um, in the presentation, it's linked, but they do grade ban recommendations. So given the discussions you were having, might want to take a look at that prior to Tuesday. Um, the, the one thing that I think we have to consider with the word expect is then a parent is going to trust that word expect that the teachers are wearing masks. And so I just wanted to make sure that that's an intended outcome. We honestly are absolutely willing to support whatever the wishes of the boards are. We've got our pens. We're typing changes as we're speaking. I just felt that was worth clarification. Did you intend for that? Because when we put the word expect that, that's empowering um, students and parents and teachers that we expect that. And as, as differently and passionately as parents feel, our teachers feel as differently as passionately as well. And again, honestly, honestly, right now you could tell us anything and we'd be like, sure, but <laughs> separately on this topic, you know, we came into this absolutely um, giving our best recommendations, supporting whatever the board feels is best interest of the district. So 
I just wanted to throw that out there because I didn't want any unintended consequences of us making decisions at 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Long. No, I, I was exactly going to the same place. I wanted to make you aware of that, that additional language. But I do appreciate the clarification. I, I hadn't thought of that. that it, the, the language of expectation would raise the bar for employees. I did. He, he agreed with the X specs, right? Yep. Mr. Dillon. I, I think we should consider the, I'm, I clicked on your link there, and it, it definitely says pre-kindergarten, right, face coverings for children in PK, pre-K may be difficult to implement. So we're, we're saying with this blanket statement that we are expecting four-year-olds to, to mask up and keep them on. Because our pre-K teachers are also classroom teachers. <laughs> of course, they're classroom just want to teachers. That one in there. But there's just a huge difference between a four year old and a 17 year old. My four year old, I, this morning know. I sat there and I asked Matthew, I said, I said Are you going to be able to wear a mask all day in class? And he, and he sat there and goes, Yeah, Dad, I can do that because that keeps me safe. And then I'm not kidding you, seven, ten minutes later he comes back and he says, I can't do that because it doesn't fit right on my face. And I thought about it, Dad, and I'm just not going to do that. So that's the mentality, like back and forth. I don't like this thing. He'll be wearing it on his ear. He'll go lick one of the chairs. I mean, that's my four-year-old. It becomes more hazardous is, yeah. is what I'm saying is because they are, they're touching it, they're pulling it. They're, but it we just, can strongly recommend. It just. Well, and then if you have the situation of a teacher who needs to take it off to communicate, for example, especially in a preschool class or in a choir class or whatever, I mean, if we're, that's why not mandating, because if you say mandate, you say expect, then it's going to expect not only will you wear it, but you'll wear it all day, except for when you're eating or drinking or whatever, you know. Yeah, the, uh, yeah what I was, face shield or mouth. And, and my thought is whatever word you land on, know that we'll finesse the language to make it work. Highly recommend works as a general statement. Expect would need more language wrapped around it to cover the concerns that you have. But whichever word you land on, we've heard your concerns, and we would wordsmith those in there. Right, yeah. and I think you've heard from all five of us. We don't think, want discipline involved in yeah, absolutely. the masks. Yeah. I think we probably need to take a look at the information that Dr. Sullivan sent. And um, I, I mean, I, I think you basically know where our sentiment is and perhaps we can come back and have additional discussion on Tuesday with with specifics. Is that okay for you guys? If it's if it's okay with the board, we're gonna leave the language as it is, since we're not being given direct uh, direction otherwise and anticip but anticipate that there may be further discussion on Tuesday at the board meeting before a final decision is made. Mm -hmm. Is that acceptable? Any board members opposed to that? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. All right, that brings us to volunteers. Tina, I think that was yours. Uh, yeah. Is anybody interested in creating a special class of volunteers? Or am I on a, out on a limb no, on that one? No, I want to hear it. Let's hear it. Well, I have already laid it out a little earlier. I just feel like we have, every school seems to have one or two that are part of the the team and you know maybe I, th I think I discussed it maybe with Dr. Mullins at some point over the last few days and maybe it is we take it nine weeks by nine weeks but I, I think some of these volunteers are vital to the functioning of our school and they they're an extra set of hands that are reliable and responsible just because they're not getting a paycheck mm -hmm. doesn't mean that their work sometimes isn't just as valuable and because they're not paying them, we're kicking them out of campus. Right, we've got volunteers who put hundreds and hundreds of hours. Yeah, and do and do year. real work. They're not right. just there shaking hands and. Right, there's some schools that babies. don't do any of their laminating. No staff does any laminating. Only volunteers do that, and which just got to be done. It's hours of work. The thing that I keep coming back to when we were talking about that is, you know, we just said, you know, we haven't passed our budget yet, but one of the recommended cuts is our media assistance, and one of the things that 
you know, came to my mind as we're going through that process is schools would have to develop, like the schools who don't have, the smaller schools that don't have media assistance, volunteer cores who could come in. And I know media centers are gonna be completely different this year than what they have ever been before. Um, but, you know, we've just said, okay, now you're, if your media assistant leaves during the year to take another position because they won't be funded next year, um, then you don't get one for the rest of the year, right? You're on your own. Um, and so, but now they don't have volunteers to, to make that work. So, I don't know about a special class. I guess at the very least, I would request that that would be some of the first people that we let back in we, as we work our plan and it's flexible and we tweak it, whatever, that that, you know, volunteers, not parents come in and eat lunch, but our people who are working and, and just very essential to the functioning of our schools, that we find a way to work them back in as quickly as possible. And I don't have a problem with asking our volunteers to do a screening, to wear a mask, because they're not a part of our um, our school body. Wow, it's eight o'clock. Um, so, but I, if we can, that, like I said, at the very least, I'd say, how, let's find a way to quickly work them back in as the, depending on how things go. Some of the, the discussion I had with Ms. Deskovich uh, was, I, I, we could certainly do that. I, I think the plan is malleable enough that we can, you know, periodically re, re, reconsider um, making adjustments along the way. Um, I think we may be surprised at how adaptive our volunteers who really want to be committed to help our schools can still provide support and assistance even not on campus. Um, so I, I, I'm not the most creative person, so I'm not going to try and pretend what that could look like. But we've seen it happen with other entities. I, mean, I think Junior Achievement was uh, recognized earlier for adapting to the current environment. Um, I, it does. Uh, for board consideration, and uh, if if we identify a certain kind of volunteer, it does put our principals in a, a rather unenviable position to say to one volunteer, you may come in, and another volunteer, you may not. I, I would propose that we need to not put our principals in that position, particularly given all of the other variables they're going to be dealing with uh, going into this year. Um, so. That, that would be my additional request for consideration. What, yeah. if, what if there was some type of allocation each school gets? I, I, I'm thinking about my very specific middle school who doesn't have a media assistant right now because she's not coming back. And now it's just the media specialist. It's exactly what you just said. And now her volunteer, so she, ran, she runs a great, great program. And she had her media assistant and a full-time volunteer, and she's losing both. So is there a way to say just in those circumstances? Or is there a way we can hire her as a substitute media assistant and not pay her? Is there, like, is there, is there, a, is there a workaround so that the principal's not put in the position where you're a special volunteer and you're not? Can I? There's certainly that consideration. I, would, I, have, I feel Chris Moore in my ear, and I that think is... <laughs> I think Miss Klein is moving around in her seat more than uh, uh, I just I think the I'm for consideration for the board's awareness if the volunteer is on our campus and happens to test positive for COVID then our schools could be impacted because of the volunteers presence in addition to the others can I can I speak real fast um, I think the affirmative <laughs> is is that we want to put people inside and the dissenting piece is we don't want them to impact our, our students, right? We don't want them to look at our students and say, er, and impact them because that's the key. What if we set a set of guidelines for the volunteer to volunteer but not have contact with the students? Because a lot of the volunteering is, is putting together the, the copies and preparing the stuff and working inside, like you said, the, cat, the, the, the media center. What if they didn't have contact? What if the plan was that they could volunteer but not have contact but stay on the school? And instead of creating a separate um, classification for volunteers, you ask them to become substitutes because we're going to need a huge pool of substitutes. And in my mind, when I'm looking at this, the substitute is actually supporting the class the same way. We're about to put all of those substitutes that come in through the same things that we're going to do, take COVID testing, whatever those things are, 
I don't see a problem with allowing them to become part of the substitute pool and acting as support, not with kids inside the classroom, but offering opportunities outside inside the media center and stuff like that. What, what about that's his thought? I don't know. I just thought about it. 11 hours strong and still got some stuff. So what do you think? She's getting climb. Why are you looking at me like that? We're at the, we would request direction from the board. So can I, I would suggest the committee has made the recommendation. If the board is directing us otherwise, we will, we will move forward appropriately. The sky has input, Ms. Belfer. <laughs> can I, um, this is Cheryl. Yep, go um, ahead. <laughs> you know, I, Dr. Mullins' idea about how creative our volunteers are, and I do believe they are, and I'm going to give you an example. Um, when we shut down in March, I know that some of the rolling readers, they videotaped and recorded their stories and sent it to the teachers, and the teachers played it for the students. So there are ways to be creative without having contact with our with our staff. Um, right now, the numbers are going up. They're not going down. And so at this point in time, to bring in people who, yes, they're vital. They do play a vital role. And I get it, Ms. Deskovich. Um, but at the same time, I'd rather have us be flexible and reevaluate this at this at this point in time. I really think that we need to, we have so much going on with what we're trying to do for our staff at this point and keep our students safe, that to bring in an unknown is, I think, a little bit risky. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm on board with you. I think our reopening plan needs to be the same as what you have it written. But I just would, my request would just be that, as soon as we can, that that's the first group of people that we open the doors to. On our reopening plan, all of it at the bottom says these guidelines may change <laughs> at any moment of time. Before we leave today, um, we could get a new directive. Um, so we are, everything we're doing is flexible. And, and this was really, really a hard, a hard point in our decision making because we know the value of our volunteers. I've been on the phone with rolling readers probably four times this summer, working out plans on which way they can continue to support our schools uh, through a virtual platform. Because not only do they not want to put our staff at risk, they don't want to be at risk themselves. So uh, I think we're looking at, at safety for all when we do this at this point in time. Okay. Are you happy with that, Ms. Deskovich? Just get them back as soon as we can. Yes. Thank you. Clear? You throwing in the towel? Mm -hmm. Just to summarize, I, I believe the board is, uh, is supporting the current direction of the recommendation that's printed. Yes. And continue to reevaluate and look for the an opportunity to open uh, open access to our volunteers. Does that include PTOs, PTAs? Okay, just check. They can still hold virtual Hobbit. meetings. Yeah. They virtual. can meet off-site. I mean, we, we used to meet in local places sometimes just for I got that. change of scenery. Does any board member have opposition to the summary that Dr. Mullins put forward on that particular issue? Nope. No. No. All right, then we are moving the on to swing sets. Field. Close. Can I Let ask, the kids do, we normally, swing. do we normally clean outdoor playground equipment ever? I don't. No? no. <laughs> Wait, what, Cheryl? I doubt it. I would be so surprised if we ever cleaned outdoor equipment. Okay, well, you can't see Sushi shaking her head, no. <laughs> I mean, it's outdoors, exposed in the sun. I mean, I doubt, unless somebody, like, sorry, threw up on one or whatever, we probably wouldn't. We yeah. do clean, we clean them those. after... Um, Bo vomit, bodily <laughs> <laughs> that we never. But on a yearly, regular basis, outdoor playground equipment is outdoor uh, it playground. Get, it gets pressure washed usually twice a year. Okay. Yeah, we've never had the handy dandy steamer though that kills germs on contact. I think that's an indoor. I don't know what's the name of it. What's it called? That thing is Swifter. No, I have no. a Swifter at home. Spritzer. A mister. Honestly, I can't remember at this moment in time. <laughs> she said it looked like R two D two. Yes. <laughs> it's getting late. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. 
nothing. I mean, if you're wrapping up the whole party going, you might as well wrap up the swings too, but. We will definitely reevaluate. Um, I know, I, we heard that a few minutes ago. I mean, we can't keep kids from touching things that other kids have touched, just reality. If they're gonna play soccer, Okay, well, you're not supposed to touch the ball, sorry. But at some, <laughs> at some point, <laughs> soccer would be a great sport for everybody to do because you can't touch the ball with your hands. Um, but at some point, somebody's going to touch something that somebody else touched, which is why we're washing our hands frequently, we're using hand sanitizer, so we can't keep them from not, from, you know, we just can't bubble tape, bubble wrap them. All, but, you know, so. The swing seems so harmless to me. They're not climbing on top of each other. They're not it's, sliding down a slide that one just touched all the way down. They can but sit in the bathroom. Whatever your direction is, we, we will make it happen. If they sit in a bathroom seat, oh how gosh. can they not sit in a swing seat? It's going down so know. quick. Is there any, Miss McDougall, anybody else have input on swings? I, I will know. share my thoughts if, if you all want. Um, We've, we've talked repeatedly about how robust this plan is and how many moving parts we have and how things are changing every single day with the expectations for our team. And I want kids to play on the playground as much as the next person. Um, but we are really, really asking a lot of our people. And I feel like the more that we can phase into things as opposed to throwing all these enormous expectations all at one time. Um, you know, if, if they don't have to worry about getting someone out there to sanitize the playground, or if they can just gate off the playground and not have to worry about supervising in that area, or I just feel like we really need to be looking for opportunities to m minimize challenges until everybody can get a stride. And then I think we can revisit a lot of things, but. I hear you, I just think it's, it is already a great challenge to send kids out to recess and have very little to do. And I, I think we're all picturing a, a school that we're most familiar with. Like, I, I keep picturing Indy Atlantic, which the playground that you're gonna gate off is separate from the swings, which is all the way on the backfield where the kids are gonna be running around. So visually, I'm thinking, just leave the swings alone. I don't even know how you're gonna gate them off because they're just over there. But maybe, Miss Belford, you're picturing a school where it's all together and you lock the gate and it's done. So, it, look. At this point, you know, I'm not going to fight for an Indy Atlantic swing, but I sure wish our kids, you know, had the opportunity to have stuff to play with out there. I just think I'm going to see teachers out there more trying to block the swings and tell kids to get off them because they're not in a place <laughs> that's gated than it's going to be worth uh, trying to keep. I them wonder going. if we could unhook the swings. I mean, some. That's, I mean, if we're worried about that, Ms. Eskowitz, I wonder if we could unhook them, but. Oh, yeah, or just flip them around 20 awesome times so they're stuck up, you know. Uh, you guys have done so much work, and, you know, I'm willing to kind of, uh, my thoughts on this are the same as the volunteers. Let's go with the plan as written on this, including swing sets in place in play, ground equipment. But, again, as things change, as we evaluate things, and you said every school's a little bit different, that's one of the things that we move to open when we can, when we feel like we can. Is anybody so I, opposed to that plan moving forward? No. So just to confirm, we're gonna leave as is and continue to evaluate, reevaluate, and see if there's opportunity to expand or uh, increase things, which could happen next week or two weeks or... Tonight. <laughs> some weeks from now. Um, so, or maybe the H word comes and blows COVID away from us far, far yeah, away. Yeah, the way it works. We're not That's not making and us feel any better. And for those of you who just joined us, the H word is not a bad word. It's <laughs> a large circling storm. Sorry, I don't cuss. So, <laughs> we just make sure we're all good. All right. Are you comfortable with the consensus direction? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. If I may just take a couple minutes and uh, no. just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost to 12 hours. So, uh, um, I, I think you understand how much work went into the committee because 
the 11 some hours of deliberation that it took to work through it is just a fraction of what the team put into getting to the place that they presented something to you. And the same debate and consternation and back and forth and our, um, I, I think the whiteboard back in the conference room has been marked up and erased and everything else dozens of times. Um, I say all of that because uh, I, I haven't had a chance to express my appreciation publicly today anyway for the work that our team has done in the most historic, unenviable circumstances we have ever known in our generation. Um, I want to thank the board for your acknowledgement of the team and their work. Um, they have been intentional. They have been focused on every last detail, as I think you can see. They have been conscientious both to a quality learning environment, but also the impact of the decisions that they brought forward all while being flexible and upholding quality learning uh, as the benchmark of what we want for our kids. So to these folks here, to everyone around, around the room who have, who have contributed, I, everyone has contributed to the, this effort in addition to the, the uh, extended task force, Lieutenant Neal and others, uh, it's just been remarkable. And um, I couldn't be more proud to, to serve as a superintendent with a team like this around me. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. We absolutely appreciate the amazing work that your team has done. I would say that your uh, team is fabulous, but they are partly successful because of your leadership and support of them as well. So, uh, we appreciate your leadership through this difficult time as well as, as the work of all of the team members to get us to the recommendations that you brought forward. And thank you for hanging in there with us for almost 12 hours today. Um, to work through all of this and now I would like for you all to go home and uh, get some rest and we will see you guys on Tuesday meeting adjourned <laughs>